Jamie. Two days' ride to either side of the King's Road, they passed through a wide swath of destruction, miles of blackened fields and orchards where the trunks of dead trees jutted into the air like archer stakes. The bridges were burnt as well, and the streams swollen by autumn rains, so they had to range along the banks in search of fords. The nights were alive with howling of wolves, but they saw no people. At Maidenpool, Lord Mouton's red salmon still flew above the castle on its hill, but the town walls were deserted, the gates smashed, half the homes and shops burned or plundered. They saw nothing living but a few feral dogs that went slinking away at the sound of their approach. The pool from which the town took its name, where legend said that Florian the Fool had first glimpsed Jonquil bathing with her sisters, was so choked with rotting corpses that the water had turned into a murky grey-green soup. Jamie took one look and burst into song. Six maids there were in a spring-fed pool. What are you doing? Brienne demanded. Singing? Six maids in a pool. I'm sure you've heard it. And shy little maids they were, too. Rather like you. Though somewhat prettier, I warrant. Be quiet, the wench said with a look that suggested she would love to leave him floating in the pool among the corpses. Please, Jamie, pleaded Cousin Cleos. Lord Mouton has sworn to River Run. We don't want to draw him out of his castle. And there may be other enemies hiding in the rubble. Hers or ours? They are not the same, cuz. I have a yen to see if the wench can use that sword she wears. If you won't be quiet, you leave me no choice but to gag you, Kingslayer. Unchain my hands, and I'll play mute all the way to King's Landing. What could be fairer than that, wench? Brienne. My name is Brienne. Three crows went flapping into the air, startled at the sound. Care for a bath, Brienne? He laughed. You're a maiden, and there's the pool. I'll wash your back. He used to scrub Circe's back when they were children together at Casterly Rock. The wench turned her horse's head and trotted away. Jamie and Sir Cleos followed her out of the ashes of Maidenpool. A half-mile on, Green began to creep back into the world once more. Jamie was glad. The burned lands reminded him too much of Ares. She's taking the Duskendale Road, Sir Cleos muttered. It would be safer to follow the coast. Safer, but slower. I'm for Duskendale, cuz. If truth be told, I'm bored with your company. You may be half Lannister, but you're a far cry from my sister. He could never bear to be long apart from his twin. Even as children, they would creep into each other's beds and sleep with their arms entwined, even in the womb. Long before his sister's flowering or the advent of his own manhood, they had seen mares and stallions in the fields and dogs and bitches in the kennels and played at doing the same. Once their mother's maid had caught them at it. He did not recall just what they had been doing, but... Whatever it was had horrified Lady Joanna. She'd sent the maid away, moved Jamie's bedchamber to the other side of Casterly Rock, set a guard outside Circe's, and told them that they must never do that again, or she would have no choice but to tell their lord father. They need not have feared, though. It was not long after that she died birthing Tyrion. Jamie barely remembered what his mother had looked like. Perhaps Stannis Baratheon and the Starks had done him a kindness. They had spread their tale of incest all over the Seven Kingdoms, so there was nothing left to hide. Why shouldn't I marry Cersei openly and share her bed every night? The dragons always married their sisters. Septons, lords, and small folk had turned a blind eye to the Targaryens for hundreds of years. Let them do the same for House Lannister. It would play havoc with Joffrey's claim to the crown, to be sure, but in the end it had been swords that had won the Iron Throne for Robert and swords could keep Joffrey there as well, regardless of whose seat he was. We could marry him to Marcella, once we've sent Sansa Stark back to her mother. That would show the realm that the Lannisters are above their laws, like gods and Targaryens. Jamie had decided that he would return Sansa, and the younger girl as well, if she could be found. It was not like to win him back his lost honor, but the notion of keeping faith when they all expected betrayal amused him more than he could say. They were riding past a trampled wheat field and a low stone wall when Jamie heard a soft thrum from behind, as if a dozen birds had taken flight at once. Down! he shouted, throwing himself against the neck of his horse. The gelding screamed and reared as an arrow took him in the rump. Other shafts went hissing past. Jamie saw Sir Cleos lurch from the saddle, twisting as his foot caught in the stirrup. 
His palfrey bolted, and Frey was dragged past, shouting, head bouncing against the ground. Jamie's gelding lumbered off ponderously, blowing and snorting in pain. He craned around to look for Brienne. She was still a horse, an arrow lodged in her back and another in her leg, but she seemed not to feel them. He saw her pull her sword and wheel in a circle, searching for the bowmen. Behind the wall! Jamie called, fighting to turn his half-blind mount back toward the fight. The reins were tangled in his damned chains, and the air was full of arrows again. At them! he shouted, kicking to show her how it was done. The old sorry horse found a burst of speed from somewhere. Suddenly they were racing across the wheat field, throwing up clouds of chaff. Jamie had just enough time to think. The winch had better follow before they realized they were being charged by an unarmed man in chains. Then he heard her coming hard behind. Even fall, she shouted as her plow horse thundered by. She brandished her longsword. Toth! Toth! A few last arrows sped harmlessly past. Then the bowmen broke and ran, the way unsupported bowmen always broke and ran before the charge of knights. Brienne reined up at the wall. By the time Jamie reached her, they had all melted into the wood twenty yards away. Lost your taste for battle? They were running. That's the best time to kill them. She sheathed her sword. Why did you charge? Bowmen are fearless so long as they can hide behind walls and shoot at you from afar. But if you come at them, they run. They know what will happen when you reach them. You have an arrow in your back, you know. And another in your leg. You ought to let me tend them. You? Who else? The last I saw of Cousin Cleos, his palfrey was using his head to plow a furrow. Though I suppose we ought to find him. He is a Lannister of sorts. They found Cleos still tangled in his stirrup. He had an arrow through his right arm and a second in his chest, but it was the ground that had done for him. The top of his head was matted with blood and mushy to the touch, pieces of broken bone moving under the skin beneath the pressure of Jamie's hand. Brienne knelt and held his hand. He's still warm. He'll cool soon enough. I want his horse and his clothes. I'm weary of rags and fleas. He was your cousin. The wench was shocked. Was, Jamie agreed. Have no fear. I am amply provisioned in cousins. I'll have a sword as well. You need someone to share the watches. You can stand a watch without weapons, she rose. Chained to a tree? Perhaps I could. Or perhaps I could make my own bargain with the next lot of outlaws and let them slip that thick neck of yours, wench. I will not arm you. And my name is Brienne, I know. I'll swear an oath not to harm you if that will ease your girlish fears. Your oaths are worthless. You swore an oath to Ares. You haven't cooked anyone in their armor, so far as I know. And we both want me safe and whole in King's Landing, don't we? He squatted beside Cleos and began to undo his sword belt. Step away from him. Now. Stop that. Jamie was tired. Tired of her suspicions, tired of her insults, tired of her crooked teeth and her broad spotty face and that limp, thin hair of hers. Ignoring her protests, he grasped the hilt of his cousin's long sword with both hands, held the corpse down with his foot, and pulled. As the blade slid from the scabbard, he was already pivoting, bringing the sword around and up in a swift, deadly arc. Steel met steel with a ringing, bone-jarring clang. Somehow Brienne had gotten her own blade out in time. Jamie laughed. Very good, wench. Give me the sword, Kingslayer. Oh, I will. He sprang to his feet and drove at her, the long sword alive in his hands. Brienne jumped back, parrying, but he followed, pressing the attack. No sooner did she turn one cut than the next was upon her. The swords kissed and sprang apart and kissed again. Jamie's blood was singing. This was what he was meant for. He never felt so alive as when he was fighting, with death balanced on every stroke. And with my wrists chained together, the winch may even give me a contest for a time. His chains forced him to use a two-handed grip, though, of course, the weight and reach were less than if the blade had been a true two-handed greatsword. But what did it matter? His cousin's sword was long enough to write an end to this Brienne of Tarth. High, low, overhand, he rained down steel upon her. Left, right, backslash, swinging so hard that sparks flew when the swords came together. Upswing, side slash, overhand, always attacking, moving into her. Step and slide, strike and step, step and strike, hacking, slashing, faster, faster, faster. Until, breathless, he stepped back and let the point of the sword fall to the ground, giving her a moment of respite. Not half bad, he acknowledged. For a winch. She took a slow, deep breath, her eyes watching him warily. I would not hurt you, Kingslayer. As if you could! He whirled the blade back up above his head and flew at her again, chains rattling. Jamie could not have said how long he pressed the attack. It might have been minutes or it might have been hours. Time slept when swords woke. He drove her away from his cousin's corpse, drove her across the road, drove her into the trees. She stumbled once on a route she never saw, and for a moment he thought she was done. 
but she went to one knee instead of falling and never lost a beat. Her sword leapt up to block a down cut that would have opened her from shoulder to groin, and then she cut at him again and again, fighting her way back to her feet stroke by stroke. The dance went on. He pinned her against an oak, cursed as she slipped away, followed her through a shallow brook half-choked with fallen leaves. Steel rang, steel sang, steel screamed and sparked and scraped, and the woman started grunting like a sow at every crash, yet somehow he could not reach her. It was as if she had an iron cage around her that stopped every blow. Not bad at all, he said when he paused for a second to catch his breath, circling to her right. For a wench? For a squire, say? A green one? He laughed, a ragged, breathless laugh. Come on! Come on, my sweetling! The music's still playing! Might I have this dance, my lady? Grunting, she came at him, blade whirling, and suddenly it was Jamie struggling to keep steel from skin. One of her slashes raked across his brow, and blood ran down into his right eye. The others take her, and River Run as well. His skills had gone to rust and rot in that bloody dungeon, and the chains were no great help either. His eye closed, his shoulders were going numb from the jarring they'd taken, and his wrists ached from the weight of chains, manacles, and sword. His long sword grew heavier with every blow, and Jamie knew he was not swinging it as quickly as he'd done earlier, nor raising it as high. She is stronger than I am. The realization chilled him. Robert had been stronger than him, to be sure. The white bull Gerald Hightower as well, in his heyday, and Sir Arthur Dane. Amongst the living, great John Umber was stronger. Strong boar of Craycall, most likely. Both Cleganes, for certainty. The mountain's strength was like nothing human. It did not matter. With speed and skill, Jamie could beat them all. But this was a woman. A huge cow of a woman, to be sure, but even so... By rights, she should be the one wearing down. Instead, she forced him back into the brook, again shouting, Yield! Throw down the sword! A slick stone turned under Jamie's foot. As he felt himself falling, he twisted the mischance into a diving lunge. His point scraped past her parry and bit into her upper thigh. A red flower blossomed, and Jamie had an instant to savor the sight of her blood before his knee slammed into a rock. The pain was blinding. Brienne splashed into him and kicked away his sword. Yield! Jamie drove his shoulder into her legs, bringing her down on top of him. They rolled, kicking and punching, until finally she was sitting astride him. He managed to jerk her dagger from his sheath, but before he could plunge it into her belly, she caught his wrist and slammed his hands back on a rock so hard he thought she'd wrenched an arm from its socket. Her other hand spread across his face. Yield! She shoved his head down, held it under, pulled it up. Yield! Jamie spit water into her face. A shove, a splash, and he was under again, kicking uselessly, fighting to breathe. Up again. Yield, or I'll drown you. And break your oath, he snarled. Like me? She let him go, and he went down with a splash. And the woods rang with coarse laughter. Brienne lurched to her feet. She was all mud and blood below the waist, her clothing askew, her face red. She looks as if they caught us fucking instead of fighting. Jamie crawled over the rocks to shallow water, wiping the blood from his eye with his chained hands. Armed men lined both sides of the brook. Small wonder we were making enough noise to wake a dragon. Well met, friends, he called to them amiably. My pardons, if I disturbed you. You caught me chastising my wife. Seemed to me she was doing the chastising. The man who spoke was thick and powerful, and the nasal bar of his iron half-helm did not wholly conceal his lack of a nose. These were not the outlaws who had killed Sir Cleos, Jamie realized suddenly. The scum of the earth surrounded them, swarthy Dornishmen and blonde Lassini, Dothraki with bells in their braids, hairy Ebenese, coal-black summer islanders in feathered cloaks. He knew them, the brave companions. Brienne found her voice. I have a hundred stags, a cadaverous man in a tattered leather cloak said. Well, take that for a start, my lady. Then I'll have you cut, said the noseless man. It can't be as ugly as the rest of you. Turn her over and rape her arse, Rog, urged the Dornish spearman with a red silk scarf wound about his helm. That way you won't need to look at her. And rob her of the pleasure of looking at me, Noseless said, and the others laughed. Ugly and stubborn though she might be, the wench deserved better than to be gang-raped by such refuse as these. Who commands here? Jamie demanded loudly. I have that honor, said Jamie. The cadaver's eyes were rimmed in red, his hair thin and dry. Dark blue veins could be seen through the pallid skin of his hands and face. Erswick I am, called Erswick the Faithful. You know who I am? 
The soul sword inclined his head. It takes more than a beard and a shaved head to deceive the brave companions. The bloody mummers, you mean. Jimmy had no more use for these than he did for Gregor Clegane or Amory Lorch. Dogs, his father called them all, and he used them like dogs to hound his prey and put fear in their hearts. If you know me, Earswick, you know you'll have your reward. A Lannister always pays his debts. As for the wench, she's high-born and worth a good ransom. The other cocked his head. Is it so? How fortunate. There was something sly about the way Erswick was smiling that Jamie did not like. You heard me. Where's the goat? A few hours distant. He will be pleased to see you, I have no doubt. But I would not call him a goat to his face. Lord Vargo grows quickly about his dignity. Since when is that slobbering savage had dignity? I'll be sure to remember that when I see him. Lord of what, pray? Harrenhal, that has been promised. Harrenhal? Has my father taken leave of his senses? Jamie raised his hands. I'll have these chains off. Erswick's chuckle was papery dry. Something is very wrong here. Jamie gave no sign of his discomfiture, but only smiled. Did I say something amusing? Noseless grinned. You're the funniest thing I've seen since Biter chewed that scepter's tits off. You and your father lost too many battles, offered the Dornishman. We had to trade our lion pelts for wolf skins. Erswick spread his hands. What Timian means to say is that the brave companions are no longer in the hire of House Lannister. We now serve Lord Bolton and the King in the North. Jamie gave him a cold, contemptuous smile. And men say I have shit for honor? Erswick was unhappy with that comment. At his signal, two of the mummers grasped Jamie by the arms, and Rorg drove a mailed fist into his stomach. As he doubled over grunting, he heard the wench protesting, Stop! He's not to be harmed! Lady Caitlin sent us! An exchange of captives! He's under my protection! Rorg hit him again, driving the air from his lungs. Brienne dove for her sword beneath the waters of the brook, but the mummers were on her before she could lay hands on it. Strong as she was, it took four of them to beat her into submission. By the end, the wench's face was as swollen and bloody as Jamie's must have been, and they had knocked out two of her teeth. It did nothing to improve her appearance. Stumbling and bleeding, the two captives were dragged back through the woods to the horses. Brienne limping from the thigh wound he'd given her in the brook. Jamie felt sorry for her. She would lose her maidenhood tonight, he had no doubt. That noseless bastard would have her for a certainty, and some of the others would likely take a turn. The Dornishmen bound them back to back atop Brienne's plough horse, while the other mummers were stripping Cleos Frey to his skin to divvy up his possessions. Rorg won the blood-stained surcoat with its proud Lannister and Frey quarterings. The arrows had punched holes through lions and towers alike. I hope you're pleased, wench, Jamie whispered at Brienne. He coughed and spat out a mouthful of blood. If you'd armed me, we'd never have been taken. She made no answer. There's a Pig stubborn bitch, he thought. But brave, yes. He could not take that from her. When we make camp for the night, you'll be raped, and more than once, he warned her. You'd be wise not to resist. If you fight them, you'll lose more than a few teeth. He felt Brienne's back stiffen against his. Is that what you would do? If you were a woman? If I were a woman, I'd be Circe. If I were a woman, I'd make them kill me. But I'm not. Jamie kicked their horse to a trot. Erswick! A word? The cadaverous soul sword and the ragged leather cloak reined up a moment, then fell in beside him. What would you have of me, sir? And mind your tongue or I'll chastise you again. Gold, said Jamie. You do like gold. Erswick studied him through reddened eyes. It has its uses, I do confess. Jamie gave Erswick a knowing smile. All the gold in Casterly Rock... Why let the goat enjoy it? Why not take us to King's Landing and collect my ransom for yourself? Hers as well, if you like. Tarth is called the Sapphire Isle, a maiden told me once. The wench squirmed at that, but said nothing. Do you take me for a turncloak? Certainly, what else? For half a heartbeat, Erswick considered the proposition. King's Landing is a long way, and your father is there. Lord Tywin may resent us for selling Harrenhal to Lord Bolton. He's cleverer than he looks. 
Jimmy had been looking forward to hanging the wretch while his pockets bulged with gold. Leave me to deal with my father. I'll get you a royal pardon for any crimes you have committed. I'll get you a knighthood. Sir Erswick, the man said, savoring the sound. How proud my dear wife would be to hear it. If only I hadn't killed her. He sighed. And what of brave Lord Vargo? Shall I sing you a verse of the reigns of Castamere? The goat won't be quite so brave when my father gets hold of him. And how would he do that? Are your father's arms so long that they can reach over the walls of Harren Hall and pluck us out? If need be. King Harren's monstrous folly had fallen before, and it could fall again. Are you such a fool as to think the goat can outfight the lion? Erswick leaned over and slapped him lazily across the face. The sheer casual insolence of it was worse than the blow itself. He does not fear me, Jimmy realized with a chill. I have heard enough, Kingslayer. I would have to be a great fool indeed to believe the promises of an oath-breaker like you. He kicked his horse and galloped smartly ahead. Ares, Jimmy thought resentfully. It always turns on Ares. He swayed with the motion of his horse, wishing for a sword. Two swords would be even better. One for the wench and one for me. We'd die, but we'd take half of them down to hell with us. Why did you tell him Tarth was a sapphire isle? Brienne whispered when Erswick was out of earshot. He's like to think my father's rich in gemstones. You best pray he does. Is every word you say a lie, Kingslayer? Tarth is called the Sapphire Isle for the blue of its waters. Shout it a little louder, wench. I don't think Erswick heard you. The sooner they know how little you're worth in ransom, the sooner the rapes begin. Every man here will mount you, but what do you care? Just close your eyes, open your legs, and pretend they're all Lord Renly. Mercifully, that shut her mouth for a time. The day was almost done by the time they found Vargo Hoet, sacking a small sept with another dozen of his brave companions. The leaded windows had been smashed, the carved wooden gods dragged out into the sunlight. The fattest Dothraki Jamie had ever seen was sitting on the mother's chest when they rode up, prying out her chalcedony eyes with the point of his knife. Nearby, a skinny, balding septon hung upside down from the limb of a spreading chestnut tree. Three of the brave companions were using his corpse for an archery butt. One of them must have been good. The dead man had arrows through both of his eyes. When the cell swords spied Erswick and the captives, a cry went up in half a dozen tongues. The goat was seated by a cook fire, eating a half-cooked bird off a skewer, grease and blood running down his fingers into his long, stringy beard. He wiped his hands on his tunic and rose. King Slayer, he slobbered, you are my captive. My lord, I am Brienne of Toth, the wench called out. Lady Caitlin Stark commanded me to deliver Sir Jamie to his brother at King's Landing. The goat gave her a disinterested glance. Silence, sir. Hear me, Brienne entreated as Rorg cut the ropes that bound her to Jamie. In the name of the king in the north, the king you serve, please listen. Rorg dragged her off the horse and began to kick her. See that you don't break any bones, Erswick called out to him. The horse-faced bitch is worth her weight in sapphires. The Dornishman Timian and a foul-smelling Ibanese pulled Jamie down from the saddle and shoved him roughly toward the cook-fire. It would not have been hard for him to have grasped one of their sword-hilts as they manhandled him, but there were too many, and he was still in fetters. He might cut down one or two, but in the end he would die for it. Jamie was not ready to die just yet, and certainly not for the likes of Brienne of Tarth. This is a sweet day, Vargo Hoet said. Around his neck hung a chain of linked coins, coins of every shape and size, cast and hammered, bearing the likenesses of kings, wizards, gods, and demons, and all manner of fanciful beasts. Coins from every land where he has fought, Jamie remembered. Greed was the key to this man. If he was turned once, he can be turned again. Lord Vargo, you were foolish to leave my father's service, but it is not too late to make amends. He will pay well for me, you know it. Oh, yes, said Varga Hoet. Half the gold in Catherly Rock I shall have. But first I must send him a message. He said something in his slithery, goatish tongue. Erswick shoved him in the back, and a jester in green and pink motley kicked his legs out from under him. When he hit the ground, one of the archers grabbed the chain between Jamie's wrists and used it to yank his arms out in front of him. The fat Dothraki put aside his knife to unsheathe the huge, curved arak the wickedly sharp scythe-sword the horse-lords loved. 
They mean to scare me. The fool hopped on Jamie's back, giggling as the Dothraki swaggered toward him. The goat wants me to piss my breeches and beg his mercy, but he'll never have that pleasure. He was a Lannister of Casterly Rock, Lord Commander of the King's Guard. No sellsword would make him scream. Sunlight ran silver along the edge of the Arak as it came shivering down, almost too fast to see. And Jamie screamed. Arya. The small square keep was half a ruin, and so too the great grey knight who lived there. He was so old he did not understand their questions. No matter what was said to him, he would only smile and mutter, I held the bridge against Sir Maynard. Red hair and a black temper he had, but he could not move me. Six wounds I took before I killed him. Six! The maester who cared for him was a young man, thankfully. After the old knight had drifted to sleep in his chair, he took them aside and said, I fear you seek a ghost. We had a bird ages ago, half a year at least. The Lannisters caught Lord Berwick near the god's eye. He was hanged. I hanged he was, but Thoros cut him down before he died. Lem's broken nose was not so red or swollen as it had been, but it was healing crooked, giving his face a lopsided look. His lordship's a hard man to kill, he is. And a hard man to find, it would seem, the maester said. Have you asked the Lady of the Leaves? We shall, said Greenbeard. The next morning, as they crossed the little stone bridge behind the keep, Gendry wondered if this was the bridge the old man had fought over. No one knew. Most like it is, said Jack be lucky. Don't see no other bridges. "'You'd know for certain if there was a song,' said Tom Sevenstrings. "'One good song, and we know who Sir Maynard used to be "'and why he wanted to cross this bridge so bad. "'Poor old Leicester might be as far-famed as the Dragon Knight "'if he'd only had sense enough to keep a singer.' "'Lord Leicester's sons died in Robert's rebellion,' grumbled Lem. "'Some on one side, some on t'other. "'He's not been right in the head since. "'No bloody songs like to help any of that.' "'What did the maester mean about asking the Lady of the Leaves?' Arya asked Angie as they rode. The archer smiled. "'Wait and see.' Three days later, as they rode through a yellow wood, Jack B. Lucky unslung his horn and blew a signal, a different one than before. The sounds had scarcely died away when rope ladders unrolled from the limbs of trees. "'Hobble the horses and up we go,' said Tom, half singing the words. They climbed to a hidden village in the upper branches, a maze of rope walkways and little moss-covered houses concealed behind walls of red and gold, and were taken to the Lady of the Leaves, a stick-thin, white-haired woman dressed in rough spun. "'We cannot stay here much longer with autumn on us,' she told them. A dozen wolves went down the Hayford Road nine days past hunting. If they'd a chance to look up, they might have seen us.' "'You've not seen Lord Berwick?' asked Tom Sevenstrings. He's dead. The woman sounded sick. The mountain caught him and drove a dagger through his eye. A begging brother told us he had it from the lips of a man who saw it happen. That's an old stale tale and false, said Lem. The lightning lord's not so easy to kill. Sir Gregor might have put his eye out, but a man don't die of that. Jack could tell you. Well, I never did, said one-eyed Jack be lucky. My father got himself good and hanged by Lord Piper's bailiff. My brother Watt got sent to the wall, and the Lannisters killed my other brothers. And I, that's nothing. You swear he's not dead? The woman clutched Lem's arm. Bless you, Lem, that's the best tidings we've had in half a year. May the warrior defend him, and the red priest too. The next night they found shelter beneath the scorched shell of a sept in a burned village called Sally Dance. Only shards remained of its windows of leaded glass, and the aged septon who greeted them said the looters had even made off with the mother's costly robes, the crone's gilded lantern, and the silver crown the father had worn. They hacked the maiden's breasts off, too, though those were only wood, he told them, and the eyes, the eyes were jet and lapis and mother of pearl. They pried them out with their knives. May the mother have mercy on them all. Whose work was this? said Lem Lemoncloak. Mummers? No, the old man said. Northmen they were, savages who worshipped trees. They wanted the Kingslayer, they said. Arya heard him and chewed her lip. She could feel Gendry looking at her. It made her angry and ashamed. There were a dozen men living in the vault beneath the sept, amongst cobwebs and roots and broken wine casks. But they had no word of Beric Dondarrion either. Not even their leader, who wore soot-blackened armor and a crude lightning bolt on his cloak. 
When Greenbeard saw Arya staring at him, he laughed and said, The lightning lord is everywhere and nowhere, skinny squirrel. I'm not a squirrel, she said. I'll almost be a woman soon. I'll be one in ten. Best watch out. I don't marry you, then. He tried to tickle her under the chin, but Arya slapped his stupid hand away. Lem and Gendry played tiles with their hosts that night, while Tom Sevenstrings sang a silly song about Big Belly Ben and the High Septon's Goose. Angie let Arya try his longbow, but no matter how hard she bit her lip, she could not draw it. You need a lighter bow, my lady, the freckled bowman said. If there's seasoned wood at River Run, might be I'll make you one. Tom overheard him and broke off a song. You're a young fool, Archer. If we go to River Run, it will be only to collect her ransom. Won't be no time for you to sit about making bows. Be thankful if you get out with your hide. Lord Hoster was hanging outlaws before you were shaving, and that son of his, a man who hates music, can't be trusted, I always say. It's not music he hates, said Lem. It's you, fool. Well, he has no cause. The wench was willing to make a man of him. Is it my fault he drank too much to do the deed? Lem snorted through his broken nose. Was it you who made a song of it, or some other bloody arse in love with his own voice? I only sang it the once, Tom complained. And who's to say the song was about him? Twas a song about a fish. A floppy fish, said Angie, laughing. Arya didn't care what Tom's stupid songs were about. She turned to Harwin. What did he mean about ransom? We have sore need of horses, my lady. Armor as well. Swords, shields, spears, all the things coin can buy. I and seed for planting, when it is coming, remember? He touched her under the chin. You will not be the first high-born captive we've ransomed, nor the last, I'd hope. That much was true, Arya knew. Knights were captured and ransomed all the time, and sometimes women were too. But what if Rob won't pay their price? She wasn't a famous knight, and kings were supposed to put the realm before their sisters. And her lady mother, what would she say? Would she still want her back after all the things she'd done? Arya chewed her lip and wondered. The next day they rode to a place called High Heart, a hill so lofty that from atop it Arya felt as though she could see half the world. Around its brow stood a ring of huge pale stumps, all that remained of a circle of once mighty weirwoods. Arya and Gendry walked around the hill to count them. There were thirty-one, some so wide that she could have used them for a bed. High Heart had been sacred to the children of the forest, Tom Sevenstrings told her, and some of their magic lingered here still. No harm can ever come to those who sleep here, the singer said. Arya thought that must be true. The hill was so high, and the surrounding lands so flat that no enemy could approach unseen. The small folk hereabouts shunned the place, Tom told her. It was said to be haunted by the ghosts of the children of the forest who had died here when the Andal king named Erig the Kinslayer had cut down their grove. Arya knew about the children of the forest, and about the Andals, too, but ghosts did not frighten her. She used to hide in the crypts of Winterfell when she was little, and play games of come into my castle, and monsters and maidens amongst the stone kings on their thrones. Yet even so the hair on the back of her neck stood up that night. She had been asleep, but the storm woke her. The wind pulled the coverlet right off her and sent it swirling into the bushes. When she went after it, she heard voices. Beside the embers of their campfire, she saw Tom, Lem, and Greenbeard talking to a tiny little woman, a foot shorter than Arya and older than old Anne, all stooped and wrinkled and leaning on a gnarled black cane. Her white hair was so long it came almost to the ground. When the wind gusted, it blew about her head in a fine cloud. Her flesh was whiter, the color of milk, and it seemed to Arya that her eyes were red, though it was hard to tell from the bushes. The old gods stir and would not let me sleep, she heard the woman say. I dreamt I saw a shadow with a burning heart butchering a golden stag, aye. I dreamt of a man without a face, waiting on a bridge that swayed and swung. On his shoulder perched a drowned crow with seaweed hanging from his wings. I dreamt of a roaring river and a woman that was a fish. Dead she drifted with red tears on her cheeks, but when her eyes did open, oh! I woke from terror. All this I dreamt, and more. Do you have gifts for me, to pay me for my dreams? Dreams, grumbled Lem, Lemoncloak. 
What good are dreams? Fish women and drowned crows. I had a dream myself last night. I was kissing this tavern wench I used to know. Are you going to pay me for that, old woman? The wench is dead. The woman hissed. Only worms may kiss her now. And then to Tom Seven Strings she said, I'll have my song or I'll have you gone. So the singer played for her, so soft and sad that Arya only heard snatches of the words, though the tune was half familiar. Sansa would know it, I bet. Her sister had known all the songs, and she could even play a little and sing so sweetly. All I could ever do was shout the words. The next morning the little white woman was nowhere to be seen. As they saddled their horses, Arya asked Tom Sevenstrings if the children of the forest still dwelled on High Heart. The singer chuckled. Saw her, did you? Was she a ghost? Do ghosts complain of how their joints creak? No, she's only an old dwarf woman. A queer one, though, an evil-eyed. But she knows things she has no business knowing, and sometimes she'll tell you if she likes the look of you. Did she like the looks of you? Arya asked doubtfully. The singer laughed. The sound of me, at least. She always makes me sing the same bloody song, though. Not a bad song, mind you, but I know others just as good. He shook his head. What matters is we have the scent now. You'll soon be seeing Thoros and the Lightning Lord, I'll wager. If you're their men, why do they hide from you? Tom Sevenstrings rolled his eyes at that, but Harwin gave her an answer. I wouldn't call it hiding, my lady, but it's true. Lord Beric moves about a lot and seldom lets on what his plans are. That way no one can betray him. By now there must be hundreds of us sworn to him, maybe thousands, but it wouldn't do for us all to trail along behind him. We'd eat the country bare or get butchered in a battle by some bigger host. The way we're scattered in little bands, we can strike in a dozen places at once and be off somewhere else before they know. And when one of us is caught and put to the question, well, we can't tell them where to find Lord Beric, no matter what they do to us. He hesitated. You know what it means to be put to the question? Arya nodded. Tickling, they called it. Polliver and Wrath and all. She told them about the village by the god's eye where she and Gendry had been caught, and the questions that the tickler had asked. Is there gold hidden in the village? He would always begin. Silver, gems. Is there food? Where is Lord Beric? Which of you village folk helped him? Where did he go? How many men did he have with him? How many knights? How many bowmen? How many were horsed? How are they armed? How many wounded? Where did they go, did you say? Just thinking of it, she could hear the shrieks again and smell the stench of blood and shit and burning flesh. He always asked the same questions, she told the outlaw solemnly, but he changed the tickling every day. No child should be made to suffer that, Harwin said when she was done. The mountain lost half his men at the stone mill, we hear. Might be this tickler's floating down the Red Fork even now, with fish biting at his face. If not, well, it's one more crime they'll answer for. I have heard his lordship say this war began when the hand sent him out to bring the king's justice to Gregor Clegane. And that's how he means for it to end. He gave her shoulder a reassuring pat. You best mount up, my lady. It's a long day's ride to Acorn Hall, but at the end of it we'll have a roof above our heads and a hot supper in our bellies. It was a long day's ride, but as dusk was settling they forded a brook and came up on Acorn Hall, with its stone curtain walls and great oaken keep. Its master was away fighting in the retinue of his master, Lord Vance, the castle gates closed and barred in his absence. But his lady wife was an old friend of Tom Seven Strings, and Angie said they'd once been lovers. Angie often rode beside her. He was closer to her in age than any of them but Gendry, and he told her droll tales of the Dornish marches. He never fooled her, though. He's not my friend. He's only staying close to watch me and make sure I don't ride off again. Well, Arya could watch as well. Sirio Farrell had taught her how. Lady Smallwood welcomed the outlaws kindly enough, though she gave them a tongue-lashing for dragging a young girl through the war. She became even more wroth when Lem let slip that Arya was highborn. "'Who dressed the poor child in those Bolton rags?' she demanded of them. "'That badge! There's many a man who would hang her in half a heartbeat for wearing a flayed man on her breast!' Arya promptly found herself marched upstairs, forced into a tub, and doused with scalding hot water. Lady Smallwood's maidservant scrubbed her so hard it felt like they were flaying her themselves. They even dumped in some stinky sweet stuff that smelled like flowers. 
and afterward they insisted she'd dress herself in girls' things, brown woolen stockings and a light linen shift, and over that a light green gown with acorns embroidered all over the bodice in brown thread, and more acorns bordering the hem. "'My great-aunt is a scepter at a mother-house in Old Town,' Lady Smallwood said, as the women laced the gown up Arya's back. "'I sent my daughter there when the war began. She'll have outgrown these things by the time she returns, no doubt. Are you fond of dancing, child?' My Carolyn's a lovely dancer. She sings beautifully as well. What do you like to do? She scuffed a toe amongst the rushes. Needlework. Very restful, isn't it? Well, said Arya, not the way I do it. No, I have always found it so. The gods give each of us our little gifts and talents, and it is meant for us to use them, my aunt always says. Any act can be a prayer, if done as well as we are able. Isn't that a lovely thought? Remember that the next time you do your needlework. Do you work at it every day? I did till I lost a needle. My new one's not as good. In times like these we all must make do as best we can. Lady Smallwood fostered the bodice of the gown. Now you look a proper young lady. I'm not a lady, Arya wanted to tell her. I'm a wolf. I do not know who you are, child, the woman said, and it may be that's for the best. Someone important, I fear. She smoothed down Arya's collar. In times like these it is better to be insignificant. Would that I could keep you here with me. That would not be safe, though. I have walls, but too few men to hold them. She sighed. Supper was being served in the hall by the time Arya was all washed and combed and dressed. Gendry took one look and laughed so hard that wine came out his nose, until Harwin gave him a thwack alongside his ear. The meal was plain, but filling, mutton and mushrooms, brown bread, peas pudding, and baked apples with yellow cheese. When the food had been cleared and the servants sent away, Greenbeard lowered his voice to ask if her ladyship had word of the lightning lord. Word? she smiled. They were here not a fortnight past, them and a dozen more driving sheep. I could scarcely believe my eyes. Thoros gave me three as thanks. You've eaten one tonight. Thoros herding sheep? Angie laughed aloud. I grant you it was an odd sight, but Thoros claimed that as a priest he knew how to tend a flock. Aye, and shear them too, chuckled Lem Lemoncloak. Someone could make a rare fine song of that, Tom plucked a string on his wood harp. Lady Smallwood gave him a withering look. Someone who doesn't rhyme carry on with Don Darion, perhaps, or play Oh, lay my sweet lass down in the grass to every milkmaid in the shire, and leave two of them with big bellies. It was let me drink your beauty, said Tom defensively, and milkmaids are always glad to hear it, as was a certain high-born lady, I do recall. I play to please. Her nostrils flared. The riverlands are full of maids you've pleased, all drinking tansy tea. You'd think a man as old as you would know to spill a seed on their bellies. Men will be calling you Tom Seven Sons before much longer. As it happens, said Tom, I passed seven many years ago. And fine boys they are, too, with voices sweet as nightingales. Plainly he did not care for the subject. Did his lordship say where he was bound, my lady? asked Harwin. Lord Berwick never shares his plans, but there's hunger down near Stony Sept and the Threepenny Wood. I should look for him there. She took a sip of wine. You'd best know. I've had less pleasant quarters as well. A pack of wolves came howling around my gates, thinking I might have Jamie Lannister in here. Tom stopped his plucking. Then it's true. The Kingslayer is loose again? Lady Smallwood gave him a scornful look. I hardly think they'd be hunting him if he was chained up under River Run. What did my lady tell them? asked Jack Be Lucky. Why, that I had Sir Jamie naked in my bed but I'd left him much too exhausted to come down. One of them had the effrontery to call me a liar, so we saw them off with a few quarrels. I believe they made for Black Bottom Bend. Arya squirmed restlessly in her seat. What Northman was it who came looking after the Kingslayer? Lady Smallwood seemed surprised that she'd spoken. They did not give their names, child, but they wore black, with the badge of a white sun on the breast. A white sun on black was the sigil of Lord Karstark, Arya thought. Those were Rob's men. She wondered if they were still close. If she could give the outlaws the slip and find them, maybe they would take her to her mother at River Run. Did they say how Lannister came to escape? Lem asked. They did. 
said Lady Smallwood. Not that I believe a word of it. They claimed that Lady Caitlin set him free. That startled Tom so badly he snapped a string. Go on with you, he said. That's madness. It's not true, thought Arya. It couldn't be true. I thought the same, said Lady Smallwood. That was when Harwin remembered Arya. Such talk is not for your ears, my lady. No, I want to hear. The outlaws were adamant. Go on with you, skinny squirrel, said Greenbeard. Be a good little lady and go play in the yard while we talk now. Arya stalked away angry, and would have slammed the door if it hadn't been so heavy. Darkness had settled over Acorn Hall. A few torches burned along the walls, but that was all. The gates of the little castle were closed and barred. She had promised Harwin that she would not try and run away again, she knew, but that was before they started telling lies about her mother. Are you? Gendry had followed her out. Lady Smallwood said there's a smithy. Want to have a look? If you want. She had nothing else to do. This Thoros, Gendry said as they walked past the kennels, is he the same Thoros who lived in the castle at King's Landing? A red priest, fat with a shaved head? I think so. Arya had never spoken to Thoros at King's Landing that she could recall, but she knew who he was. He and Jalabar Shaw had been the most colorful figures at Robert's court, and Thoros was a great friend of the king as well. He won't remember me, but he used to come to our forge. The small wood forge had not been used in some time, though the smith had hung his tools neatly on the wall. Gendry lit a candle and set it on the anvil, while he took down a pair of tongs. My master always scolded him about his flaming swords. It was no way to treat good steel, he'd say, but this Thoros never used good steel. He'd just dip some cheap sword in wildfire and set it alight. It was only an alchemist's trick, my master said, but it scared the horses and some of the greener knights. She screwed up her face, trying to remember if her father had ever talked about Thoros. He isn't very priestly, is he? No, Gendry admitted. Master Mott said Thoros could out-drink even King Robert. They were peas in a pot, he told me, both gluttons and sots. You shouldn't call the king a sot. Maybe King Robert had drunk a lot, but he'd been her father's friend. I was talking about Thoros. Jenry reached out with the tongs as if to pinch her face, but Arya swatted them away. He liked feasts and tourneys. That was why King Robert was so fond of him. And this Thoros was brave. When the walls of Pike crashed down, he was the first through the breach. He fought with one of his flaming swords, setting iron men afire with every slash. I wish I had a flaming sword. Arya could think of lots of people she'd like to set on fire. It's only a trick, I told you. The wildfire ruins the steel. My master sold Thoros a new sword after every tourney, every time they would have a fight about the price. Gendry hung the tongs back up and took down the heavy hammer. Master Mott said it was time I made my first longsword. He gave me a sweet piece of steel, and I knew just how I wanted to shape the blade. Only Yorin came and took me away for the night's watch. You can still make swords if you want, said Arya. You can make them for my brother Rob when we get to River Run. River Run. Jenry put the hammer down and looked at her. You look different now, like a proper little girl. I look like an oak tree with all these stupid acorns. Nice, though. A nice oak tree. He stepped closer and sniffed at her. You even smell nice for a change. You don't. You stink. Arya shoved him back against the anvil and made to run, but Gendry caught her arm. She stuck a foot between his legs and tripped him, but he yanked her down with him, and they rolled across the floor of the smithy. He was very strong, but she was quicker. Every time he tried to hold her still, she wriggled free and punched him. Gendry only laughed at the blows, which made her mad. He finally caught both her wrists in one hand and started to tickle her with the other, so Arya slammed her knee between his legs and wrenched free. Both of them were covered in dirt, and one sleeve was torn on her stupid acorn dress. I bet I don't look so nice now, she shouted. Tom was singing when they returned to the hall. My feather bed is deep and soft, and there I'll lay you down. I'll dress you all in yellow silk, and on your head a crown. For you shall be my lady love, and I shall be your lord. I'll always keep you warm and safe, and guard you with my sword. Harwin took one look at them and burst out laughing, and Angie smiled one of his stupid, freckly smiles, and said, 
Are we certain this one is a high-born lady? But Lem Lemon Cloak gave Gendry a clout alongside the head. You want to fight? Fight with me. She's a girl and half your age. You keep your hands off of her, you hear me? I started it, said Arya. Gendry was just talking. Leave the boy, Lem, said Harwin. Arya did start it, I have no doubt. She was much the same at Winterfell. Tom winked at her as she sang. And how she smiled and how she laughed, the maiden of the tree. She spun away and said to him, No feather bed for me. I'll wear a gown of golden leaves and bind my hair with grass. But you can be my forest love, and me your forest lass. I have no gowns of leaves, said Lady Smallwood with a small, fond smile. But Carolyn left some other dresses that might serve. Come, child. Let us go upstairs and see what we can find. It was even worse than before. Lady Smallwood insisted that Arya take another bath, and cut and comb her hair besides. The dress she put her in this time was sort of lilac-colored, and decorated with little baby pearls. The only good thing about it was that it was so delicate that no one could expect her to ride in it. So the next morning, as they broke their fast, Lady Smallwood gave her breeches, belt, and tunic to wear, and a brown doe-skin jerkin dotted with iron studs. They were my son's things, she said. He died when he was seven. I'm sorry, my lady. Arya suddenly felt bad for her, and ashamed. I'm sorry I tore the acorn dress, too. It was pretty. Yes, child. And so are you. Be brave. Daenerys in the center of the Plaza of Pride stood a red brick fountain whose waters smelled of brimstone. And in the center of the fountain, a monstrous harpy made of hammered bronze. Twenty feet tall, she reared. She had a woman's face with gilded hair, ivory eyes, and pointed ivory teeth. Water gushed yellow from her heavy breasts. But in place of arms she had the wings of a bat or a dragon, her legs were the legs of an eagle, and behind she wore a scorpion's curled and venomous tail. A harpy of geese, Danny thought. Old geese had fallen five thousand years ago, if she remembered true, its legions shattered by the might of young Valyria, its brick walls pulled down, its streets and buildings turned to ash and cinder by dragon flame its very fields sown with salt, sulphur, and skulls. The gods of geese were dead, and so too its people. These Astapori were mongrels, Sir Jorah said. Even the Giscari tongue was largely forgotten. The slave cities spoke the High Valyrian of their conquerors, or what they had made of it. Yet the symbol of the old empire still endured here, though this bronze monster had a heavy chain dangling from her talons, an open manacle at either end. The harpy of geese had a thunderbolt in her claws. This is the harpy of Astapor. Tell the Westerosi whore to lower her eyes, the slaver Krasnus Monoklaus complained to the slave girl who spoke for him. I deal in meat, not metal. The bronze is not for sale. Tell her to look at the soldiers. Even the dim purple eyes of a sunset savage can see how magnificent my creatures are, surely. Krasnus's high Valyrian was twisted and thickened by the characteristic growl of geese, and flavored here and there with words of slaver Argot. Dany understood him well enough, but she smiled and looked blankly at the slave girl, as if wondering what he might have said. The good master Krasnus asks, are they not magnificent? The girl spoke the common tongue well, for one who had never been to Westeros. No older than ten, she had the round, flat face, dusky skin, and golden eyes of Noth. The peaceful people, her folk were called, all agreed that they made the best slaves. They might be adequate to my needs, Dany answered. It had been Sir Jorah's suggestion that she speak only Dothraki and the common tongue while in Astapor. My bear is more clever than he looks. Tell me of their training. The Westerosi woman is pleased with them, but speaks no praise to keep the price down, the translator told her master. She wishes to know how they were trained. Krasnus Monoklaus bobbed his head. He smelled as if he'd bathed in raspberries, this slaver, and his jutting red-black beard glistened with oil. 
He has larger breasts than I do, Denny reflected. She could see them through the thin sea-green silk of the gold-fringed tokar he wound about his body and over one shoulder. His left hand held the tokar in place as he walked, while his right clasped a short leather whip. Are all Westerosi pigs so ignorant? he complained. All the world knows that the unsullied are masters of spear and shield and short sword. He gave Danny a broad smile. Tell her what she would know, slave, and be quick about it. The day is hot. That much, at least, is no lie. A matched pair of slave girls stood behind them, holding a striped silk awning over their heads, but even in the shade Danny felt light-headed, and Krosnus was perspiring freely. The plaza of pride had been baking in the sun since dawn. Even through the thickness of her sandals she could feel the warmth of the red bricks underfoot. Waves of heat rose off them, shimmering to make the stepped pyramids of Astapor around the plaza seem half a dream. If the unsullied felt the heat, however, they gave no hint of it. They could be made of brick themselves, the way they stand there. A thousand had been marched out of their barracks for her inspection. Drawn up in ten ranks of one hundred before the fountain and its great bronze harpy, they stood stiffly at attention, their stony eyes fixed straight ahead. They wore naught but white linen clouts knotted about their loins, and conical bronze helms topped with a sharpened spike a foot tall. Krosnes had commanded them to lay down their spears and shields, and doff their sword belts and quilted tunics, so the Queen of Westeros might better inspect the lean hardness of their bodies. They are chosen young for size and speed and strength, the slave told her. They begin their training at five. Every day they train from dawn to dusk, until they have mastered the short sword, the shield, and the three spears. Their training is most rigorous, Your Grace. Only one boy in three survives it. This is well known. Among the unsullied it is said that on the day they win their spiked cap, the worst is done with, for no duty that will ever fall to them could be as hard as their training. Krasnys Monaklaus supposedly spoke no word of the common tongue, but he bobbed his head as he listened, and from time to time gave the slave girl a poke with the end of his lash. Tell her that these have been standing here for a day and a night, with no food nor water. Tell her that they will stand until they drop, if I should command it. And when nine hundred and ninety-nine have collapsed to die upon the bricks, the last will stand there still, and never move until his own death claims him. Such is their courage. Tell her that. I call that madness, not courage, said Arstan Whitebeard, when the solemn little scribe was done. He tapped the end of his hardwood staff against the bricks, tap, tap, as if to tell his displeasure. The old man had not wanted to sail to Astapor, nor did he favor buying this slave army. A queen should hear all sides before reaching a decision. That was why Dany had brought him with her to the Plaza of Pride, not to keep her safe. Her blood riders would do that well enough. Sir Jorah Mormont she had left aboard Balerion to guard her people and her dragons. Much against her inclination, she had locked the dragons below decks. It was too dangerous to let them fly freely over the city. The world was all too full of men who would gladly kill them for no better reason than to name themselves Dragon Slayer. "'What did the smelly old man say?' the slaver demanded of his translator. When she told him, he smiled and said, "'Inform the savages that we call this obedience.' Others may be stronger, or quicker, or larger than the unsullied. Some few may even equal their skill with sword and spear and shield. But nowhere between the seas will you ever find any more obedient. Sheep are obedient, said Arstan, when the words had been translated. He had some Valyrian as well, though not so much as Dany, but like her he was feigning ignorance. Krasnus Monoklaus showed his big white teeth when that was rendered back to him. A word for me and these sheep would spill his stinking old bowels on the bricks, he said. But do not say that. Tell them that these creatures are more dogs than sheep. Do they eat dogs or horse in these seven kingdoms? They prefer pigs and cows, your worship. Beef. Fuck. <laughs> Food for unwashed savages. Ignoring them all, Danny walked slowly down the line of slave soldiers. The girls followed close behind with a silk awning to keep her in the shade, but the thousand men before her enjoyed no such protection. More than half had the copper skins and almond eyes of Dothraki and Lazarine, but she saw men of the free cities in the ranks as well, along with pale Carthine, ebon-faced summer islanders, and others whose origins she could not guess. And some had skins of the same amber hue as Krasnus Monoklos, and the bristly red-black hair that marked the ancient folk of Geese, who named themselves the Harpy's Sons. 
they sell even their own kind. It should not have surprised her. The Dothraki did the same when Kalasar met Kalasar in the Sea of Grass. Some of the soldiers were tall and some were short. They ranged in age from fourteen to twenty, she judged. Their cheeks were smooth and their eyes all the same, be they black or brown or blue or gray or amber. They are like one man, Danny thought, until she remembered that they were no men at all. The unsullied were eunuchs, every one of them. Why do you cut them? she asked Krasnis to the slave girl. Whole men are stronger than eunuchs, I have always heard. A eunuch who is cut young will never have the brute strength of one of your Westerosi knights. This is true, said Krasnis Monaklaus when the question was put to him. A bull is strong as well, but bulls die every day in the fighting pits. A girl of nine killed one not three days past in Jothiel's pit. The Unsullied have something better than strength, Delta. They have discipline. We fight in the fashion of the old empire, yes. They are the lockstep legions of old geese come again, absolutely obedient, absolutely loyal, and utterly without fear. Denny listened patiently to the translation. Even the bravest men fear death and maiming, Ostan said when the girl was done. Krasnis smiled again when he heard that. Tell the old man that he smells of piss and needs a stick to hold him up. Truly, your worship? He poked her with his lash. No, not truly. Are you a girl or a goat to ask such folly? Say that unsullied are not men. Say that death means nothing to them and maiming less than nothing. He stopped before a thick-set man who had a look of Lazar about him, and brought his whip up sharply, laying a line of blood across one copper cheek. The eunuch blinked and stood there, bleeding. "'Would you like another?' asked Krasnus. "'If it please, your worship.' It was hard to pretend not to understand. Denny laid a hand on Krasnus's arm before he could raise the whip again. And "'Tell the good master that I see how strong his unsullied are, and how bravely they suffer pain.' Krasnus chuckled when he heard her words in Valyrian. "'Tell this ignorant whore of a Westerner that courage has nothing to do with it.' "'The good master says that was not courage, your grace.' "'Tell her to open those slut's eyes of hers.' "'He begs you attend this carefully, your grace.' Krasnus moved to the next eunuch in line, a towering youth with the blue eyes and flaxen hair of Lys. "'Your sword,' he said. The eunuch knelt, unsheathed the blade, and offered it up hilt first. It was a short sword, made more for stabbing than for slashing, but the edge looked razor-sharp. "'Stand!' Krasnus commanded. "'Your worship!' the eunuch stood, and Krasnus Monoklos slid the sword slowly up his torso, leaving a thin red line across his belly and between his ribs. Then he jabbed the sword point in beneath a wide pink nipple and began to work it back and forth. "'What is he doing?' Danny demanded of the girl, as the blood ran down the man's chest. "'Tell the cow to stop her bleating,' said Krasnus, without waiting for the translation. "'This will do him no great harm. Men have no need of nipples. Eunuchs even less so.' The nipple hung by a thread of skin. He slashed and sent it tumbling to the bricks, leaving behind a round red eye, copiously weeping blood. The eunuch did not move until Krasnus offered him back a sword hilt first. "'Here, I'm done with you.' This one is pleased to have served you. Krasnus turned back to Dany. They feel no pain, you see. How can that be? she demanded through the scribe. The wine of courage, was the answer he gave her. It is no true wine at all, but made from deadly nightshade, bloodfly larva, black lotus root, and many secret things. They drink it with every meal from the day they are cut, and with each passing year feel less and less. It makes them fearless in battle. Nor can they be tortured. Tell the savage her secrets are safe with the unsullied. She may set them to guard her councils and even her bedchamber, and never a worry as to what they might overhear. In Yunkai and Mirin, eunuchs are often made by removing a boy's testicles, but leaving the penis. Such a creature is infertile, yet often still capable of erection. Only trouble can come of this. We remove the penis as well, leaving nothing. The unsullied are the purest creatures on the earth. He gave Danny and Arstan another of his broad white smiles. I have heard that in the sunset kingdoms men take solemn vows to keep chaste and father no children, but live only for their duty. Is it not so? It is, Arstan said, when the question was put. 
There are many such orders. The maesters of the citadel, the septons and septers who serve the seven, the silent sisters of the dead, the king's guard, and the night's watch. Poor things, growled the slaver after the translation. Men were not made to live thus. Their days are a torment of temptation any fool must see, and no doubt most succumb to their baser selves. Not so are unsullied. They are wed to their swords in a way that your sworn brothers cannot hope to match. No woman can ever tempt them, nor any man. His girl conveyed the essence of his speech more politely. There are other ways to tempt men besides the flesh, Austin Whitebeard objected when she was done. Men, yes, but not unsullied. Plunder interests them no more than rape. They are nothing but their weapons. We do not even permit them names. No names? Denny frowned at the little scribe. Can that be what the good master said? They have no names? It is so, Your Grace. Krosnes stopped in front of a Giscari who might have been his taller, fitter brother, and flicked his lash at a small bronze disc on the sword belt at his feet. There is his name. Ask the whore of Westeros whether she can read Giscari glyphs. When Dany admitted that she could not, the slaver turned to the unsullied. What is your name? he demanded. This one's name is Red Flea, your worship. The girl repeated their exchange in the common tongue. And yesterday, what was it? Black Rat, your worship. The day before? Brown Flea, your worship. Before that? This one does not recall your worship. Blue Toad, perhaps, or Blue Worm. Tell her all their names are such, Krosnes commanded the girl. It reminds them that by themselves they are vermin. The name discs are thrown in an empty cask at duty's end, and each dawn plucked up again at random. More madness, said Ostan when he heard. How can any man possibly remember a new name every day? Those who cannot are cold in training, along with those who cannot run all day in full pack, scale a mountain in the black of night, walk across a bed of coals, or slay an infant. Danny's mouth surely twisted at that. Did he see, or is he blind as well as cruel? She turned away quickly, trying to keep her face a mask until she heard the translation. Only then did she allow herself to say, Whose infants do they slay? To win his spiked cap, an unsullied must go to the slave marts with a silver mark, find some wailing newborn, and kill it before its mother's eyes. In this way we make certain that there is no weakness left in them. She was feeling faint. The heat, she tried to tell herself. You take a babe from its mother's arms, kill it as she watches, and pay for her pain with a silver coin? When the translation was made for him, Krosnus Monoklaus laughed aloud. What a soft, mewling fool this one is! Tell the whore of Westeros that the mark is for the child's owner, not the mother. The unsullied are not permitted to steal. He tapped his whip against his leg. Tell her that few ever fail that test. The dogs are harder for them, it must be said. We give each boy a puppy on the day that he is cut. At the end of the first year he is required to strangle it. Any who cannot are killed and fed to the surviving dogs. It makes for a good, strong lesson, we find. Austin Whitebeard tapped the end of his staff on the bricks as he listened to that. Tap, 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 slow and steady. Tap, tap, tap. Danny saw him turn his eyes away as if he could not bear to look at Krosnes any longer. The good master has said that these eunuchs cannot be tempted with coin or flesh, Danny told the girl. But if some enemy of mine should offer them freedom for betraying me, they would kill him out of hand and bring her his head. Tell her that, the slaver answered. Other slaves may steal and hoard up silver in hopes of buying freedom, but an unsullied would not take it if the little mare offered it as a gift. They have no life outside their duty. They are soldiers, and that is all. It is soldiers I need, Danny admitted. Tell her it is well she came to Astapor, then. Ask her how large an army she wishes to buy. How many unsullied do you have to sell? 
Eight thousand fully trained and available at present. We sell them only by the unit, she should know. By the thousand or the century. Once we sold by the ten as household guards, but that proved unsound. Ten is too few. They mingle with other slaves, even freemen, and forget who and what they are. Crossness waited for that to be rendered in the common tongue, and then continued. This beggar queen must understand such wonders do not come cheaply. And Yunkai and Mirin, slave swordsmen can be had for less than the price of their swords, but unsullied are the finest foot in all the world, and each represents many years of training. Tell her they are like Valyrian steel, folded over and over and hammered for years on end, until they are stronger and more resilient than any metal on earth. I know of Valyrian steel, said Dany. Ask the good master if the unsullied have their own officers. You must set your own officers over them. We train them to obey, not to think. If it is wits she wants, let her buy scribes. And their gear? Sword, shield, spear, sandals, and quilted tunic are included, said Crossness, and the spiked caps, to be sure. They will wear such armor as you wish, but you must provide it. Danny could think of no other questions. She looked at Arstan. You have lived long in the world, Whitebeard. Now that you have seen them, what do you say? I say no, Your Grace, the old man answered at once. Why? she asked. Speak freely. Dany thought she knew what he would say, but she wanted the slave girl to hear, so Krasnus Monaklaus might hear later. My queen, said Arstan, there have been no slaves in the Seven Kingdoms for thousands of years. The old gods and the new alike hold slavery to be an abomination. Evil. If you should land in Westeros at the head of a slave army, many good men will oppose you for no other reason than that. You will do great harm to your cause and to the honor of your house. Yet I must have some army, Danny said. The boy Joffrey will not give me the Iron Throne for asking politely. When the day comes that you raise your banners, half of Westeros will be with you, Whitebeard promised. Your brother Rhaegar is still remembered with great love. And my father, Danny said. The old man hesitated before saying, King Ares is also remembered. He gave the realm many years of peace. Your grace, you have no need of slaves. Magister Illyrio can keep you safe while your dragons grow, and send secret envoys across the narrow sea on your behalf to sound out the high lords for your cause. Those same high lords who abandoned my father to the Kingslayer and bent the knee to Robert the Usurper? Even those who bent their knees may yearn in their hearts for the return of the dragons. May, said Danny. That was such a slippery word, may, in any language. She turned back to Krasnus Monoklaus and his slave girl. I must consider carefully. The slaver shrugged. Tell her to consider quickly. There are many other buyers. Only three days past I showed these same unsullied to a corsair king who hopes to buy them all. The corsair wanted only a hundred, your worship, Danny heard the slave girl say. He poked her with the end of the whip. Corsairs are all liars. He'll buy them all. Tell her that, girl. Danny knew she would take more than a hundred if she took any at all. Remind your good master of who I am. Remind him that I am Daenerys Stormborn, mother of dragons, the unburnt, true-born queen of the seven kingdoms of Westeros. My blood is the blood of Aegon the Conqueror, and of old Valyria before him. Yet her words did not move the plump, perfumed slaver, even when rendered in his own ugly tongue. Old geese ruled an empire when the Valyrians were still fucking sheep, he growled at the poor little scribe. And we are the sons of the harpy, he gave a shrug. My tongue is wasted wagging at women. East or west it makes no matter, they cannot decide until they have been pampered and flattered and stuffed with sweetmeats. Well, if this is my fate, so be it. Tell the whore that if she requires a guide to our sweet city, Krasnus Monoklaus will gladly serve her, and service her as well, if she is more woman than she looks. Good Master Krasnus would be most pleased to show you Astapor while you ponder, Your Grace, the translator said. I will feed her jellied dog brains and a fine rich stew of red octopus and unborn puppy, he wiped his lips. Many delicious dishes can be had here, he says. Tell her how pretty the pyramids are at night, the slaver growled. Tell her I will lick honey off her breasts, or allow her to lick honey off mine if she prefers. 
Astapor is most beautiful at dusk, Your Grace, said the slave girl. The good masters light silk lanterns on every terrace, so all the pyramids glow with coloured lights. Pleasure barges ply the worm, playing soft music and calling at the little islands for food and wine and other delights. Ask her if she wishes to view our fighting pits, Crossness added. Ducor's pit has a fine folly scheduled for the evening. A bear and three small boys. One boy will be rolled in honey, one in blood, and one in rotting fish, and she may wager on which the bear will eat first. Tap, tap, tap. Denny heard. Ostan Whitebeard's face was still, but his staff beat out his rage. Tap, tap, tap. She made herself smile. I have my own bear on Belirion, she told the translator, and he may well eat me if I do not return to him. See, said Crosness, when her words were translated, it is not the woman who decides. It is this man she runs to, as ever. Thank the good master for his patient kindness, Danny said, and tell him that I will think on all I learned here. She gave her arm to Arstan Whitebeard to lead her back across the plaza to her litter. Ago and Jogo fell into either side of them, walking with a bow-legged swagger all the horse lords affected, when forced to dismount and stride the earth like common mortals. Danny climbed into her litter, frowning, and beckoned Ostan to climb in beside her. A man as old as him should not be walking in such heat. She did not close the curtains as they got underway. With the sun beating down so fiercely on the city of red brick, every stray breeze was to be cherished, even if it did come with a swirl of fine red dust. Besides, I need to see. Astapor was a queer city, even to the eyes of one who had walked within the house of dust and bathed in the womb of the world beneath the mother of mountains. All the streets were made of the same red brick that had paved the plaza. So, too, were the stepped pyramids, the deep-dug fighting pits with their rings of descending seats, the sulfurous fountains and gloomy wine caves, and the ancient walls that encircled them. So many bricks, she thought, and so old and crumbling. Their fine red dust was everywhere, dancing down the gutters at each gust of wind. Small wonder so many Astapori women veiled their faces. The brick dust stung the eyes worse than sand. "'Make way!' Jogo shouted as he rode before her litter. "'Make way for the Mother of Dragons!' But when he uncoiled the great silver-handled whip that Danny had given him and made to crack it in the air, she leaned out and told him, "'Nay, not in this place, blood of my blood,' she said in his own tongue. These bricks have heard too much of the sound of whips. The streets had been largely deserted when they had set out from the port that morning, and scarcely seemed more crowded now. An elephant lumbered past with a latticework litter on its back. A naked boy with peeling skin sat in a dry brick gutter, picking his nose and staring sullenly at some ants in the street. He lifted his head to the sound of hooves, and gaped as a column of mounted guards trotted by in a cloud of red dust and brittle laughter. The copper discs, sewn to their cloaks of yellow silk, glittered like so many suns, but their tunics were embroidered linen, and below the waist they wore sandals and pleated linen skirts. Bareheaded, each man had teased and oiled and twisted his stiff, red-black hair into some fantastic shape, horns and wings and blades and even grasping hands, so they looked like some troop of demons escaped from the seventh hell. The naked boy watched them for a bit along with Danny, but soon enough they were gone, and he went back to his aunt's, and a knuckle up his nose. An old city, this, she reflected, but not so populous as it was in its glory, nor near so crowded as Carth or Pentos or Lys. Her litter came to a sudden halt at the cross street, to allow a coffle of slaves to shuffle across her path, urged along by the crack of an overseer's lash. These were no unsullied, Denny noted, but a more common sort of men, with pale brown skins and black hair. There were women among them, but no children. All were naked. Two Astapori rode behind them on white asses, a man in a red silk tokar, and a veiled woman in sheer blue linen, decorated with flakes of lapis lazuli. In her red-black hair she wore an ivory comb. The man laughed as he whispered to her, paying no more mind to Denny than to his slaves, nor the overseer with his twisted five-thonged lash, a squat broad Dothraki who had a harpy and chains tattooed proudly across his muscular chest. "'Bricks and blood built Astapor,' Whitebeard murmured at her side, "'and bricks and blood her people.' "'What is that?' 
Danny asked him, curious. An old rhyme a maester taught me when I was a boy. I never knew how true it was. The bricks of Astapor are red with the blood of the slaves who make them. I can well believe that, said Danny. Then leave this place before your heart turns to brick as well. Sail this very night on the evening tide. Would that I could, thought Danny. When I leave Astapor it must be with an army, Sir Jorah says. Sir Jorah was a slaver himself, your grace, the old man reminded her. There are sellswords in Pentos and Mir and Tirosh you can hire. A man who kills for coin has no honor, but at least they are no slaves. Find your army there, I beg you. My brother visited Pentos, Mir, Bravos, near all the free cities. The magisters and archons fed him wine and promises, but his soul was starved to death. A man cannot sup from the beggar's bowl all his life, and stay a man. I had my taste in Karth, that was enough. I will not come to Pentos bowl in hand. Better to come a beggar than a slaver, Ostan said. There speaks one who has been neither. Danny's nostrils flared. Do you know what it is like to be sold, squire? I do. My brother sold me to Karl Drogo for the promise of a golden crown. Well, Drogo crowned him in gold, though not as he had wished, and I— My son and stars made a queen of me, but if he had been a different man it might have been much otherwise. Do you think I have forgotten how it felt to be afraid? Whitebeard bowed his head. Ill grace, I did not mean to give offence. Only lies offend me. Never honest counsel. Then he patted Arstan's spotted hand to reassure him. I have a dragon's temper, that's all. You must not let it frighten you. I shall try and remember, Whitebeard smiled. He has a good face and great strength to him, Danny thought. She could not understand why Sir Jorah mistrusted the old man so. Could he be jealous that I have found another man to talk to? Unbidden, her thoughts went back to the night on Beleriand when the exile knight had kissed her. He should never have done that. He is thrice my age and of too low a birth for me, and I never gave him leave. No true knight would ever kiss a queen without her leave. She had taken care never to be alone with Sir Jorah after that, keeping her handmaids with her aboard ship, and sometimes her blood riders. He wants to kiss me again. I see it in his eyes. What Danny wanted, she could not begin to say. But Jorah's kiss had woken something in her, something that had been sleeping since Carl Drogo died. Lying abed in her narrow bunk, she found herself wondering how it would be to have a man squeezed in beside her in place of her handmaid, and the thought was more exciting than it should have been. Sometimes she would close her eyes and dream of him, but it was never Jorah Mormont she dreamed of. Her lover was always younger and more comely, though his face remained a shifting shadow. Once so tormented she could not sleep, Danny slid a hand down between her legs and gasped when she felt how wet she was. Scarce daring to breathe, she moved her fingers back and forth between her lower lips, slowly so as not to wake Eerie beside her, until she found one sweet spot and lingered there, touching herself lightly, timidly at first, and then faster. Still the relief she wanted seemed to recede before her, until her dragon stirred, and one screamed out across the cabin, and Eerie woke and saw what she was doing. Danny knew her face was flushed, but in the darkness Erie surely could not tell. Wordless, the handmaid put a hand on her breast, then bent to take a nipple in her mouth. Her other hand drifted down across the soft curve of belly, through the mound of fine silvery gold hair, and went to work between Danny's thighs. It was no more than a few moments until her legs twisted and her breasts heaved and her whole body shuddered. She screamed then. Or perhaps that was Drogon. Erie never said a thing only curled back up and went back to sleep the instant the thing was done. The next day it all seemed a dream. And what did Sir Jorah have to do with it, if anything? It is Drogo I want, my sun and stars, Denny reminded herself. Not Eerie and not Sir Jorah, only Drogo. Drogo was dead, though. She would thought these feelings had died with him there in the red waste, but one treacherous kiss had somehow brought them back to life. He should never have kissed me. He presumed too much, and I permitted it. It must never happen again. She set her mouth grimly and gave her head a shake, and the bell in her braid chimed softly. 
Closer to the bay, the city presented a fairer face. The great brick pyramids lined the shore, the largest 400 feet high. All manner of trees and vines and flowers grew on their broad terraces, and the winds that swirled around them smelled green and fragrant. Another gigantic harpy stood atop the gate, this one made of baked red clay and crumbling visibly, with no more than a stub of her scorpion's tail remaining. The chain she grasped in her clay claws was old iron, rotten with rust. It was cooler down by the water, though. The lapping of the waves against the rotting pilings made a curiously soothing sound. Ago helped Dany down from her litter. Strong Belwas was seated on a massive piling, eating a great haunch of brown roasted meat. Dog, he said happily, when he saw Dany. Good dog, and ask the poor little queen. Eat? He offered it with a greasy grin. That is kind of you, Belwas, but no. Dany had eaten dog in other places, at other times, but just now all she could think of was the unsullied and their stupid puppies. She swept past the huge eunuch and up the plank onto the deck of Valyrian. Sir Jorah Mormont stood waiting for her. "'Your Grace,' he said, bowing his head, "'the slavers have come and gone, three of them, "'with a dozen scribes and as many slaves to lift and fetch. "'They crawled over every foot of our holds "'and made note of all we had.' "'He walked her aft. "'How many men do they have for sale?' "'None.' "'Was it Mormont she was angry with, "'or this city with its sullen heat, "'its stinks and sweats and crumbling bricks? "'They sell eunuchs, not men.' Eunuchs made of brick, like the rest of Astapor. Shall I buy eight thousand brick eunuchs with dead eyes that never move, who kill suckling babes for the sake of a spiked hat and strangle their own dogs? They don't even have names, so don't call them men, sir. Khaleesi, he said, taken aback by her fury, the unsullied are chosen as boys and trained. I have heard all I care to of their training. Dany could feel tears welling in her eyes, sudden and unwanted. Her hand flashed up and cracked Sir Jorah hard across the face. It was either that or cry. Mormont touched the cheek she'd slapped. If I have displeased my queen— You have. You've displeased me greatly, sir. If you were my true knight, you would never have brought me to this vile sty. If you were my true knight, you would never have kissed me or looked at my breasts the way you did, or— as your grace commands, I shall tell Captain Grolio to make ready to sail on the evening tide for some styless file. No, said Dany. Grolio watched them from the forecastle, and his crew was watching too. Whitebeard, her blood riders, Jicky, every one had stopped what they were doing at the sound of the slap. I want to sail now, not on the tide. I want to sail far and fast and never look back. But I can't, can I? There are eight thousand brick eunuchs for sale, and I must find some way to buy them. And with that she left him and went below. Behind the carved wooden door of the captain's cabin her dragons were restless. Drogon raised his head and screamed, pale smoke venting from his nostrils. And Viserion flapped at her and tried to perch on her shoulder, as he had when he was smaller. No, Danny said, trying to shrug him off gently. You're too big for that now, sweetling. But the dragon coiled his white and gold tail around one arm and dug black claws into the fabric of her sleeve, clinging tightly. Helpless, she sank into Grolio's great leather chair, giggling. They have been wild while you were gone, Khaleesi, Eri told her. Viserion clawed splinters from the door, do you see? And Drogon made to escape when the slaver men came to see them. When I grabbed his tail to hold him back, he turned and bit me. She showed Dany the marks of his teeth on her hand. Did any of them try to burn their way free? That was the thing that frightened Dany the most. No, Khaleesi. Drogon breathed his fire, but in the empty air. The slaver men feared to come near him. She kissed Eri's hand where Drogon had bitten it. I'm sorry he hurt you. Dragons are not meant to be locked up in a small ship's cabin. Dragons are like horses in this, Eri said, and riders too. The horses scream below, Khaleesi, and kick at the wooden walls. I hear them. And Jicky says the old women and the little ones scream, too, when you are not here. They do not like this water-cart. They do not like the black salt sea. I know, Denny said. I do, I know. My Khaleesi is sad. Yes, Denny admitted, sad and lost. Should I pleasure the Khaleesi? 
Denny stepped away from her. No, Erie, you do not need to do that. What happened that night when you woke? You're no bed slave. I freed you, remember? You— I am handmaid to the mother of dragons, the girl said. It is great honor to please my Khaleesi. I don't want that, she insisted. I don't. She turned away sharply. Leave me now. I want to be alone, to think. Dusk had begun to settle over the waters of Slaver's Bay before Dany returned to the deck. She stood by the rail and looked out over Astapor. From here it looks almost beautiful, she thought. The stars were coming out above and the silk lanterns below, just as Krasnus's translator had promised. The brick pyramids were all glimmery with light. But it is dark below, in the streets and plazas and fighting pits. And it is darkest of all in the barracks, where some little boy is feeding scraps to the puppy they gave him when they took away his manhood. There was a soft step behind her. Carlisi, his voice, might I speak frankly? Danny did not turn. She could not bear to look at him just now. If she did, she might well slap him again, or cry, or kiss him. I never know which was right and which was wrong and which was madness. Say what you will, sir. When Aegon the dragon stepped ashore in Westeros, the kings of Vale and Rock and Reach did not rush to hand him their crowns. If you mean to sit his iron throne, you must win it as he did, with steel and dragon fire. And that will mean blood on your hands before the thing is done. Blood and fire, thought Dany. The words of House Targaryen. She had known them all her life. The blood of my enemies I will shed gladly. The blood of innocence is another matter. Eight thousand unsullied they would offer me. Eight thousand dead babes. Eight thousand strangled dogs. Your grace, said Jorah Mormont, I saw King's Landing after the sack. Babes were butchered that day as well, and old men and children at play. More women were raped than you can count. There is a savage beast in every man, and when you hand that man a sword or spear and send him forth to war, the beast stirs. The scent of blood is all it takes to wake him. Yet I have never heard of these unsullied raping, nor putting a city to the sword, nor even plundering, save at the express command of those who lead them. Brick they may be, as you say, but if you buy them henceforth, the only dogs they'll kill are those you want dead. And you do have some dogs you want dead, as I recall. The usurper's dogs. Yes, Danny gazed off at the soft-colored lights and let the cool salt breeze caress her. You speak of sacking cities. Answer me this, sir. Why have the Dothraki never sacked this city? She pointed. Look at the walls. You can see where they've begun to crumble. There and there. Do you see any guards on those towers? I don't. Are they hiding, sir? I saw these sons of the Harpy today, all their proud, high-born warriors. They dressed in linen skirts, and the fiercest thing about them was their hair. Even a modest colossar could crack this astapor like a nut and spill out the rotted meat inside. So tell me, why is that ugly Harpy not sitting beside the God's Way and Vase Dothrock among the other stolen gods? You have a dragon's eye, Khaleesi. That's plain to see. I wanted an answer, not a compliment. There are two reasons. Astapor's brave defenders are so much chaff, it's true. Old names and fat purses who dress up as Giscare scourges to pretend they still rule a vast empire. Everyone is a high officer. On feast days they fight mock wars in the pits to demonstrate what brilliant commanders they are, but it's the eunuchs who do the dying. All the same, any enemy wanting to sack Astapor would have to know that they'd be facing Unsullied. The slavers would turn out the whole garrison in the city's defense. The Dothraki have not ridden against Unsullied since they left their braids at the gates of Kohor. And the second reason? Denny asked. Who would attack Astapor? said Jorah asked. Meereen and Yunkai are rivals, but not enemies. The doom destroyed Valyria. The folk of the eastern hinterlands are all Giscari, and beyond the hills lies Lazar. The lamb men, as your Dothraki call them, are notably unwarlike people. Yes, 
she agreed. But north of the slave cities is the Dothraki Sea, and two dozen mighty carls who like nothing more than sacking cities and carrying off their people into slavery. Carrying them off where? What good are slaves once you've killed the slavers? Valyria is no more. Carth lies beyond the Red Waste, and the nine free cities are thousands of leagues to the west. And you may be sure the sons of the Harpy give lavishly to every passing call, just as the magisters do in Pentos and Norvos and Myr. They know that if they feast the horse lords and give them gifts, they will soon ride on. It's cheaper than fighting, and a deal more certain. Cheaper than fighting, Danny thought. Yes, it might be. If only it could be that easy for her. How pleasant it would be to sail to King's Landing with her dragons and pay the boy Joffrey a chest of gold to make him go away. Khaleesi, Sir Jorah prompted, when she had been silent for a long time. He touched her elbow lightly. Danny shrugged him off. Viserys would have bought as many unsullied as he had the coin for. But you once said I was like Rhaegar. I remember, Daenerys. Your grace, she corrected. Prince Rhaegar led free men into battle, not slaves. Whitebeard said he dubbed his squires himself and made many other knights as well. There was no higher honor than to receive your knighthood from the Prince of Dragonstone. Tell me, then, when he touched a man on the shoulder with his sword, what did he say? Go forth and kill the weak, or go forth and defend them? At the trident, those brave men Viserys spoke of who died beneath our dragon banners, did they give their lives because they believed in Rhaegar's cause, or because they had been bought and paid for? Danny turned to Mormont, crossed her arms, and waited for an answer. My queen, the big man said slowly, all you say is true, but Rhaegar lost on the trident. He lost the battle. He lost the war, he lost the kingdom, and he lost his life. His blood swirled downriver with the rubies from his breastplate, and Robert the usurper rode over his corpse to steal the Iron Throne. Rhaegar fought valiantly. Rhaegar fought nobly. Rhaegar fought honorably. And Rhaegar died. Bran no roads ran through the twisted mountain valleys where they walked now. Between the grey stone peaks lay still blue lakes, long and deep and narrow, and the green gloom of endless piney woods. The russet and gold of autumn leaves grew less common when they left the wolf's wood to climb amongst the old flint hills, and vanished by the time those hills had turned to mountains. Giant grey-green sentinels loomed above them now, and spruce and fir and soldier pines in endless profusion— the undergrowth was sparse beneath them, the forest floor carpeted in dark green needles. When they lost their way, as happened once or twice, they need only wait for a clear cold night when the clouds did not intrude, and look up in the sky for the ice dragon. The blue star in the dragon's eye pointed the way north, as Osha told him once. Thinking of Osha made Bran wonder where she was. He pictured her safe in White Harbor, with Rickon and Shaggy Dog, eating eels and fish and hot crab pie with fat Lord Manderley. Or maybe they were warming themselves at the last hearth before the Great John's fires. But Bran's life had turned into endless chilly days on Hodor's back, riding his basket up and down the slopes of mountains. Up and down, Mira would sigh sometimes as they walked, then down and up then up and down again. I hate these stupid mountains of yours, Prince Bran. Yesterday you said you loved them. Oh, I do. My lord father told me about mountains, but I never saw one till now. I love them more than I can say. Bran made a face at her. When you just said you hated them. Why can't it be both? Mira reached up to pinch his nose. Because they're different, he insisted. Like night and day, or ice and fire. If ice can burn, said Jojen in his solemn voice, then love and hate can mate. Mountain or marsh, it makes no matter. The land is one. One, his sister agreed, but over-wrinkled. The high glens seldom did them the courtesy of running north and south, so often they found themselves going long leagues in the wrong direction, and sometimes they were forced to double back the way they'd come. 
If we took the King's Road, we could be at the wall by now, Brand would remind the reeds. He wanted to find the three-eyed crow so he could learn to fly. Half a hundred times he said it, if he said it once, until Mira started teasing by saying it along with him. If we took the King's Road, we wouldn't be so hungry either, he started saying then. Down in the hills they'd had no lack of food. Mira was a fine huntress and even better at taking fish from streams with her three-pronged frog spear. Bran liked to watch her, admiring her quickness, the way she sent the spear lancing down and pulled it back with a silvery trout wriggling on the end of it. And they had summer hunting for them as well. The dire wolf vanished most every night as the sun went down, but he was always back again before dawn, most often with something in his jaws, a squirrel or a hare. But here in the mountains the streams were smaller and more icy, and the game scarcer. Mira still hunted and fished when she could, but it was harder, and some nights even summer found no prey. Often they went to sleep with empty bellies. But Jojin remained stubbornly determined to stay well away from roads. "'Where you find roads you find travellers,' he said in that way he had, "'and travellers have eyes to see and mouths to spread tales of the crippled boy, his giant, and the wolf that walks beside them.' No one could get as stubborn as Jojin, so they struggled on through the wild, and every day climbed a little higher and moved a little farther north. Some days it rained, some days were windy, and once they were caught in a sleet storm so fierce that even Hodor bellowed in dismay. On the clear days it often seemed as if they were the only living things in all the world. "'Does no one live up here?' Mira Reed asked once, as they made their way around a granite upthrust as large as Winterfell. "'There's people,' Bran told her. "'The Umbers are mostly east of the King's Road, "'but they graze their sheep in the high meadows in summer. "'There are wolves west of the mountains along the Bay of Ice, "'Harkclays back behind us in the hills, "'and knots and littles and norries "'and even some flints up here in the high places.' "'His father's mother's mother had been a flint of the mountains. "'Old Nan once said that it was her blood in him "'that made Bran such a fool for climbing before his fall.' She had died years and years and years before he was born, though, even before his father had been born. Wool, said Mira. Jojen, wasn't there a wool who rode with father during the war? Theo wool, Jojen was breathing hard from the climb. Buckets, they used to call him. That's their sigil, said Bran. Three brown buckets on a blue field, with a border of white and grey checks. Lord Wool came to Winterfell once, to do his fealty and talk with father, and he had the buckets on his shield. He's no true lord, though. Well, he is, but they call him just the wool, and there's the knot and the nori and a little, too. At Winterfell we called them lords, but their own folk don't. Jojen Reed stopped to catch his breath. Do you think these mountain folk know we're here? They know. Bran had seen them watching, not with his own eyes, but with summer's sharper ones, that missed so little. They won't bother us so long as we don't try and make off with their goats or horses. Nor did they. Only once did they encounter any of the mountain people, when a sudden burst of freezing rain sent them looking for shelter. Summer found it for them, sniffing out a shallow cave behind the grey-green branches of a towering sentinel tree. But when Hodor ducked beneath the stony overhang, Bran saw the orange glow of fire farther back and realized they were not alone. Come in and warm yourselves, a man's voice called out. There's stone enough to keep the rain off all our heads. He offered them oat cakes and blood sausage and a swallow of ale from a skin he carried, but never his name, nor did he ask theirs. Bran figured him for a little. The clasp that fastened his squirrel-skin cloak was gold and bronze and wrought in the shape of a pine cone, and the littles bore pine cones on the white half of their green and white shields. Is it far to the wall? Bran asked him as they waited for the rain to stop. "'Not so far as the raven flies,' said the little, if that was who he was. "'Farther for them as lax wings.' Bran started. "'I bet we'd be there if we took the king's road,' Mira finished with him. The little took out a knife and whittled at a stick. "'When there was a stark in Winterfell, a maiden girl could walk the king's road in her name-day gown and still go unmolested.' and travellers could find fire, bread, and salt at many an inn and holdfast. But the nights are colder now, and doors are closed. There's squids in the wolf's wood, and flayed men ride the king's road asking after strangers. 
The reeds exchanged a look. Flayed men, said Jojen. The bastards, boys, I. He was dead, but now he's not. And paying good silver for wolfskins, a man hears, and maybe gold for word of certain other walking dead. He looked at Bran when he said that, and at Summer stretched out beside him. As to that wall, the man went on, it's not a place that I'd be going. The old bear took the watch into the haunted woods, and all that come back was his ravens, with hardly a message between them. Dark wings, dark words, me mother used to say, but when the birds fly silent, seems to me that's even darker. He poked at the fire with a stick. It was different when there was a stark in Winterfell. But the old wolf's dead, and young one's gone south to play the game of thrones, and all that's left us is the ghosts. The wolves will come again, said Jojen solemnly. And how would you be knowing, boy? I dreamed it. Some nights I dream of me mother that I buried nine years past, the man said. But when I wake, she's not come back to us. There are dreams and dreams, my lord. Hodor, said Hodor. They spent that night together, for the rain did not let up till well past dark, and only summer seemed to want to leave the cave. When the fire had burned down to embers, Bran let him go. The dire wolf did not feel the damp as people did, and the night was calling him. Moonlight painted the wet woods in shades of silver and turned the great peaks white. Owls hooted through the dark and flew silently between the pines, while pale goats moved along the mountainsides. Bran closed his eyes and gave himself up to the wolf dream, to the smells and sounds of midnight. When they woke the next morning, the fire had gone out and the little was gone, but he left a sausage for them and a dozen oat cakes folded up neatly in a green and white cloth. Some of the cakes had pine nuts baked in them and some had blackberries. Bran ate one of each and still did not know which sort he liked the best. One day there would be Starks in Winterfell again, he told himself, and then he'd send for the Littles and pay them back a hundredfold for every nut and berry. The trail they followed was a little easier that day, and by noon the sun came breaking through the clouds. Bran sat in his basket up on Hodor's back and felt almost content. He dozed off once, lulled to sleep by the smooth swing of the big stable boy's stride and the soft humming sound he made sometimes when he walked. Mira woke him up with a light touch on his arm. Look, she said, pointing at the sky with her frog spear, an eagle. Bran lifted his head and saw it. Its gray wings spread and still as it floated on the wind. He followed it with his eyes as it circled higher wondering what it would be like to soar about the world so effortless. Better than climbing, even. He tried to reach the eagle, to leave his stupid crippled body and rise into the sky to join it, the way he joined with Summer. The green seers could do it. I should be able to do it, too. He tried and tried until the eagle vanished in the golden haze of the afternoon. It's gone, he said, disappointed. We'll see others, said Mira. They live up here. I suppose. Hold on said Hodor. Hodor, Bran agreed. Jojen kicked a pine cone. Hodor likes it when you say his name, I think. Hodor's not his true name, Bran explained. It's just some word he says. His real name is Walder, old Nan told me. She was his grandmother's grandmother or something. Talking about old Nan made him sad. Do you think the Iron Men killed her? They hadn't seen her body at Winterfell. He didn't remember seeing any women dead, now that he thought back. She never hurt no one, not even Theon. She just told stories. Theon wouldn't hurt someone like that, would he? Some people hurt others just because they can, said Jojen. And it wasn't Theon who did the killing at Winterfell, said Mira. Too many of the dead were ironmen. She shifted her frog spear to her other hand. Remember old Nan's stories, Bran? Remember the way she told them the sound of her voice. So long as you do that, part of her will always be alive in you. I'll remember, he promised. They climbed without speaking for a long time, following a crooked game trail over the high saddle between two stony peaks. Scrawny soldier pines clung to the slopes around them. Far ahead, Bran could see the icy glitter of a stream where it tumbled down a mountainside. He found himself listening to Jojen's breathing and the crunch of pine needles under Hodor's feet. Do you know any stories? he asked the reeds all of a sudden. 
Mira laughed. Oh, a few. A few, her brother admitted. Hodor, said Hodor, humming. You could tell one, said Bran. While we walked, Hodor likes stories about knights. I do too. There are no knights in the neck, said Jojen. Above the water, his sister corrected. The bogs are full of dead ones, though. That's true, said Jojen. Andals and Iron Men, Freys and other fools, all those proud warriors who set out to conquer Grey Water. Not one of them could find it. They ride into the neck, but not back out, and sooner or later they blunder into the bogs and sink beneath the weight of all that steel and drown there in their armor. The thought of drowned knights under the water gave Bran the shivers. He didn't object, though. He liked the shivers. There was one knight, said Mira, in the year of the false spring. The knight of the Laughing Tree, they called him. He might have been a Cranagh man, that one. Or not. Jojen's face was dappled with green shadows. Prince Bran has heard that tale a hundred times, I'm sure. No, said Bran, I haven't. And if I have, it doesn't matter. Sometimes old Nan would tell the same story she told before, but we never minded, if it was a good story. Old stories are like old friends, she used to say. You have to visit them from time to time. That's true. Mira walked with her shield on her back, pushing an occasional branch out of the way with her frog spear. Just when Bran began to think that she wasn't going to tell the story after all, she began, Once there was a curious lad who lived in the neck. He was small like all Cranach men, but brave and smart and strong as well. He grew up hunting and fishing and climbing trees and learned all the magics of my people. Bran was almost certain he had never heard this story. Did he have green dreams like Jojen? No, said Mira. But he could breathe mud and run on leaves and change earth to water and water to earth with no more than a whispered word. He could talk to trees and weave words and make castles appear and disappear. I wish I could, Bran said plaintively. When does he meet the tree knight? Mira made a face at him. Sooner, if a certain prince would be quiet. I was just asking. The lad knew the magics of the Cranags she continued, but he wanted more. Our people seldom travel far from home, you know. We're a small folk, and our ways seem queer to some, so the big people do not always treat us kindly. But this lad was bolder than most, and one day, when he had grown to manhood, he decided he would leave the Cranags and visit the Isle of Faces. No one visits the Isle of Faces, objected Bran. That's where the green men live. It was the green men he meant to find. So he donned a shirt sewn with bronze scales, like mine, took up a leathern shield and a three-pronged spear, like mine, and paddled a little skin boat down the green fork. Bran closed his eyes to try and see the man in his little skin boat. In his head the Cranach man looked like Jojen, only older and stronger and dressed like Mira. He passed beneath the twins by night, so the phrase would not attack him, and when he reached the trident he climbed from the river and put his boat on his head and began to walk. It took him many a day, but finally he reached the god's eye, threw his boat in the lake, and paddled out to the Isle of Faces. Did he meet the green men? Yes, said Mira, but that's another story, and not for me to tell. My prince asked for knights. Green men are good, too. They are, she agreed, but said no more about them. All that winter the Cranach man stayed on the isle, but when the spring broke, he heard the wide world calling and knew the time had come to leave. His skin boat was just where he'd left it, so he said his farewells and paddled off toward shore. He rode and rode, and finally saw the distant towers of a castle rising beside the lake. The towers reached ever higher as he neared shore, until he realized that this must be the greatest castle in all the world. Harrenhal, Bran knew at once. It was Harrenhal, Mira smiled. Was it? Beneath its walls he saw tents of many colors, bright banners cracking in the wind, and knights in mail and plate on barded horses. He smelled roasting meats and heard the sound of laughter and the blare of herald's trumpets. A great tourney was about to commence, and champions from all over the land had come to contest it. The king himself was there, with his son the Dragon Prince. The white swords had come to welcome a new brother to their ranks. The Storm Lord was on hand, and the Rose Lord as well. The great Lion of the Rock had quarreled with the king and stayed away, but many of his bannermen and knights attended all the same. The Cranig man had never seen such pageantry, and knew he might never see the like again. Part of him wanted nothing so much as to be part of it. Bran knew that feeling well enough. When he'd been little, all he had ever dreamed of was being a knight. 
but that had been before he fell and lost his legs. The daughter of the great castle reigned as queen of love and beauty when the tourney opened. Five champions had sworn to defend her crown, her four brothers of Harren Hall, and her famous uncle, a white knight of the king's guard. Was she a fair maid? She was, said Mira, hopping over a stone. But there were others fairer still. One was the wife of the dragon prince, who had brought a dozen lady companions to attend her. The knights all begged them for favors to tie about their lances. This isn't going to be one of those love stories, is it? Bran asked suspiciously. Hodor doesn't like those so much. Hodor, said Hodor agreeably. He likes the stories where the knights fight monsters. Sometimes the knights are the monsters, Bran. The little Cranach man was walking across the field, enjoying the warm spring day and harming none, when he was set upon by three squires. They were none older than fifteen, yet even so they were bigger than him, all three. This was their world, as they saw it, and he had no right to be there. They snatched away his spear and knocked him to the ground, cursing him for a frog-eater. Were they Walders? It sounded like something little Walder Frey might have done. None offered a name, but he marked their faces well so he could revenge himself upon them later. They shoved him down every time he tried to rise and kicked him when he curled up on the ground. But then they heard a roar. "'That's my father's man you're kicking,' howled the she-wolf. "'A wolf on four legs or two? Two, said Mira. The she-wolf laid into the squires with a tourney sword, scattering them all. The Cranach man was bruised and bloodied, so she took him back to her lair to clean his cuts and bind them up with linen. There he met her pack brothers, the wild wolf who led them, the quiet wolf beside him, and the pup who was youngest of the four. That evening there was to be a feast in Harren Hall to mark the opening of the tourney, and the she-wolf insisted that the lad attend. He was of high birth, with as much a right to a place on the bench as any other man. She was not easy to refuse, this wolf maid, so he let the young pup find him garb suitable to a king's feast, and went up to the great castle. Under Harren's roof he ate and drank with the wolves, and many of their sworn swords besides, barrow-down men, and moose, and bears, and mermen. The dragon prince sang a song so sad it made the wolf maid sniffle, but when her pup brother teased her for crying, she poured wine over his head. A black brother spoke, asking the knights to join the night's watch. The storm lord drank down the night of skulls and kisses in a wine-cup war. The Cranach man saw a maid with laughing purple eyes dance with a white sword, a red snake, and the lord of griffins, and lastly with a quiet wolf. But only after the wild wolf spoke to her on behalf of a brother too shy to leave his bench. Amidst all this merriment, the little Cranach man spied the three squires who had attacked him. One served a pitchfork knight, one a porcupine, while the last attended a knight with two towers on his surcoat, a sigil all Cranach men know well. The phrase, said Bran, the phrase of the crossing. Then, as now, she agreed. The wolf maid saw them too and pointed them out to her brothers. I could find you a horse and some armor that might fit, the pup offered. The little Cranach man thanked him, but gave no answer. His heart was torn. Cranach men are smaller than most, but just as proud. The lad was no knight, no more than any of his people. We sit a boat more often than a horse, and our hands are made for oars, not lances. Much as he wished to have his vengeance, he feared he would only make a fool of himself and shame his people. The quiet wolf had offered the little Cranach man a place in his tent that night, but before he slept he knelt on the lake shore, looking across the water to where the Isle of Faces would be, and said a prayer to the old gods of North and Neck. "'You never heard this tale from your father?' asked Jojen. "'It was old Nan who told the stories. "'Mira, go on. You can't stop there.' "'Hodor must have felt the same. "'Hodor,' he said, and then, "'Hodor, Hodor, Hodor, Hodor.' "'Well,' said Mira, "'if you would hear the rest. "'Yes, tell it.' Five days of jousting were planned,' she said. "'There was a great seven-sided melee as well.' an archery, an axe-throwing, a horse-race, and tourney of singers. Never mind about all that. Bran squirmed impatiently in his basket on Hodor's back. Tell about the jousting. As my prince commands. The daughter of the castle was the queen of love and beauty, with four brothers and an uncle to defend her, but all four sons of Harren Hall were defeated on the first day. Their conquerors reigned briefly as champions until they were vanquished in turn. 
As it happened, the end of the first day saw the Porcupine Knight win a place among the champions, and on the morning of the second day the Pitchfork Knight and the Knight of the Two Towers were victorious as well. But late on the afternoon of that second day, as the shadows grew long, a mystery knight appeared in the lists. Bran nodded sagely. Mystery knights would oft appear at tourneys, with helms concealing their faces, and shields that were either blank or bore some strange device. Sometimes they were famous champions in disguise. The dragon knight once won a tourney as the knight of tears, so he could name his sister the queen of love and beauty in place of the king's mistress. And Baristan the bold twice donned a mystery knight's armor, the first time when he was only ten. It was the little clannic man, I bet. No one knew, said Mira. But the mystery knight was short of stature, and clad in ill-fitting armor made up of bits and pieces. The device upon his shield was a heart-tree of the old gods, a white weirwood with a laughing red face. "'Maybe he came from the Isle of Faces,' said Bran. "'Was he green?' In old Nan's stories the guardians had a dark green skin and leaves instead of hair. Sometimes they had antlers, too, but Bran didn't see how the mystery knight could have worn a helm if he had antlers. "'I bet the old gods sent him.' Perhaps they did. The mystery knight dipped his lance before the king and rode to the end of the lists, where the five champions had their pavilions. You know the three he challenged. The porcupine knight, the pitchfork knight, and the knight of the twin towers. Bran had heard enough stories to know that. He was the little crannig man, I told you. Whoever he was, the old gods gave strength to his arm. The porcupine knight fell first, then the pitchfork knight, and lastly the knight of the two towers. None were well loved, so the common folk cheered lustily for the Knight of the Laughing Tree, as the new champion soon was called. When his fallen foes sought to ransom horse and armor, the Knight of the Laughing Tree spoke in a booming voice through his helm, saying, Teach your squire honor, that shall be ransom enough. Once the defeated knights chastised their squire sharply, their horses and armor were returned. And so the little cranic man's prayer was answered. By the green men, of the old gods, or the children of the forest, who can say? It was a good story, Bran decided after thinking about it a moment or two. Then what happened? Did the knight of the laughing tree win the tourney and marry a princess? No, said Mira. That night at the great castle, the storm lord and the knight of skulls and kisses each swore they would unmask him, and the king himself urged men to challenge him, declaring that the face behind that helm was no friend of his. But the next morning, when the heralds blew their trumpets and the king took his seat, only two champions appeared. The knight of the laughing tree had vanished. The king was wroth, and even sent his son the dragon prince to seek the man, but all they ever found was his painted shield, hanging abandoned in a tree. It was the dragon prince who won that tourney in the end. Oh, Bran thought about the tale a while. That was a good story. But it should have been the three bad knights who hurt him, not their squires. Then the little chronic man could have killed them all. The part about the ransoms was stupid, and the mystery knight should win the tourney, defeating every challenger, and name the wolf-maid the queen of love and beauty. She was, said Mira, but that's a sadder story. Are you certain you never heard this tale before, Bran? asked Chojen. Your lord father never told it to you? Bran shook his head. The day was growing old by then, and long shadows were creeping down the mountainsides to send black fingers through the pines. If the little Cranach man could visit the Isle of Faces, maybe I could too. All the tales agreed that the green men had strange magic powers. Maybe they could help him walk again, even turn him into a knight. They turned the little Cranach man into a knight, even if it was only for a day, he thought. A day would be enough. Davos The cell was warmer than any cell had a right to be. It was dark, yes. Flickering orange light fell through the ancient iron bars from the torch in the sconce on the wall outside, but the back half of the cell remained drenched in gloom. It was dank as well as might be expected on an isle such as Dragonstone, where the sea was never far. And there were rats, as many as any dungeon could expect to have, and a few more besides. But Davos could not complain of chill. The smooth, stony passages beneath the great mass of dragonstone were always warm, and Davos had often heard it said they grew warmer the farther down one went. 
He was well below the castle, he judged, and the wall of his cell often felt warm to his touch when he pressed a palm against it. Perhaps the old tales were true, and Dragonstone was built with the stones of hell. He was sick when they first brought him here. The cough that had plagued him since the battle grew worse, and a fever took hold of him as well. His lips broke with blood blisters, and the warmth of the cell did not stop his shivering. I will not linger long, he remembered thinking. I will die soon, here in the dark. Davos soon found that he was wrong about that, as about so much else. Dimly he remembered gentle hands and a firm voice, and young Maester Pylos looking down on him. He was given hot garlic broth to drink, and milk of the poppy to take away his aches and shivers. The poppy made him sleep, and while he slept, they leached him to drain off the bad blood, or so he surmised, by the leech marks on his arms when he woke. Before very long the coughing stopped. The blisters vanished, and his broth had chunks of white fish in it, and carrots and onions as well, and one day he realized that he felt stronger than he had since Black Betha shattered beneath him and flung him in the river. He had two jailers to tend him. One was broad and squat, with thick shoulders and huge, strong hands. He wore a leather brigantine dotted with iron studs, and once a day brought Davos a bowl of oaten porridge. Sometimes he sweetened it with honey, or poured in a bit of milk. The other jailer was older, stooped and sallow, with greasy, unwashed hair and pebbled skin. He wore a doublet of white velvet with a ring of stars worked upon the breast in golden thread. It fit him badly, being both too short and too loose, and was soiled and torn besides. He would bring Davos plates of meat and mash, or fish stew, and once even half a lamprey pie. The lamprey was so rich he could not keep it down, but even so it was a rare treat for a prisoner in a dungeon. Neither sun nor moon shone in the dungeons, no windows pierced the thick stone walls. The only way to tell day from night was by his jailers. Neither man would speak to him, though he knew they were no mutes. Sometimes he heard them exchange a few brusque words as the watch was changing. They would not even tell him their names, so he gave them names of his own. The short, strong one he called Porridge, the stooped, sallow one Lamprey, for the pie. He marked the passage of days by the meals they brought, and by the changing of the torches in the sconce outside his cell. A man grows lonely in the dark and hungers for the sound of a human voice. Davos would talk to the jailers whenever they came to his cell, whether to bring him food or change his slops pail. He knew they would be deaf to please for freedom or mercy. Instead he asked them questions, hoping perhaps one day one might answer. "'What news of the war?' he asked, and "'Is the king well?' He asked after his son Devon, and the princess Shireen, and Salador San. "'What is the weather like?' he asked, and "'Have the autumn storms begun yet? Do ships still sail the narrow sea?' It made no matter what he asked, they never answered though sometimes Porridge gave him a look, and for half a heartbeat Davos would think that he was about to speak. With Lamprey there was not even that much. I am not a man to him, Davos thought, only a stone that eats and shits and speaks. He decided after a while that he liked Porridge much the better. Porridge at least seemed to know he was alive, and there was a queer sort of kindness to the man. Davos suspected that he fed the rats. That was why there were so many. Once he thought he heard the jailer talking to them as if they were children, but perhaps he'd only dreamed that. They do not mean to let me die, he realized. They are keeping me alive for some purpose of their own. He did not like to think what that might be. Lord Sunglass had been confined in the cells beneath Dragonstone for a time, as had Sir Hubert Rampton's sons. All of them had ended on the pyre. I should have given myself to the sea. Davos thought, as he sat staring at the torch beyond the bars, or let the sail pass me by to perish on my rock. I would sooner feed crabs than flames. Then one night, as he was finishing his supper, Davos felt a queer flush come over him. He glanced up through the bars, and there she stood in shimmering scarlet, with her great ruby at her throat, her red eyes gleaming as bright as the torch that bathed her. Melisandre, he said, with a calm he did not feel. Onion night, she replied, just as calmly, as if the two of them had met on the stair or in the yard, and were exchanging polite greetings. Are you well? Better than I was. 
do you lack for anything? My king, my son, I lack for them. He pushed the bowl aside and stood. Have you come to burn me? Her strange red eyes studied him through the bars. This is a bad place, is it not? A dark place and foul. The good sun does not shine here, nor the bright moon. She lifted a hand toward the torch in the wall sconce. This is all that stands between you and the darkness, Onion Knight. This little fire. This gift of the lore. Shall I put it out? No. He moved toward the bars. Please. He did not think he could bear that, to be left alone in utter blackness, with no one but the rats for company. The red woman's lips curved upward in a smile. So you have come to love the fire, it would seem. I need the torch. His hands opened and closed. I will not beg her. I will not. I am like this torch, Sir Davos. We are both instruments of a law. We were made for a single purpose, to keep the darkness at bay. Do you believe that? No. Perhaps he should have lied and told her what she wanted to hear, but Davos was too accustomed to speaking truth. You are the mother of darkness. I saw that under storm's end when you gave birth before my eyes. Is the brave Sir Onions so frightened of a passing shadow? Take heart, then. Shadows only live when given birth by light, and the king's fires burn so low I dare not draw off any more to make another son. It might well kill him. Melisandre moved closer. With another man, though. A man whose flames still burn hot and high. If you truly wish to serve your king's cause, come to my chamber one night. I could give you pleasure such as you have never known, and with your life-fire I could make a horror. Davos retreated from her. I want no part of you, my lady, or your god. May the seven protect me. Melisandre sighed. They did not protect Gunser Sunglass. He prayed thrice each day and bore seven seven-pointed stars upon his shield, but when the Lord reached out his hand, his prayers turned to screams, and he burned. Why cling to these false gods? I have worshipped them all my life. All your life, Davos Seaworth. As well say, it was so yesterday. She shook her head sadly. You have never feared to speak the truth to kings. Why do you lie to yourself? Open your eyes, Sir Knight. What is it you would have me see? The way the world is made. The truth is all around you, plain to behold. The night is dark and full of terrors. The day, bright and beautiful and full of hope. One is black, the other white. There is ice, and there is fire, hate and love, bitter and sweet, male and female, pain and pleasure, winter and summer, evil and good. She took a step toward him. Death and life. Everywhere opposites. Everywhere the war. The war? asked Davos. The war, she affirmed. There are two, Onion Knight, not seven, not one, not a hundred or a thousand, two. Do you think I crossed half the world to put yet another vain king on yet another empty throne? The war has been waged since time began, and before it is done all men must choose where they will stand. On one side is Relor, the Lord of Light, the Heart of Fire, the God of Flame and Shadow, Against him stands the great other, whose name may not be spoken, the Lord of Darkness, the Soul of Ice, the God of Night and Terror. Ours is not a choice between Baratheon and Lannister, between Greyjoy and Stark. It is death we choose, or life, darkness, or light. She clasped the bars of his cell with her slender white hands. The great ruby at her throat seemed to pulse with its own radiance. So tell me, Sir Davos Seaworth, and tell me truly, does your heart burn with the shining light of a lore, or is it black and cold and full of worms? 
She reached through the bars and laid three fingers upon his breast, as if to feel the truth of him through flesh and woolen leather. My heart, Davos said slowly, is full of doubts. Melisandre sighed. Ah, Davos, the good knight is honest to the last, even in his day of darkness. It is well you did not lie to me, I would have known. The other's servants oft hide black hearts in gaudy light, so the law gives his priests the power to see through falsehoods. She stepped lightly away from the cell. Why did you mean to kill me? I will tell you, said Davos, if you will tell me who betrayed me. It could only have been Salador's son, and yet even now he prayed it was not so. The red woman laughed. No one betrayed you on your night. I saw your purpose in my flames. The flames. If you can see the future in these flames, how is it that we burned upon the black water? You gave my sons to the fire. My sons, my ship, my men, all burning. Melisandre shook her head. You wrong me, Onion Knight. Those were no fires of mine. Had I been with you, your battle would have had a different ending. But his grace was surrounded by unbelievers, and his pride proved stronger than his faith. His punishment was grievous, but he has learned from his mistake. Were my sons no more than a lesson for a king, then? Davos felt his mouth tighten. It is night in your seven kingdoms now, the red woman went on, but soon the sun will rise again. The war continues, Davos Seaworth, and some will soon learn that even an ember in the ashes can still ignite a great blaze. The old maester looked at Stannis and saw only a man. You see a king. You are both wrong. He is the Lord's chosen, the warrior of fire. I have seen him leading the fight against the dark. I have seen it in the flames. The flames do not lie, else you would not be here. It is written in prophecy as well. When the red star bleeds and the darkness gathers, Azor Ahai shall be born again amidst smoke and salt to wake dragons out of stone. The bleeding star has come and gone, and Dragonstone is the place of smoke and salt. Stannis Baratheon is Azor Ahai reborn. Her red eyes blazed like twin fires and seemed to stare deep into his soul. You do not believe me. You doubt the truth of a lord even now, yet have served him all the same, and will serve him again. I shall leave you here to think on all that I have told you, and because Valor is the source of all good, I shall leave the torch as well. With a smile and swirl of scarlet skirts, she was gone. Only her scent lingered after, that and the torch. Davos lowered himself to the floor of the cell and wrapped his arms about his knees. The shifting torchlight washed over him. Once Melisandre's footsteps faded away, the only sound was the scrabbling of rats. Ice and fire, he thought, black and white, dark and light. Davos could not deny the power of her god. He had seen the shadow crawling from Melisandre's womb, and the priestess knew things she had no way of knowing. She saw my purpose in her flames. It was good to learn that Sala had not sold him, but the thought of the red woman spying out his secrets with her fires disquieted him more than he could say. And what did she mean when she said that I had served her god and would serve him again? He did not like that either. He lifted his eyes to stare up at the torch. He looked for a long time, never blinking, watching the flames shift and shimmer. He tried to see beyond them, to peer through the fiery curtain and glimpse whatever lived back there. But there was nothing, only fire. And after a time his eyes began to water. God blind and tired, Davos curled up on the straw and gave himself to sleep. Three days later, well, porridge had come thrice, and Lamprey twice. Davos heard voices outside his cell. He sat up at once, his back to the stone wall, listening to the sounds of struggle. This was new, a change in his unchanging world. The noise was coming from the left, where the steps led up to daylight. He could hear a man's voice pleading and shouting. Madness! the man was saying as he came into view, dragged along between two guardsmen with fiery hearts on their breasts. 
Porridge went before them, jangling a ring of keys, and Sir Axel Florent walked behind. Axel, the prisoner said desperately, for the love you bear me, unhand me. You cannot do this. I'm no traitor. He was an older man, tall and slender, with silvery gray hair, a pointed beard, and a long, elegant face, twisted in fear. Where is Elise? Where is the queen? I demand to see her. The others take you all. Release me. The guards paid no mind to his outcries. Here, Porridge asked in front of the cell. Davos got to his feet. For an instant he considered trying to rush them when the door was opened, but that was madness. There were too many. The guards wore swords, and Porridge was strong as a bull. Sir Axel gave the jailer a curt nod. Let the traitors enjoy each other's company. I am no traitor, screeched the prisoner as Porridge was unlocking the door. Though he was plainly dressed in grey wool doublet and black breeches, his speech marked him as highborn. His birth will not serve him here, thought Davos. Porridge swung the bars wide. Sir Axel gave a nod, and the guards flung their charge in headlong. The man stumbled and might have fallen, but Davos caught him. At once he wrenched away and staggered back toward the door, only to have it slammed in his pale, pampered face. No! he shouted. No! All the strength suddenly left his legs, and he slid slowly to the floor, clutching at the iron bars. Sir Axel, Porridge, and the guards had already turned to leave. You cannot do this! the prisoner shouted at their retreating backs. I am the king's hand! It was then that Davos knew him. You are Alistair Florent. The man turned his head. Who? Sir Davos Seaworth. Lord Alistair blinked. Seaworth, the Onion Knight. You tried to murder Melisandre. Davos did not deny it. At Storm's End, you wore red gold armor with inlaid lapis flowers on your breastplate. He reached down a hand to help the other man to his feet. Lord Alistair brushed the filthy straw from his clothing. I, I must apologize for my appearance, sir. My chests were lost when the Lannisters overran our camp. I escaped with no more than the mail on my back and the rings on my fingers. He still wears those rings, noted Davos, who had lacked even all of his fingers. No doubt some cook's boy or groom is prancing around King's Landing just now in my slashed velvet doublet and jeweled cloak, Lord Alistair went on, oblivious. But war has its horrors, as all men know. No doubt you suffered your own losses. My ship, said Davos, all my men, four of my sons. May the, may the Lord of Light lead them through the darkness to a better world, the other man said. May the father judge them justly and the mother grant them mercy, Davos thought, but he kept his prayer to himself. The seven had no place on Dragonstone now. My own son is safe at Brightwater, the Lord went on, but I lost a nephew in the fury, Sir Emery, my brother Ryan's son. It had been Sir Emery Florent who led them blindly up the Blackwater rush with all oars pulling, paying no heed to the small stone towers at the mouth of the river. Davos was not like to forget him. My son Merrick was your nephew's oarmaster. He remembered his last sight of fury, engulfed in wildfire. Has there been any word of survivors? The fury burned and sank with all hands, his lordship said. Your son and my nephew were lost, with countless other good men. The war itself was lost that day, sir. This man is defeated. Davos remembered Melisandre's talk of embers and the ashes igniting great blazes. Small wonder he ended here. His grace will never yield, my lord. Folly, that's folly. Lord Alistair sat on the floor again, as if the effort of standing for a moment had been too much for him. Stannis Baratheon will never sit the Iron Throne? Is it treason to say the truth? A bitter truth, but no less true for that. His fleet is gone, save for the Lysini, and Salador San will flee at the first sight of a Lannister sail. Most of the lords who supported Stannis have gone over to Joffrey or died. Even the lords of the Narrow Sea? The lords sworn to Dragonstone? Lord Alistair waved his hand feebly. Lord Celtigar was captured and bent the knee. Monford Valarian died with his ship. The Red Woman burned sunglass, and Lord Bar Emmon is fifteen fat and feeble. Those are your lords of the Narrow Sea. Only the strength of House Florence is left to Stannis against all the might of High Garden, Sunspear, and Castle Rock. And now most of the Storm Lords as well. The best hope that remains is to try and salvage something with a peace. 
That is all I meant to do. Gods be good, how can they call it treason? Davos stood frowning. My lord, what did you do? Not treason. Never treason. I love his grace as much as any man. My own niece is his queen, and I remained loyal to him when wiser men fled. I am his hand, the hand of the king. How can I be a traitor? I only meant to save our lives, and— Honor, yes. He licked his lips. I panned the letter. Salador Hassan swore that he had a man who could get it to King's Landing, to Lord Tywin. His lordship is a, a man of reason, and my terms, the terms were fair, more than fair. What terms were these, my lord? It is filthy here, Lord Alistair said suddenly. And that odor, what is that odor? The pale, said Davos, gesturing. We have no privy here. What terms? His lordship stared at the pale in horror. That Lord Stannis give up his claim to the Iron Throne and retract all he said of Joffrey's bastardy, on the condition that he be accepted back into the King's peace and confirmed as Lord of Dragonstone in Storm's End. I vow to do the same, for the return of Brightwater Keep and all our lands. I thought Lord Tywin would see the sense in my proposal. He still has the Starks to deal with, and the Iron Men as well. I offered to seal the bargain by wedding Shireen to Joffrey's brother Tommen. He shook his head. The terms, they are as good as we are ever like to get. Even you can see that, surely. Yes, said Davos, even me. Unless Stannis should father a son, such a marriage would mean that Dragonstone and Storm's End would one day pass to Tommen, which would doubtless please Lord Tywin. Meanwhile the Lannisters would have Shireen as hostage to make certain Stannis raised no new rebellions. And what did his grace say when you proposed these terms to him? He is always with the Red Woman, and he is not in his right mind, I fear. This talk of a stone dragon! Madness, I tell you, sheer madness! Did we learn nothing from Arion Brightfire, from the Nine Mages, from the Alchemists? Did we learn nothing from Summer Hall? No good has ever come from these dreams of dragons. I told Axel as much. My way was better, surer. And Stannis gave me his seal. He gave me leave to rule. The hand speaks with the king's voice. Not in this. Davos was no courtier, and he did not even try to blunt his words. It is not in Stannis to yield, so long as he knows his claim is just. No more than he can unsay his words against Joffrey when he believes them true. As for the marriage, Tommen was born of the same incest as Joffrey, and his grace would sooner see Shireen dead than wed to such. A vein throbbed in Florence's forehead. He has no choice. You are wrong, my lord. He can choose to die a king. And us with him? Is that what you desire, Onion Knight? No. But I am the king's man, and I will make no peace without his leave. Lord Alistair stared at him helplessly for a long moment, and then began to weep. John. The last night fell black and moonless, but for once the sky was clear. I am going up the hill to look for ghost. He told the Thens at the cave mouth, and they grunted and let him pass. So many stars, he thought, as he trudged up the slope through pines and firs and ash. Maester Lewin had taught him his stars as a boy in Winterfell. He had learned the names of the twelve houses of heaven and the rulers of each. He could find the seven wanderers, sacred to the faith. He was old friends with the ice dragon, the shadow cat, the moon maid, and the sword of the morning. All those he shared with Ygritte, but not some of the others. We look up at the same stars and see such different things. The king's crown was the cradle, to hear her tell it. The stallion was the horned lord. The red wanderer that Septons preached was sacred to their smith up here, was called the thief. And when the thief was in the moon maid, that was a propitious time for a man to steal a woman, Ygritte insisted. Like the night you stole me. The thief was bright that night. I never meant to steal you, he said. I never knew you were a girl until my knife was at your throat. If you kill a man and never mean to, he's just as dead, Egret said stubbornly. John had never met anyone so stubborn, except maybe for his little sister Arya. 
Is she still my sister? he wondered. Was she ever? He had never truly been a Stark, only Lord Eddard's motherless bastard, with no more place at Winterfell than Theon Greyjoy. And even that he'd lost. When a man of the Night's Watch said his words, he put aside his old family and joined a new one. But Jon Snow had lost those brothers, too. He found Ghost atop the hill, as he thought he might. The white wolf never howled, yet something drew him to the heights all the same, and he would squat there on his hind quarters, hot breath rising in a white mist, as his red eyes drank the stars. Do you have names for them as well? John asked as he went to one knee beside the dire wolf and scratched the thick white fur on his neck. The hare, the doe, the she-wolf? Ghost licked his face, his rough, wet tongue rasping against the scabs where the eagle's talons had ripped John's cheek. The bird marked both of us, he thought. Ghost, he said quietly, on the morrow we go over. There's no steps here, no cage and crane, no way for me to get you to the other side. We have to part. Do you understand? In the dark, the dire wolf's red eyes looked black. He nuzzled at John's neck, silent as ever, his breath a hot mist. The wildlings called John Snow a warg, but if so, he was a poor one. He did not know how to put on a wolf skin the way Oral had with his eagle before he died. Once John had dreamed that he was ghost, looking down upon the valley of the milk water where a man's raider had gathered his people, and that dream had turned out to be true. But he was not dreaming now, and that left him only words. You cannot come with me. John said, cupping the wolf's head in his hands and looking deep into those eyes. You have to go to Castle Black. Do you understand? Castle Black. Can you find it, the way home? Just follow the ice, east and east into the sun, and you'll find it. They will know you at Castle Black, and maybe your coming will warn them. He had thought of writing out a warning for ghosts to carry, but he had no ink, no parchment, not even a writing quill, and the risk of discovery was too great. I will meet you again at Castle Black, but you have to get there by yourself. We must each hunt alone for a time. Alone. The dire wolf twisted free of John's grasp. His ears pricked up. And suddenly he was bounding away. He loped through a tangle of brush, leapt a deadfall, and raced down the hillside, a pale streak among the trees. Off to Castle Black? John wondered. Or off after a hare? He wished he knew. He feared he might prove just as poor a warg as a sworn brother and a spy. A wind sighed through the trees, rich with a smell of pine needles, tugging at his faded blacks. John could see the wall looming high and dark to the south, a great shadow blocking out the stars. The rough hilly ground made him think they must be somewhere between the Shadow Tower and Castle Black, and likely closer to the former. For days they had been wending their way south between deep lakes that stretched like long, thin fingers along the floors of narrow valleys, while flint ridges and pine-clad hills jostled against one another to either side. Such ground made for slow riding, but offered easy concealment for those wishing to approach the wall unseen. For wildling raiders, he thought, like us, like me. Beyond that wall lay the Seven Kingdoms, and everything he had sworn to protect. He had said the words, had pledged his life and honor, and by rights he should be up there standing sentry. He should be raising a horn to his lips to rouse the knight's watch to arms. He had no horn, though. It would not be hard to steal one from the wildlings, he suspected. But what would that accomplish? Even if he blew it, there was no one to hear. The wall was a hundred leagues long, and the watch sadly dwindled. All but three of the strongholds had been abandoned. There might not be a brother within forty miles of here, but for John, if he was a brother still. I should have tried to kill Mance Raider on the fist, even if it meant my life. That was what Corin Halfhand would have done. But John had hesitated, and the chance passed. The next day he had ridden off with Steer, the Magnar, Jarl, and more than a hundred picked Thens and Raiders. He told himself that he was only biding his time, that when the moment came he would slip away and ride for Castle Black. The moment never came. They rested most nights in empty wildling villages, and Steer always had a dozen of his thens to guard the horses. Jarl watched him suspiciously. Andy Grit was never far, day or night. 
Two hearts that beat as one. Mance Raider's mocking words rang bitter in his head. John had seldom felt so confused. I have no choice, he told himself the first time, when she slipped beneath his sleeping skins. If I refuse her, she will know me for a turncloak. I am playing the part the half-hand told me to play. His body had played the part eagerly enough. His lips on hers, his hand sliding under her doeskin shirt to find a breast, his manhood stiffening when she rubbed her mound against it through their clothes. My vows, he thought, remembering the weirwood grove where he had said them, the nine great white trees in a circle, the carved red faces watching, listening. But her fingers were undoing his laces, and her tongue was in his mouth, and her hand slipped inside his small clothes and brought him out, and he could not see the weirwoods any more, only her. She bit his neck, and he nuzzled hers, burying his nose in her thick red hair. Lucky, he thought. She is lucky, fire-kissed. Isn't that good, she whispered as she guided him inside her. She was sopping wet down there, and no maiden, that was plain. But John did not care. His vows, her maidenhood, none of it mattered, only the heat of her, the mouth on his, the finger that pinched at his nipple. Isn't that sweet, she said again. Not so fast. Oh, slow. Yes, like that. There now, there now. Yes, sweet, sweet. You know nothing, John Snow, but I can show you harder now. Yes. A part, he tried to remind himself afterward. I am playing a part. I had to do it once to prove I'd abandoned my vows. I had to make her trust me. It need never happen again. He was still a man of the Night's Watch and a son of Eddard Stark. He had done what needed to be done, proved what needed to be proven. The proving had been so sweet, though, and Egrit had gone to sleep beside him with her head against his chest, and that was sweet as well, dangerously sweet. He thought of the weirwoods again and the words he'd said before them. It was only once, and it had to be. Even my father stumbled once, when he forgot his marriage vows and sired a bastard. John vowed to himself that it would be the same with him. It will never happen again. It happened twice more that night, and again in the morning when she woke to find him hard. The wildlings were stirring by then, and several could not help but notice what was going on beneath the pile of furs. Jarl told them to be quick about it before he had to throw a pail of water over them. Like a pair of rutting dogs, John thought afterward. Was that what he'd become? I am a man of the Night's Watch. A small voice inside insisted, but every night it seemed a little fainter, and when Egrit kissed his ears up at his neck, he could not hear it at all. Was this how it was for my father, he wondered. Was he as weak as I am, when he dishonored himself in my mother's bed? Something was coming up the hill behind him, he realized suddenly. For half a heartbeat he thought it might be Ghost to come back, but the dire wolf never made so much noise. John drew Longclaw in a single smooth motion, but it was only one of the thens, a broad man in a bronze helm. Snow, the intruder said. Come, Magna wants. The men of Thin spoke the old tongue, and most had only a few words of the common. John did not much care what the Magnar wanted, but there was no use arguing with someone who could scarcely understand him, so he followed the man back down the hill. The mouth of the cave was a cleft in the rock, barely wide enough for a horse, half concealed behind a soldier pine. It opened to the north, so the glows of the fires within would not be visible from the wall. Even if by some mischance a patrol should happen to pass atop the wall tonight, they would see nothing but hills and pines and the icy sheen of starlight on a half-frozen lake. Mance Raider had planned his thrust well. Within the rock, the passage descended twenty feet before it opened out onto a space as large as Winterfell's great hall. Cook fires burned amongst the columns, their smoke rising to blacken the stony ceiling. The horses had been hobbled along one wall, beside a shallow pool. A sinkhole in the center of the floor opened on what might have been an even greater cavern below, though the darkness made it hard to tell. John could hear the soft rushing sound of an underground stream somewhere below as well. Jarl was with the Magnar. Mance had given them the joint command. Steer was none too pleased by that, John had noted early on. Mance Raider had called the dark youth a pet of Val, who was sister to Dalla, his own queen, which made Jarl a sort of good brother once removed to the king beyond the wall. The Magnar plainly resented sharing his authority. He had brought a hundred thens, 
five times as many men as Jarl, and often acted as if he had the sole command. But it would be the younger man who got them over the ice, John knew. Though he could not have been older than twenty, Jarl had been raiding for eight years, and had gone over the wall a dozen times with the likes of Alfin Crowkiller and the Weeper, and more recently with his own band. The Magnar was direct. Jarl has warned me of crows patrolling on high. Tell me all you know of these patrols. Tell me, John noted, not tell us, though Jarl stood right beside him. He would have liked nothing better than to refuse the brusque demand, but he knew Steer would put him to death at the slightest disloyalty, and he grit as well for the crime of being his. There are four men in each patrol, two rangers and two builders, he said. The builders are supposed to make note of cracks, melting and other structural problems, while the rangers look for signs of foes. They ride mules. Mules? The earless man frowned. Mules are slow. Slow, but more sure-footed on the ice. The patrols often ride atop the wall, and aside from Castle Black, the paths up there have not been graveled for long years. The mules are bred at Eastwatch and specially trained to their duty. They often ride atop the wall? Not always? No. One patrol in four follows the base instead to search for cracks in the foundation ice or signs of tunneling. The Magnar nodded. Even in Far Thin we know the tale of Arson Ice Axe and his tunnel. John knew the tale as well. Arson Ice Axe had been halfway through the wall when his tunnel was found by rangers from the night fort. They did not trouble to disturb him at his digging, only sealed the way behind with ice and stone and snow. Dolores Ed used to say that if you pressed your ear flat to the wall, you could still hear Arson chipping away with his axe. When do these patrols go out? How often? John shrugged. It changes. I've heard that Lord Commando Corgile used to send them out every third day from Castle Black to East Watch by the sea, and every second day from Castle Black to the Shadow Tower. The Watch had more men in his day, though. Lord Commander Mormont prefers to vary the number of patrols in the days of their departure to make it more difficult for anyone to know their comings and goings. And sometimes the old bear will even send a larger force to one of the abandoned castles for a fortnight or a moon's turn. His uncle had originated that tactic, John knew. Anything to make the enemy unsure. Is Stone Door manned at present? asked Jarl. Greyguard? So we're between those two, are we? John kept his face carefully blank. Only East Watch, Castle Black, and the Shadow Tower were manned when I left the wall. I can't speak to what Bowen Marsh or Sir Dennis might have done since. How many crows remain within the castles? asked Steer. Five hundred, Castle Black. Two hundred at Shadow Tower, perhaps three hundred at East Watch. John added three hundred men to the count. If only it were that easy. Jarl was not fooled, however. He's lying, he told Steer, or else including those they lost in the fist. Crow, the Magnar warned, do not take me for Mance Raider. If you lie to me, I will have your tongue. I'm no crow and won't be called a liar. John flexed the fingers of his sword hand. The Magnar of Than studied John with his chilly gray eyes. We shall learn their numbers soon enough, he said after a moment. Go, I will send for you if I have further questions. John bowed his head stiffly and went. If all the wildlings were like Steer, it would be easier to betray them. The Thens were not like other free folk, though. The Magnar claimed to be the last of the first men, and ruled with an iron hand. His little land of Then was a high mountain valley, hidden amongst the northernmost peaks of the Frostfangs, surrounded by cave dwellers, hornfoot men, giants, and the cannibal clans of the ice rivers. Egret said the Thens were savage fighters, and that their Magnar was a god to them. John could believe that. Unlike Jarl in Harma and Rattleshirt, Steer commanded absolute obedience from his men, and that discipline was no doubt part of why Mance had chosen him to go over the wall. He walked past the Thens, sitting atop their rounded bronze helms about their cook-fires. Where did Egret get herself to? He found her gear and his together, but no sign of the girl herself. She took a torch and went off that way, Grig the goat told him, pointing toward the back of the cavern. John followed his finger and found himself in a dim back room, wandering through a maze of columns and stalactites. She can't be here, he was thinking, when he heard her laugh. 
He turned toward the sound, but within ten paces he was in a dead end, facing a blank wall of rose and white flowstone. Baffled, he made his way back the way he'd come, and then he saw it, a dark hole under an outthrust of wet stone. He knelt, listened, heard the faint sound of water. Hey, Grit? In here. A voice came back, echoing faintly. John had to crawl a dozen paces before the cave opened up around him. When he stood again, it took his eyes a moment to adjust. Egrit had brought a torch, but there was no other light. She stood beside a little waterfall that fell from a cleft in the rock down into a wide, dark pool. The orange and yellow flames shone against the pale green water. What are you doing here? he asked her. I heard water. I wanted to see how deep the cave went. She pointed with the torch. There's a passage that goes down further. I followed it a hundred paces before I turned back. At that end? You know nothing, John Snow. It went on and on and on. There are hundreds of caves in these hills, and down deep they all connect. There's even a way under your wall, Gorn's way. Gorn, said John. Gorn was king beyond the wall. Aye, said Egrit, together with his brother Gendel. Three thousand years ago, they led a host of free folk through the caves, and the watch was none the wiser. But when they come out, the wolves of Winterfell fell upon them. There was a battle, John recalled. Gorn slew the king in the north, but his son picked up his banner and took the crown from his head and cut down Gorn in turn. And the sound of swords woke the crows in their castles, and they rode out all in black to take the free folk in the rear. Yes, Gendel had the king to the south, the umbers to the east, and the watch to the north of him. He died as well. You know nothing, John Snow. Gendel did not die. He caught his way free through the crows and led his people back north with the wolves howling at their heels. Only Gendel did not know the caves as Gorn had and took a wrong turn. She swept the torch back and forth so the shadows jumped and moved. Deeper he went and deeper, and when he tried to turn back, the ways that seemed familiar ended in stone rather than sky. Soon his torches began to fail one by one, till finally there was naught but dark. Gentle's folk were never seen again, but on a still night you can hear their children's children's children sobbing under the hills, still looking for the way back up. Listen, do you hear them? All John could hear was the falling water and the faint crackle of flames. This way under the wall was lost as well? Some have searched for it. Them that go too deep find Gentle's children, and Gentle's children are always hungry. Smiling, she set the torch carefully in a notch of rock and came toward him. There's naught to eat in the dark but flesh, she whispered, biting at his neck. John nuzzled her hair and filled his nose with the smell of her. You sound like old Nan telling Bran a monster story. He grit punched his shoulder. An old woman am I. You're older than me. I and wiser. You know nothing, John Snow. She pushed away from him and shrugged out of her rabbit-skin vest. What are you doing? Showing you how old I am. She unlaced her doe-skin shirt, tossed it aside, pulled her three woolen undershirts up over her head all at once. I want you should see me. We shouldn't... We should. Her breasts bounced as she stood on one leg to pull one boot, then hopped onto her other foot to attend to the other. Her nipples were wide pink circles. You as well... Egrit said as she yanked down her sheepskin breeches. If you want to look, you have to show. You know nothing, Jon Snow. I know I want you, he heard himself say, all his vows and all his honor forgotten. She stood before him, naked as her name day, and he was as hard as a rock around them. He had been in her half a hundred times by now, but always beneath the firs, with others all around them. He had never seen how beautiful she was. Her legs were skinny but well-muscled. The hair at the juncture of her thighs are brighter red than that on her head. Does that make it even luckier? He pulled her close. I love the smell of you, he said. I love your red hair. I love your mouth and the way you kiss me. I love your smile. I love your tits. He kissed them, one and then the other. I love your skinny legs and what's between them. He knelt to kiss her there, lightly on her mound at first, but Egrit moved her legs apart a little, and he saw the pink inside and kissed that as well, and tasted her. She gave a little gasp. If you love me all so much, why are you still dressed? She whispered. You know nothing, Jon Snow. Nothing. Uh, oh. 
Oh. Afterward, she was almost shy, or as shy as Egret ever got. That thing you did, she said, when they lay together on their piled clothes, with your mouth. She hesitated. Is that... Is it what lords do to their ladies down in the south? I don't think so. No one had ever told John just what lords did with their ladies. I only wanted to kiss you there, that's all. You seemed to like it. I... I... I liked it some. No one taught you such? There's been no one, he confessed. Only you. A maid, she teased. You were a maid. He gave her closest nipple a playful pinch. I was a man of the night's watch. Was, he heard himself say. What was he now? He did not want to look at that. Were you a maid? Egret pushed herself onto an elbow. I am nineteen and a spearwife, and kissed by fire. How could I be maiden? Who was he? A boy at a feast, five years past. He'd come trading with his brothers, and he had hair like mine kissed by fire. So I thought he would be lucky, but he was weak. When he came back to try and steal me, Longspear broke his arm and ran him off, and he never tried again, not once. It wasn't Longspear, then. John was relieved. He liked Longspear, with his homely face and friendly ways. She punched him. That's vile. Would you bed your sister? Longspear's not your brother. He's of my village. You know nothing, John Snow. A true man steals a woman from afar to strengthen the clan. Women who bed brothers or fathers or clan kin offend the gods and are cursed with weak and sickly children, even monsters. Craster weds his daughters, John pointed out. She punched him again. Craster's more your kind than ours. His father was a crow who stole a woman out of White Tree Village, but after he had her, he flew back to his wall. She went to Castle Black once to show the crow his son, but the brothers blew their horns and run her off. Craster's blood is black, and he bears a heavy curse. She ran her fingers lightly across his stomach. I feared you'd do the same once. Fly back to the wall. You never knew what to do after you stole me. John sat up. Egret, I never stole you. Ah, you did. You jumped down the mountain and killed Oral, and before I could get my axe you had a knife at my throat. I thought you'd have me then, or kill me, or maybe both, but you never did. And when I told you the tale of Bale the Bard and how he plucked the rose of Winterfell, I thought you'd know to pluck me then for certain, but you didn't. You know nothing, John Snow. She gave him a shy smile. You might be learning some, though. The light was shifting all about her, John noticed suddenly. He looked around. We had best go up. The torch is almost done. Is the crow afeard of Gendel's children? She said with a grin. It's only a little way up, and I'm not done with you, John Snow. She pushed him back down on the clothes and straddled him. Would you... She hesitated. What? He prompted as the torch began to gutter. Do it again, he grit blurted. With your mouth, the Lord's kiss. And I... I could see if you liked it any. By the time the torch burned out, John Snow no longer cared. His guilt came back afterward, but weaker than before. If this is so wrong, he wondered, why did the gods make it feel so good? The grotto was pitch dark by the time they finished. The only light was the dim glow of the passage back up to the larger cavern, where a score of fires burned. They were soon fumbling and bumping into each other as they tried to dress in the dark. Egret stumbled into the pool and screeched at the cold of the water. When John laughed, she pulled him in, too. They rustled and splashed in the dark, and then she was in his arms again, and it turned out they were not finished after all. John Snow, she told him, when he'd spent his seed inside her. Don't move now, sweet. I like the feel of you in there. I do. Let's not go back to Steer and Jarl. Let's go down inside and join up with Gendel's children. I don't ever want to leave this cave, John Snow. Not ever. Dangerous. All? The slave girl sounded wary. Your grace, did this one's worthless ears mishear you? Cool green light filled her down to the diamond-shaped panes of colored glass set in the sloping triangular walls, and a breeze was blowing gently through the terrace doors, carrying the scents of fruit and flowers from the garden beyond. Your ears heard true, said Danny. I want to buy them all. 
Tell the good masters, if you will. She had chosen a Carthine gown today. The deep violet silk brought out the purple of her eyes. The cut of it bared her left breast. While the good masters of Astapor conferred among themselves in low voices, Dany sipped tart persimmon wine from a tall silver flute. She could not quite make out all that they were saying, but she could hear the greed. Each of the eight brokers was attended by two or three body slaves, though one Grazdan, the eldest, had six. So it was not to seem a beggar, Dany had brought her own attendants, Eerie and Jicky in their sand-silk trousers and painted vests, Old Whitebeard and mighty Belwas, her blood-riders. Sir Jorah stood behind her, sweltering in his green surcoat with the black bear of Mormont embroidered upon it. The smell of his sweat was an earthy answer to the sweet perfumes that drenched the Astapori. "'Oh!' growled Krasnis, Mo Naklaus, who smelled of peaches today. The slave girl repeated the word in the common tongue of Westeros. "'Of thousands there are eight. Is this what she means by all?' There are also six centuries, who shall be part of a ninth thousand when complete. Would she have them, too? I would, said Dany, when the question was put to her. The eight thousands, the six centuries, and the ones still in training as well, the ones who have not earned the spikes. Krasnis turned back to his fellows. Once again they conferred among themselves. The translator had told Dany their names, but it was hard to keep them straight. Four of the men seemed to be named Grasdan, presumably after Grasdan the Great, who had founded Old Geese in the dawn of days. They all looked alike, thick, fleshy men with amber skin, broad noses, dark eyes. Their wiry hair was black or a dark red, or that queer mixture of red and black that was peculiar to Giscari. All wrapped themselves in tokars, a garment permitted only to freeborn men of Astapor. It was the fringe on the tokar that proclaimed a man's status, Denny had been told by Captain Grolio. In this cool green room atop the pyramid, two of the slavers wore tokars fringed in silver. Five had gold fringes, and one, the oldest Grasdan, displayed a fringe of fat white pearls that clacked together softly when he shifted in his seat or moved an arm. "'We cannot sell half-trained boys,' one of the silver-fringed Grasdans was saying to the others. "'We can, if our gold is good,' said a fatter man whose fringe was gold. They are not unsullied. They have not killed their sucklings. If they fail in the field, they will shame us. And even if we cut five thousand raw boys tomorrow, it would be ten years before they are fit for sale. What would we tell the next buyer who comes seeking unsullied? We will tell him that he must wait, said the fat man. Gold in my purse is better than gold in my future. Then he let them argue, sipping the tart persimmon wine and trying to keep her face blank and ignorant. I will have them all, no matter the price, she told herself. The city had a hundred slave traders, but the eight before her were the greatest. When selling bed slaves, field hands, scribes, craftsmen, and tutors, these men were rivals. But their ancestors had allied one with the other for the purpose of making and selling the unsullied. Brick and blood built Astapor, and brick and blood her people. It was Krasnus who finally announced their decision. Tell her that the eight thousands she shall have, if our gold proves sufficient, and the six centuries if she wishes. Tell her to come back in a year, and we will sell her another two thousand. In a year I shall be in Westeros, said Dany, when she had heard the translation. My need is now. The unsullied are well trained, but even so many will fall in battle. I shall need the boys as replacements to take up the swords they drop. She put her wine aside and leaned toward the slave girl. Tell the good masters that I will want even the little ones who still have their puppies. Tell them that I will pay as much for the boy they cut yesterday as for an unsullied in a spiked helm. The girl told them. The answer was still no. Then he frowned an annoyance. Very well. Tell them I will pay double, so long as I get them all. Double? The fat one in the gold fringe all but drooled. "'This little whore is a fool, truly,' said Krasnis Monoclos. "'Ask her for triple, I say. She is desperate enough to pay. Ask for ten times the price of every slave, yes!' 
The tall Grasdan with a spiked beard spoke in the common tongue, though not so well as the slave girl. "'Your grace,' he growled, "'Westeros is being wealthy, yes, but you are not being queen now. Perhaps we'll never be in queen. Even Unsullied may be losing battles to savage steel knights of seven kingdoms. I am reminding the good masters of Astapor are not selling flesh for promisings. Are you having gold and trading goods sufficient to be paying for all these eunuchs you are wanting?' "'You know the answer to that better than I, good master.' Denny replied, "'Your men have gone through my ships and tallied every bead of amber and jar of saffron. How much do I have?' "'Sufficient to be buying one of thousands,' the good master said with a contemptuous smile. "'Yet you are paying double, you are saying. Five centuries, then, is all you buy.' "'Your pretty crown might buy another century,' said the fat one in Valyrian. "'Your crown of the three dragons.' Danny waited for his words to be translated. My crown is not for sale. When Viserys sold their mother's crown, the last joy had gone from him, leaving only rage. Nor will I enslave my people, nor sell their goods and horses. But my ships you can have. The great cog Beleriand and the galleys Vagar and Meraxes. She had warned Grolio and the other captains it might come to this, though they had protested the necessity of it furiously. Three good ships should be worth more than a few paltry eunuchs. The fat Grasdan turned to the others. They conferred in low voices once again. Two of the thousands, the one with a spiked beard said when he turned back. It is too much, but the good masters are being generous, and your need is being great. Two thousand would never serve for what she meant to do. I must have them all. Danny knew what she must do now though the taste of it was so bitter that even the persimmon wine could not cleanse it from her mouth. She had considered long and hard and found no other way. It is my only choice. Give me all, she said, and you may have a dragon. There was the sound of indrawn breath from Jicky beside her. Krasnis smiled at his fellows. Did I not tell you anything she would give us? Whitebeard stared in shocked disbelief. His hand trembled where it grasped the staff. No! He went to one knee before her. Your grace, I beg you, win your throne with dragons, not slaves. You must not do this thing. You must not presume to instruct me. Sir Jorah, remove Whitebeard from my presence. Mormont seized the old man roughly by an elbow, yanked him back to his feet, and marched him out onto the terrace. Tell the good masters I regret this interruption, said Dany to the slave girl. Tell them I await their answer. She knew the answer, though. She could see it in the glitter of their eyes and the smiles they tried so hard to hide. Astapor had thousands of eunuchs and even more slave boys waiting to be cut. But there were only three living dragons in all the great wide world. And the Giscari lost the dragons. How could they not? Five times... Had old geese contended with Valeria when the world was young, and five times gone down to bleak defeat. For the freehold had dragons, and the empire had none. The oldest Grasdan stirred in his seat, and his pearls clacked together softly. A dragon of our choice, he said in a thin, hard voice. The black one is largest and healthiest. His name is Drogon, she nodded. All your goods, save your crown and your queenly raiment, which we will allow you to keep. The three ships, and Drogon. Done, she said in the common tongue. Done, the old Grasdan answered in his thick Valyrian. The others echoed that old man of the pearl fringe. Done, the slave girl translated, and done, and done, eight times done. The unsullied will learn your savage tongue quick enough added Krasnus Monaklaus, when all the arrangements had been made. But until such time you will need a slave to speak to them. Take this one as our gift to you, a token of a bargain well struck. I shall, said Dany. The slave girl rendered his words to her and hers to him. If she had feelings about being given for a token, she took care not to let them show. Our Stan Whitebeard held his tongue as well when Dany swept by him on the terrace, he followed her down the steps in silence, but she could hear his hard wood staff tap-tapping on the red bricks as they went. 
She did not blame him for his fury. It was a wretched thing she did. The mother of dragons has sold her strongest child. Even the thought made her ill. Yet down in the plaza of pride, standing on the hot red bricks between the slaver's pyramid and the barracks of the eunuchs, Danny turned on the old man. Whitebeard, she said, I want your counsel, and you should never fear to speak your mind with me, when we are alone. But never question me in front of strangers. Is that understood? Yes, your grace, he said unhappily. I am not a child, she told him. I am a queen. Yet even queens can err. The Astapori have cheated you, your grace. A dragon is worth more than any army. Aegon proved that three hundred years ago upon the field of fire. I know what Aegon proved. I mean to prove a few things of my own. Denny turned away from him to the slave girl standing meekly beside her litter. Do you have a name, or must you draw a new one every day from some barrel? That is only for unsullied, the girl said. Then she realized the question had been asked in High Valyrian. Her eyes went wide. Oh! Your name is O? No, your grace, forgive this one her outburst. Your slave's name is Missandy, but— Missandy is no longer a slave. I free you from this instant. Come ride with me in the litter. I wish to talk. Makaro helped them in, and Dany drew the curtains shut against the dust and heat. If you stay with me, you will serve as one of my handmaids, she said as they set off. I shall keep you by my side to speak for me as you spoke for Krasnus. But you may leave my service whenever you choose. If you have father or mother, you would sooner return to. This one will stay, the girl said. This one... I... There is no place for me to go. This... I will serve you gladly. I can give you freedom, but not safety, Danny warned. I have a world to cross and wars to fight. You may go hungry. You may grow sick. You may be killed. Valar Morgulis, said Miss Andy, in High Valyrian. All men must die, Danny agreed. But not for a long while, we may pray. She leaned back on the pillows and took the girl's hand. Are these unsullied truly fearless? Yes, your grace. You serve me now. Is it true they feel no pain? The wine of courage kills such feelings. By the time they slay their sucklings, they have been drinking it for years. And they are obedient. Obedience is all they know. If you told them not to breathe, they would find that easier than not to obey. Danny nodded. And when I am done with them, your grace? When I have won my war and claimed the throne that was my father's, my knights will sheathe their swords and return to their keeps, to their wives and children and mothers, to their lives. But these eunuchs have no lives. What am I to do with eight thousand eunuchs when there are no more battles to be fought? The unsullied make fine guards and excellent watchmen, your grace, said Miss Andy, and it is never hard to find a buyer for such fine, well-blooded troops. Men are not bought and sold in Westeros, they tell me. With all respect, your grace, unsullied are not men. If I did resell them, how would I know they could not be used against me? Danny asked pointedly. Would they do that? Fight against me? Even do me harm? If their master commanded. They do not question, your grace. All the questions have been culled from them. They obey. She looked troubled. When you are... When you are done with them, your grace might command them to fall upon their swords. And even that they would do? Yes, Miss Sandy's voice had grown soft. Your grace. Danny squeezed her hand. You would sooner I did not ask it of them, though. Why is that? Why do you care? This one does not... I... Your grace, tell me. The girl lowered her eyes. Three of them were my brothers once, Your Grace. Then I hope your brothers are as brave and clever as you. Denny leaned back into her pillow and let the litter bear her onward, back to Beleriand one last time to set her world in order. And back to Drogon. Her mouth set grimly. It was a long, dark, windy night that followed. Denny fed her dragons, as she always did, but found she had no appetite herself. She cried a while, alone in her cabin, then dried her tears long enough for yet another argument with Grolio. 
Magister Illyrio is not here, she finally had to tell him, and if he was, he could not sway me either. I need the Unsullied more than I need these ships, and I will hear no more about it. The anger burned the grief and fear from her, for a few hours at the least, after which she called her blood riders to her cabin with Sir Jorah. They were the only ones she truly trusted. She meant to sleep afterward, to be well rested for the morrow, but an hour of restless tossing in the stuffy confines of the cabin soon convinced her that was hopeless. Outside her door she found Argo fitting a new string to his bow by the light of a swinging oil lamp. Arcaro sat cross-legged on the deck beside him, sharpening his arak with a whetstone. Danny told them both to keep on with what they were doing, and went up on deck for a taste of the cool night air. The crew left her alone as they went about their business, but Sir Jorah soon joined her by the rail. He is never far, Danny thought. He knows my moods too well. Khaleesi, you ought to be asleep. Tomorrow will be hot and hard, I promise you. You'll need your strength. Do you remember Eroa? she asked him. The Lazarine girl? They were raping her. But I stopped them and took her under my protection. Only when my son and stars was dead, Mago took her back, used her again, and killed her. Argo said it was her fate. I remember, Sir Jorah said. I was alone for a long time, Jorah. All alone but for my brother. I was such a small, scared thing. Viserys should have protected me, but instead he hurt me and scared me worse. He shouldn't have done that. He wasn't just my brother, he was my king. Why do the gods make kings and queens if not to protect the ones who can't protect themselves? Some kings make themselves. Robert did. He was no true king, Denny said scornfully. He did no justice. Justice, that's what kings are for. Sir Jorah had no answer. He only smiled and touched her hair so lightly. It was enough. That night she dreamt that she was Rhaegar, riding to the trident. But she was mounted on a dragon, not a horse. When she saw the usurper's rebel host across the river, they were armored all in ice. But she bathed them in dragon fire, and they melted away like dew, and turned the trident into a torrent. Some small part of her knew that she was dreaming, but another part exulted. This is how it was meant to be. The other was a nightmare, and I have only now awakened. She woke suddenly in the darkness of her cabin, still flush with triumph. Valyrian seemed to wake with her, and she heard the faint creak of wood, water lapping against the hull, a footfall on the deck above her head, and something else. Someone was in the cabin with her. Eri, Chicky, where are you? Her handmaids did not respond. It was too black to see, but she could hear them breathing. Jorah, is that you? They sleep a woman said. They all sleep. The voice was very close. Even dragons must sleep. She's standing over me. Who's there? Danny peered into the darkness. She thought she could see a shadow, the faintest outline of a shape. What do you want of me? Remember, to go north, you must journey south. To reach the west, you must go east. To go forward you must go back, and to touch the light you must pass beneath the shadow. Quaith? Danny sprung from the bed and threw open the door. Pale yellow lantern light flooded the cabin, and Eerie and Jiki sat up sleepily. Galisi, murmured Jiki, rubbing her eyes. The Serion woke and opened his jaws, and a puff of flame brightened even the darkest corners. There was no sign of a woman in a red lacquer mask. Galisi, are you unwell? asked Jiki. A dream. Danny shook her head. I dreamed a dream no more. Go back to sleep. All of us go back to sleep. Yet try as she might, sleep would not come again. If I look back, I am lost, Danny told herself the next morning as she entered Astapor through the harbor gates. She dare not remind herself how small and insignificant her following truly was, or she would lose all courage. Today she rode her silver, clad in horsehair pants and painted leather vest. 
a bronze medallion belt about her waist and two more crossed between her breasts. Erie and Jicky had braided her hair and hung it with a tiny silver bell whose chime sang of the undying of Carth, burned in their palace of dust. The red brick streets of Astapor were almost crowded this morning. Slaves and servants lined the ways, while the slavers and their women donned their tokars to look down from their stepped pyramids. They are not so different from Carthine after all, she thought. They want a glimpse of dragons to tell their children of and their children's children. It made her wonder how many of them would ever have children. Argo went before her with his great Dothraki bow. Strong Belwas walked to the right of her mare, the girl Missandy to her left. Sir Jorah Mormont was behind in mail and surcoat, glowering at anyone who came too near. Rakaro and Jogo protected the litter. Dany had commanded that the top be removed, so her three dragons might be chained to the platform. Eri and Jicky rode with them to try and keep them calm. Yet Viserion's tail lashed back and forth, and smoke rose angry from his nostrils. Regal could sense something wrong as well. Thrice he tried to take wing, only to be pulled down by the heavy chain in Jicky's hand. Drogon coiled into a ball, wings and tail tucked tight. Only his eyes remained to tell that he was not asleep. The rest of her people followed, Grolio and the other captains and their crews, and the eighty-three Dothraki, who remained to her of the hundred thousand who had once ridden in Drogo's Kalasar. She put the oldest and weakest on the inside of the column, with the nursing women and those with child, and the little girls and the boys too young to braid their hair. The rest— her warriors, such as they were, rode outside and moved their dismal herd along, the hundred-odd gaunt horses that had survived both Red Waste and Black Salt Sea. "'I ought to have a banner sewn,' she thought, as she led her tattered band up along Astapor's meandering river. She closed her eyes to imagine how it would look, all flowing black silk, and on it the red three-headed dragon of Targaryen, breathing golden flames— a banner such as Rhaegar might have borne. The river's banks were strangely tranquil. The worm, the Astapori called the stream, it was wide and slow and crooked, dotted with tiny wooded islands. She glimpsed children playing on one of them, darting amongst elegant marble statues. On another island two lovers kissed in the shade of tall green trees, with no more shame than Dothraki at a wedding. Without clothing she could not tell if they were slave or free. The plaza of pride, with its great bronze harpy, was too small to hold all the unsullied she had bought. Instead they had been assembled in the plaza of punishment, fronting on Astapor's main gate, so they might be marched directly from the city once Daenerys had taken them in hand. There were no bronze statues here, only a wooden platform where rebellious slaves were racked and flayed and hanged. The good masters placed them so they will be the first thing a new slave sees upon entering the city— Miss Andy told her as they came to the plaza. At first glimpse, Dany thought their skin was striped like the zorses of the Jogosnai. Then she rode her silver nearer and saw the raw red flesh beneath the crawling black stripes. Flies, flies and maggots. The rebellious slaves had been peeled like a man might peel an apple in a long curling strip. One man had an arm black with flies from fingers to elbow and red and white beneath. Denny reined in beneath him. What did this one do? He raised a hand against his owner. Her stomach roiling, Denny wheeled her silver about and trotted toward the center of the plaza, and the army she had bought so dear. Rank on rank on rank they stood, her stone half-men with their hearts of brick, eight thousand and six hundred in the spiked bronze caps of fully trained unsullied, and five thousand odd behind them, bareheaded yet armed with spears and short swords. The ones farthest to the back were only boys, she saw, but they stood as straight and still as all the rest. Krasnis, Mo, Naklaws, and his fellows were all there to greet her. Other well-born Astapori stood in knots behind them, sipping wine from silver flutes, as slaves circulated among them with trays of olives and cherries and figs. The elder Grasdan sat in a sedan chair, supported by four huge copper-skinned slaves. Half a dozen mounted lancers rode along the edges of the plaza, keeping back the crowds who had come to watch. The sun flashed blinding bright off the polished copper discs sewn to their cloaks, but she could not help but notice how nervous their horses seemed. They fear the dragons, and well they might. Krosnes had a slave help her from her saddle. 
His own hands were full. One clutched his tow car while the other held an ornate whip. Here they are. He looked at Miss Andy. Tell her they are hers, if she can pay. She can, the girl said. Sir Jorah barked a command, and the trade goods were brought forward. Six bales of tiger skins, three hundred bolts of fine silk, jars of saffron, jars of myrrh, jars of pepper and curry and cardamom, an onyx mask, twelve jade monkeys, casks of ink in red and black and green, a box of rare black amethysts, a box of pearls, a cask of pitted olives stuffed with maggots, a dozen casks of pickled cave fish, a great brass gong and a hammer to beat it with, seventeen ivory eyes, and a huge chest full of books written in tongues that Dany could not read, and more and more and more. Her people stacked it all before the slavers. While the payment was being made, Krasnis Monoklaus favored her with a few final words on the handling of her troops. They are green as yet, he said to Miss Andy. Tell the whore of Westeros she would be wise to blood them early. There are many small cities between here and there, cities ripe for sacking. Whatever plunder she takes will be hers alone, and so they'd have no lust for gold or gems. And should she take captives, a few guards will suffice to march them back to Astapor. We'll buy the healthy ones, and for a good price. And who knows, in ten years, some of the boys she sends us may be unsullied in their turn. Thus all shall prosper. Finally, there were no more trade goods to add to the pile. Her Dothraki mounted their horses once more, and Dany said, This was all we could carry. The rest awaits you on the ships, a great quantity of amber and wine and black rice. And you have the ships themselves. So all that remains is... The dragon, finished the Grazdan, with a spiked beard, who spoke the common tongue so thickly. And here he waits. Sir Jorah and Belwas walked beside her to the litter, where Drogon and his brothers lay basking in the sun. Jicky unfastened one end of the chain and handed it down to her. When she gave a yank, the black dragon raised his head, hissing, and unfolded wings of night and scarlet. Krasnus Monaklaus smiled broadly as their shadow fell across him. Dany handed the slaver the end of Drogon's chain. In return, he presented her with a whip. The handle was black dragonbone, elaborately carved and inlaid with gold. Nine long, thin leather lashes trailed from it, each one tipped by a gilded claw. The gold pommel was a woman's head with pointed ivory teeth. The harpy's fingers, Krasnus named the scourge. Dany turned the whip in her hand. Such a light thing, to bear such weight. Is it done, then? Do they belong to me? It is done, he agreed, giving the chain a sharp pull to bring Drogon down from the litter. Dany mounted her silver. She could feel her heart thumping in her chest. She felt desperately afraid. Was this what my brother would have done? She wondered if Prince Rhaegar had been this anxious when he saw the usurper's host formed up across the trident with all their banners floating on the wind. She stood in her stirrups and raised the harpy's fingers above her head for all the unsullied to see. "'It is done!' she cried at the top of her lungs. "'You are mine!' She gave the mare her heels and galloped along the first rank, holding the fingers high. "'You are the dragons now! You're bought and paid for! It is done! It is done!' She glimpsed old Grazdan turn his grey head sharply. He hears me speak Valyrian. The other slavers were not listening. They crowded around Krasnus and the dragon, shouting advice. Though the Astapori yanked and tugged, Drogon would not budge off the litter. Smoke rose grey from his open jaws, and his long neck curled and straightened as he snapped at the slaver's face. It is time to cross the trident, Dany thought, as she wheeled and rode her silver back. Her blood riders moved in close around her. "'You are in difficulty,' she observed. "'He will not come,' Krasner said. "'There is a reason. "'A dragon is no slave.' "'And then he swept the lash down as hard as he could across the slaver's face. "'Krasner screamed and staggered back, "'the blood running red down his cheeks into his perfumed beard. "'The harpy's fingers had torn his features half to pieces with one slash, "'but she did not pause to contemplate the ruin. "'Trogon!' she sang out loudly, sweetly, all her fear forgotten. Dracarys! The black dragon spread his wings and roared. A lance of swirling dark flame took Krasnus full in the face. 
His eyes melted and ran down his cheeks, and the oil in his hair and beard burst so fiercely into fire that for an instant the slaver wore a burning crown twice as tall as his head. The sudden stench of charred meat overwhelmed even his perfume, and his wail seemed to drown all other sound. Then the plaza of punishment blew apart into blood and chaos. The good masters were shrieking, stumbling, shoving one another aside, and tripping over the fringes of their tow-cars in their haste. Drogon flew almost lazily at Krosnus, black wings beating. As he gave the slaver another taste of fire, Eri and Jicky unchained Viserion and Regal, and suddenly there were three dragons in the air. When Dany turned to look, a third of Astapor's proud demon-horned warriors were fighting to stay atop their terrified mounts, and another third were fleeing in a bright blaze of shiny copper. One man kept his saddle long enough to draw a sword, but Jogo's whip coiled about his neck and cut off his shout. Another lost a hand to Rakaro's Arak, and rode off reeling and spurting blood. Ago sat calmly notching arrows to his bowstring and sending them at Tokars. Silver, gold, or plain, he cared nothing for the fringe. Strong Belwas had his Arak out as well, and he spun it as he charged. Spears! Then he heard one Astapori shout. It was Grazdan, old Grazdan, and his Tokar heavy with pearls. Unsullied! Defend us! Stop them! Defend your masters! Spears! Swords! When Rakaro put an arrow through his mouth, the slaves holding his sedan chair broke and ran, dumping him unceremoniously on the ground. The old man crawled to the first rank of eunuchs, his blood pooling on the bricks. The unsullied did not so much as look down to watch him die. Rank on rank on rank they stood and did not move. The gods have heard my prayer. Unsullied! Dany galloped before them, her silver-gold braid flying behind her, her bell chiming with every stride. Slay the good masters! Slay the soldiers! Slay every man who wears a tokar or holds a whip! But harm no child under twelve, and strike the chains off every slave you see! She raised the harpy's fingers in the air, and then she flung the scourge aside. Freedom! she sang out. Dracarys! 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 they shouted back, the sweetest word she'd ever heard. Dracarys! Dracarys! And all around them slavers ran and sobbed and begged and died, and the dusty air was filled with spears and fire. Sansa On the morning her new gown was to be ready, the serving girls filled Sansa's tub with steaming hot water and scrubbed her head to toe until she glowed pink. Circe's own bedmaid trimmed her nails and brushed and curled her auburn hair, so it fell down her back in soft ringlets. She brought a dozen of the queen's favorite scents as well. Santa chose a sharp, sweet fragrance with a hint of lemon in it under the smell of flowers. The maid dabbed some on her finger and touched Sansa behind each ear, and under her chin, and then lightly on her nipples. Circe herself arrived with a seamstress and watched as they dressed Sansa in her new clothes. The small clothes were all silk, but the gown itself was ivory samite and cloth of silver, and lined with silvery satin. The points of the long, dagged sleeves almost touched the ground when she lowered her arms. And it was a woman's gown, not a little girl's. There was no doubt of that. The bodice was slashed in front almost to her belly. The deep V covered over with a panel of ornate, mirish lace in dove gray. The skirts were long and full, the waist so tight that Sansa had to hold her breath as they laced her into it. They brought her new shoes as well, slippers of soft gray doe skin that hugged her feet like lovers. "'You are very beautiful, my lady,' the seamstress said when she was dressed. "'I am, aren't I?' Sansa giggled, and spun, her skirts swirling around her. "'Oh, I am!' She could not wait for Willis to see her like this. "'He will love me, he will, he must.' He will forget Winterfell when he sees me. I'll see that he does. Queen Cersei studied her critically. A few gems, I think. The moonstones Joffrey gave her. That once, Your Grace, her maid replied. When the moonstones hung from Sansa's ears and about her neck, the queen nodded. Yes. The gods have been kind to you, Sansa. You are a lovely girl. It seems almost obscene to squander such sweet innocence on that gargoyle. What gargoyle? Sansa did not understand. Did she mean Willis? How could she know? No one knew but her and Marguerite and the Queen of Thorns. Oh, and Dantos, but he didn't count. Cersei Lannister ignored the question. 
The cloak, she commanded, and the women brought it up. A long cloak of white velvet, heavy with pearls. A fierce direwolf was embroidered upon it in silver thread. Sansa looked at it with sudden dread. "'Your father's colours,' said Circe, as they fastened it about her neck with a slender silver chain. "'A maiden's cloak.' Sansa's hand went to her throat. She would have torn the thing away if she had dared. "'You're prettier with your mouth closed, Sansa,' Circe told her. "'Come along now. The septon is waiting, and the wedding guests as well.' "'No,' Sansa blurted. "'No!' "'Yes. You are a ward of the crown. The king stands in your father's place, since your brother is an attainted traitor. That means he has every right to dispose of your hand. You are to marry my brother Tyrion.' "'My claim,' she thought, sickened. Dantos the fool was not so foolish after all. He had seen the truth of it. Sansa backed away from the queen. "'I won't. I'm to marry Willis. I'm to be the Lady of Highgarden. Please—' I understand your reluctance. Cry if you must. In your place I would likely rip my hair out. He's a loathsome little imp, no doubt of it, but marry him you shall. You can't make me. Of course we can. You may come along quietly and say your vows as befits a lady, or you may struggle and scream and make a spectacle for the stable boys to titter over. But you will end up wedded and bedded all the same. The queen opened the door. Sir Merrin Trant and Sir Osmond Kettleblack were waiting without, in the white scale armour of the King's Guard. Escort Lady Sansa to the sept, she told them. Carry her if you must, but try not to tear the gown. It was very costly. Sansa tried to run, but Circe's handmaid caught her before she'd gone a yard. Sir Merrin Trant gave her a look that made her cringe, but Kettleblack touched her almost gently and said, Do as you're told, sweetling. It won't be so bad. Wolves are supposed to be brave, aren't they? Brave. Santa took a deep breath. I am a Stark. Yes, I can be brave. They were all looking at her the way they had looked at her that day in the yard when Sir Boris Blount had torn her clothes off. It had been the imp who saved her from a beating that day, the same man who was waiting for her now. He is not so bad as the rest of them, she told herself. I'll go. Circe smiled. I knew you would. Afterward, she could not remember leaving the room or descending the steps or crossing the yard. It seemed to take all her attention just to put one foot down in front of the other. Sir Merrin and Sir Osmond walked beside her, in cloaks as pale as her own, lacking only the pearls and the direwolf that had been her father's. Joffrey himself was waiting for her on the steps of the castle sept. The king was resplendent in crimson and gold, his crown on his head. "'I'm your father today,' he announced. "'You're not,' she flared. "'You'll never be.' His face darkened. "'I am! I'm your father, and I can marry you to whoever I like. To anyone. You'll marry the pig-boy, if I say so, and bed down with him in the sty.' His green eyes glittered with amusement. "'Or maybe I should give you to Ellen Payne. Would you like him better?' Her heart lurched. "'Please, Your Grace.' she begged. If you ever loved me even a little bit, don't make me marry your— Uncle! Tyrion Lannister stepped through the doors of the sept. Your grace, he said to Joffrey, grant me a moment alone with Lady Sansa, if you would be so kind. The king was about to refuse, but his mother gave him a sharp look. They drew off a few feet. Tyrion wore a doublet of black velvet covered with golden scrollwork, thigh-high boots that added three inches to his height, a chain of rubies and lion's heads. But the gash across his face was raw and red, and his nose was a hideous scab. "'You are very beautiful, Sansa,' he told her. "'It is good of you to say so, my lord.' She did not know what else to say. Should I tell him he is handsome? He'll think me a fool or a liar. She lowered her gaze and held her tongue. "'My lady, this is no way to bring you to your wedding.' I am sorry for that, and for making this so sudden and so secret. My lord father felt it necessary, for reasons of state. Else I would have come to you sooner, as I wished. He waddled closer. You did not ask for this marriage, I know, no more than I did. If I had refused you, however, they would have wed you to my cousin Lancel. 
Perhaps you would prefer that. He is nearer your age and fairer to look upon. If that is your wish, say so, and I will end this farce. I don't want any Lannister, she wanted to say. I want Willis, I want Highgarden and the puppies in the barge, and sons named Eddard and Bran and Rickon. But then she remembered what Dantos had told her in the godswood. Tyrell or Lannister, it makes no matter. It's not me they want, only my claim. You are kind, my lord, she said, defeated. I am a ward of the throne, and my duty is to marry as the king commands. He studied her with his mismatched eyes. I know I am not the sort of husband young girls dream of, Sansa, he said softly, but neither am I Joffrey. No, she said. You were kind to me. I remember. Tyrion offered her a thick, blunt-fingered hand. Come, then. Let us do our duty. So she put her hand in his, and he led her to the marriage altar, where the septon waited between the mother and the father to join their lives together. She saw Dantos in his fool's motley, looking at her with big round eyes. Sir Balan Swan and Sir Boros Blount were there in Kingsguard White, but not Sir Loras. None of the Tyrells are here, she realized suddenly. But there were other witnesses aplenty, the eunuch Varys, Sir Adam Marbrand, Lord Philip Foote, Sir Bronn, Jalabar Cho, a dozen others. Lord Giles was coughing, Lady Amasand was at the breast, and Lady Tonda's pregnant daughter was sobbing for no apparent reason. Let her sob, Sansa thought. Perhaps I shall do the same before this day is done. The ceremony passed as in a dream. Sansa did all that was required of her. There were prayers and vows and singing and tall candles burning, a hundred dancing lights, that the tears in her eyes transformed into a thousand. Thankfully no one seemed to notice that she was crying as she stood there, wrapped in her father's colors, or if they did, they pretended not to. In what seemed no time at all, they came to the changing of the cloaks. As father of the realm, Joffrey took the place of Lord Eddard Stark. Sansa stood stiff as a lance as his hands came over her shoulders to fumble with the clasp of her cloak. One of them brushed her breast and lingered to give it a little squeeze. Then the clasp opened, and Joff swept her maiden's cloak away with a kingly flourish and a grin. His uncle's part went less well. The bride's cloak he held was huge and heavy, crimson velvet richly worked with lions and bordered with gold satin and rubies. No one had thought to bring a stool, however, and Tyrion stood a foot and a half shorter than his bride. As he moved behind her, Sansa felt a sharp tug on her skirt. He wants me to kneel, she realized, blushing. She was mortified. It was not supposed to be this way. She had dreamed of her wedding a thousand times, and always she had pictured how her betrothed would stand behind her, tall and strong, sweep the cloak of his protection over her shoulders, and tenderly kiss her cheek as he leaned forward to fasten the clasp. She felt another tug at her skirt, more insistent. I won't. Why should I spare his feelings? when no one cares about mine. The dwarf tugged at her a third time. Stubbornly she pressed her lips together and pretended not to notice. Someone behind them tittered. The queen, she thought, but it didn't matter. They were all laughing by then, Joffrey the loudest. Don't toss down on your hands and knees, the king commanded. My uncle needs a boost to climb his bride. And so it was that her lord husband cloaked her in the colors of House Lannister whilst standing on the back of a fool. When Sansa turned, the little man was gazing up at her, his mouth tight, his face as red as her cloak. Suddenly she was ashamed of her stubbornness. She smoothed her skirts and knelt in front of him, so their heads were on the same level. With this kiss I pledge my love, and take you for my lord and husband. With this kiss I pledge my love, the dwarf replied hoarsely and take you for my lady and wife. He leaned forward, and their lips touched briefly. He is so ugly, Sansa thought, when his face was close to hers. He is even uglier than the hound. The septon raised his crystal high, so the rainbow light fell down upon them. Here in the sight of gods and men, he said, I do solemnly proclaim Tyrion of House Lannister, 
and Sansa of Halstock, to be man and wife, one flesh, one heart, one soul, now and forever, and cursed be the one who comes between them. She had to bite her lip to keep from sobbing. The wedding feast was held in the small hall. There were perhaps fifty guests, Lannister retainers and allies for the most part, joining those who had been at the wedding. And here Sansa found the Tyrells. Marguerite gave her such a sad look, and when the Queen of Thorns tottered in between left and right, she never looked at her at all. Eleanor, Alla, and Mega seemed determined not to know her. My friends, Sansa thought bitterly. Her husband drank heavily and ate but little. He listened whenever someone rose to make a toast and sometimes nodded a curt acknowledgment, but otherwise his face might have been made of stone. The feast seemed to go on forever, though Sansa tasted none of the food. She wanted it to be done, and yet she dreaded its end. For after the feast would come the bedding. The men would carry her up to her wedding bed, undressing her on the way and making rude jokes about the fate that awaited her between the sheets, while the women did Tyrion the same honors. Only after they had been bundled naked into bed would they be left alone, and even then the guests would stand outside the bridal chamber, shouting ribald suggestions through the door. The bedding had seemed wonderfully wicked and exciting when Sansa was a girl, but now that the moment was upon her she felt only dread. She did not think she could bear for them to rip off her clothes, and she was certain she would burst into tears at the first randy jape. When the musicians began to play, she timidly laid her hand on Tyrion's and said, My lord, should we lead the dance? His mouth twisted. I think we have already given them sufficient amusement for one day, don't you? As you say, my lord. She pulled her hand back. Joffrey and Marguerite led in their place. How can a monster dance so beautifully? Sansa wondered. She had often daydreamed of how she would dance at her wedding, with every eye upon her and a handsome lord. In her dreams they had all been smiling. Not even my husband is smiling. Other guests soon joined the king and his betrothed on the floor. Eleanor danced with her young squire, and Mega with Prince Tommen. Lady Merriweather, the mirish beauty with the black hair and the big dark eyes, spun so provocatively that every man in the hall was soon watching her. Lord and Lady Tyrell moved more sedately. Sir Kevin Lannister begged the honor of Lady Janna Fossaway, Lord Tyrell's sister. Mary Crane took the floor with the exile Prince Jalabar Show, gorgeous in his feathered finery. Cersei Lannister partnered first Lord Redwine, then Lord Rowan, and finally her own father, who danced with smooth, unsmiling grace. Sansa sat with her hands in her lap, watching how the queen moved and laughed and tossed her blonde curls. She charms them all, she thought dully. How I hate her. She looked away to where Moonboy danced with Dantos. Lady Sansa, Sir Garland Tyrell stood beside the dais. Would you honor me, if your lord consents? The imp's mismatched eyes narrowed. My lady can dance with whomever she pleases. Perhaps she ought to have remained beside her husband, but she wanted to dance so badly. And Sir Garland was brother to Marguerite, to Willis, to her knight of flowers. I see why they name you Garland the Gallant, sir, she said as she took his hand. My lady is gracious to say so. My brother Willis gave me that name, as it happens, to protect me. To protect you. She gave him a puzzled look. Sir Garland laughed. I was a plump little boy, I fear, and we do have an uncle called Garth the Gross. So Willis struck first, though not before threatening me with Garland the Greensick, Garland the Galling, and Garland the Gargoyle. It was so sweet and silly that Sansa had to laugh, despite everything. Afterward she was absurdly grateful. Somehow the laughter made her hopeful again, if only for a little while. Smiling, she let the music take her, losing herself in the steps and the sound of flute and pipes and harp and the rhythm of the drum, and from time to time in Sir Garland's arms when the dance brought them together. "'My lady wife is most concerned for you,' he said quietly one such time. 
Lady Leonette is too sweet. Tell her I am well. A bride at her wedding should be more than well. His voice was not unkind. You seemed close to tears. Tears of joy, sir. Your eyes give the lie to your tongue. Sir Gawain turned her to her close to his side. My lady, I have seen how you look at my brother. Loras is valiant and handsome, and we all love him dearly. But your imp will make a better husband. He is a bigger man than he seems, I think. The music spun them apart before Sansa could think of a reply. It was Mace Tyrell opposite her, red-faced and sweaty, and then Lord Merriweather, and then Prince Tommen. "'I want to be married, too,' said the plump little princeling, who was all of nine. "'I'm taller than my uncle.' "'I know you are,' said Sansa, before the partners changed again. Sir Kevin told her she was beautiful. Jalabar Show said something she did not understand in the summer tongue, and Lord Redwine wished her many fat children and long years of joy. And then the dance brought her face to face with Joffrey. Sansa stiffened as his hand touched hers, but the king tightened his grip and drew her closer. You shouldn't look so sad. My uncle's an ugly little thing, but you'll still have me. You are to marry Margery. A king can have other women. Whores. My father did. One of the Aegons did, too. The third one, or the fourth. He had lots of whores and lots of bastards. As they whirled to the music, Joff gave her a moist kiss. My uncle will bring you to my bed whenever I command it. Sansa shook her head. He won't. He will, or I'll have his head. That King Aegon, he had any woman he wanted, whether they were married or no. Thankfully, it was time to change again. Her legs had turned to wood, though, and Lord Rowan, Sir Talad, and Eleanor, Squire, all must have thought her a very clumsy dancer. And then she was back with Sir Garlin once more, and soon, blessedly, the dance was over. Her relief was short-lived. No sooner had the music died than she heard Joffrey say, "'It's time to bed, them. Let's get the clothes off her and have a look at what those she-wolves got to give my uncle.' Other men took up the cry loudly. Her dwarf husband lifted his eyes slowly from his wine-cup. "'I'll have no bedding.' Joffrey seized Sansa's arm. "'You will, if I command it!' The imp slammed his dagger down on the table, where it stood quivering. "'Then you'll service your own bride with a wooden prick. I'll gild you, I swear it!' A shocked silence fell. Sansa pulled away from Joffrey, but he had a grip on her, and her sleeve ripped. No one even seemed to hear. Queen Cersei turned to her father. "'Did you hear him?' Lord Tywin rose from his seat. I believe we can dispense with the bedding. Tyrion, I am certain you did not mean to threaten the king's royal person. Sansa saw a spasm of rage pass across her husband's face. I misspoke, he said. It was a bad jape, sire. You threatened to geld me, Joffrey said shrilly. I did, your grace, said Tyrion but only because I envied your royal manhood. My own is so small and stunted. His face twisted into a leer. And if you take my tongue, you will leave me no way at all to pleasure this sweet wife you gave me. Laughter burst from the lips of Sir Osmond Kettleblack. Someone else sniggered, but Joff did not laugh, nor Lord Tywin. Your grace, he said, my son is drunk, you can see that. I am the imp confessed, but not so drunk that I cannot attend to my own bedding. He hopped down from the dais and grabbed Sansa roughly. Come, wife, time to smash your portcullis. I want to play come into the castle. Red-faced, Sansa went with him from the small hall. What choice do I have? Tyrion waddled when he walked, especially when he walked as quickly as he did now. The gods were merciful, and neither Joffrey nor any of the others moved to follow. Before their wedding night, they had been granted the use of an airy bedchamber, high in the Tower of the Hand. Tyrion kicked the door shut behind them. There is a flagon of good arbor gold on the sideboard, Sansa. Will you be so kind as to pour me a cup? Is that wise, my lord? Nothing was ever wiser. I am not truly drunk, you see. But I mean to be. Sansa filled a goblet for each of them. It will be easier if I am drunk as well. 
She sat on the edge of the great curtained bed and drained half her cup in three long swallows. No doubt it was very fine wine, but she was too nervous to taste it. It made her head swim. Would you have me undress, my lord? Tyrion, he cocked his head. My name is Tyrion, Sansa. Tyrion, my lord. Should I take off my gown, or do you want to undress me? She took another swallow of wine. The imp turned away from her. The first time I wed, there was us and a drunken septon, and some pigs to bear witness. We ate one of our witnesses at our wedding feast. Tysha fed me crackling, and I licked the grease off her fingers, and we were laughing when we fell into bed. You were wed before? I, I had forgotten. You did not forget. You never knew. Who was she, my lord? Sansa was curious to spite herself. Lady Tysha. His mouth twisted. Of House Silverfist. Their arms have one gold coin and a hundred silver upon a bloody sheet. Ours was a very short marriage, as befits a very short man, I suppose. Sansa stared down at her hands and said nothing. How old are you, Sansa? asked Tyrion after a moment. Thirteen, she said, when the moon turns. Gods have mercy. The dwarf took another swallow of wine. Well, talk won't make you older. Shall we get on with this, my lady, if it please you? It will please me to please my lord husband. That seemed to anger him. You hide behind courtesy as if it were a castle wall. Courtesy is a lady's armor, Sansa said. Her scepter had always told her that. I am your husband. You can take off your armor now. And my clothing? That, too. He waved his wine cup at her. My lord father has commanded me to consummate this marriage. Her hands trembled as she began fumbling at her clothes. She had ten thumbs instead of fingers, and all of them were broken. Yet somehow she managed the laces and buttons, and her cloak and gown and girdle and undersilk slid to the floor, until finally she was stepping out of her small clothes. Goose prickles covered her arms and legs. She kept her eyes on the floor, too shy to look at him, but when she was done she glanced up and found him staring. There was hunger in his green eye, it seemed to her, and fury in the black. Santa did not know which scared her more. "'You're a child,' he said. She covered her breasts with her hands. "'I've flowered.' "'A child,' he repeated. "'But I want you.' Does that frighten you, Sansa? Yes. Me as well. I know I am ugly. No, my... He pushed himself to his feet. Don't lie, Sansa. I am malformed, scarred and small, but... She could see him groping. A bed, when the candles are blown out, I am made no worse than other men. In the dark, I am the knight of flowers. He took a draught of wine. I am generous. Loyal to those who are loyal to me. I have proven I'm no craven, and I am cleverer than most. Surely wits count for something. I can even be kind. Kindness is not a habit with us Lannisters, I fear, but I know I have some somewhere. I could be... I could be good to you. He is as frightened as I am, Sansa realized. Perhaps that should have made her feel more kindly toward him, but it did not. All she felt was pity. And pity was death to desire. He was looking at her, waiting for her to say something, but all her words had withered. She could only stand there, trembling. When he finally realized that she had no answer for him, Tyrion Lannister drained the last of his wine. "'I understand,' he said bitterly. "'Get in the bed, Sansa.' We need to do our duty. She climbed onto the feather bed, conscious of his stare. A scented beeswax candle burned on the bedside table, and rose petals had been strewn between the sheets. She had started to pull up a blanket to cover herself when she heard him say, No. The cold made her shiver, but she obeyed. Her eyes closed, and she waited. 
After a moment she heard the sound of her husband pulling off his boots and the rustle of clothing as he undressed himself. When he hopped up on the bed and put his hand on her breast, Sansa could not help but shudder. She lay with her eyes closed, every muscle tense, dreading what might come next. Would he touch her again? Kiss her? Should she open her legs for him now? She did not know what was expected of her. Sansa. The hand was gone. Open your eyes. She had promised to obey. She opened her eyes. He was sitting by her feet, naked. Where his legs joined, his man's staff poked up stiff and hard from a thicket of coarse yellow hair. But it was the only thing about him that was straight. My lady, Tyrion said, you are lovely, make no mistake, but I cannot do this. My father be damned. We will wait. The turn of a moon, a year, a season, however long it takes, until you have come to know me better. And perhaps to trust me a little. His smile might have been meant to be reassuring, but without a nose, it only made him look more grotesque and sinister. Look at him, Sansa told herself. Look at your husband, at all of him. Septa Mordain said all men are beautiful. Find his beauty, try. She stared at the stunted legs, the swollen, brutish brow, the green eye and the black one, the raw stump of his nose and crooked pink scar, the coarse tangle of black and gold hair that passed for his beard. Even his manhood was ugly, thick and veined, with a bulbous purple head. This is not right. This is not fair. How have I sinned that the gods would do this to me? How? On my honor as a Lannister, the imp said, I will not touch you until you want me to. It took all the courage that was in her to look in those mismatched eyes and say, And if I never want you to, my lord? His mouth jerked as if she had slapped him. Never? Her neck was so tight she could scarcely nod. Why, he said, that is why the gods made whores for imps like me. He closed his short, blunt fingers into a fist and climbed down off the bed. Arya Stony Sept was the biggest town Arya had seen since King's Landing, and Harwin said her father had won a famous battle here. The Mad King's men had been hunting Robert, trying to catch him before he could rejoin your father, he told her as they rode toward the gate. He was wounded, being tended by some friends, when Lord Conington the Hand took the town with a mighty force and started searching house by house. Before they could find him, though, Lord Eddard and your grandfather came down on the town and stormed the walls. Lord Conington fought back fierce. They battled in the streets and alleys, even on the rooftops, and all the septons rang their bells so the small folk would know to lock their doors. Robert came out of hiding to join the fight when the bells began to ring. He slew six men that day, they say. One was Miles Mouton, a famous knight who had been Prince Rhaegar's squire. He would have slain the hand, too, but the battle never brought them together. Connington wounded your grandfather Tully, sore, though, and killed Sir Dennis Arryn, the darling of the Vale. But when he saw the day was lost, he flew off as fast as the griffins on his shield. The Battle of the Bells, they called it after. Robert always said your father won it, not him. More recent battles have been fought here as well, Arya thought from the look of the place. The town gates were made of raw new wood. Outside the walls a pile of charred planks remained, to tell what had happened to the old ones. Stony Sept was closed up tight, but when the captain of the gate saw who they were, he opened a sally port for them. "'How are you fixed for food?' Tom asked as they entered. "'Not so bad as we were. The huntsmen brought in a flock of sheep, and there's been some trading across the Blackwater. The harvest wasn't burned south of the river.' Of course, there's plenty want to take what we got. Wolves one day, mummers the next. Them that's not looking for food are looking for plunder or women to rape, and them that's not out for gold or winches are looking for the bloody Kingslayer. Talk is, he slipped right through Lord Edmure's fingers. Lord Edmure? Len frowned. Is Lord Hoster dead, then? Dead or dying. Think Lannister might be making for the Blackwater? It's the quickest way to King's Landing, the huntsman swears. The captain did not wait for an answer. He took his dogs out for a sniff round. If Sir Jamie's hereabouts, they'll find him. 
I've seen them dogs rip bears apart. Think they'll like the taste of lion blood? A chewed-up corpse is no good to no one, said Lem. The huntsman bloody well knows that, too. When the westermen came through, they raped the huntsman's wife and sister, put his crops to the torch, ate half his sheep, and killed the other half for spite. Killed six dogs, too, and threw the carcasses down as well. A chewed-up corpse would be plenty good enough for him, I'd say. Me as well. He'd best not, said Lem. That's all I got to say. He'd best not, and you're a bloody fool. Arya rode between Harwin and Angie as the outlaws moved down the streets where her father once had fought. She could see the sept on its hill, and below it a stout, strong hold fast of grey stone that looked much too small for such a big town. But every third house they passed was a blackened shell, and she saw no people. Are all the town folk dead? Only shy, Angie pointed out two bowmen on a roof, and some boys with sooty faces crouched in the rubble of an alehouse. Farther on, a baker threw open a shuttered window and shouted down to Lem. The sound of his voice brought more people out of hiding, and Stony Sept slowly seemed to come to life around them. In the market square at the town's heart stood a fountain in the shape of a leaping trout, spouting water into a shallow pool. Women were filling pails and flagons there. A few feet away, a dozen iron cages hung from creaking wooden posts. Crow cages, Arya knew. The crows were mostly outside the cages, splashing in the water or perched atop the bars. Inside were men. Lem reined up, scowling. What's this now? Justice, answered a woman at the fountain. What, did you run short a hempen rope? Was this done at Sir Wilbert's decree? asked Tom. A man laughed bitterly. The lions killed Sir Wilbert a year ago. His sons are all off with the young wolf, getting fat in the west. You think they give a damn for the likes of us? It was the mad huntsman caught these wolves. Wolves, Arya went cold. Rob's men and my father's. She felt drawn toward the cages. The bars allowed so little room that prisoners could neither sit nor turn. They stood naked, exposed to sun and wind and rain. The first three cages held a dead men. Carrion crows had eaten out their eyes, yet the empty sockets seemed to follow her. The fourth man in the row stirred as she passed. Around his mouth his ragged beard was thick with blood and flies. They exploded when he spoke, buzzing around his head. What? The word was a croak. Please. What? The man in the next cage opened his eyes at the sound. Eh, yeah, he said. Eh, yeah, me. An old man he was, his beard was grey, and his scalp was bald and mottled brown with age. There was another dead man beyond the old one, a big red-bearded man, with a rotting grey bandage covering his left ear and part of his temple. But the worst thing was between his legs, where nothing remained but a crusted brown hole crawling with maggots. Farther down was a fat man. The crow cage was so cruelly narrow it was hard to see how they'd ever gotten him inside. The iron dug painfully into his belly, squeezing bulges out between the bars. Long days, baking in the sun, had burned him a painful red from head to heel. When he shifted his weight, his cage creaked and swayed, and Arya could see pale white stripes where the bars had shielded his flesh from the sun. "'Whose men were you?' she asked them. At the sound of her voice, the fat man opened his eyes. The skin around them was so red they looked like boiled eggs floating in a dish of blood. What, eh? A drink? Whose? She said again. Pay them no mind, boy, the townsman told her. They're none of your concern. Right on by. What did they do? She asked him. They put eight people to the sword at Tumbler's Falls, he said. They wanted the Kingslayer, but he wasn't there, so they did some rape and murder. He jerked a thumb toward the corpse with maggots where his manhood ought to be. That one there did the raping. Now move along. A swallow, the fat one called down. A mercy, boy, a swallow. The old one slid an arm up to grasp the bars. The motion made his cage swing violently. What a... gasped the one with the flies in his beard. She looked at their filthy hair and scraggly beards and reddened eyes, at their dry, cracked, bleeding lips. Wolves, she thought again, like me. 
Was this her pack? How could they be Rob's men? She wanted to hit them. She wanted to hurt them. She wanted to cry. They all seemed to be looking at her, the living and the dead alike. The old man had squeezed three fingers out between the bars. Water, he said. Water. Arya swung down from her horse. They can't hurt me. They're dying. She took her cup from her bedroll and went to the fountain. What do you think you're doing, boy? The townsman snapped. They're no concern of yours. She raised the cup to the fish's mouth. The water splashed across her fingers and down her sleeve, but Arya did not move until the cup was brimming over. When she turned back toward the cages, the townsman moved to stop her. You get away from them, boy! She's a girl, said Harwin. Leave her be. Aye, said Lem. Lord Beric don't hold with caging men to die of thirst. Why don't you hang them decent? There was nothing decent about them things they did at Tumblers Falls, the townsman growled right back at him. The bars were too narrow to pass a cup through, but Harwin and Gendry offered her a leg up. She planted a foot in Harwin's cupped hands, vaulted onto Gendry's shoulders, and grabbed the bars on top of the cage. The fat man turned his face up and pressed his cheek to the iron, and Arya poured the water over him. He sucked at it eagerly and let it run down over his head and cheeks and hands, and then he licked the dampness off the bars. He would have licked Arya's fingers if she hadn't snatched them back. By the time she served the other two the same, a crowd had gathered to watch her. "'The mad huntsman will hear this,' a man threatened. "'He won't like it. No, he won't. He'll like this even less, then.' Angie strung his longbow, slid an arrow from his quiver, knocked, drew, loosed. The fat man shuddered as the shaft drove up between his chins, but the cage would not let him fall. Two more arrows ended the other two northmen. The only sound in the market square was the splash of falling water and the buzzing of flies. Valar Morgulus, Arya thought. On the east side of the market square stood a modest inn with whitewashed walls and broken windows. Half its roof had burnt off recently, but the hole had been patched over. Above the door hung a wooden shingle, painted as a peach, with a big bite taken out of it. They dismounted at the stables, sitting catty-corner, and Greenbeard bellowed for grooms. The buxom red-haired innkeep howled with pleasure at the sight of them, then promptly set to tweaking them. Greenbeard, is it? Or Greybeard? Mother, take mercy, when did you get so old? Lem, is that you? Still wearing the same ratty cloak, are you? I know why you never wash it, I do. You're afraid all the piss will wash out and we'll see you are really a knight of the King's Guard. And Tom a sevens, you randy old goat! You come to see that son of yours? Well, you're too late. He's off riding with that bloody huntsman. And don't tell me he's not yours. He hasn't got my voice, Tom protested weakly. He's got your nose, though. I into other parts as well to hear the girls talk. She spied Gendry then and pinched him on the cheek. Look at this fine young ox. Wait till Alice sees those arms. so oh, and he blushes like a maid, too. Well, Alice will fix that for you, boy, see if she don't. Arya had never seen Jenry turn so red. Tansy, you leave the bull alone. He's a good lad, said Tom Sevenstrings. All we need from you is safe beds for a night. Speak for yourself, singer. Angie slid his arm around a strapping young serving girl as freckly as he was. Beds we got, said red-haired Tansy. There's never been no lack of beds at the Peach. But you'll all climb in a tub first. Last time you lot stayed under my roof, you left your fleas behind. She poked Greenbeard in the chest. And yours was green, too. You want food? If you can spare it, we won't say no, Tom conceded. Now, when did you ever say no to anything, Tom? The woman hooted. I'll roast some mutton for your friends and an old dry rat for you. It's more than you deserve, but if you gargle me a song or three, might be all weaken. I always pity the afflicted. Come on, come on, Cass. Lana, put some kettles on. Jizine, help me get the clothes off them. We'll need to boil those, too. She made good on all her threats. Arya tried to tell them that she'd been bathed twice at Acorn Hall, not a fortnight past. But the red-haired woman was having none of it. Two serving wenches carried her up the stairs bodily, arguing about whether she was a girl or a boy. The one called Helly won, so the other had to fetch the hot water and scrub Arya's back with a stiff, bristly brush that almost took her skin off. 
Then they stole all the clothes that Lady Smallwood had given her, and dressed her up like one of Sansa's dolls in linen and lace. But at least when they were done she got to go down and eat. As she sat in the common room in her stupid girl clothes, Arya remembered what Cyril Farrell had told her, the trick of looking and seeing what was there. When she looked, she saw more serving wenches than any inn could want, and most of them young and comely. And come even fall, lots of men started coming and going at the peach. They did not linger long in the common room, not even when Tom took out his wood harp and began to sing, Six Maids in a Pool. The wooden steps were old and steep and creaked something fierce whenever one of the men took a girl upstairs. I bet this is a brothel, she whispered to Gendry. You don't even know what a brothel is. I do so, she insisted. It's like an inn with girls. He was turning red again. What are you doing here, then? he demanded. A brothel's no fit place for no bloody high-born lady. Everybody knows that. One of the girls sat down on a bench beside him. Who's a high-born lady? The little skinny one? She looked at Arya and laughed. I'm a king's daughter myself. Arya knew she was being mocked. You are not. Well, I might be. When the girl shrugged, her gown slipped off one shoulder. They say King Robert fucked my mother when he hit here, back before the battle. Not that he didn't have all the other girls, too, but Leslin says he liked my ma the best. The girl did have hair like the old king's, Arya thought. A great thick mop of it, as black as coal. That doesn't mean anything, though. Gendry has the same kind of hair, too. Lots of people have black hair. I'm named Bella, the girl told Gendry, for the battle. I bet I could ring your bell, too. You want to? No, he said gruffly. I bet you do. She ran a hand along his arm. I don't cost nothing to friends of Thoros and the Lightning Lord. No, I said. Gendry rose abruptly and stalked away from the table, out into the night. Bella turned to Arya. Don't he like girls? Arya shrugged. He's just stupid. He likes to polish helmets and beat on swords with hammers. No. Oh. Bella tugged her gown back over her shoulder and went to talk with Jack B. Lucky. Before long she was sitting in his lap, giggling and drinking wine from his cup. Greenbeard had two girls, one on each knee. Angie had vanished with his freckle-faced wench, and Lynn was gone as well. Tom Sevenstrings sat by the fire, singing, The Maids That Bloom in Spring. Arya sipped at the cup of watered wine the red-haired woman had allowed her, listening. Across the square the dead men were rotting in their crow cages. But inside the peach everyone was jolly. Except it seemed to her that some of them were laughing too hard, somehow. It would have been a good time to sneak away and steal a horse, but Arya couldn't see how that would help her. She could only ride as far as the city gates. That captain would never let me pass, and if he did, Harwin would come after me, or that huntsman with his dogs. She wished she had her map, so she could see how far Stony Sept was from River Run. By the time her cup was empty, Arya was yawning. Gendry hadn't come back. Tom Sevenstrings was singing Two Hearts That Beat As One, and kissing a different girl at the end of every verse. In the corner by the window, Lem and Harwin sat talking to red-haired Tansy in low voices. "'Spent the night in Jamie's cell,' she heard the woman say. "'Her and this other wench, the one who slew Renly. All three of them together, and come the morn, Lady Caitlin cut him loose for love.' She gave a throaty chuckle. "'It's not true,' Arya thought. "'She never would.' She felt sad and angry and lonely all at once. An old man sat down beside her. "'Well, aren't you a pretty little peach?' His breath smelled near as foul as the dead men in the cages, and his little pig eyes were crawling up and down her. "'Does my sweet peach have a name?' For half a heartbeat she forgot who she was supposed to be. She wasn't any peach, but she couldn't be Arya Stark, either, not here with some smelly drunk she did not know. "'I'm—' "'She's my sister,' Jenry put a heavy hand on the old man's shoulder, and squeezed. "'Leave her be!' The man turned, spoiling for a quarrel, but when he saw Gendry's size, he thought better of it. "'Your sister is she. What kind of brother are you? I'd never bring no sister of mine to the peach that I wouldn't.' He got up from the bench and moved off muttering in search of a new friend. "'Why did you say that?' Arya hopped to her feet. "'You're not my brother.' "'That's right,' he said angrily. "'I'm too bloody low-born to be kin to my lady high.' Arya was taken aback by the fury in his voice. 
That's not the way I meant it. Yes, it is. He sat down on the bench, cradling a cup of wine between his hands. Go away. I want to drink this wine in peace. Then maybe I'll go find that black-haired girl and ring her bell for her. But I said go away, milady. Now you whirled and left him there. A stupid, bull-headed bastard boy, that's all he is. He could ring all the bells he wanted. It was nothing to her. Their sleeping room was at the top of the stairs, under the eaves. Maybe the peach had no lack of beds, but there was only one to spare for the likes of them. It was a big bed, though. It filled the whole room, just about, and the musty straw-stuffed mattress looked large enough for all of them. Just now, though, she had it to herself. Her real clothes were hanging from a peg on the wall— between Gendry's stuff and Lem's. Arya took off the linen and lace, pulled her tunic over her head, climbed up into the bed, and burrowed under the blankets. Queen Circe, she whispered into the pillow, King Joffrey, Sir Illyn, Sir Merrin, Dunson, Rath, and Tolliver, the Tickler, the Hound, and Sir Gregor the Mountain. She liked to mix up the order of the names sometimes, it helped her remember who they were and what they'd done. Maybe some of them are dead, she thought. Maybe they're in iron cages someplace, and the crows are picking out their eyes. Sleep came as quick as she closed her eyes. She dreamed of wolves that night, stalking through a wet wood with the smell of rain and rot and blood thick in the air. Only they were good smells in the dream, and Arya knew she had nothing to fear. She was strong and swift and fierce, and her pack was all around her, her brothers and her sisters. They ran down a frightened horse together, tore its throat out and feasted, and when the moon broke through the clouds, she threw back her head and howled. But when the day came, she woke to the barking of dogs. Arya sat up yawning. Jenry was stirring on her left, and Lem Lemon Cloak snoring loudly to her right. But the baying outside all but drowned him out. There must be half a hundred dogs out there. She crawled from under the blankets and hopped over Lem, Tom, and Jack Be Lucky to the window. When she opened the shutters wide, wind and wet and cold all came flooding in together. The day was gray and overcast. Down below in the square the dogs were barking, running in circles, growling and howling. There was a pack of them, great black mastiffs and lean wolfhounds and black and white sheep dogs, and kinds Arya did not know. Shaggy, brindled beasts with long yellow teeth. Between the inn and the fountain, a dozen riders sat astride their horses, watching the townsman open the fat man's cage and tug his arm until his swollen corpse spilled out onto the ground. The dogs were at him at once, tearing chunks of flesh off his bones. Arya heard one of the riders laugh. "'Here's your new castle, you bloody Lannister bastard,' he said. "'A little snug for the likes of you, but we'll squeeze you in, never fret.' Beside him a prisoner sat sullen, with coils of hempen rope tight around his wrists. Some of the townsmen were throwing dung at him, but he never flinched. "'You'll rot in them cages,' his captor was shouting. "'The crows will be picking out your eyes while we're spinning all that good Lannister gold of yours.' "'And when them crows are done, we'll send what's left of you to your bloody brother, though I doubt he'll know you.' The noise had woken half the peach. Gendry squeezed into the window beside Arya, and Tom stepped up behind them, naked as his name-day. "'What's all that bloody shouting?' Lem complained from bed. "'A man's trying to get some bloody sleep.' "'Where's Greenbeard?' Tom asked him. "'A bed with Tansy,' Lem said. "'Why?' "'Best find him. Archer, too. The mad huntsman's come back with another man for the cages.' "'Lannister,' said Arya. I heard him say Lannister. Have they caught the Kingslayer? Gendry wanted to know. Down in the square a thrown stone caught the captive on the cheek, turning his head. Not the Kingslayer, Arya thought, when she saw his face. The gods had heard her prayers after all. John. Ghost was gone when the wildlings led their horses from the cave. Did he understand about Castle Black? John took a breath of the crisp morning air and allowed himself to hope. The eastern sky was pink near the horizon and pale gray higher up. The sword of the morning still hung in the south, the bright white star in its hilt blazing like a diamond in the dawn, but the blacks and grays of the darkling forest were turning once again to greens and golds, reds and russets. 
and above the soldier pines and oaks and ash and sentinels stood the wall, the ice pale and glimmering beneath the dust and dirt that pocked its surface. The Magnar sent a dozen men riding west, and a dozen more east, to climb the highest hills they could find and watch for any sign of rangers in the wood or riders on the high ice. The Fens carried bronze-banded war-horns to give warning should the watch be sighted. The other wildlings fell in behind Jarl, John, and Ygritte with the rest. This was to be the young raider's hour of glory. The wall was often said to stand seven hundred feet high, but Jarl had found a place where it was both higher and lower. Before them the ice rose sheer from out of the trees like some immense cliff, crowned by wind-carved battlements that loomed at least eight hundred feet high, perhaps nine hundred in spots. But that was deceptive, John realized, as they drew closer. Brandon, the builder, had laid his huge foundation blocks along the heights wherever feasible, and hereabouts the hills rose wild and rugged. He had once heard his uncle Benjamin say that the wall was a sword east of Castle Black, but a snake to the west. It was true. Sweeping in over one huge humped hill, the ice dipped down into a valley, climbed the knife edge of a long granite ridge line for a league or more, ran along a jagged crest, dipped again into a valley deeper still, and then rose higher and higher, leaping from hill to hill as far as the eye could see, into the mountainous west. Jarl had chosen to assault the stretch of ice along the ridge. Here, though the top of the wall loomed eight hundred feet above the forest floor, a good third of that height was earth and stone rather than ice. The slope was too steep for their horses, almost as difficult a scramble as the fist of the first men, but still vastly easier to ascend than the sheer vertical face of the wall itself. And the ridge was densely wooded as well, offering easy concealment. Once brothers in black had gone out every day with axes to cut back the encroaching trees, but those days were long past, and here the forest grew right up to the ice. The day promised to be damp and cold, and damper and colder by the wall, beneath those tons of ice. The closer they got, the more the thens held back. I have never seen the wall before, not even the Magnar, John realized. It frightens them. In the Seven Kingdoms it was said that the wall marked the end of the world. That is true for them as well. It was all in where you stood. And where do I stand? John did not know. To stay with Ygritte he would need to become a wildling, heart and soul. If he abandoned her to return to his duty, the Magnar might cut her heart out. And if he took her with him, assuming she would go, which was far from certain, well, he could scarcely bring her back to Castle Black to live among the brothers. A deserter and a wildling could expect no welcome anywhere in the Seven Kingdoms. We could go look for Jendal's children, I suppose, though they'd be more like to eat us than to take us in. The wall did not awe Jarl's raiders, John saw. They have done this before, every man of them. Jarl called out names when they dismounted beneath the ridge, and eleven gathered round him. All were young. The oldest could not have been more than five and twenty, and two of the ten were younger than John. Every one was lean and hard, though. They had a look of sinewy strength that reminded him of Stone Snake, the brother the half-hand had sent off afoot when Rattleshirt was hunting them. In the very shadow of the wall the wildlings made ready, winding thick coils of hempen rope around one shoulder and down across their chests, and lacing on queer boots of supple doeskin. The boots had spikes jutting from the toes, iron for Jarl and two others, bronze for some, but most often jagged bone. Small stone-headed hammers hung from one hip, a leathern bag of stakes from the other, their ice axes were antlers with sharpened tines, bound to wooden hafts with strips of hide. The eleven climbers sorted themselves into three teams of four. Jarl himself made the twelfth man. Mance promises swords for every man of the first team to reach the top, he told them, his breath misting in the cold air. Southron swords of castle-forged steel. And your name in the song he'll make of this, that too. What more could a free man ask? Up! And the others take the hindmost. The others take them all, thought John, as he watched them scramble up the steep slope of the ridge and vanish beneath the trees. It would not be the first time wildlings had scaled the wall, not even the hundred and first. 
The patrols stumbled on climbers two or three times a year, and rangers sometimes came on the broken corpses of those who had fallen. Along the east coast, the raiders most often built boats to slip across the Bay of Seals. In the west, they would descend into the black depths of the gorge to make their way around the shadow tower. But in between, the only way to defeat the wall was to go over it, and many a raider had. Fewer come back, though, he thought with a certain grim pride. Climbers must of necessity leave their mounts behind, and many younger, greener raiders began by taking the first horses they found. Then a hue and cry would go up, ravens would fly, and as often as not, the night's watch would hunt them down and hang them before they could get back with their plunder and stolen women. Jarl would not make that mistake, John knew, but he wondered about Steer. The Magnar is a ruler, not a raider. He may not know how the game is played. There they are! He grit said, and John glanced up to see the first climber emerge above the treetops. It was Jarl. He had found a sentinel tree that leaned against the wall, and led his men up the trunk to get a quicker start. The woods should never have been allowed to creep so close. They're three hundred feet up, and they haven't touched the ice itself yet. He watched the wildling move carefully from wood to wall, hacking out a handhold with short, sharp blows of his ice axe, then swinging over. The rope around his waist tied him to the second man in line, still edging up the tree. Step by slow step, Jarl moved higher, kicking out toe-holds with his spiked boots when there were no natural ones to be found. When he was ten feet above the sentinel, he stopped upon a narrow icy ledge, slung his axe from his belt, took out his hammer, and drove an iron stake into a cleft. The second man moved on to the wall behind him, while the third was scrambling to the top of the tree. The other two teams had no happily placed trees to give them a leg up, and before long the Thens were wondering whether they had gotten lost climbing the ridge. Jarl's party were all on the wall and eighty feet up before the leading climbers from the other groups came into view. The teams were spaced a good twenty yards apart. Jarl's four were in the center. To the right of them was a team headed up by Grig the Goat, whose long blond braid made him easy to spot from below. To the left a very thin man named Eric led the climbers. "'So slow!' the Magnar complained loudly as he watched them edge their way upward. "'Has he forgotten the crows? He should climb faster before we are discovered!' John had to hold his tongue. He remembered the skirling pass all too well and the moonlight climb he'd made with Stone Snake. He had swallowed his heart a half-dozen times that night, and by the end his arms and legs had been aching and his fingers were half-frozen. And that was stone, not ice. Stone was solid. Ice was treacherous stuff at the best of times, and on a day like this, when the wall was weeping, the warmth of a climber's hand might be enough to melt it. The huge blocks could be frozen rock-hard inside, but their outer surface would be slick, with runnels of water trickling down and patches of rotten ice where the air had gotten in. Whatever else the wildlings are, they're brave. All the same, John found himself hoping that Steer's fears proved well-founded. If the gods are good, a patrol will chance by and put an end to this. No wall can keep you safe, his father had told him once, as they walked the walls of Winterfell. A wall is only as strong as the men who defend it. The wildlings might have a hundred and twenty men, but four defenders would be enough to see them off, with a few well-placed arrows and perhaps a pail of stones. No defenders appeared, however. Not four, not even one. The sun climbed the sky, and the wildlings climbed the wall. Jarl's four remained well ahead till noon, when they hit a pitch of bad ice. Jarl had looped his rope around a wind-carved pinnace, and was using it to support his weight, when the whole jagged thing suddenly crumbled and came crashing down, and him with it. Chunks of ice as big as a man's head bombarded the three below, but they clung to the handholds, and the stakes held, and Jarl jerked to a sudden halt at the end of the rope. By the time his team had recovered from that mischance, Grig the goat had almost drawn even with them. Eric's four remained well behind. The face where they were climbing looked smooth and unpitted, covered with a sheet of ice melt that glistened wetly where the sun brushed it. Grig's section was darker to the eye, with more obvious features, long horizontal ledges where a block had been imperfectly positioned atop the block below, cracks and crevices, even chimneys along the vertical joins, where wind and water had eaten holes large enough for a man to hide in. Jarl soon had his men edging upward again. His four and Griggs moved almost side by side, with Eric's fifty feet below. 
deer-horn axes chopped and hacked, sending showers of glittery shards cascading down onto the trees. Stone hammers pounded stakes deep into the ice to serve as anchors for the ropes. The iron stakes ran out before they were halfway up, and after that the climbers used horn and sharpened bone. And the men kicked, driving the spikes on their boots against the hard, unyielding ice again and again and again and again to make one foothold. Their legs must be numb, John thought, by the fourth hour. How long can they keep on with that? He watched as restless as the magnar, listening for the distant moan of a thin war horn. But the horns stayed silent, and there was no sign of a night's watch. By the sixth hour, Jarl had moved ahead of Grig the goat again, and his men were widening the gap. The manse's pet must want a sword, the magnar said, shading his eyes. The sun was high in the sky, and the upper third of the wall was a crystalline blue from below, reflecting so brilliantly that it hurt the eyes to look on it. Jarl's four and Griggs were all but lost in the glare, though Eric's team was still in shadow. Instead of moving upward, they were edging their way sideways at about five hundred feet, making for a chimney. John was watching them inch along when he heard the sound, a sudden crack that seemed to roll along the ice, followed by a shout of alarm. And then the air was full of shards and shrieks and falling men, as a sheet of ice, a foot thick and fifty feet square, broke off from the wall and came tumbling, crumbling, rumbling, sweeping all before it. Even down at the foot of the ridge, some chunks came spinning through the trees and rolling down the slope. John grabbed Egrit and pulled her down to shield her, and one of the thens was struck in the face by a chunk that broke his nose. And when they looked up, Jarl and his team were gone. Men, ropes, stakes, all gone. Nothing remained above six hundred feet. There was a wound in the wall where the climbers had clung half a heartbeat before, the ice within as smooth and white as polished marble and shining in the sun. Far, far below there was a faint red smear where someone had smashed against a frozen pinnace. The wall defends itself, John thought as he pulled Egrit back to her feet. They found Jarl in a tree, impaled upon a splintered branch and still roped to the three men who lay broken beneath him. One was still alive, but his legs and spine were shattered, and most of his ribs as well. Mercy, he said when they came upon him. One of the thens smashed his head in with a big stone mace. The magnar gave orders, and his men began to gather fuel for a pyre. The dead were burning when Grig the goat reached the top of the wall. By the time Eric's four had joined them, nothing remained of Jarl and his team but bone and ash. The sun had begun to sink by then, so the climbers wasted little time. They unwound the long coils of hemp they'd had looped around their chests, tied them all together, and tossed down one end. The thought of trying to climb five hundred feet up that rope filled John with dread. But Mance had planned better than that. The raider's jarl had left below, uncasked a huge ladder, with rungs of woven hemp as thick as a man's arm, and tied it to the climber's rope. Eric and Grig and their men grunted and heaved, pulled it up, staked it to the top, then lowered the rope again to haul up a second ladder. There were five altogether. When all of them were in place, the magnar shouted a brusque command in the old tongue, and five of his thens started up together. Even with the ladders it was no easy climb. Egrit watched them struggle for a while. "'I hate this wall,' she said in a low, angry voice. "'Can you feel how cold it is?' "'It's made of ice,' John pointed out. You know nothing, John Snow. This wall is made of blood. Nor had it drunk its fill. By sunset two of the Thens had fallen from the ladder to their deaths, but they were the last. It was near midnight before John reached the top. The stars were out again, and Egrit was trembling from the climb. I almost fell, she said with tears in her eyes. Twice, thrice. The wall was trying to shake me off. I could feel it. One of the tears broke free and trickled slowly down her cheek. The worst is behind us, John tried to sound confident. Don't be frightened. He tried to put an arm around her. Egrit slammed the heel of her hand into his chest so hard it stung even through his layers of wool, mail, and boiled leather. I wasn't frightened. You know nothing, John Snow. Why are you crying, then? Not for fear. She kicked savagely at the ice beneath her with a heel, chopping out a chunk. I'm crying because we never found the horn of winter. We opened half a hundred graves and let all those shades loose in the world, and never found the horn of Joramund to bring this cold thing down. Jamie. His hand burned. 
Still, still, long after they had snuffed out the torch they'd used to sear his bloody stump, days after he could still feel the fire lancing up his arm, and his fingers twisting in the flames, the fingers he no longer had. He had taken wounds before, but never like this. He had never known there could be such pain. Sometimes, unbidden, old prayers bubbled from his lips. Prayers he learned as a child and never thought of since. Prayers he had first prayed with Circe kneeling beside him in the sept at Casterly Rock. Sometimes he even wept until he heard the mummers laughing. Then he made his eyes go dry and his heart go dead, and prayed for his fever to burn away his tears. Now I know how Tyrion has felt all those times they laughed at him. After the second time he fell from the saddle, they bound him tight to Brienne of Tarth and made them share a horse again. One day, instead of back to front, they bound them face to face. The lovers, Shagwell sighed loudly, and what a lovely sight they are. T'would be cruel to separate the good knight and his lady. Then he laughed that high, shrill laugh of his and said, Ah, but which one is the knight, and which one is the lady? If I had my hand, you'd learn that soon enough, Jamie thought. His arms ached and his legs were numb from the ropes, but after a while none of that mattered. His world shrunk to the throb of agony that was his phantom hand, and Brienne pressed against him. She's warm, at least, he consoled himself, though the wench's breath was as foul as his own. His hand was always between them. Erswick had hung it about his neck on a cord, so it dangled down against his chest, slapping Brienne's breasts as Jamie slipped in and out of consciousness. His right eye was swollen shut, the wound inflamed where Brienne had cut him during their fight. But it was his hand that hurt the most. Blood and pus seeped from his stump, and the missing hand throbbed every time the horse took a step. His throat was so raw that he could not eat, but he drank wine when they gave it to him, and water when that was all they offered. Once they handed him a cup, and he quaffed it straight away, trembling, and the brave companions burst into laughter so loud and harsh it hurt his ears. "'That's horse-piss you're drinking, Kingslayer,' Rorg told him. Jamie was so thirsty he drank it anyway, but afterward he retched it all back up. They made Brienne wash the vomit out of his beard, just as they made her clean him up when he soiled himself in the saddle. One damp, cold morning, when he was feeling slightly stronger, a madness took hold of him, and he reached for the Dornishman's sword with his left hand and wrenched it clumsily from its scabbard. "'Let them kill me,' he thought, "'so long as I die fighting a blade in hand.' But it was no good. Shagwell came hopping from leg to leg, dancing nimbly aside when Jamie slashed at him. Unbalanced, he staggered forward, hacking wildly at the fool, but Shagwell spun and ducked and darted until all the mummers were laughing at Jamie's futile efforts to land a blow. When he tripped over a rock and stumbled to his knees, the fool leapt in and planted a wet kiss atop his head. Rorg finally flung him aside and kicked the sword from Jamie's feeble fingers as he tried to bring it up. "'That was the moving, King Slayer, said Varga Hoet. "'But if you try it again, I shall take your other hand, or perhaps a foot.' Jamie lay on his back afterward, staring at the night sky, trying not to feel the pain that snaked up his right arm every time he moved it. The night was strangely beautiful. The moon was a graceful crescent, and it seemed as though he had never seen so many stars. The king's crown was at the zenith, and he could see the stallion rearing, and there the swan. The moon maid, shy as ever, was half hidden behind a pine tree. "'How can such a night be beautiful?' he asked himself. "'Why would the stars want to look down on such as me?' "'Jamie,' Brienne whispered so faintly he thought he was dreaming it. "'Jamie, what are you doing?' "'Dying,' he whispered back. "'No!' She said, No, you must live. He wanted to laugh. Stop telling me what to do, wench. I'll die if it pleases me. Are you so craven? The word shocked him. He was Jamie Lannister, a knight of the Kingsguard. He was the Kingslayer. No man had ever called him craven. Other things they called him, yes. Oathbreaker, liar, murderer. They said he was cruel, treacherous, reckless, but never craven. What else can I? Do but die. Live, she said. Live and fight and take revenge. 
but she spoke too loudly. Rorg heard her voice, if not her words, and came over to kick her, shouting at her to hold her bloody tongue if she wanted to keep it. Craven, Jamie thought, as Brienne fought to stifle her moans. Can it be? They took my sword hand. Was that all I was, a sword hand? Gods be good, is it true? The wench had the right of it. He could not die. Circe was waiting for him. She would have need of him. And Tyrion, his little brother, who loved him for a lie. And his enemies were waiting, too. The young wolf who had beaten him in the Whispering Wood and killed his men around him. Edmure Tully, who had kept him in darkness in chains. These brave companions. When morning came, he made himself eat. They fed him a mush of oats, horse food, but he forced down every spoon. He ate again at evenfall, and the next day. Live, he told himself harshly, when the mush was like to gag him. Live for Circe. Live for Tyrion. Live for vengeance. A Lannister always pays his debts. His missing hand throbbed and burned and stank. When I reach King's Landing, I'll have a new hand forged, a golden hand, and one day I'll use it to rip out Vargo Howitt's throat. The days and the nights blurred together in a haze of pain. He would sleep in the saddle, pressed against Brienne, his nose full of the stink of his rotting hand, and then at night he would lie awake on the hard ground, caught in a waking nightmare. Weak as he was, they always bound him to a tree. It gave him some cold consolation to know that they feared him that much, even now. Brienne was always bound beside him. She lay there in her bonds like a big dead cow, saying not a word. The wench has built a fortress inside herself. They will rape her soon enough, but behind her walls they cannot touch her. But Jamie's walls were gone. They had taken his hand. They had taken his sword hand. And without it he was nothing. The other was no good to him. Since the time he could walk, his left arm had been his shield arm, no more. It was his right hand that made him a knight, his right arm that made him a man. One day he heard Erswick say something about Harrenhal, and remembered that was to be their destination. That made him laugh aloud, and that made Timion slash his face with a long, thin whip. The cut bled, but beside his hand he scarcely felt it. "'Why did you laugh?' the wench asked him that night in a whisper. "'Harrenhal was where they gave me the white cloak,' he whispered back. "'Wench, great tourney.' He wanted to show us all his big castle and his fine sons. I wanted to show them, too. I was only fifteen, but no one could have beaten me that day. Ares never let me joust. He laughed again. He sent me away. But now I'm coming back. They heard the laugh. That night it was Jamie who got the kicks and punches. He hardly felt them either, until Rorg slammed a boot into his stump, and then he fainted. It was the next night when they finally came, three of the worst, Shagwell, Noseless Rorg, and the fat Dothraki Zalo, the one who'd cut his hand off. Zalo and Rorg were arguing about who would go first as they approached. There seemed to be no question but that the fool would be going last. Shagwell suggested that they should both go first and take her front and rear. Zalo and Rorg liked that notion, only then they began to fight about who would get the front and who the rear. They will leave her a cripple, too, but inside, where it does not show. Wench, he whispered, as Zalo and Rorg were cursing one another, let them have the meat, and you go far away. It will be over quicker, and they'll get less pleasure from it. They'll get no pleasure from what I'll give them, she whispered back, defiant. Stupid, stubborn, brave bitch. She was going to get herself good and killed, he knew it. And what do I care if she does? If she hadn't been so pig-headed, I'd still have a hand. Yet he heard himself whisper, Let them do it and go away inside. That was what he'd done when the Starks had died before him, Lord Rickard cooking in his armor while his son Brandon strangled himself trying to save him. Think of Renly if you loved him. Think of Tarth, mountains and seas, pools, waterfalls, whatever you have on your sapphire isle. Think... But Rorg had won the argument by then. "'You're the ugliest woman I ever seen,' he told Brienne. "'But don't think I can't make you uglier.' 
You want a nose like mine? Fight me and you'll get one. And two eyes, that's too many. One scream out of you and I'll pop one out and make you eat it, and then I'll pull your fucking teeth out one by one. Oh, do it, Rog, pleaded Shagwell. Without her teeth, she'll look just like my dear old mother, he cackled. And I always wanted to fuck my dear old mother up the arse. Jamie chuckled. That's a funny fool. I have a riddle for you, Shagwell. Why do you care if she screams? Oh, wait, I know, he shouted. Sapphires! as loudly as he could. Cursing, Rorg kicked at his stump again. Jamie howled. I never knew there was such agony in the world, was the last thing he remembered thinking. It was hard to say how long he was gone, but when the pain spit him out, Erswick was there and Vargo Howard himself. This not to be touched, the goat screamed, spraying spittle all over Zalo. Thee hath to be a maid, you fool! This worth a bag of sapphires! And from then on, every night Howard put guards on them to protect them from his own. Two nights passed in silence before the winch finally found the courage to whisper, Jamie, why did you shout out? Why did I shout sapphires, you mean? Use your wits, wench. Would this lot have cared if I shouted rape? You did not need to shout at all. You're hard enough to look at with a nose. Besides, I wanted to make the goat say, Thaphireth. He chuckled. A good thing for you, I'm such a liar. An honorable man would have told the truth about the sapphire isle. All the same, she said, I thank you, sir. His hand was throbbing again. He ground his teeth and said, Our Lannister pays his debts. That was for the river and those rocks you dropped on Robin Riger. The goat wanted to make a show of parading him in, so Jamie was made to dismount a mile from the gates of Harrenhal. A rope was looped around his waist, a second around Brienne's wrists. The ends were tied to the pommel of Vargo Howitt's saddle. They stumbled along side by side behind the Corhorek's striped zorse. Jamie's rage kept him walking. The linen that covered the stump was gray and stinking with pus. His phantom fingers screamed with every step. I am stronger than they know, he told himself. I am still a Lannister. I am still a knight of the King's Guard. He would reach Harrenhal, and then King's Landing. He would live. And I will pay this debt with interest. As they approached the cliff-like walls of Black Harren's monstrous castle, Brienne squeezed his arm. Lord Bolton holds this castle. The Boltons are bannermen to the Starks. The Boltons skin their enemies. Jamie remembered that much about the Northmen. Tyrion would have known all there was to know about the Lord of the Dread Fort, but Tyrion was a thousand leagues away with Cersei. I cannot die while Cersei lives, he told himself. We will die together, as we were born together. The Castleton outside the walls had been burned to ash and blackened stone, and many men and horses had recently encamped beside the lake shore, where Lord Went had staged his great tourney in the year of the false spring. A bitter smile touched Jamie's lips as they crossed that torn ground. Someone had dug a privy trench in the very spot where he'd once knelt before the king to say his vows. I never dreamed how quick the sweet would turn to sour. Ares would not even let me savor that one night. He honored me, and then he spat on me. The banners, Brienne observed. Flayed man and twin towers, see? King Rob's sworn men. They're above the gatehouse, gray on white. They fly the dire wolf. Jamie twisted his head upward for a look. That's your bloody wolf, true enough, he granted her. And those are heads to either side of it. Soldiers, servants, and camp followers gathered to hoot at them. A spotted bitch followed them through the camps, barking and growling, until one of the Licini impaled her on a lance and galloped to the front of the column. "'I am bearing Kingslayer's banner!' he shouted, shaking the dead dog above Jamie's head. The walls of Harrenhal were so thick that passing beneath them was like passing through a stone tunnel. Vargo Hoad had sent two of his Dothraki ahead to inform Lord Bolton of their coming, so the outer ward was full of the curious. They gave way as Jamie staggered past, the rope around his waist jerking and pulling at him whenever he slowed. "'I give you the Kingslayer!' 
Vargo Hoat proclaimed in that thick, slobbery voice of his. A spear jabbed at the small of Jamie's back, sending him sprawling. Instinct made him put out his hands to stop his fall. When his stump smashed against the ground, the pain was blinding, yet somehow he managed to fight his way back to one knee. Before him, a flight of broad stone steps led up to the entrance of one of Harrenhal's colossal round towers. Five knights and a northman stood looking down on him, the one pale-eyed in woolen fur, the five fierce in mail and plate, with the twin towers sigil on their surcoats. "'A fury of phrase,' Jamie declared. "'Sir Danwell, Sir Anis, Sir Hostine!' He knew Lord Walder's sons by sight. His aunt had married one, after all. "'You have my condolences.' "'For what, sir?' Sir Danwell Frey asked. "'Your brother's son, Sir Cleos,' said Jamie. "'He was with us until outlaws filled him full of arrows. Erswick and this lot took his goods and left him for the wolves.' "'My lords!' Brienne wrenched herself free and pushed forward. "'I saw your banners. Hear me for your oath.' "'Her speaks?' demanded Sir Anis Frey. "'Ranatherth wet nerth. "'I am Brienne of Toth, daughter to Lord Selwyn the Evenstar, "'and sworn to House Stark even as you are.' "'Sir Anis spit at her feet. "'That's for your oaths. "'We trusted the word of Rob Stark, "'and he repaid our faith with betrayal.' "'Now well, this is interesting.' "'Jamie twisted to see how Brienne might take the accusation, "'but the wench was as single-minded as a mule with a bit between his teeth. "'I know of no betrayal.' "'She chafed at the ropes around her wrists.' Lady Caitlin commanded me to deliver Lannister to his brother at King's Landing. She was trying to drown him when we found them, said Erswick, the faithful. She reddened. In anger I forgot myself, but I would never have killed him. If he dies, the Lannisters will put my lady's daughters to the sword. Sir Aeneas was unmoved. Why should that trouble us? Ransom him back to Riveron, urged Sir Danwell. Casterly Rock is more gold, one brother objected. "'Kill him!' said another. "'His head for Ned Stark's!' Shagwell the Fool somersaulted to the foot of the steps in his grey and pink motley and began to sing. "'There once was a lion who danced with a bear, oh my, oh my!' "'Silent fool!' Varga Hoat cuffed the man. "'The King's Slayer is not for the bear. He is mine!' "'He is no one's, should he die.' Moose Bolton spoke so softly that men quieted to hear him. And pray recall, my lord, you are not master of Harrenhal till I march north. Fever made Jamie as fearless as he was light-headed. Can this be the lord of the Dreadfort? When last I heard, my father had sent you scampering off with your tail betwixt your legs. When did you stop running, my lord? Bolton's silence was a hundred times more threatening than Varga Hoet's slobbering malevolence. Pale as morning mist, his eyes concealed more than they told. Jamie misliked those eyes. They reminded him of the day at King's Landing when Ned Stark had found him seated on the Iron Throne. The Lord of the Dreadfort finally pursed his lips and said, "'You have lost a hand.' "'No,' said Jamie. "'I have it here, hanging round my neck.' Loose Bolton reached down, snapped the cord, and flung the hand at Hoat. "'Take this away.' The sight of it offends me. I will send it to his lord father. I will tell him he must pay one hundred thousand dragons, or we shall return the king's lair to him piece by piece. And when we ask his gold, we shall deliver Sir Jamie to Carthock, and collect a maiden too. And a roar of laughter went up from the brave companions. A fine plan, said Bruce Bolton the same way he might say, a fine wine, to a dinner companion, though Lord Carstark will not be giving you his daughter. King Rob has shortened him by a head for treason and murder. As to Lord Tywin, he remains at King's Landing, and there he will stay till the new year, when his grandson takes for bride a daughter of Highgarden. Winterfell, said Brienne. You mean Winterfell. King Joffrey is betrothed to Sansa Stark. No longer. The Battle of the Blackwater changed all. The Rose and the Lion joined there to shatter Stannis Baratheon's host and burn his fleet to ashes. I warned you, 
Erswick, Timmy thought, and you, goat. When you bet against the lions, you lose more than your purse. Is there word of my sister? he asked. She is well, as is your nephew. Bolton paused before he said nephew, a pause that said, I know. Your brother also lives, though he took a wound in the battle. He beckoned to a door northman in a studded brigantine. Escort Sir Jamie to Kyburn, and unbind this woman's hands. As the rope between Brienne's wrists was slashed in two, he said, Pray forgive us, my lady. In such troubled times it is hard to know friend from foe. Brienne rubbed inside her wrist, where the hemp had scraped her skin bloody. My lord, these men tried to rape me. Didn't they? Lord Bolton turned his pale eyes on Varga Hoet. I am displeased. By that, and this of Sir Jamie's hand. There were five Northmen, and as many Freys in the yard for every brave companion. The goat might not be as clever as some, but he could count that high at least. He held his tongue. They took my sword, Brienne said, my armor. You shall have no need of armor here, my lady, Lord Bolton told her. In Harrenhal you are under my protection. Amabel, find suitable rooms for the Lady Brienne. Walton, you will see to Sir Jamie at once. He did not wait for an answer, but turned and climbed the steps, his fur-trimmed cloak swirling behind. Jamie had only enough time to exchange a quick look with Brienne before they were marched away, separately. In the maester's chambers beneath the rookery, a grey-haired, fatherly man named Kyburn sucked in his breath when he cut away the linen from the stump of Jamie's hand. That bad? Will I die? Kyburn pushed at the wound with a finger and wrinkled his nose at the gush of pus. No, though in a few more days he sliced away Jamie's sleeve. The corruption has spread. See how tender the flesh is? I must cut it all away. The safest course would be to take the arm off. Then you'll die, Jamie promised. Clean the stump and sew it up. I'll take my chances. Kyburn frowned. I can leave you the upper arm, make the cut at your elbow, but take any part of my arm, and you'd best chop off the other one as well, or I'll strangle you with it afterward. Kyburn looked in his eyes. Whatever he saw there gave him pause. Very well. I will cut away the rotten flesh no more. Try to burn out the corruption with boiling wine and a poultice of nettle, mustard seed, and bread mold. Mayhaps that will suffice. It is on your head. You will want milk of the poppy. No. Jamie dare not let himself be put to sleep. He might be short an arm when he woke, no matter what the man said. Kyburn was taken aback. There will be pain. I'll scream. A great deal of pain. I'll scream very loudly. Will you take some wine at least? Does the high septon ever pray? Of that I am not certain. I shall bring the wine. Lie back. I must needs strap down your arm. With a bowl and a sharp blade, Kyburn cleaned the stump while Jamie gulped down strong wine, spilling it all over himself in the process. His left hand did not seem to know how to find his mouth, but there was something to be said for that. The smell of wine and his sodden beard helped disguise the stench of pus. Nothing helped when the time came to pare away the rotten flesh. Jamie did scream then, and pounded his table with his good fist, over and over and over again. He screamed again when Kyburn poured boiling wine over what remained of a stump. Despite all his vows and all his fears, he lost consciousness for a time. When he woke, the maester was sewing at his arm with needle and catgut. I left a flap of skin to fold back over your wrist. You have done this before, muttered Jamie weakly. He could taste blood in his mouth where he'd bitten his tongue. No man who serves with Varga Hoet is a stranger to stumps. He makes them wherever he goes. Kyburn did not look a monster, Jamie thought. He was spare and soft-spoken, with warm brown eyes. How does a maester come to ride with the brave companions? The citadel took my chain. Kyburn put away his needle. I should do something about that wound above your eye as well. The flesh is badly inflamed. Jamie closed his eyes and let the wine and Kyburn do their work. Tell me of the battle. As keeper of Harrenhal's ravens, Kyburn would have been the first to hear the news. Lord Stannis was caught between your father and the fire. It's said the imp set the river itself aflame. 
Jamie saw green flames reaching up into the sky higher than the tallest towers, as burning men screamed in the streets. I have dreamed this dream before. It was almost funny, but there was no one to share the joke. Open your eye. Kyburn soaked the cloth in warm water and dabbed at the crust of dried blood. The eyelid was swollen, but Jamie found he could force it open halfway. Kyburn's face loomed above. How did you come by this one? the maester asked. A wench's gift. Rough wooing, my lord. This wench is bigger than me and uglier than you. You'd best see to her as well. She's still limping on the leg I pricked when we fought. I will ask after her. What is this woman to you? My protector. Jamie had to laugh, no matter how it hurt. I'll grind some herbs you can mix with wine to bring down your fever. Come back on the morrow, and I'll put a leech on your eye to drain the bad blood. A leech. Lovely. Lord Bolton is very fond of leeches, Kyburn said primly. Yes, said Jamie. He would be. Tyrion. Nothing remained beyond the King's Gate but mud and ashes and bits of burned bone. Yet already there were people living in the shadow of the city walls, and others selling fish from barrows and barrels. Tyrion felt their eyes on him as he rode past, chilly eyes, angry and unsympathetic. No one dared speak to him, or tried to bar his way, not with brawn beside him in oiled blackmail. If I were alone, though, they would pull me down and smash my face in with a cobblestone, as they did for Preston Greenfield. They come back quicker than the rats, he complained. We burned them out once. You'd think they'd take that as a lesson. Give me a few dozen gold cloaks, and I'll kill them all, said Bron. Once they're dead, they don't come back. No, but others come in their places. Leave them be. But if they start throwing up hovels against the wall again, pull them down at once. The war's not done yet, no matter what these fools may think. He spied the mud gate up ahead. I have seen enough for now. We'll return on the morrow with the guildmasters to go over their plans. He sighed. Well, I burned most of this. I suppose it's only just that I rebuild it. That task was to have been his uncle's, but solid, steady, tireless Sir Kevin Lannister had not been himself since the raven had come from River Run with word of his son's murder. Willem's twin Martin had been taken captive by Rob Stark as well, and their elder brother Lancel was still abed, beset by an ulcerating wound that would not heal. With one son dead and two more in mortal danger, Sir Kevin was consumed by grief and fear. Lord Tywin had always relied on his brother, but now he had no choice but to turn again to his dwarf son. The cost of rebuilding was going to be ruinous, but there was no help for that. King's Landing was the realm's principal harbor, rivaled only by Old Town. The river had to be reopened, and the sooner the better. And where am I going to find the bloody coin? It was almost enough to make him miss Littlefinger, who had sailed north a fortnight past. While he beds Lisa Arryn and rules the Vale beside her, I get to clean up the mess he left behind him. Though at least his father was giving him significant work to do. He won't name me heir to Casterly Rock, but he'll make use of me wherever he can, Tyrion thought, as a captain of gold cloaks waved them through the mudgate. The three whores still dominated the market square inside the gate, but they stood idle now, and the boulders and barrels of pitch had all been tumbled away. There were children climbing the towering wooden structures, swarming up like monkeys in rough spun to perch on the throwing arms and hoot at each other. Remind me to tell Sir Adam to post some gold cloaks here, Tyrion told Bronn as they rode between two of the trebuchets. Some fool boys like to fall off and break his neck. There was a shout from above, and a clot of manure exploded on the ground a foot in front of them. Tyrion's mare reared and almost threw him. On second thoughts, he said when he had the horse in hand, let the poxy brats splatter on the cobbles like overripe melons. He was in a black mood, and not just because a few street urchins wanted to pelt him with dung. His marriage was a daily agony. Sansa Stark remained a maiden, and half the castle seemed to know it. When they had saddled up this morning, he'd heard two of the stable boys sniggering behind his back. He could almost imagine that the horses were sniggering as well. He'd risked his skin to avoid the bedding ritual, hoping to preserve the privacy of his bedchamber, but that hope had been dashed quick enough. 
Either Sansa had been stupid enough to confide in one of her bedmaids, every one of whom was a spy for Cersei, or Varys and his little birds were to blame. What difference did it make? They were laughing at him all the same. The only person in the Red Keep who didn't seem to find his marriage a source of amusement was his lady wife. Sansa's misery was deepening every day. Tyrion would gladly have broken through her courtesy to give her what solace he might, but it was no good. No words would ever make him fair in her eyes. Nor any less a Lannister. This was the wife they had given him for all the rest of his life, and she hated him. And their nights together in the great bed were another source of torment. He could no longer bear to sleep naked, as had been his custom. His wife was too well trained ever to say an unkind word, but the revulsion in her eyes whenever she looked on his body was more than he could bear. Tyrion had commanded Sansa to wear a sleeping shift as well. I want her, he realized. I want Winterfell, yes, but I want her as well, child or woman or whatever she is. I want to comfort her. I want to hear her laugh. I want her to come to me willingly, to bring me her joys and her sorrows and her lust. His mouth twisted in a bitter smile. Yes, and I want to be tall as Jamie and as strong as Sir Gregor on the mountain, too, for all the bloody good it does. Unbidden, his thoughts went to Shay. Tyrion had not wanted her to hear the news from any lips but his own, so he had commanded Varys to bring her to him the night before his wedding. They met again in the eunuch's chambers, and when Shay began to undo the laces of his jerkin, he'd caught her by the wrist and pushed her away. Wait, he said. There is something you must hear. On the morrow I am to be wed. To Sansa Stark, I know. He was speechless for an instant. Even Sansa did not know, not then. How could you know? Did Varys tell you? Some page was telling Sir Talad about it when I took Lalas to the Sept. He had it from this serving girl who heard Sir Kevin talking to your father. She wriggled free of his grasp and pulled her dress up over her head, as ever she was naked underneath. I don't care. She's only a little girl. You'll give her a big belly and come back to me. Some part of him had hoped for less indifference. Had hoped, he jeered bitterly. But now you know better, dwarf. Shay is all the love you're ever like to have. Muddy Way was crowded, but soldiers and town folk alike made way for the imp and his escort. Hollow-eyed children swarmed underfoot, some looking up in silent appeal, whilst others begged noisily. Tyrion pulled a big fistful of coppers from his purse and tossed them in the air, and the children went running for them, shoving and shouting. The lucky ones might be able to buy a heel of stale bread tonight. He had never seen markets so crowded, and for all the food the Tyrells were bringing in, prices remained shockingly high. Six coppers for a melon, a silver stag for a bushel of corn, a dragon for a side of beef, or six skinny piglets. Yet there seemed no lack of buyers. Gaunt men and haggard women crowded around every wagon and stall, while others even more ragged looked on sullenly from the mouths of alleys. This way, Bron said, when they reached the foot of the hook. If you still mean to— I do. The river front had made a convenient excuse, but Tyrion had another purpose today. It was not a task he relished, but it must be done. They turned away from Aegon's high hill into the maze of smaller streets that clustered around the foot of Visenya's. Bronn led the way. Once or twice Tyrion glanced back over his shoulder to see if they were being followed, but there was nothing to be seen except the usual rabble, a carter beating his horse, an old woman throwing night soil from her window, two little boys fighting with sticks, three gold cloaks escorting a captive. They all looked innocent, but any one of them could be his undoing. Varys had informers everywhere. They turned at a corner and again to the next, and rode slowly through a crowd of women at a well. Bronn led him along a curving wind through an alley under a broken archway. They cut through the rubble where a house had burned and walked their horses up a shallow flight of stone steps. The buildings were close and poor. Bronn halted at the mouth of a crooked alley, too narrow for two to ride abreast. There's two jags and then a dead end. The sink is in the cellar of the last building. Tyrion swung down off his horse. See that no one enters or leaves till I return. This won't take long. His hand went into his cloak to make certain the gold was still there in the hidden pocket. Thirty dragons. A bloody fortune for a man like him. He waddled up the alley quickly, anxious to be done with this. 
The wine sink was a dismal place, dark and damp, walls pale with nitre, the ceiling so low that Bronn would have had to duck to keep from hitting his head on the beams. Tyrion Lannister had no such problem. At this hour the front room was empty, but for a dead-eyed woman who sat on a stool behind a rough plank bar. She handed him a cup of sour wine and said, "'In the back.' The back room was even darker. A flickering candle burned on a low table beside a flagon of wine. The man behind it scarce looked a danger. A short man, though all men were tall to Tyrion, with thinning brown hair, pink cheeks, and a little pot pushing at the bone buttons of his doeskin jerkin. In his soft hands he held a twelve-stringed wood-harp, more deadly than a longsword. Tyrion sat across from him. "'Simon Silvertongue!' the man inclined his head. He was bald on top. "'My Lord Hand,' he said, "'you mistake me. My father is the King's Hand. I am no longer even a finger, I fear. You shall rise again, I am sure, a man like you. My sweet Lady Shay tells me you are newly wed. Would that you had sent for me earlier. I should have been honoured to sing at your feast.' "'The last thing my wife needs is more songs.' said Tyrion. As for Shay, we both know she is no lady, and I would thank you never to speak her name aloud. As the hand commands, Simon said. The last time Tyrion had seen the man, a sharp word had been enough to set him sweating, but it seemed the singer had found some courage somewhere. Most like in that flagon. Or perhaps Tyrion himself was to blame for this new boldness. I threatened him, but nothing ever came of a threat. So now he believes me toothless. He sighed. I am told you are a very gifted singer. You are most kind to say so, my lord. Tyrion gave him a smile. I think it is time you brought your music to the free cities. They are great lovers of song in Bravos and Pentos and Lys, and generous with those who please them. He took a sip of wine. It was foul stuff, but strong. A tour of all nine cities would be best. You wouldn't want to deny anyone the joy of hearing you sing. A year in each should suffice. He reached inside his cloak to where the gold was hidden. With a port closed, you will need to go to Duskendale to take ship. But my man Bronn will find a horse for you, and I would be honored if you would let me pay your passage. But, my lord, the man objected, you have never heard me sing. Pray listen a moment. His fingers moved deftly over the strings of the wood-harp, and soft music filled the cellar. Simon began to sing. He rode through the streets of the city, down from his hill on high. O'er the wines and the steps and the cobbles he rode to a woman's sigh. For she was his secret treasure, she was his shame and his bliss, and a chain and a keep are nothing compared to a woman's kiss. There's more the man said as he broke off. Oh, a good deal more. The refrain is especially nice, I think. For hands of gold are always cold, but a woman's hands are warm. Enough! Tyrion slit his fingers from his cloak, empty. That's not a song I would care to hear again, ever. No. Simon Silvertongue put his harp aside and took a sip of wine. A pity. Still, each man has his song, as my old master used to say when he was teaching me to play. Others might like my tune better. The Queen, perhaps. Or your Lord Father. Tyrion rubbed the scar over his nose and said, My father has no time for singers, and my sister is not as generous as one might think. A wise man could earn more from silence than from song. He could not put it much plainer than that. Simon seemed to take his meaning quick enough. You will find my price modest, my lord. That's good to know. This would not be a matter of thirty golden dragons, Tyrion feared. Tell me. At King Joffrey's wedding feast, the man said, there is to be a tournament of singers. And jugglers, and jesters, and dancing bears. Only one dancing bear, my lord, said Simon, who had plainly attended Circe's arrangements with far more interest than Tyrion had. But seven singers. Galleon of Cui, Bethany Fairfingers, Amon Costain, Alaric of Isen, Hamish the Harper, Collio Aquinas, and Orland of Old Town will compete for a gilded lute with silver strings. Yet unaccountably no invitation has been forthcoming for one who is master of them all. Let me guess, 
Simon Silvertongue? Simon smiled modestly. I am prepared to prove the truth of my boast before king and court. Hamish is old, and oft forgets what he is singing. And Collio, with that absurd Taroshi accent? If you understand one word in three, count yourself fortunate. My sweet sister has arranged the feast. Even if I could secure you this invitation, it might look queer. Seven kingdoms, seven vows, seven challenges, seventy-seven dishes. But eight singers? What would the high septon think? You did not strike me as a pious man, my lord. Piety is not the point. Certain forms must be observed. Simon took a sip of wine. Still, a singer's life is not without peril. We ply our trade in alehouses and wine sinks before unruly drunkards. If one of your sister's seven should suffer some mishap, I hope you might consider me to fill his place. He smiled slyly, inordinately pleased with himself. Six singers would be as unfortunate as eight, to be sure. I will inquire after the health of Circe's seven. If any of them should be indisposed, my man Bran will find you. Very good, my lord. Simon might have left it at that, but flushed with triumph, he added, I shall sing the night of King Joffrey's wedding. Should it happen that I am called to court, why, I will want to offer the king my very best compositions, songs I have sung a thousand times that are certain to please. If I should find myself singing in some dreary wine-sink, though, well, that would be an apt occasion to try my new song— for hands of gold are always cold, but a woman's hands are warm. That will not be necessary, said Tyrion. You have my word as a Lannister. Bronn will call upon you soon. Very good, my lord. The balding, kettle-bellied singer took up his wood-harp again. Bronn was waiting with the horses at the mouth of the alley. He helped Tyrion into his saddle. When do I take the man to Duskendale? You don't. Tyrion turned his horse. Give him three days, then inform him that Hamish the Harper has broken his arm. Tell him that his clothes will never serve for court, so he must be fitted for new garb at once. He'll come with you quick enough. He grimaced. You may want his tongue. I understand it's made of silver. The rest of him should never be found. Bronn grinned. There's a pot shot. I know, in Flea Bottom makes a savory bowl of brown. All kinds of meat in it, I hear. Makes certain I never eat there. Tyrion spurred to a trot. He wanted a bath, and the hotter the better. Even that modest pleasure was denied him, however, no sooner had he returned to his chambers than Podrick Payne informed him that he had been summoned to the Tower of the Hand. His lordship wants to see you, the Hand, Lord Tywin. I recall who the hand is, Pod, Tyrion said. I lost my nose, not my wits. Bronn laughed. Don't bite the boy's head off now. Why not? He never uses it. Tyrion wondered what he'd done now. No more like what I have failed to do. A summons from Lord Tywin always had teeth. His father never sent for him just to share a meal or a cup of wine, that was for certain. As he entered his lord father's solar a few moments later, he heard a voice saying, Cherry wood for the scabbards, bound in red leather and ornamented with a row of lion's head studs in pure gold, perhaps with garnets for the eyes. Rubies, Lord Tywin said. Garnets lack the fire. Tyrion cleared his throat. My lord, you sent for me. His father glanced up. I did. Come have a look at this. A bundle of oilcloth lay on the table between them, and Lord Tywin had a long sword in his hand. A wedding gift for Joffrey, he told Tyrion. The light streaming through the diamond-shaped panes of glass made the blade shimmer black and red as Lord Tywin turned it to inspect the edge, while the pommel and crossguard flamed gold. With this fool's jabber of Stannis and his magic sword, it seemed to me that we had best give Joffrey something extraordinary as well. A king should bear a kingly weapon. That's much too much sword for Joff, Tyrion said. He will go into it. Here, feel the weight of it. He offered the weapon hilt first. The sword was much lighter than he had expected. As he turned it in his hand, he saw why. 
Only one metal could be beaten so thin and still have strength enough to fight with. And there was no mistaking those ripples, the mark of steel that has been folded back on itself many thousands of times. Valyrian steel! Yes, Lord Tywin said in a tone of deep satisfaction. At long last, father. Valyrian steel blades were scarce and costly, yet thousands remained in the world, perhaps two hundred in the Seven Kingdoms alone. It had always irked his father that none belonged to House Lannister. The old kings of the Rock had owned such a weapon, but the great sword Bright Roar had been lost when the second king, Tommen, carried it back to Valyria on his fool's quest. He had never returned, nor had Uncle Jerry, the youngest and most reckless of his father's brothers, who had gone seeking after the lost sword some eight years past. Thrice, at least, Lord Tywin had offered to buy Valyrian longswords from impoverished lesser houses, but his advances had always been firmly rebuffed. The little lordlings would gladly part with their daughters, should a Lannister come asking, but they cherished their old family swords. Tyrion wondered where the metal for this one had come from. A few master armorers could rework old Valyrian steel, but the secrets of its making had been lost when the doom came to old Valyria. The colors are strange, he commented, as he turned the blade in the sunlight. Most Valyrian steel was a gray, so dark it looked almost black, as was true here as well, but blended into the folds was a red as deep as the gray. The two colors lapped over one another without ever touching, each ripple distinct like waves of night and blood upon some steely shore. How did you get this patterning? I've never seen anything like it. Nor I, my lord said the armorer. I confess these colors were not what I intended, and I do not know that I could duplicate them. Your lord father had asked for the crimson of your house, and it was that color I set out to infuse into the metal. But Valyrian steel is stubborn. These old swords remember, it is said, and they do not change easily. I worked half a hundred spells and brightened the red time and time again, but always the color would darken, as if the blade was drinking the sun from it and some folds would not take the red at all, as you can see. If my lords of Lannister are displeased, I will, of course, try again, as many times as you should require, but— No need, Lord Tywin said. This will serve. A crimson sword might flash prettily in the sun, but if truth be told, I like these colors better, said Tyrion. They have an ominous beauty, and they make this blade unique. There is no other sword like it in all the world, I should think. There is one, the armorer bent over the table and unfolded the bundle of oilcloth, to reveal a second longsword. Tyrion put down Joffrey's sword and took up the other. If not twins, the two were at least close cousins. This one was thicker and heavier, a half inch wider and three inches longer, but they shared the same fine, clean lines and the same distinctive color, the ripples of blood and night. Three fullers, deeply incised, ran down the second blade from hilt to point. The king's sword had only two. Joff's hilt was a good deal more ornate, the arms of its cross-guard done as lion's paws with ruby claws unsheathed. But both swords had grips of finely tooled red leather and gold lion's heads for pommels. Magnificent! Even in hands as unskilled as Tyrion's, the blade felt alive. I have never felt better balance. It is meant for my son. No need to ask which son. Tyrion placed Jamie's sword back on the table beside Joffrey's, wondering if Rob Stark would let his brother live long enough to wield it. Our father must surely think so, else why have this blade forged? You have done good work, Master Mott, Lord Tywin told the armorer. My steward will see to your payment. And remember, rubies for the scabbards. I shall, my lord, you are most generous. The man folded the swords up in the oilcloth, tucked the bundle under one arm, and went to his knee. It is an honor to serve the king's hand. I shall deliver the swords the day before the wedding. See that you do. When the guards had seen the armorer out, Tyrion clambered up onto a chair. So... A sword for Joff, a sword for Jamie, and not even a dagger for the dwarf. Is that the way of it, father? 
The steel was sufficient for two blades, not three. If you have need of a dagger, take one from the armory. Robert left a hundred when he died. Geryon gave him a gilded dagger with an ivory grip and a sapphire pommel for a wedding gift, and half the envoys who came to court tried to curry favor by presenting his grace with jewel-encrusted knives and silver inlay swords. Tyrion smiled. They'd have pleased him more if they'd presented him with their daughters. No doubt. The only blade he ever used was the hunting knife he had from John Arryn when he was a boy. Lord Tywin waved a hand, dismissing King Robert and all his knives. What did you find at the riverfront? Mud, said Tyrion, and a few dead things no one's bothered to bury. Before we can open the port again, the black water's going to have to be dredged. The sunken ship's broken up or raised. Three-quarters of the quays need repair, and some may have to be torn down and rebuilt. The entire fish market is gone, and both the river gate and the king's gate are splintered from the battering Stannis gave them, and should be replaced. I shudder to think of the cost. If you do shit, Goldfather, you find a privy and get busy, he wanted to say, but he knew better. You will find whatever gold is required. Will I? Where? The treasury is empty, I've told you that. We're not done paying the alchemists for all that wildfire, or the smiths for my chain, and Cersei's pledged the crown to pay half the costs of Joff's wedding. Seventy-seven bloody courses, a thousand guests, a pie full of doves, singers, jugglers. Extravagance has its uses. We must demonstrate the power and wealth of Casterly Rock for all the realm to see. Then perhaps Casterly Rock should pay. Why? I have seen Littlefinger's accounts. Crown incomes are ten times higher than they were under Ares. As are the Crown's expenses. Robert was as generous with his coin as he was with his cock. Littlefinger borrowed heavily. From you, amongst others. Yes, the incomes are considerable, but they are barely sufficient to cover the usury on Littlefinger's loans. Will you forgive the throne's debt to House Lannister? Don't be absurd. And perhaps seven courses would suffice. Three hundred guests instead of a thousand. I understand that a marriage can be just as binding without a dancing bear. The Tyrells would think us niggardly. I will have the wedding and the waterfront. If you cannot pay for them, say so, and I shall find a master of coin who can. The disgrace of being dismissed after so short a time was not something Tyrion cared to suffer. I will find your money. You will. His father promised, and while you are about it, see if you can find your wife's bed as well. So the talk has reached even him. I have, thank you. It's that piece of furniture between the window and the hearth, with the velvet canopy and the mattress stuffed with goose down. I am pleased you know of it. Now perhaps you ought to try and know the woman who shares it with you. Woman? Child, you mean? Has a spider been whispering in your ear, or do I have my sweet sister to thank? Considering the things that went on beneath Circe's blanket, she would think she'd have the decency to keep her nose out of his. Tell me, why is it that all of Sansa's maids are women in Circe's service? I am sick of being spied upon in my own chambers. If you mislike your wife's servants, dismiss them, and hire ones more to your liking. That is your right. It is your wife's maidenhood that concerns me, not her maid's. This delicacy puzzles me. You seem to have no difficulty bedding whores. Is the Stark girl made differently? Why do you take so much bloody interest in where I put my cock? Tyrion demanded. Sansa is too young. She is old enough to be Lady of Winterfell once her brother is dead. Claim her maidenhood, and you will be one step closer to claiming the North. Get her with child, and the prize is all but won. Do I need to remind you that a marriage that has not been consummated can be set aside? By the High Septon, or a Council of Faith. Our present High Septon is a trained seal who barks prettily on command. Moonboy is more like to annul my marriage than he is. Perhaps I should have married Sansa Stark to Moonboy. He might have known what to do with her. Tyrion's hands clenched on the arms of his chair. I have heard all I mean to hear on the subject of my wife's maidenhood. But so long as we are discussing marriage, 
Why is it that I hear nothing of my sister's impending nuptials? As I recall— Lord Tywin cut him off. Mace Tyrrell has refused my offer to marry Cersei to his heir Willis. Refused, our sweet Cersei? That put Tyrion in a much better mood. When I first broached the match to him, Lord Tyrell seemed well enough disposed, his father said. A day later, all was changed. The old woman's work. She hectors her son unmercifully. Varys claims she told him that your sister was too old and too used for this precious one-legged grandson of hers. Cersei must have loved that, he laughed. Lord Tywin gave him a chilly look. She does not know, nor will she. It is better for all of us if the offer was never made. See that you remember that, Tyrion. The offer was never made. What offer? Tyrion rather suspected that Lord Tyrell might come to regret this rebuff. Your sister will be wed. The question is to whom? I have several thoughts. Before he could get to them, there was a rap at the door, and a guardsman stuck in his head to announce Grand Maester Purcell. He may enter, said Lord Tywin. Purcell tottered in on a cane and stopped long enough to give Tyrion a look that would curdle milk. His once magnificent white beard, which someone had unaccountably shaved off, was growing back sparse and wispy, leaving him with unsightly pink wattles to dangle beneath his neck. My lord hand, the old man said, bowing as deeply as he could without falling, there has been another bird from Castle Black. Mayhaps we could consult privily. There's no need for that. Lord Tywin waved Grand Maester Purcell to a seat. Tyrion may stay. Ooh, may I? He rubbed his nose and waited. Purcell cleared his throat, which involved a deal of coughing and hawking. The letter is from the same Bowen Marsh who sent the last. The Castellan, he writes that Lord Mormont has sent word of wildlings moving south in vast numbers. The lands beyond the wall cannot support vast numbers, said Lord Tywin firmly. This warning is not new. This last is, my lord. Mormont sent a bird from the haunted forest to report that he was under attack. More ravens have returned since, but none with letters. This Bowen Marsh fears Lord Mormont slain with all his strength. Tyrion had rather liked old J. R. Mormont, with his gruff manner and talking bird. Is this certain? he asked. It is not, Purcell admitted. But none of Mormont's men have returned as yet. Marsh fears the wildlings have killed them, and that the wall itself may be attacked next. He fumbled in his robe and found the paper. Here is his letter, my lord, a plea to all five kings. He wants men, as many men as we can send him. Five kings? His father was annoyed. There is one king in Westeros. Those fools in black might try and remember that if they wish his grace to heed them. When you reply, tell him that Renly is dead and the others are traitors and pretenders. No doubt they will be glad to learn it. The wall is a world apart, and news oft reaches them late. Purcell bobbed his head up and down. What shall I tell Marsh concerning the men he begs for? Shall we convene the council? There is no need. The Night's Watch is a pack of thieves, killers, and base-born churls. But it occurs to me that they could prove otherwise, given proper discipline. If Mormont is indeed dead, the Black Brothers must choose a new Lord Commander. The cell gave Tyrion a sly glance. An excellent thought, my lord. I know the very man. Janos Slint. Tyrion liked that notion not at all. The Black Brothers choose their own commander, he reminded them. Lord Slint is new to the wall. I know I sent him there. Why should they pick him over a dozen more senior men? Because, his father said in a tone that suggested Tyrion was quite the simpleton, if they do not vote as they are told, their wall will melt before it sees another man. Yes, that would work. Tyrion hitched forward. Janos Slint is the wrong man, father. We'd do better with the commander of the Shadow Tower, or East Watch by the Sea. The commander of the Shadow Tower is a Malister of Seaguard. East Watch is held by an Iron Man. Neither would serve his purposes, Lord Tywin's tone said clear enough. Janos Slint is a butcher's son, Tyrion reminded his father forcefully. You yourself told me. I recall what I told you. 
Castle Black is not Harren Hall, however. The Night's Watch is not the King's Council. There is a tool for every task, and a task for every tool. Tyrion's anger flashed. Lord Janos is a hollow suit of armor who will sell himself to the highest bidder. I count that a point in his favor. Who is like to bid higher than us? He turned to Purcell. Cinder Raven, write that King Joffrey was deeply saddened to hear of Lord Commander Mormont's death but regrets that he can spare no men just now, whilst so many rebels and usurpers remain in the field, suggests that matters might be quite different once the throne is secure, provided the king has full confidence in the leadership of the watch. In closing, ask Marsh to pass along his grace's fondest regards to his faithful friend and servant, Lord Janos Slint. Yes, my lord, Purcell bobbed his withered head once more. I shall write as the hand commands, with great pleasure. I should have trimmed his head, not his beard, Tyrion reflected. And Slint should have gone for a swim with his dear friend Allardim. At least he had not made the same foolish mistake with Simon Silvertongue. See there, father, he wanted to shout. See how fast I learn my lessons. Samwell Up in the loft, a woman was giving birth noisily, while below a man lay dying by the fire. Samuel Tarley could not say which frightened him more. They had covered poor Bannon with a pile of furs and stoked the fire high, yet all he could say was, I'm cold, please, I'm so cold. Sam was trying to feed him onion broth, but he could not swallow. The broth dribbled over his lips and down his chin as fast as Sam could spoon it in. That one's dead, Craster eyed the man with indifference as he worried at a sausage. Be kinder to stick a knife in his chest than that spoon down his throat, you ask me. I don't recall as we did. Giant was no more than five feet tall. His true name was Bedwick, but a fierce little man for all that. Slayer, did you ask Craster for his counsel? Sam cringed at the name, but shook his head. He filled another spoon, brought it to Bannon's mouth, and tried to ease it between his lips. Food and fire, Giant was saying. That was all we asked of you, and you grudge us the food. Be glad I didn't grudge you fire, too. Craster was a thick man, made thicker by the ragged, smelly sheepskins he wore day and night. He had a broad, flat nose, a mouth that drooped to one side, and a missing ear. And though his matted hair and tangled beard might be grey going white, his hard, knuckly hands still looked strong enough to hurt. "'I fed you what I could, but you crows are always hungry. I'm a godly man, else I would have chased you off. You think I need the likes of him, dying on my floor?' You think I need all your mouths, little man? The wildling spat. Crows! When did a blackbird ever bring good to a man's hall, I ask you? Never! Never! More broth ran from the corner of Bannon's mouth. Sam dabbed it away with the corner of his sleeve. The ranger's eyes were open, but unseeing. I'm cold, he said again, so faintly. A maester might have known how to save him, but they had no maester. Kedge White Eye had taken Bannon's mangled foot off nine days past, and a gout of pus and blood that made Sam sick, but it was too little too late. I'm so cold, the pale lips repeated. About the hall, a ragged score of black brothers squatted on the floor or sat on rough hewn benches, drinking cups of the same thin onion broth and gnawing on chunks of hard bread. A couple were wounded worse than Bannon to look at them. Forneo had been delirious for days, and Sir Byam's shoulder was oozing a foul yellow pus. When they left Castle Black, Brown Bernard had been carrying bags of mirish fire, mustard salve, ground garlic, tansy, poppy, king's copper, and other healing herbs. Even sweet sleep, which gave the gift of painless death. But Brown Bernard had died on the fist, and no one had thought to search for Maester Amon's medicines. Hake had known some herb lore as well, being a cook, but Hake was also lost. So it was left to the surviving stewards to do what they could for the wounded, which was little enough. At least they are dry here, with a fire to warm them. They need more food, though. They all needed more food. The men had been grumbling for days. Clubfoot Carl kept saying how Craster had to have a hidden larder, and Garth of Old Town had begun to echo him when he was out of the Lord Commander's hearing. Sam had thought of begging for something more nourishing, for the wounded men at least, but he did not have the courage. Craster's eyes were cold and mean, and whenever the wildling looked his way, his hands twitched a little, as if they wanted to curl up into fists. Does he know I spoke to Jilly? 
the last time we were here? He wondered. Did she tell him I said we'd take her? Did he beat it out of her? I'm cold, said Bannon. Please, I'm cold. For all the heat and smoke in Craster's Hall, Sam felt cold himself. I'm tired, so tired. He needed sleep, but whenever he closed his eyes, he dreamed of blowing snow and dead men shambling toward him with black hands and bright blue eyes. Up in the loft, Jilly let out a shuddering sob that echoed down the long, low, windowless hall. Push, he heard one of Craster's older wives tell her. Harder, harder. Scream if it helps. She did, so loud it made Sam wince. Craster turned his head to glare. I've had a belly full of that shrieking, he shouted up. Give her a rag to bite down on, or I'll come up there and give her a taste of my hand. He would, too, Sam knew. Craster had nineteen wives, but none who'd dare interfere once he started up that ladder. No more than the Black Brothers had two nights past when he was beating one of the younger girls. There had been mutterings, to be sure. He's killing her, Garth of Greenaway had said, and Clubfoot Carl laughed and said, If he don't want the little sweet meat, he could give her to me. Black Bernard cursed in a low, angry voice, and Alan of Rosby got up and went outside so he wouldn't have to hear. His roof, his rule, the ranger Ronald Harclay had reminded them. Crast as a friend to the watch. A friend, thought Sam, as he listened to Jilly's muffled shrieks. Craster was a brutal man who ruled his wives and daughters with an iron hand, but his keep was a refuge all the same. Frozen crows, Craster sneered when they straggled in, those few who had survived the snow, the whites, and the bitter cold. And not so big a flock as went north, neither. Yet he had given them space on his floor, a roof to keep the snow off, a fire to dry them out, and his wives had brought them cups of hot wine to put some warmth in their bellies. Bloody crows, he called them, but he'd fed them too, meager though the fare might be. We are guests, Sam reminded himself. Jilly is his, his daughter, his wife, his roof, his rule. The first time he'd seen Craster's keep, Jilly had come begging for help, and Sam had lent her his black cloak to conceal her belly when she went to find Jon Snow. Knights are supposed to defend women and children. Only a few of the Black Brothers were knights, but even so, we all say the words, Sam thought. I am the shield that guards the realms of men. A woman was a woman, even a wildling woman. We should help her, we should. It was her child Jilly feared for. She was frightened that it might be a boy. Craster raised up his daughters to be his wives, but there were neither men nor boys to be seen about his compound. Jilly had told John that Craster gave his sons to the gods. If the gods are good, they will send her a daughter, Sam prayed. Up in the loft, Jilly choked back a scream. That's it, a woman said. Another push now. Oh, I see his head. Hers, Sam thought miserably. Her head, hers. Cold, said Bannon weakly. Please, I'm so cold. Sam put the bowl and spoon aside, tossed another fur across the dying man, put another stick on the fire. Jilly gave a shriek and began to pant. Craster gnawed on his hard black sausage. He had sausages for himself and his wives, he said, but none for the watch. Women, he complained, away they wail. I had me a fat sow once birthed a litter of eight with no more than a grunt. Chewing, he turned his head to squint contemptuously at Sam. She was near as fat as you, boy. Slayer, he laughed. It was more than Sam could stand. He stumbled away from the fire pit, stepping awkwardly over and around the men, sleeping and squatting and dying upon the hard-packed earthen floor. The smoke and screams and moans were making him feel faint. Bending his head, he pushed through the hanging deer-hide flaps that served Craster for a door, and stepped out into the afternoon. The day was cloudy, but still bright enough to blind him after the gloom of the hall. Some patches of snow weighed down the limbs of surrounding trees and blanketed the gold and russet hills, but fewer than there had been. The storm had passed on, and the days at Craster's Keep had been, well, not warm, perhaps, but not so bitter cold. Sam could hear the soft dip, dip, dip of water melting off the icicles that bearded the edge of the thick sod roof. He took a deep, shuddering breath and looked around. To the west, Alo Lophand and Tim Stone were moving through the horse lines, feeding and watering 
the remaining garons. Downwind, other brothers were skinning and butchering the animals deemed too weak to go on. Spearmen and archers walked sentry behind the earthen dikes that were Craster's only defense against whatever hid in the wood beyond, while a dozen fire pits sent up thick fingers of blue-gray smoke. Sam could hear the distant echoes of axes at work in the forest, where a work detail was harvesting enough wood to keep the blazes burning all through the night. Nights were the bad time, when it got dark and cold. There had been no attacks while they had been at Craster's, neither whites nor others. Nor would there be, Craster said. A godly man got no cause to fear such. I said as much to that man's raider once, when he comes sniffing round. He never listened, no more than you crows with your swords and your bloody fires. That won't help you none when the white cold comes. Only the gods will help you then. You best get right with the gods. Jilly had spoken of the white cold as well, and she told them what sort of offerings Craster made to his gods. Sam had wanted to kill him when he heard. There are no laws beyond the wall, he reminded himself, and Craster's a friend to the watch. A ragged shout went up from behind the Dobbin Wattle Hall. Sam went to take a look. The ground beneath his feet was a slush of melting snow and soft mud that Dolores Ed insisted was made of Craster's shit. It was thicker than shit, though. It sucked at Sam's boots so hard he felt one pull loose. Back of a vegetable garden and empty sheepfold, a dozen black brothers were loosing arrows at a butt they'd built of hay and straw. The slender blonde steward they called Sweet Donnell had laid a shaft just off the bull's-eye at fifty yards. "'Best that, old man,' he said. "'Aye, I will.' Ulmer, stooped and grey-bearded and loose of skin and limb, stepped to the mark and pulled an arrow from the quiver at his waist. In his youth he had been an outlaw, a member of the infamous Kingswood Brotherhood. He claimed he'd once put an arrow through the hand of the white bull of the Kingsguard to steal a kiss from the lips of a Dornish princess. He had stolen her jewels, too, and a chest of golden dragons, but it was the kiss he liked to boast of in his cups. He notched and drew all smooth as summer silk, then let fly— his shaft struck the butt an inch inside of Donal Hills. "'Will that do, lad?' he asked, stepping back. "'Well enough,' said the younger man, grudgingly. "'The cross wind helped you. It blew more strongly when I loosed.' "'You ought to have allowed for it, then. You have a good eye and a steady hand, but you'll need a deal more to best a man of the Kingswood. Fletcher Dick it was who showed me how to bend the bow, and no finer archer ever lived.' Have I told you about old Dick now? Only three hundred times. Every man at Castle Black had heard Ulmer's tales of the great outlaw band of yore, of Simon Toyne and the Smiling Knight, Oswin Longneck, the Thrice Hanged, Wenda the White Fawn, Fletcher Dick, Big Belly Ben, and all the rest. Searching for escape, sweet Donald looked about and spied Sam standing in the muck. Slayer! he called. Come, show us how you slew the other! He held out the tall yew longbow. Sam turned red. It wasn't an arrow. It was a dagger, dragon glass. He knew what would happen if he took the bow. He would miss the butt and send the arrow sailing over the dike off into the trees. Then he'd hear the laughter. No matter, said Alan of Rosby, another fine bowman. We're all keen to see the slayer shoot, aren't we, lads? He could not face them. The mocking smiles, the mean little jests, the contempt in their eyes. Sam turned to go back the way he'd come but his right foot sank deep in the muck, and when he tried to pull it out, his boot came off. He had to kneel to wrench it free, laughter ringing in his ears. Despite all his socks, the snow melt had soaked through to his toes by the time he made his escape. Useless, he thought miserably. My father saw me true. I have no right to be alive when so many brave men are dead. Gren was tending the fire pit south of the compound gate, stripped to the waist as he split logs. His face was red with exertion, the sweat steaming off his skin. But he grinned as Sam came chuffing up. The others get your boot, Slayer. Him, too? It was the mud. Please don't call me that. Why not? Gren sounded honestly puzzled. It's a good name, and you came by it fairly. Pip always teased Gren about being thick as a castle wall, so Sam explained patiently. "'It's just a different way of calling me a coward,' he said, standing on his left leg and wriggling back into his muddy boot. 
They're mocking me the same way they mock Bedwick by calling him giant. He's not a giant, though, said Grin. And Paul was never small. Well, maybe when he was a babe at the breast, but not after. You did slay the other, though, so it's not the same. I just... I never... I was scared. No more than me. It's only Pip who says I'm too dumb to be frightened. I get as frightened as anyone. Gren bent to scoop up a split log and tossed it into the fire. I used to be scared of John whenever I had to fight him. He was so quick, and he fought like he meant to kill me. The green, damp wood sat in the flames, smoking before it took fire. I never said, though. Sometimes I think everyone is just pretending to be brave, and none of us really are. Maybe pretending is how you get brave. I don't know. Let them call you Slayer. Who cares? You never liked Sir Alasir to call you Aurochs. He was saying I was big and stupid. Gren scratched at his beard. If Pip wanted to call me Aurochs, though, he could. Or you, or John. And Aurochs is a fierce, strong beast, so that's not so bad. And I am big and getting bigger. Wouldn't you rather be Sam the Slayer than Sir Piggy? Why can't I just be Samwell Tarly? He sat down heavily on a wet log that Grin had yet to split. It was the dragon glass that slew it, not me, the dragon glass. He had told them. He had told them all. Some of them didn't believe him, he knew. Dirk had shown Sam his Dirk and said, I got iron. What do I want with glass? Black Bernard and the three Garths made it plain that they doubted his whole story. And Raleigh of Sisterton came right out and said, more like you stabbed some rustling bushes, and it turned out to be small Paul taking a shit, so you came up with a lie. But Dywin listened, and Dolores said, and they made Sam and Grin tell the Lord Commander. Mormont frowned all through the tale and asked pointed questions. But he was too cautious a man to shun any possible advantage. He asked Sam for all the dragon glass in his pack, though that was little enough. Whenever Sam thought of the cash John had found buried beneath the fist, it made him want to cry. There had been dagger blades and spearheads, and two or three hundred arrowheads at least. John had made daggers for himself, Sam, and Lord Commander Mormont, and he'd given Sam a spearhead, an old broken horn, and some arrowheads. Gren had taken a handful of arrowheads as well, but that was all. So now all they had was Mormont's dagger and the one Sam had given Gren plus nineteen arrows and a tall hardwood spear with a black dragon-glass head. The sentries passed the spear along from watch to watch, while Mormont had divided the arrows among his best bowmen. Muttering Bill, Garth Greyfeather, Ronald Harclay, Sweet Donnell Hill, and Alan of Rosby had three apiece, and Ulmer had four. But even if they made every shaft tell, they'd soon be down to fire arrows like all the rest. They had loosed hundreds of fire arrows on the fist, Yet still the whites kept coming. It will not be enough, Sam thought. Craster's sloping palisades of mud and melting snow would hardly slow the whites, who'd climb the much steeper slopes of the fist to swarm over the ring wall. And instead of three hundred brothers drawn up in disciplined ranks to meet them, the whites would find forty-one ragged survivors, nine too badly hurt to fight. Forty-four had come straggling into Craster's out of the storm, out of the sixty-odd who'd cut their way free of the fist, but three of those had died of their wounds, and Bannon would soon make four. "'Do you think the whites are gone?' Sam asked Gren. "'Why don't they come finish us?' "'They only come when it's cold.' "'Yes,' said Sam. "'But is it the cold that brings the whites, or the whites that bring the cold?' "'Who cares?' Gren's axe sent wood chips flying. "'They come together, that's what matters.' Hey, now that we know that dragon-glass kills them, maybe they won't come at all. Maybe they're frightened of us now. Sam wished he could believe that. But it seemed to him that when you were dead, fear had no more meaning than pain or love or duty. He wrapped his hands around his legs, sweating under his layers of wool and leather and fur. The dragon-glass dagger had melted the pale thing in the woods, true, but Gren was talking like it would do the same to the whites. We don't know that, he thought. We don't know anything, really. I wish John was here. He liked Gran, but he couldn't talk to him the same way. John wouldn't call me Slayer, I know. And I could talk to him about Jilly's baby. 
John had ridden off with Corin Halfan, though, and they'd had no word of him since. He had a dragon-glass dagger, too. But did he think to use it? Is he lying dead and frozen in some ravine? Or worse, is he dead and walking? He could not understand why the gods would want to take Jon Snow and Bannon and leave him, craven and clumsy as he was. He should have died on the fist, where he'd pissed himself three times and lost his sword besides. And he would have died in the woods if small Paul had not come along to carry him. I wish it was all a dream. Then I could wake up. How fine that would be, to wake back on the fist of the first men with all his brothers still around him, even John and Ghost. Or even better, to wake in Castle Black, behind the wall, and go to the common room for a bowl of three-finger hobs, thick cream of wheat, with a big spoon of butter melting in the middle and a dollop of honey besides. Just the thought of it made his empty stomach rumble. Snurl! Sam glanced up at the sound. Lord Commander Mormont's raven was circling the fire, beating the air with wide black wings. Snow! the bird called. Snow! Snow! Wherever the raven went, Mormont soon followed. The Lord Commander emerged from beneath the trees, mounted on his garron between old Dywin and the fox-faced ranger Ronald Harclay, who'd been raised to Thorin Smallwood's place. The spearman at the gate shouted a challenge, and the old bear returned a gruff, who in seven hells do you think goes there? Did the others take your eyes? He rode between the gateposts, one bearing a ram's skull and the other the skull of a bear, then reined up, raised a fist, and whistled. The raven came flapping down at his call. My lord, Sam heard Ronald Harclay say, we have only twenty-two mounts, and I doubt half will reach the wall. I know that, Mormont grumbled. We must go all the same. Craster's made that plain. He glanced to the west, where a bank of dark clouds hid the sun. The guards gave us a respite, but for how long? Mormont swung down from the saddle, jolting his raven back into the air. He saw Sam then, and bellowed, Tarly! Me? Sam got awkwardly to his feet. Me? The raven landed on the old man's head. Me? Is your name Tarly? Do you have a brother hereabouts? Yes, you! Close your mouth and come with me. With you? The words tumbled out in a squeak. Lord Commander Mormont gave him a withering look. You are a man of the Night's Watch. Try not to soil your small clothes every time I look at you. Come, I said. His boots made squishing sounds in the mud, and Sam had to hurry to keep up. I've been thinking about this dragon glass of yours. It's not mine, Sam said. John Snow's dragon glass, then. If dragon-glass daggers are what we need, why do we have only two of them? Every man on the wall should be armed with one the day he says his words. We never knew. We never knew. But we must have known once. The Night's Watch has forgotten its true purpose, Tarly. You don't build a wall seven hundred feet high to keep savages in skins from stealing women. The wall was made to guard the realms of men and not against other men, which is all the wildlings are when you come right down to it. Too many years, Tarly, too many hundreds and thousands of years. We lost sight of the true enemy. And now he's here, but we don't know how to fight him. Is dragon glass made by dragons, as the small folk like to say? The ma maesters think not, Sam stammered. The maesters say it comes from the fires of the earth. They call it obsidian. Mormont snorted. They can call it lemon pie for all I care. If it kills as you claim, I want more of it. Sam stumbled. John found more on the fist. Hundreds of arrowheads, spearheads as well. So you said. Small good it does us there. To reach the fist again, we'd need to be armed with the weapons we won't have until we reach the bloody fist. And there are still the wildlings to deal with. We need to find dragon glass some place else. Sam had almost forgotten about the wildlings. So much had happened since. The children of the forest used dragon glass blades, he said. They'd know where to find obsidian. The children of the forest are all dead, said Mormont. The first men killed half of them with bronze blades, and the Andals finished the job with iron. Why, a glass dagger should— 
The old bear broke off as Craster emerged from between the deer hide flaps of his door. The wildling smiled, revealing a mouth of brown, rotten teeth. I have a son. Son, called Mormont's raven. Son, son, son. The Lord Commander's face was stiff. I'm glad for you. Are you now? Me, I'll be glad when you and yours are gone. Past time, I'm thinking. As soon as our wounded are strong enough. As strong as they like to get, old crow. And both of us know it. Them that's dying, you know them too. Cut their bloody throats and be done with it. Or leave them if you don't have the stomach, and I'll sort them out myself. Lord Commander Mormont bristled. Thorin Smallwood claimed you were a friend to the watch. Aye, said Craster. I gave you all I could spare, but winter's coming on, and now the girl stuck me with another squalling mouth to feed. We could take him, someone squeaked. Craster's head turned. His eyes narrowed. He spat on Sam's foot. What did you say, Slayer? Sam opened and closed his mouth. I, uh, I only meant, if you didn't want him, his mouth to feed, with winter coming on, we, we could take him and— My son, my blood! You think I'd give him to you, crows? I only thought— You have no sons, you expose them, Jilly said as much. You leave them in the woods, that's why you have only wives here and daughters who grew up to be wives. Be quiet, Sam, said Lord Commander Mormont. You've said enough. Too much inside. M my lord, inside. Red-faced, Sam pushed through the deer hides, back into the gloom of the hall. Mormont followed. How great a fool are you? The old man said within, his voice choked and angry. Even if Craster gave us the child, he'd be dead before we reached the wall. We need a newborn babe to care for, near as much as we need more snow. Do you have milk to feed him in those big tits of yours? Or did you mean to take the mother, too? She wants to come, Sam said. She begged me. Mormont raised a hand. I will hear no more of this, Charlie. You've been told and told to stay well away from Craster's wives. She's his daughter, Sam said feebly. Go see to Bannon, now, before you make me wroth. Yes, my lord, Sam hurried off, quivering. But when he reached the fire, it was only to find Giant pulling a fur cloak up over Bannon's head. He said he was cold, the small man said. I hope he's gone someplace warm, I do. His wound, said Sam. Bugger his wound. Dirk parted the corpse with his foot. His foot was hurt. I knew a man back in my village lost a foot. He lived in nine and forty. The cold, said Sam. He was never warm. He was never fed, said Dirk. Not proper. That bastard Craster starved him dead. Sam looked around anxiously, but Craster had not returned to the hall. If he had, things might have grown ugly. The wildling hated bastards, though the ranger said he was baseborn himself, fathered on a wildling woman by some long-dead crow. Craster's got his own to feed, said Giant. All these women, he's given us what he can. Don't you bloody believe it. The day we leave, he'll tap a keg of mead and sit down to feast on ham and honey, and laugh at us out starving in the snow. He's a bloody wildling, is all he is. There's none of them friends of the watch. He kicked at Bannon's corpse. Ask him, if you don't believe me. They burned the ranger's corpse at sunset in the fire that Gren had been feeding earlier that day. Tim Stone and Garth of Old Town carried out the naked corpse and swung him twice between them before heaving him into the flames. The surviving brothers divided up his clothes, his weapons, his armor, and everything else he owned. At Castle Black, the Night's Watch buried its dead with all due ceremony. They were not at Castle Black, though. And bones do not come back as whites. His name was Bannon. Lord Commander Mormont said, as the flames took him. He was a brave man, a good ranger. He came to us from... Where did he come from? Down White Harbor Way, someone called out. Mormont nodded. He came to us from White Harbor and never failed in his duty. He kept his vows as best he could, rode far, fought fiercely. We shall never see his like again. And now his watch is ended.
the black brother said in solemn chant. And now his watch is ended, Mormont echoed. Ended, cried his raven. Ended. Sam was red-eyed and sick from the smoke. When he looked at the fire, he thought he saw Bannon sitting up, his hands coiling into fists, as if to fight off the flames that were consuming him. But it was only for an instant, before the swirling smoke hit all. The worst thing was the smell. If it had been a foul, unpleasant smell, he might have stood it. But his burning brother smelled so much like roast pork that Sam's mouth began to water. And that was so horrible that as soon as the bird squawked, And it! He ran behind the hall to throw up in the ditch. He was there on his knees in the mud when Dolores Ed came up. Digging for worms, Sam? Or are you just sick? Sick, said Sam weakly, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand. The smell. Never knew Bannon could smell so good. Ed's tone was as morose as ever. I had half a mind to carve a slice off him. If we had some applesauce, I might have done it. Pork's always best with applesauce, I find. Ed undid his laces and pulled out his cock. You best not die, Sam, or I fear I might succumb. There's bound to be more crackling on you than Bannon ever had, and I never could resist a bit of crackling. He sighed as his piss arced out, yellow and steaming. We ride at first light, did you hear? Sun or snow, the old bear tells me. Sun or snow? Sam glanced up anxiously at the sky. Snow? he squeaked. We ride? All of us? Well, no, some will need to walk, he shook himself. Dywin now, he says we need to learn to ride dead horses like the others do. He claims it would save on feed. How much could a dead horse eat? Ed laced himself back up. Can't say I fancy the notion. Once they figure a way to work a dead horse, we'll be next. Likely I'll be the first, too. Ed, they'll say, dying's no excuse for lying down no more, so get on up and take the spear. You've got the watch tonight. Well, I shouldn't be so gloomy. Might be I'll die before they work it out. Might be we'll all die, and sooner than we'd like. Sam thought as he climbed awkwardly to his feet. When Craster learned that his unwanted guests would be departing on the morrow, the wildling became almost amiable, or as close to amiable as Craster ever got. Past time, he said. You don't belong here, I told you that. All the same, I'll see you off proper with a feast. Well, a feed. My wives can roast them horses you slaughtered, and I'll find some beer and bread. He smiled his brown smile. Nothing better than beer and horse meat. If you can't ride them, eat them. That's what I say. His wives and daughters dragged out the benches and the long log tables and cooked and served as well. Except for Jilly, Sam could hardly tell the women apart. Some were old and some were young and some were only girls, but a lot of them were Craster's daughters as well as his wives. And they all looked sort of alike. As they went about their work, they spoke in soft voices to each other, but never to the men in black. Craster owned but one chair. He sat in it, clad in a sleeveless sheepskin jerkin. His thick arms were covered with white hair, and about one wrist was a twisted ring of gold. Lord Commander Mormont took the place at the top of the bench to his right, while the brothers crowded in knee to knee. A dozen remained outside to guard the gate and tend the fires. Sam found a place between Gren and Orphan Oss, his stomach rumbling. The charred horse meat dripped with grease as Craster's wives turned the spits above the fire pit and the smell of it set his mouth to watering again. But that reminded him of Bannon. Hungry as he was, Sam knew he would wretch if he so much as tried a bite. How could they eat the poor, faithful Garons who had carried them so far? When Craster's wives brought onions, he seized one eagerly. One side was black with rot, but he cut that part off with his dagger and ate the good half raw. There was bread as well, but only two loaves. When Omer asked for more, the woman only shook her head. That was when the trouble started. Two loaves, Clubfoot Carl complained from down the bench. How stupid are you, women? We need more bread than this. Lord Commander Mormont gave him a hard look. Take what you're given and be thankful. Would you sooner be out in the storm eating snow? We'll be there soon enough. Clubfoot Carl did not flinch from the old bear's wrath. 
I'd sooner eat what Craster's hiding, my lord. Craster narrowed his eyes. I gave you crows enough. I got me women to feed. Dirk speared a chunk of horse meat. Aye, so you admit you got a secret larder. How else to make it through a winter? I'm a godly man, Craster started. You're a niggardly man, said Carl, and a liar. Hems, Garth of Old Town said in a reverent voice. There were pigs last time we come. I bet he's got hams in some place. Smoked and salted hams, and bacon, too. Sausage, said Dirk. Them long black ones, they're like rocks they keep for years. I bet he's got a hundred hanging in some cellar. Oats, suggested Olo, mop-hand. Corn, barley. Corn, said Mormont's raven, with a flap of the wings. Corn, 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 corn. Enough, said Lord Commander Mormont, over the bird's raucous calls. Be quiet, all of you. This is folly. Apples, said Garth of Greenaway. Barrels and barrels of crisp autumn apples. There are apple trees out there. I saw him. Dried berries, cabbages, pine nuts. Corn, corn, corn. Salt mutton. There's a sheepfold. He's got casks and casks of mutton laid by. You know he does. Craster looked fit to spit them all by then. Lord Commander Mormont rose. Silence! I'll hear no more such talk. Then stuff bread in your ears, old man, Clubfoot Carl pushed back from the table. Or did you swallow your bloody crumb already? Sam saw the old bear's face go red. Have you forgotten who I am? Sit, eat, and be silent. That is a command. No one spoke. No one moved. All eyes were on the Lord Commander and the big club-footed ranger, as the two of them stared at each other across the table. It seemed to Sam that Carl broke first, and was about to sit, though sullenly, but Craster stood, and his axe was in his hand, the big black steel axe that Mormont had given him as a guest gift. Now, he growled, you'll not sit. No one who calls me niggard will sleep beneath my roof nor eat at my board. Out with you, cripple! And you, and you, and you! He jabbed the head of the axe toward Dirk and Garth, and Garth in turn. Go sleep in the cold with empty bellies, the lot of you! Bloody bastard! Sam heard one of the Garths curse. He never saw which one. Who calls me bastard? Craster roared, sweeping platter and meat and wine cups from the table with his left hand, while lifting the axe with his right. It's no more than all men know, Carl answered. Craster moved quicker than Sam would have believed possible, vaulting across the table with axe in hand. A woman screamed. Garth Greenaway and Orphan Oss drew knives. Carl stumbled back and tripped over Sir Byam, lying wounded on the floor. One instant Craster was coming after him, spitting curses. The next he was spitting blood. Dirk had grabbed him by the hair, yanked his head back, and opened his throat ear to ear with one long slash. Then he gave him a rough shove, and the wildling fell forward, crashing face first across Sir Byam. Byam screamed in agony as Craster drowned in his own blood, the axe slipping from his fingers. Two of Craster's wives were wailing, a third cursed, a fourth flew at Sweet Donald and tried to scratch his eyes out. He knocked her to the floor. The Lord Commander stood over Craster's corpse, dark with anger. "'The guards will curse us!' he cried. There is no crime so foul as for a guest to bring murder into a man's hall. By all the laws of the hearth we— There are no laws beyond the wall, old man, remember? Dirk grabbed one of Craster's wives by the arm and shoved the point of his bloody Dirk up under her chin. Show us where he keeps the food, or you'll get the same as he did, woman. Unhand her! Mormont took a step. I'll have your head for this, you— Garth of Greenaway blocked his path, and Allo Lophand yanked him back. They both had blades in hand. Hold your tongue, Allo warned. Instead, the Lord Commander grabbed for his dagger. Allo had only one hand, but that was quick. He twisted free of the old man's grasp, shoved the knife into Mormont's belly, and yanked it out again all red. And then the world went mad. Later, much later, Sam found himself sitting cross-legged on the floor, with Mormont's head in his lap. He did not remember how they'd gotten there, or much of anything else that had happened after the old bear was stabbed. 
Garth of Greenaway had killed Garth of Old Town, he recalled, but not why. Raleigh of Sisterton had fallen from the loft and broken his neck after climbing the ladder to have a taste of Craster's wives. Gren... Gren had shouted and slapped him, and then he'd run away with Giant and Dolorous Ed and some others. Craster still sprawled across Sir Byam, but the wounded knight no longer moaned. Four men in black sat on the bench eating chunks of burned horse meat, while Allo coupled with a weeping woman on the table. Darley. When he tried to speak, the blood dribbled from the old bear's mouth down into his beard. Tarly, go. Go. Where, my lord? His voice was flat and lifeless. I am not afraid. It was a queer feeling. There's no place to go. The wall. Make for the wall. Now. Now, squawked the raven. Now, now. The bird walked up the old man's arm to his chest and plucked a hair from his beard. You must... must tell them. Tell them what, my lord? Sam asked politely. All. The fist, the wildlings, dragon glass. This. All. His breathing was very shallow now, his voice a whisper. Tell my son, Jora. Tell him, take the black. My wish. Dying wish. Wish? The raven cocked its head, beady black eyes shining. Corn? The bird asked. No corn, said Mormont feebly. Tell Jora. Forgive him. My son... Please, go. It's too far, said Sam. I'll never reach the wall, my lord. He was so very tired. All he wanted was to sleep, to sleep and sleep and never wake. And he knew that if he just stayed here soon enough, Dirk or Ollo, Lophand, or Clubfoot Carl would get angry with him and grant his wish, just to see him die. I'd sooner stay with you. See, I'm not frightened any more. Of you, or of anything. You should be, said a woman's voice. Three of Craster's wives were standing over them. Two were haggard old women he did not know, but Jilly was between them, all bundled up in skins and cradling a bundle of brown and white fur that must have held her baby. We're not supposed to talk to Craster's wives, Sam told them. We have orders. That's done now said the old woman on the right. "'The blackest crows are down in the cellar gorging,' said the old woman on the left, "'or up in the loft with the young ones. They'll be back soon, though. Best you be gone when they do. The horses run off, but Dyer's caught, too.' "'You said you'd help me,' Judy reminded him. "'I said John would help you. John's brave, and he's a good fighter, but I think he's dead now. I'm a craven and fat.' Look how fat I am. Besides, Lord Mormont's hurt. Can't you see? I couldn't leave the Lord Commander. Child, said the other old woman, that old crow's gone before you. Look. Mormont's head was still in his lap, but his eyes were open and staring, and his lips no longer moved. The raven cocked its head and squawked, then looked up at Sam. Corn? No corn. He has no corn. Sam closed the old bear's eyes and tried to think of a prayer. But all that came to mind was, Mother, have mercy, mother, have mercy, mother, have mercy. Your mother can't help you none, said the old woman on the left. That dead old man can't neither. You take his sword and you take that big warm fur cloak of his, and you take his horse if you can find him, and you go. The girl don't lie, the old woman on the right said. She's my girl, and I beat the lying out of her early on. You said you'd help her. Do what Fernie says, boy. Take the girl and be quick about it. Quick, the raven said. Quick, quick, quick. Where? asked Sam, puzzled. Where should I take her? Some place warm, the two old women said as one. Jilly was crying. Me and the babe, please. I'll be your wife like I was Crastus. Please, said Crow. 
He's a boy, just like Nella said he'd be. If you don't take him, they will. They? said Sam, and the raven cocked its black head and echoed, They, they, they. The boy's brothers, said the old woman on the left, Craster's sons. The white cold's rising out there, Crow. I can feel it in my bones. These poor old bones don't lie. They'll be here soon, the sons. Arya. Her eyes had grown accustomed to blackness. When Harwin pulled the hood off her head, the ruddy glare inside the hollow hill made Arya blink like some stupid owl. A huge fire pit had been dug in the center of the earthen floor, and its flames rose, swirling and crackling toward the smoke-stained ceiling. The walls were equal parts stone and soil, with huge white roots twisting through them like a thousand slow, pale snakes. People were emerging from between those roots as she watched, edging out from the shadows for a look at the captives, stepping from the mouths of pitch-black tunnels, popping out of crannies and crevices on all sides. In one place, on the far side of the fire, the roots formed a kind of stairway up to a hollow in the earth where a man sat almost lost in the tangle of weirwood. Lem unhooded Gendry. "'What is this place?' he asked. "'An old place, deep and secret, a refuge where neither wolves nor lions come prowling.' "'Neither wolves nor lions,' Arya's skin prickled. She remembered the dream she'd had, and the taste of blood when she tore the man's arm from his shoulder. Big as the fire was, the cave was bigger, and it was hard to tell where it began and where it ended. The tunnel mouths might have been two feet deep, or gone on two miles. Arya saw men and women and little children, all of them watching her warily. Greenbeard said, "'Here's the wizard, skinny squirrel. You'll get your answers now.' He pointed toward the fire, where Tom Sevenstrings stood talking to a tall, thin man, with oddments of old armor buckled on over his ratty pink robes. "'That can't be Thoros of Mir. Arya remembered the Red Priest as fat, with a smooth face and a shiny bald head. This man had a droopy face and a full head of shaggy gray hair. Something Tom said made him look at her, and Arya thought he was about to come over to her. Only then the mad huntsman appeared, shoving his captive down into the light, and she and Gendry were forgotten. The huntsman had turned out to be a stocky man in patched tan leathers, balding and weak-chinned and quarrelsome. At Stony Sept she had thought that Lemon Greenbeard might be torn to pieces when they faced him at the crow cages to claim his captive for the Lightning Lord. The hounds had been all around them, sniffing and snarling, but Thomas Evans soothed them with his playing, Tansy marched across the square with her apron full of bones and fatty mutton, and Lem pointed out Angie in the brothel window, standing with an arrow notched. The mad huntsman had cursed them all for lickspittles, but finally he had agreed to take his prize to Lord Berwick for judgment. They had bound his wrists with hempen rope, strung a noose around his neck, and pulled a sack down over his head, but even so there was danger in the man, or you could feel it across the cave. Thoros, if that was Thoros, met captor and captive halfway to the fire. "'How did you take him?' the priest asked. "'The dogs caught the scent. He was sleeping off a drunk under a willow tree, if you believe it. "'Betrayed by his own kind, Thoros turned to the prisoner and yanked his hood off. "'Welcome to our humble hall, dog. It is not so grand as Robert's throne room, but the company is better.' The shifting flames painted Sandor Clegane's burned face with orange shadows, so he looked even more terrible than he did in daylight. When he pulled at the rope that bound his wrists, flakes of dry blood fell off. The hound's mouth twitched. "'I know you,' he said to Thoros. "'You did. In melees you'd curse my flaming sword, though thrice I overthrew you with it. "'Thoros of Mir. You used to shave your head. To betoken a humble heart, but in truth my heart was vain. Besides, I lost my razor in the woods. The priest slapped his belly. I am less than I was, but more. A year in the wild will melt the flesh off a man. Would that I could find a tailor to take in my skin. I might look young again, and pretty maids would shower me with kisses. Only the blind ones, priest. 
The outlaws hooted, none so loud as Thoros. Just so, yet I am not the false priest you knew. The Lord of Light has woken in my heart. Many powers long asleep are waking, and there are forces moving in the land. I have seen them in my flames. The hound was unimpressed. Bugger your flames, and you as well. He looked around at the others. You keep queer company for a holy man. These are my brothers, Thoros said simply. Lem Lemoncloak pushed forward. He and Greenbeard were the only men there tall enough to look the hound in the eye. Be careful how you bark, dog. We hold your life in our hands. Best wipe the shit off your fingers, then, the hound laughed. How long have you been hiding in this hole? Angie the archer bristled at the suggestion of cowardice. Ask the goat if we've hidden, hound. Ask your brother. Ask the lord of leeches. We've bloodied them all. You lot don't make me laugh. You look more swineherds than soldiers. Some of us was swineherds, said a short man. Arya did not know. And some was tanners or singers or masons. But that was before the war come. When we left King's Landing, we were men of Winterfell and men of Derry and men of Blackhaven, Mallory men and wild men. We were knights and squires and men-at-arms, lords and commoners, bound together only by our purpose. The voice came from the man seated amongst the weirwood roots halfway up the wall. Six score of us set out to bring the king's justice to your brother. The speaker was descending the tangle of steps toward the floor. Six score brave men and true, led by a fool in a starry cloak. A scarecrow of a man, he wore a ragged black cloak, speckled with stars, and an iron breastplate dinted by a hundred battles. A thicket of red-gold hair hid most of his face, save for a bald spot above his left ear where his head had been smashed in. More than eighty of our company are dead now, but others have taken up the swords that fell from their hands. When he reached the floor, the outlaws moved aside to let him pass. One of his eyes was gone, Arya saw. The flesh about the socket scarred and puckered, and he had a dark black ring all around his neck. With their help we fight on as best we can, for Robert and the realm. Robert! rasped Sandor Clegane, incredulous. Ned Stark sent us out, said pot-helmed Jack B. Lucky. But he was sitting the Iron Throne when he gave us our command, so we were never truly his men but Robert's. Robert is the king of the worms now. Is that why you're down in the earth, to keep his court for him? The king is dead, the Scarecrow Knight admitted, but we are still king's men. Though the royal banner we bore was lost to the Mummer's Ford when your brother's butchers fell upon us. He touched his breast with a fist. Robert is slain, but his realm remains, and we defend her. Her? the hound snorted. Is she your mother, Tondarion, or your whore? Tondarion? Beric Dondarion had been handsome. Sansa's friend Jane had fallen in love with him. Even Jane Poole was not so blind as to think this man was fair. Yet when Arya looked at him again, she saw it. The remains of a forked purple lightning bolt on the cracked enamel of his breastplate. Rocks and trees and rivers, that's what your realm is made of, the hound was saying. Do the rocks need defending? Robert wouldn't have thought so. If he couldn't fuck it, fight it, or drink it, it bored him, and so would you, you brave companions. Outrage swept the hollow hill. Call us that name again, dog, and you'll swallow that tongue. Lem drew his long sword. The hound stared at the blade with contempt. Here's a brave man bearing steel on a bound captive. Untie me, why don't you? We'll see how brave you are then. He glanced at the mad huntsman behind him. How about you? Or did you leave all your courage in your kennels? No, but I should have left you in a crow cage. The huntsman drew a knife. I might still. The hound laughed in his face. We are brothers here, Thoros of Mir declared. Holy brothers sworn to the realm, to our god and to each other. The brotherhood without banners. Tom Sevenstrings plucked a string. The Knights of the Hollow Hill. Knights? Clegane made the word a sneer. 
Dawn. Barry on's a knight, but the rest of you are the sorriest lot of outlaws and broken men I've ever seen. I shit better men than you. Any knight can make a knight, said the scarecrow that was Beric Dondarrion, and every man you see before you has felt a sword upon his shoulder. We are the Forgotten Fellowship. Send me on my way, and I'll forget you too, Clegane rasped. But if you mean to murder me, then bloody well get on with it. You took my sword, my horse, and my gold, so take my life and be done with it. But spare me this pious bleeding. You will die soon enough, dog, promised Thoros. But it shan't be murder, only justice. Aye, said the mad huntsman, and a kind of faith in you deserve for all your kind of done. Lions, you call yourselves. At Sherrod and the Mummer's Ford, girls of six and seven years were raped, and babes still in the breast were cut in two while their mothers watched. No lion ever killed so cruel. I was not at Sherrod nor the Mummer's Ford, the hound told him. Lay your dead children at some other door. Thoros answered him. Do you deny that House Clegane was built upon dead children? I saw them lay Prince Aegon and Princess Rhaenys before the Iron Throne. By rights, your arm should bear two bloody infants in place of those ugly dogs. The hound's mouth twitched. Do you take me for my brother? Is being born Clegane a crime? Murder is a crime. Who did I murder? Lord Lothar Mallory, and Sir Gladden Wilde, said Harwin. My brother's Lister and Lennox, declared Jack B. Lucky. Goodman Beck, and Mudge the Miller's son from Donaldwood. An old woman called from the shadows. Merriman's widow, who loved so sweet, added Greenbeard. Them septons at Slushy Pond. Sir Andrew Charlton, his squire Lucas Root, every man, woman, and child in Fieldstone and Mousedown Mill. Lord and Lady Deddings, it was so rich. Tom Sevenstrings took up the count. Alan of Winterfell, Joth Quickbow, Little Matt and his sister Randa, Anvil Rhine, Sir Ormond, Sir Dudley, Pate of Moray, Pate of Lancewood, Old Pate, and Pate of Shermer's Grove, Blind Wile the Whittler, Good Wife Mary, Mary the Whore, Becca the Baker, Sir Raymond Darry, Lord Darry, Young Lord Darry, the Bastard of Bracken, Fletcher Will, Harsley, Good Wife Nolla. Enough! The hound's face was tight with anger. You're making noise. These names mean nothing. Who are they? People, said Lord Beric. People great and small, young and old. Good people and bad people who died on the points of Lannister spears or saw their bellies opened by Lannister swords. It wasn't my sword in their bellies. Any man who says it was is a bloody liar. You serve the Lannisters of Casterly Rock, said Thoros. Once. Me and thousands more. Is each of us guilty of the crimes of the others? Clegane spat. Might be you are knights after all. You lie like knights. Maybe you murder like knights. Lem and Jack be lucky began to shout at him, but Dondarrion raised a hand for silence. Say what you mean, Clegane. A knight's a sword with a horse. The rest... The vows and the sacred oils and the ladies' favors. They are silk ribbons tied round the sword. Maybe the sword's prettier with ribbons hanging off it, but it will kill you just as dead. Well, bugger your ribbons and shove your swords up your arses. I'm the same as you. The only difference is I don't lie about what I am. So kill me, but don't call me a murderer while you stand there telling each other that your shit don't stink. You hear me? Arya squirted past Greenbeard so fast he never saw her. You are a murderer, she screamed. You killed Micah. Don't say you never did. You murdered him. The hound stared at her with no flicker of recognition. And who was this Micah boy? I'm not a boy, but Micah was. He was a butcher's boy, and you killed him. Jory said you cut him near in half, and he never even had a sword. She could feel them looking at her now, the women and the children and the men who called themselves the Knights of the Hollow Hill. Who's this now? Someone asked. The hound answered, Seven hells. The little sister, the brat who tossed Joff's pretty sword in the river. He gave a bark of laughter. Don't you know you're dead? No, you're dead, she threw back at him. Harwin took her arm to draw her back as Lord Beric said, The girl has named you a murderer. Do you deny killing this butcher's boy, Micah? The big man shrugged 
I was Joffrey's sworn shield. The butcher's boy attacked a prince of the blood. That's a lie, Arya squirmed in Harwin's grip. It was me. I hit Joffrey and threw Lion's Paw in the river. Micah just ran away like I told him. Did you see the boy attack Prince Joffrey? Lord Beric Dondarrion asked the hound. I heard it from the royal lips. It's not my place to question princes. Clegane jerked his hands toward Arya. This one's own sister told the same tale when she stood before your precious Robert. Sans is just a liar, Arya said, furious at her sister all over again. It wasn't like she said it wasn't. Thoros drew Lord Beric aside. The two men stood talking in low whispers while Arya seethed. They have to kill him. I prayed for him to die hundreds and hundreds of times. Beric Dondarrion turned back to the hound. You stand accused of murder, but no one here knows the truth or falsehood of the charge. So it is not for us to judge you. Only the Lord of Light may do that now. I sentence you to trial by battle. The hound frowned suspiciously, as if he did not trust his ears. Are you a fool or a madman? Neither. I am a just lord. Prove your innocence with a blade, and you shall be free to go. No! Arya cried before Harwin covered her mouth. No, they can't. He'll go free. The hound was deadly with a sword. Everyone knew that. He'll laugh at them, she thought. And so he did, a long rasping laugh that echoed off the cave walls, a laugh choking with contempt. So who will it be? He looked at Lem Lemoncloak. The brave man in the piss-yellow cloak? No? How about you, huntsman? You've kicked dogs before. Try me. He saw Greenbeard. You're big enough, Tirash. Step forward. Or do you mean to make the little girl fight me yourself? He laughed again. Come on, who wants to die? It's me, your face, said Lord Beric Dondarrion. Arya remembered all the tales. He can't be killed, she thought, hoping against hope. The mad huntsman sliced apart the ropes that bound Sandor Clegane's hands together. I'll need sword and armor, the hound rubbed a torn wrist. Your sword you shall have, declared Lord Beric, but your innocence must be your armor. Clegane's mouth twitched. My innocence against your breastplate, is that the way of it? Ned, help me remove my breastplate. Arya got goosebumps when Lord Beric said her father's name, but this Ned was only a boy, a fair-haired squire, no more than ten or twelve. He stepped up quickly to undo the clasps that fastened the battered steel about the marcher lord. The quilting beneath was rotten with age and sweat, and fell away when the metal was pulled loose. Gendry sucked in his breath. Mother, have mercy. Lord Beric's ribs were outlined starkly beneath his skin. A puckered crater scarred his breast just above his left nipple, and when he turned to call for sword and shield, Arya saw a matching scar upon his back. The lance went through him. The hound had seen it, too. Is he scared? Arya wanted him to be scared before he died, as scared as Micah must have been. Ned fetched Lord Beric his sword belt and a long black surcoat. It was meant to be worn over armor, so it draped his body loosely, but across it crackled the forked purple lightning of his house. He unsheathed his sword and gave the belt back to his squire. Thoros brought the hound his sword belt. Does a dog have honor? the priest asked. Lest you think to cut your way free of here, or seize some child for a hostage. Angie, Dennett, Kyle, feather him at the first sign of treachery. Only when the three bowmen had notched their shafts did Thoros hand Clegane the belt. The hound ripped the sword free and threw away the scabbard. The mad huntsman gave him his oaken shield, all studded with iron and painted yellow, the three black dogs of Clegane emblazoned upon it. The boy, Ned, helped Lord Beric with his own shield, so hacked and battered that the purple lightning and the scatter of stars upon it had almost been obliterated. But when the hound made to step toward his foe, Thoros of Myr stopped him. First we pray. He turned toward the fire and lifted his arms. Lord of Light, look down upon us. All around the cave, the Brotherhood without banners lifted their own voices in response. Lord of Light, defend us. Lord of Light, protect us in the darkness. Lord of Light, shine your face upon us. Light your flame among us, Rolor, said the Red Priest. Show us the truth or falseness of this man. Strike him down if he is guilty. 
and give strength to a sword if he is true. Lord of light, give us wisdom. For the night is dark, the others chanted, Harwin and Angie loud as all the rest, and full of terrors. This cave is dark, too, said the hound. But I'm the terror here. I hope your god's a sweet one, Don Darion. You're going to meet him shortly. Unsmiling, Lord Beric laid the edge of his long sword against the palm of his left hand, and drew it slowly down. Blood ran dark from the gash he made, and washed over the steel. And then the sword took fire. Arya heard Gendry whisper a prayer. Burn in seven hells, the hound cursed. You and Thoros, too. He threw a glance at the red priest. When I'm done with him, you'll be next, Mir. Every word you say proclaims your guilt, dog, answered Thoros, while Lemon Greenbeard and Jack B. Lucky shouted threats and curses. Lord Beric himself waited silent, calm as still water, his shield on his left arm and his sword burning in his right hand. Kill him, Arya thought. Please, you have to kill him. Lit from below, his face was a death mask, his missing eye a red and angry wound. The sword was aflame from point to crossguard, but Don Darion seemed not to feel the heat. He stood so still he might have been carved of stone. But when the hound charged him, he moved fast enough. The flaming sword leapt up to meet the cold one, long streamers of fire trailing in its wake like the ribbons the hound had spoken of. Steel rang on steel. No sooner was his first slash blocked than Clegane met another, but this time Lord Beric's shield got in the way, and wood chips flew from the force of the blow. Hard and fast the cuts came, from low and high, from right and left, and each one Don Darion blocked. The flames swirled about his sword and left red and yellow ghosts to mark its passage. Each move Lord Beric made fanned them and made them burn the brighter, until it seemed as though the lightning lord stood within a cage of fire. Is it wildfire? Arya asked Gendry. No, this is different. This is... Magic, she finished as the hound edged back. Now it was Lord Beric attacking, filling the air with ropes of fire, driving the bigger man back on his heels. Clegane caught one blow high on his shield, and a painted dog lost a head. He countercut, and Dondarion interposed his own shield and launched a fiery backslash. The outlaw brotherhood shouted on their leader, He's yours, Arya heard, and at him, at him, at him. The hound parried a cut at his head, grimacing as the heat of the flames beat against his face. He grunted and cursed and reeled away. Lord Beric gave him no respite. Hard on the big man's heels he followed, his arm never stilled. The swords clashed and sprang apart and clashed again. Splinters flew from the lightning shield, while swirling flames kissed the dogs once and twice and thrice. The hound moved to his right, but Dondarrion blocked him with a quick sidestep and drove him back the other way, toward the sullen red blaze of the fire pit. Clegane gave ground until he felt the heat at his back. A quick glance over his shoulder showed him what was behind him, and almost cost him his head when Lord Beric attacked anew. Arya could see the whites of Sandor Clegane's eyes as he bowled his way forward again. Three steps up and two back. A move to the left that Lord Beric blocked, two more forward and went back. Clang and clang, and the big oaken shields took blow after blow after blow. The hound's lank, dark hair was plastered to his brow in a sheen of sweat. Wine sweat, Arya thought, remembering that he'd been taken drunk. She thought she could see the beginnings of fear wake in his eyes. He's going to lose, she told herself, exulting, as Lord Beric's flaming sword whirled and slashed. In one wild flurry, the lightning lord took back all the ground the hound had gained, sending Clegane staggering to the very edge of the fire pit once more. He is, he is, he's going to die. She stood on her toes for a better look. Bloody bastard! The hound screamed as he felt the fire licking against the back of his thighs. He charged, swinging the heavy sword harder and harder, trying to smash the smaller man down with brute force to break blade or shield or arm. But the flames of Dondarion's parries snapped at his eyes, and when the hound jerked away from them, his foot went out from under him, and he staggered to one knee. At once Lord Beric closed, his downcut screaming through the air, trailing pennons of fire. Panting from exertion, Clegane jerked his shield up over his head just in time, and the cave rang with a loud crack of splintering oak. His shield is afire, Gendry said in a hushed voice. Arya saw it in the same instant. The flames had spread across the chipped yellow paint, and the three black dogs were engulfed. Sandor Clegane had fought his way back to his feet with a reckless counterattack. Not until Lord Beric retreated a pace did the hound seem to realize that the fire that roared so near his face was his own shield, burning. With a shout of revulsion he hacked down savagely on the broken oak, completing its destruction. The shield shattered, one piece of it spinning away, still afire, while the other clung stubbornly to his forearm. His efforts to free himself only fanned the flames. His sleeve caught, 
and now his whole left arm was ablaze. Finish him, Greenbeard urged Lord Berwick. And other voices took up the chant of, Guilty! Arya shouted with a rest, Guilty! Guilty! Kill him! Guilty! Smooth as summer silk, Lord Berwick slid close to make an end of the man before him. The hound gave a rasping scream, raised his sword in both hands, and brought it crashing down with all the strength. Lord Berwick blocked the cut easily. No! Arya shrieked. But the burning sword snapped in two, and the hound's cold steel plowed into Lord Beric's flesh, where his shoulder joined his neck and clove him clean down to the breastbone. The blood came rushing out in a hot black gush. Sandor Clegane jerked backward, still burning. He ripped the remnants of his shield off and flung them away with a curse, then rolled in the dirt to smother the fire running along his arm. Lord Beric's knees folded slowly, as if for prayer. When his mouth opened, only blood came out. The hound's sword was still in him as he toppled face forward. The dirt drank his blood. Beneath the hollow hill there was no sound but the soft crackling of flames and the whimper the hound made when he tried to rise. Arya could only think of Micah and all the stupid prayers she'd prayed for the hound to die. If there were gods, why didn't Lord Beric win? She knew the hound was guilty. Please, Sandor Clegane rasped, cradling his arm. I'm burned. Help me, someone. Help me! He was crying. Please! Arya looked at him in astonishment. He's crying like a little baby, she thought. Mele, see to his burns, said Thoros. Them, Jack, help me with Lord Beric. Ned, you'd best come too. The red priest wrenched the hound's sword from the body of his fallen lord and thrust the point of it down in the blood-soaked earth. Lem slid his big hands under Dondarion's arms, while Jack be lucky took his feet. They carried him around the fire pit and to the darkness of one of the tunnels. Thoros and the boy Ned followed after. The mad huntsman spat. I say we take him back to Stony Sept and put him in a crow cage. Yes, Arya said. He murdered Micah. He did. Such an angry squirrel, murmured Greenbeard. Harwin sighed. Valor has judged him innocent. Who's Valor? She couldn't even say it. The Lord of Light. Thoros has taught us. She didn't care what Thoros had taught them. She yanked Greenbeard's dagger from its sheath and spun away before he could catch her. Gendry made a grab for her as well, but she had always been too fast for Gendry. Tom Seven Strings and some woman were helping the hound to his feet. The sight of his arm shocked her speechless. There was a strip of pink where the leather strap had clung, but above and below the flesh was cracked and red and bleeding from elbow to wrist. When his eyes met hers, his mouth twitched. You want me dead that bad? Then do it, wolf girl. Shove it in, it's cleaner than fire. Clegane tried to stand, but as he moved, a piece of burned flesh sloughed right off his arm, and his knees were not from under him. Tom caught him by his good arm and held him up. His arm, Arya thought, and his face. But he was the hound. He deserved to burn in a fiery hell. The knife felt heavy in her hand. She gripped it tighter. You killed Micah, she said once more, daring him to deny it. Tell them, you did, you did. I did. His whole face twisted. I rode him down and cut him in half, and laughed. I watched them beat your sister bloody, too. Watched them cut your father's head off. Lem grabbed her wrist and twisted, wrenching the dagger away. She kicked at him, but he would not give it back. You go to hell, hound, she screamed at Sandor Clegane in helpless, empty-handed rage. You just go to hell. He has said a voice scarce stronger than a whisper. When Arya turned, Lord Beric Dondarion was standing behind her, his bloody hand clutching Thoros by the shoulder. Caitlin Let the kings of winter have their cold crypt under the earth, Caitlin thought. The Tullys drew their strength from the river, and it was to the river they returned when their lives had run their course. They laid Lord Hoster in a slender wooden boat, clad in shining silver armor, plate and mail. His cloak was spread beneath them, rippling blue and red. His surcoat was divided blue and red as well. A trout, scaled in silver and bronze, crowned the crest of the great helm they placed beside his head. On his chest they placed a painted wooden sword, his fingers curled about its hilt. Mail gauntlets hid his wasted hands, and made him look almost strong again. His massive oak and iron shield was set by his left side, his hunting horn to his right. 
The rest of the boat was filled with driftwood and kindling and scraps of parchment, and stones to make it heavy in the water. His banner flew from the prow, the leaping trout of River Run. Seven were chosen to push the funereal boat to the water in honor of the seven faces of God. Rob was one, Lord Hoster's liege lord. With him were the Lords Bracken, Blackwood, Vance, and Malister, Sir Mark Piper, and lame Lothar Frey, who had come down from the twins with the answer they had awaited. Forty soldiers rode in his escort, commanded by Walder Rivers, the eldest of Lord Walder's bastard brood, a stern grey-haired man with a formidable reputation as a warrior. Their arrival, coming within hours of Lord Hoster's passing, had sent Edmure into a rage. "'Walder Frey should be flayed and quartered!' he'd shouted. "'He sends a cripple and a bastard to treat with us. Tell me there is no insultment by that!' "'I have no doubt that Lord Walder chose his envoys with care,' she replied. "'It was a peevish thing to do, a petty sort of revenge, but remember who we are dealing with. "'The late Lord Frey, father used to call him. "'The man is ill-tempered, envious, and above all, prideful. "'Blessedly her son had shown better sense than her brother. "'Rob had greeted the Freys with every courtesy, found barracks space for the escort, and quietly asked Sir Desmond Grell to stand aside so Lothar might have the honor of helping to send Lord Hoster on his last voyage. He has learned a rough wisdom beyond his years, my son. House Frey might have abandoned the King of the North, but the Lord of the Crossing remained the most powerful of River Run's bannermen, and Lothar was here in his stead. The seven launched Lord Hoster from the water stair, wading down the steps as the portcullis was winched upward. Lothar Frey, a soft-bodied portly man, was breathing heavily as they shoved the boat out into the current. Jason Malister and Titos Blackwood, at the prow, stood chest deep in the river to guide it on its way. Caitlin watched from the battlements, waiting and watching as she had waited and watched so many times before. Beneath her the swift, wild tumblestone plunged like a spear into the side of the broad red fork, its blue-white current churning the muddy red-brown flow of the greater river. A morning mist hung over the water, as thin as gossamer and the wisps of memory. Bran and Rickon will be waiting for him, Caitlin thought sadly, as once I used to wait. The slim boat drifted out from under the red stone arch of the water gate, picking up speed as it was caught in the headlong rush of the tumblestone and pushed out into the tumult where the waters met. As the boat emerged from beneath the high sheltering walls of the castle, its square sail filled with wind, and Caitlin saw sunlight flashing on her father's helm. Lord Hoster Tully's rudder held true, and he sailed serenely down the center of the channel, into the rising sun. Now, her uncle urged, beside him her brother Edmure, Lord Edmure now in truth, and how long would that take to grow used to, knocked an arrow to his bowstring. His squire held a brand to its point. Edmure waited until the flame caught, then lifted the great bow, drew the string to his ear, and let fly. With a deep thrum, the arrow sped upward. Caitlin followed its flight with her eyes and heart until it plunged into the water with a soft hiss, while astern of Lord Hoster's boat. Edmure cursed softly. The wind, he said, pulling a second arrow. Again. The brand kissed the oil-soaked rag behind the arrowhead. The flames went licking up. Edmure lifted, pulled, and released. High and far the arrow flew. Too far. It vanished in the river a dozen yards beyond the boat, its fire winking out in an instant. A flush was creeping up Edmure's neck, red as his beard. Once more, he commanded, taking a third arrow from the quiver. He is as tight as his bowstring, Caitlin thought. Sir Brendan must have seen the same thing. Let me, my lord, he offered. I can do it, Edmure insisted. He let them light the arrow, jerked the bow up, took a deep breath, drew back the arrow. For a long moment he seemed to hesitate while the fire crept up the shaft, crackling... Finally he released. The arrow flashed up and up and finally curved down again, falling, falling, and hissing past the billowing sail. A narrow miss, no more than a hand span, and yet a miss. The others, take it, her brother swore. The boat was almost out of range, drifting in and out among the river mists. Wordless, Edmure thrust the bow at his uncle. Swiftly! Sir Brendan said. He knocked an arrow, held it steady for the brand, drew and released before Caitlin was quite sure that the fire had caught. But as the shot rose, she saw the flames trailing through the air, a pale orange pennon. 
The boat had vanished in the mists. Falling, the flaming arrow was swallowed up as well, but only for a heartbeat. Then, sudden as hope, they saw the red bloom flower. The sails took fire, and the fog glowed pink and orange. For a moment, Caitlin saw the outline of the boat clearly, wreathed in leaping flames. Watch for me, little cat, she could hear him whisper. Caitlin reached out blindly, groping for her brother's hand, but Edmure had moved away to stand alone on the highest point of the battlements. Her uncle Brynden took her hand instead, twining his strong fingers through hers. Together they watched the little fire grow smaller as the burning boat receded in the distance. And then it was gone, drifting down river still, perhaps, or broken up and sinking. The weight of his armor would carry Lord Hoster down to rest in the soft mud of the riverbed, and the watery halls where the Tullys held eternal court, with schools of fish their last attendants. No sooner had the burning boat vanished from their sight than Edmure walked off. Caitlin would have liked to embrace him, if only for a moment, to sit for an hour or a night or the turn of a moon to speak of the dead and mourn. Yet she knew as well as he that this was not the time. He was lord of River Run now, and his knights were falling in around him, murmuring condolences and promises of fealty, walling him off from something as small as a sister's grief. Edmure listened, hearing none of the words. "'It is no disgrace to miss your shot,' her uncle told her quietly. "'Edmure should hear that. The day my own lord father went down river, Hoster missed as well.' With his first shaft, Caitlin had been too young to remember, but Lord Hoster had often told the tale. His second found the sail. She sighed. Edmure was not as strong as he seemed. Their father's death had been a mercy when it came at last, but even so her brother had taken it hard. Last night in his cups he had broken down and wept, full of regrets for things undone and words unsaid. He ought never to have ridden off to fight his battle on the fords, he told her tearfully. He should have stayed at their father's bedside. "'I should have been with him as you were,' he said. "'Did he speak of me at the end? Tell me true, Cat. Did he ask for me?' Lord Hoster's last word had been, "'Tansy,' but Caitlin could not bring herself to tell him that. "'He whispered your name,' she lied, and her brother had nodded gratefully and kissed her hand. If he had not tried to drown his grief and guilt, he might have been able to bend a bow— she thought to herself, sighing, but that was something else she dare not say. The blackfish escorted her down from the battlements to where Rob stood among his bannermen, his young queen at his side. When he saw her, her son took her suddenly in his arms. "'Lord Hoster looked as noble as a king, my lady,' remembered Jane, "'would that I had been given the chance to know him.' "'And I to know him better,' added Rob. "'He would have wished that, too,' said Caitlin. There were too many leagues between River Run and Winterfell, and too many mountains and rivers and armies between River Run and the Eyrie, it would seem. Lisa had made no reply to her letter. And from King's Landing came only silence as well. By now she had hoped that Brienne and Sir Cleos would have reached the city with their captive. It might even be that Brienne was on her way back and the girls with her. Sir Cleos swore he would make the imp send a raven once the trade was made. He swore it. Ravens did not always win through. Some bowmen could have brought the bird down and roasted him for supper. The letter that would have set her heart at ease might even now be lying by the ashes of some campfire beside a pile of raven bones. Others were waiting to offer Rob their consolations, so Caitlin stood aside patiently while Lord Jason Malister, the great John, and Sir Rolf Spicer spoke to him each in turn. But when Lothar Frey approached, she gave his sleeve a tug. Rob turned and waited to hear what Lothar would say. Your Grace, a plump man in his middle thirties, Lothar Frey had close-set eyes, a pointed beard, and dark hair that fell to his shoulders in ringlets. A leg twisted at birth had earned him the name Lame Lothar. He had served as his father's steward for the past dozen years. "'We are loath to intrude upon your grief, but perhaps you might grant us audience to-night.' "'It would be my pleasure,' said Rob. "'It was never my wish to sow enmity between us.' "'Nor mine to be the cause of it,' said Queen Jane. Lothar Frey smiled. "'I understand, as does my lord father.' 
He instructed me to say that he was young once, and well remembers what it is like to lose one's heart to beauty. Caitlin doubted very much that Lord Walder had said any such thing, or that he had ever lost his heart to beauty. The Lord of the Crossing had outlived seven wives, and was now wed to his eighth, but he spoke of them only as bedwarmers and broodmares. Still the words were fairly spoken, and she could scarce object to the compliment. Nor did Rob. "'Your father is most gracious,' he said. "'I shall look forward to our talk.' Lothar bowed, kissed the Queen's hand, and withdrew. By then a dozen others had gathered for a word. Rob spoke with them each, giving a thanks here, a smile there, as needed. Only when the last of them was done did he turn back to Caitlin. "'There is something we must speak of. Will you walk with me?' "'As you command, your grace. That wasn't a command, mother. It will be my pleasure, then. Her son had treated her kindly enough since returning to River Run, yet he seldom sought her out. If he was more comfortable with his young queen, she could scarcely blame him. Jane makes him smile, and I have nothing to share with him but grief. He seemed to enjoy the company of his bride's brothers as well, young Rollam, his squire, and Sir Reynold, his standard-bearer. They are standing in the boots of those he's lost— Caitlin realized when she watched them together. Rollam has taken Bran's place, and Reynold is part Theon and part Jon Snow. Only with the Westerlings did she see Rob smile, or hear him laugh like the boy he was. To the others he was always the king in the north, head bowed beneath the weight of the crown even when his brows were bare. Rob kissed his wife gently, promised to see her in their chambers, and went off with his lady mother. His steps led them toward the godswood. Lothar seemed amiable. That's a hopeful sign. We need the phrase. That does not mean we shall have them. He nodded, and there was glumness to his face and a slope to his shoulders that made her heart go out to him. The crown is crushing him, she thought. He wants so much to be a good king, to be brave and honorable and clever. But the weight is too much for a boy to bear. Rob was doing all he could, yet still the blows kept falling one after the other, relentless. When they brought him word of the battle at Duskendale, where Lord Randall Tarley had shattered Robert Glover and Sir Helmon Tallhart, he might have been expected to rage. Instead, he'd stared in dumb disbelief and said, Duskendale? On the narrow sea? Why would they go to Duskendale? He shook his head, bewildered. A third of my foot lost for Duskendale? The Iron Men have my castle, and now the Lannisters hold my brother, Galbart Glover said, in a voice thick with despair. Robert Glover had survived the battle, but had been captured near the King's Road not long after. Not for long, her son promised. I will offer them Martin Lannister in exchange. Lord Tywin will have to accept for his brother's sake. Martin was Sir Kevin's son, a twin to the Willem that Lord Karstark had butchered. Those murders still haunted her son, Caitlin knew. He had tripled the guard around Martin, but still feared for his safety. "'I should have traded the Kingslayer for Sansa when you first urged it,' Rob said as they walked the gallery. "'If I'd offered to wed her to the Knight of Flowers, the Tyrells might be ours instead of Joffrey's. I should have thought of that. Your mind was on your battles, and rightly so.' Even a king cannot think of everything. Battles, muttered Rob as he led her out beneath the trees. I have won every battle, yet somehow I'm losing the war. He looked up as if the answer might be written on the sky. The Iron Men hauled Winterfell and Moat Kalin too. Father's dead, and Bran and Rickon, maybe are ya, and now your father too. She could not let him despair. She knew the taste of that draft too well herself. My father has been dying for a long time. You could not have changed that. You have made mistakes, Rob, but what king has not? Ned would have been proud of you. Mother, there is something you must know. Caitlin's heart skipped a beat. This is something he hates, something he dreads to tell me. All she could think of was Brienne and her mission. Is it the Kingslayer? No. It's Sansa. She's dead. Caitlin thought at once. Brienne failed. Jamie is dead. And Cersei has killed my sweet girl in retribution. For a moment she could barely speak. Is... is she gone, Rob? Gone? He looked startled. 
Dead? Oh, mother, no, not that. They haven't harmed her, not that way, only... A bird came last night, but I couldn't bring myself to tell you, not until your father was sent to his rest. Rob took her hand. They married her to Tyrion Lannister. Caitlin's fingers clutched at his. The imp. Yes. He swore to trade her for his brother, she said numbly. Sansa and Arya both. We would have them back if we returned his precious Jamie. He swore it before the whole court. How could he marry her after saying that in sight of gods and men? He's the Kingslayer's brother. Oath-breaking runs in their blood. Rob's fingers brushed the pommel of a sword. If I could, I'd take his ugly head off. Sansa would be a widow then and free. There's no other way that I can see. They made her speak the vows before a septon and don a crimson cloak. Caitlin remembered the twisted little man she had seized at the crossroads inn and carried all the way to the airy. I should have let Lisa push him out her moon door. My poor sweet Sansa. Why would anyone do this to her? For Winterfell, Rob said at once. With Bran and Rickon dead, Sansa is my heir. If anything should happen to me, she clutched tight at his hand, nothing will happen to you. Nothing. I could not stand it. They took Ned and your sweet brothers. Sansa is married. Arya is lost. My father's dead. If anything befell you, I would go mad, Rob. You are all I have left. You are all the North has left. I am not dead yet, mother. Suddenly Caitlin was full of dread. Wars need not be fought until the last drop of blood. Even she could hear the desperation in her voice. You would not be the first king to bend the knee, nor even the first Stark. His mouth tightened. No. Never. There is no shame in it. Valen Greyjoy bent the knee to Robert when his rebellion failed. Torrin Stark bent the knee to Aegon the Conqueror rather than see his army face the fires. Did Aegon kill King Torrin's father? He pulled his hand from hers. Never, I said. He is playing the boy now, not the king. The Lannisters do not need the North. They will require homage and hostages, no more. And the imp will keep Sansa no matter what we do, so they have their hostage. The Iron Men will prove a more implacable enemy, I promise you. To have any hope of holding the North, the Greyjoys must leave no single sprig of House Stark alive to dispute their right. Theon's murdered Bran and Rickon, so now all they need do is kill you. And Jane, yes. Do you think Lord Balan can afford to let her live to bear you heirs? Rob's face was cold. Is that why you freed the Kingslayer? To make a peace with the Lannisters? I freed Jaime for Sansa's sake, and Arya's, if she still lives. You know that. But if I nurtured some hope of buying peace as well, was that so ill? Yes, he said. The Lannisters killed my father. Do you think I have forgotten that? I don't know. Have you? Caitlin had never struck her children in anger, but she almost struck Rob then. It was an effort to remind herself how frightened and alone he must feel. You are king in the North. The choice is yours. I only ask that you think on what I've said. The singers make much of kings who die valiantly in battle, but your life is worth more than a song, to me at least, who gave it to you. She lowered her head. Do I have your leave to go? Yes. He turned away and drew his sword. What he meant to do with it, she could not say. There was no enemy there, no one to fight. Only her and him amongst tall trees and fallen leaves. There are fights no sword can win, Caitlin wanted to tell him, but she feared the king was deaf to such words. Hours later she was sewing in her bedchamber when young Rollam Westerling came running with a summons to supper. Good, Caitlin thought, relieved. She had not been certain that her son would want her there after their quarrel. A dutiful squire, she said to Rollam gravely. Bran would have been the same. If Rob seemed cool at table and Edmure surly, Lame Lothar made up for them both. He was the model of courtesy, reminiscing warmly about Lord Hoster, offering Caitlin gentle condolences on the loss of Bran and Rickon, praising Edmure for the victory at Stone Mill, and thanking Rob for the swift, sure justice he had meted out to Ricard Carstark. 
Lothar's bastard brother, Walder Rivers, was another matter. A harsh, sour man with old Lord Walder's suspicious face, he spoke but seldom and devoted most of his attention to the meat and mead that was set before him. When all the empty words were said, the Queen and the other Westerlings excused themselves. The remains of the meal were cleared away, and Lothar Frey cleared his throat. "'Before we turn to the business that brings us here, there is another matter,' he said solemnly. "'A grave matter, I fear. "'I had hoped it would not fall to me to bring you these tidings, but it seems I must. "'My lord father has had a letter from his grandsons.' Caitlin had been so lost in grief for her own that she had almost forgotten the two phrase she had agreed to foster. "'No more,' she thought. "'Mother, have mercy. How many more blows can we bear?' Somehow she knew the next words she heard would plunge yet another blade into her heart. "'The grandsons at Winterfell?' she made herself ask. "'My wards?' "'Walder and Walder, yes. "'But they are presently at the Dreadfort, my lady. "'I grieve to tell you this, but there has been a battle. "'Winterfell is burned.' "'Burned?' Rob's voice was incredulous. "'Your northern lords tried to retake it from the Iron Men. "'When Theon Greyjoy saw that his prize was lost, "'he put the castle to the torch.' "'We have heard naught of any battle,' said Sir Brendan. "'My nephews are young, I grant you, but they were there. "'Big Walder wrote the letter, though his cousin signed as well. "'It was a bloody bit of business by their account. "'Your castellan was slain. "'Sir Roderick, was that his name?' "'Sir Roderick Castle,' said Caitlin numbly. "'That dear, brave, loyal old soul. "'She could almost see him tugging on his fierce white whiskers. "'What of our other people? "'The Iron Men put many of them to the sword, I fear.' "'Wordless with rage, Rob slammed a fist down on the table "'and turned his face away so the phrase would not see his tears. "'But his mother saw them. "'The world grows a little darker every day.' Caitlin's thoughts went to Sir Roderick's little daughter Beth, to tireless Maester Lewin and cheerful Septon Chael, Micken at the forge, Farlin and Paula in the kennels, old Nan and simple Hodor. Her heart was sick. Please, not all. No, said lame Lothar. The women and children hid, my nephews Walder and Walder among them. With Winterfell in ruins, the survivors were carried back to the dread fort by this son of Lord Bolton's. Bolton's son? Rob's voice was strained. Walder Rivers spoke up. A bastard son, I believe. Not Ramsay Snow? Does Lord Roos have another bastard? Rob scowled. This Ramsay was a monster and a murderer, and he died a coward, or so I was told. I cannot speak to that. There is much confusion in any war. Many false reports— all I can tell you is that my nephews claim it was this bastard son of Bolton's who saved the women of Winterfell and the little ones. They are safe at the Dreadfort now, all those who remain. Theon, Rob said suddenly. What happened to Theon Greyjoy? Was he slain? Lame Lothar spread his hands. That I cannot say, Your Grace. Walder and Walder made no mention of his fate. Perhaps Lord Bolton might know if he has had word from this son of his. Sir Brynden said, we will be certain to ask him. You are all distraught, I see. I am sorry to have brought you such fresh grief. Perhaps we should adjourn until the morrow. Our business can wait until you have composed yourselves. No, said Rob. I want the matter settled. Her brother Edmure nodded. Me as well. Do you have an answer to our offer, my lord? I do. Lothar smiled. My lord father bids me tell your grace that he will agree to this new marriage alliance between our houses, and renew his fealty to the king in the north, upon the condition that the king's grace apologize for the insult done to House Frey, in his royal person face to face. An apology was a small enough price to pay, but Caitlin misliked this petty condition of Lord Walder's at once. I am pleased, Rob said cautiously. It was never my wish to cause this rift between us, Lothar. The Freys have fought valiantly for my cause. I would have them at my side once more. You are too kind, Your Grace. As you accept these terms, I am then instructed to offer Lord Tully the hand of my sister, the Lady Rosalind, a maid of sixteen years. Rosalind is my lord father's youngest daughter by Lady Bethany of House Rosby, his sixth wife. 
She has a gentle nature and a gift for music. Edmure shifted in his seat. Might not it be better if I first met— You'll meet when you're wed, said Walder Rivers curtly, unless Lord Tully feels a need to count her teeth first. Edmure kept his temper. I will take your word so far as her teeth are concerned, but it would be pleasant if I might gaze upon her face before I espoused her. You must accept her now, my lord, said Walder Rivers, else my father's offer is withdrawn. Lame Lothar spread his hands. My brother has a soldier's bluntness, but what he says is true. It is my lord father's wish that this marriage take place at once. At once? Edmure sounded so unhappy that Caitlin had the unworthy thought that perhaps he had been entertaining notions of breaking the betrothal after the fighting was done. "'Has Lord Walder forgotten that we are fighting a war?' Brynden Blackfish asked sharply. "'Scarcely,' said Lothar. "'That is why he insists that the marriage take place now, sir. Men die in war, even men who are young and strong. What would become of our alliance should Lord Edmure fall before he took Rosalind to bride?' and there is my father's age to consider as well. He is past ninety, and not like to see the end of the struggle. It would put his noble heart at peace if he could see his dear Rosalind safely wed before the gods take him, so he might die with the knowledge that the girl had a strong husband to cherish and protect her. We all want Lord Walder to die happy. Caitlin was growing less and less comfortable with this arrangement. "'My brother has just lost his own father. He needs time to mourn.' "'Rosalind is a cheerful girl,' said Lothar. "'She may be the very thing Lord Edmure needs to help him through his grief.' "'And my grandfather has come to mislike lengthy betrothals,' the bastard Walter Rivers added. "'I cannot imagine why.' Rob gave him a chilly look. I take your meaning, Rivers. Pray excuse us. As your grace commands, lame Lothar rose, and his bastard brother helped him hobble from the room. Edmure was seething. There is much as saying that my promise is worthless. Why should I let that old weasel choose my bride? Lord Walder has other daughters besides this Rosalind. Granddaughters as well. I should be offered the same choice you were. I'm his liege lord. He should be overjoyed that I'm willing to wed any of them. He is a proud man, and we have wounded him, said Caitlin. The others take his pride. I will not be shamed in my own hall. My answer is no. Rob gave him a weary look. I will not command you, not in this. But if you refuse, Lord Frey will take it for another slight, and any hope of putting this aright will be gone. You cannot know that, Edmure insisted. Frey has wanted me for one of his daughters since the day I was born. He will not let a chance like this slip between those grasping fingers of his. When Lothar brings him our answer, he'll come wheedling back and accept a betrothal, and to a daughter of my choosing. Perhaps in time, said Brynden Blackfish. But can we wait while Lothar rides back and forth with offers and counters? Rob's hands curled into fists. I must get back to the north. My brother's dead, Winterfell burned, my small folk put to the sword. The gods only know what this bastard of Bolton's is about, or whether Theon is still alive and on the loose. I can't sit here waiting for a wedding that might or might not happen. It must happen, said Caitlin, though not gladly. I have no more wish to suffer Walder Frey's insults and complaints than you do, brother. But I see little choice here. Without this wedding, Rob's cause is lost. Edmure, we must accept. We must accept? He echoed peevishly. I don't see you offering to become the ninth Lady Frey, Cat. The eighth Lady Frey is still alive and well, so far as I know, she replied, thankfully. Otherwise it might well have come to that, knowing Lord Walder. The blackfish said, I am the last man in the Seven Kingdoms to tell anyone who they must wed, nephew. Nonetheless, you did say something of making amends for your battle of the fords. I had in mind a different sort of amends, single combat with a kingslayer, seven years of penis as a begging brother, swimming the sunset sea with my legs tied. When he saw that no one was smiling, Edmure threw up his hands. The others take you all. Very well, I'll wed the wench. As amends.
Davos. Lord Alistair looked up sharply. Voices, he said. Do you hear, Davos? Someone is coming for us. Lamprey, said Davos. It's time for our supper, or near enough. Last night Lamprey had brought them half a beef and bacon pie and a flagon of meat as well. Just the thought of it made his belly start to rumble. No, there's more than one. He's right. Davos heard two voices at least, and footsteps growing louder. He got to his feet and moved to the bars. Lord Alistair brushed the straw from his clothes. The king has sent for me, or the queen, yes. Selyse would never let me rot here, her own blood. Outside the cell, Lamp reappeared with a ring of keys in hand. Sir Axel Florent and four guardsmen followed close behind him. They waited beneath the torch while Lamprey searched for the correct key. Axel, Lord Alistair said, gods be good. Is it the king who sends for me or the queen? No one has sent for you, traitor, Sir Axel said. Lord Alistair recoiled as if he'd been slapped. No, I swear to you I committed no treason. Why won't you listen? If his grace would only let me explain. Lamprey thrust a great iron key into the lock, turned it, and pulled open the cell. The rusted hinges screamed in protest. Yo, he said to Davos. Come. Where? Davos looked to Sir Axel. Tell me true, sir. Do you mean to burn me? You are sent for. Can you walk? I can walk. Davos stepped from the cell. Lord Alistair gave a cry of dismay as Lamprey slammed the door shut once more. Take the torch, Sir Axel commanded the jailer. Leave the traitor to the darkness. No, his brother said. Axel, please don't take the light. Gods have mercy. Gods? There is only R'hllor. And the other? Sir Axel gestured sharply, and one of his guardsmen pulled the torch from its sconce and led the way to the stair. Are you taking me to Melisandre? Davos asked. She will be there, Sir Axel said. She is never far from the king. But it is his grace himself who asked for you. Davos lifted his hand to his chest, where once his luck had hung in a leather bag on a thong. Gone now, he remembered, and the ends of four fingers as well. But his hands were still long enough to wrap about a woman's throat, he thought, especially a slender throat like hers. Up they went, climbing the turnpike stair in single file. The walls were rough, dark stone, cool to the touch. The light of the torches went before them, and their shadows marched beside them on the walls. At the third turn they passed an iron gate that opened on blackness, and another at the fifth turn. Davos guessed that they were near the surface by then, perhaps even above it. The next door they came to was made of wood, but still they climbed. Now the walls were broken by arrow slits, but no shafts of sunlight pried their way through the thickness of the stone. It was night outside. His legs were aching by the time Sir Axel thrust open a heavy door and gestured him through. Beyond a high stone bridge arched over emptiness to the massive central tower called the Stone Drum. A sea wind blew restlessly through the arches that supported the roof, and Davos could smell the salt water as they crossed. He took a deep breath, filling his lungs with a clean, cold air. Wind and water, give me strength, he prayed. A huge night-fire burned in the yard below to keep the terrors of the dark at bay, and the Queen's men were gathered around it, singing praises to their new red god. They were in the center of the bridge when Sir Axel stopped suddenly. He made a brusque gesture with his hand, and his men moved out of earshot. Were it my choice, I would burn you with my brother Alistair, he told Davos. You are both traitors. Say what you will, I would never betray King Stannis. You would, you will. I see it in your face. And I have seen it in the flames as well. The Lord has blessed me with that gift. Like Lady Melisandre, he shows me the future in the fire. Stannis Baratheon will sit the Iron Throne. I have seen it. And I know what must be done. His grace must make me his hand in place of my traitor brother. And you will tell him so. Will I? Davos said nothing. The Queen has urged my appointment, Sir Axel went on. 
Even your old friend from Lys, the pirate San, he says the same. We have made a plan together, him and me. Yet his grace does not act. The defeat gnaws inside him, a black worm in his soul. It is up to us who love him to show him what to do. If you are as devoted to his cause as you claim, smuggler, you will join your voice to ours. Tell him that I am the only hand he needs. Tell him. And when we sail, I shall see that you have a new ship. A ship. Davos studied the other man's face. Sir Axel had big florent ears, much like the Queen's. Coarse hair grew from them, as from his nostrils, more sprouted in tufts and patches beneath his double chin. His nose was broad, his brow beetled, his eyes close-set and hostile. He would sooner give me a pyre than a ship, he said as much. But if I do him this favor— If you think to betray me, Sir Axel said, pray remember that I have been Castellan of Dragonstone a good long time. The garrison is mine. Perhaps I cannot burn you without the king's consent, but who is to say you might not suffer a fall? He laid a meaty hand on the back of Davos's neck and shoved him bodily against the waist-high side of the bridge, then shoved a little harder to force his face out over the yard. Do you hear me? I hear, said Davos. And you dare name me traitor? Sir Axel released him. Good, he smiled. His grace awaits. Best we do not keep him. At the very top of Stone Drum, within the great round room called the Chamber of the Painted Table, they found Stannis Baratheon standing behind the artifact that gave the hall its name, a massive slab of wood carved and painted in the shape of Westeros, as it had been in the time of Aegon the Conqueror. An iron brazier stood beside the king, its coals glowing a ruddy orange. Four tall, pointed windows looked out to north, south, east, and west. Beyond was the night and the starry sky. Davos could hear the wind moving, and fainter the sounds of the sea. "'Your grace,' Sir Axel said, "'as it please you, I have brought the Onion Knight.' "'Sir, I see.' Stannis wore a grey wool tunic, a dark red mantle, and a plain black leather belt from which his sword and dagger hung. A red gold crown with flame-shaped points encircled his brows. The look of him was a shock. He seemed ten years older than the man that Davos had left at Storm's End when he set sail for the Blackwater and the battle that would be their undoing. The king's close-cropped beard was spider-webbed with gray hairs, and he had dropped two stone or more of weight. He had never been a fleshy man, but now the bones moved beneath his skin like spears, fighting to cut free. Even his crown seemed too large for his head. His eyes were blue pits, lost in deep hollows, and the shape of a skull could be seen beneath his face. Yet when he saw Davos, a faint smile brushed his lips. So the sea has returned me, my knight of the fish and onions. It did, your grace. Does he know that he had me in his dungeon? Davos went to one knee. Rise, sir, Davos, Stannis commanded. I have missed you, sir. I have need of good counsel, and you never gave me less. So tell me true. What is the penalty for treason? The word hung in the air. A frightful word, thought Davos. Was he being asked to condemn his cellmate, or himself, perchance? Kings know the penalty for treason better than any man. Treason? He finally managed weakly. What else would you call it? To deny your king and seek to steal his rightful throne? I ask you again. What is the penalty for treason under the law? Davos had no choice but to answer. Death, he said. The penalty is death, your grace. It has always been so. I am not... I am not a cruel man, Sir Davos. You know me. have known me long. This is not my decree. It has always been so since Aegon's day and before. Damon Blackfire, the Brothers Toyne, the Vulture King, Grand Maester Harith. Traitors have always paid with their lives. Even Rhaenyra Targaryen. 
She was daughter to one king and mother to two more, yet she died a traitor's death for trying to usurp her brother's crown. It is law. Law, Devas, not cruelty. Yes, your grace. He does not speak of me. Devas felt a moment's pity for his cellmate down in the dark. He knew he should keep silent, but he was tired and sick of heart. And he heard himself say, Sire, Lord Florent meant no treason. Do smugglers have another name for it? I made him hand, and he would have sold my rights for a bowl of peas porridge. He would even have given them Shireen. Mine only child, he would have wed to a bastard born of incest. The king's voice was thick with anger. My brother had a gift for inspiring loyalty, even in his foes. At Summerhall he won three battles in a single day, and brought Lords Grandison and Catherine back to Storm's End as prisoners. He hung their banners in the hall as trophies. Catherine's white fawns were spotted with blood, and Grandison's sleeping lion was torn near in two. Yet they would sit beneath those banners of a night drinking and feasting with Robert. He even took them hunting. These men meant to deliver you to Ares to be burned, I told him after I saw them throwing axes in the yard. You should not be putting axes in their hands. Robert only laughed. I would have thrown Grandison and Catherine into a dungeon, but he turned them into friends. Lord Catherine died at Ashford Castle, cut down by Randall Tarley whilst fighting for Robert. Lord Grandison was wounded on the trident and died of it a year after. My brother made them love him, but it would seem that I inspire only betrayal. Even in mine own blood and kin, brother, grandfather, cousins, good uncle. Your grace, said Sir Axel, I beg you, give me the chance to prove to you that not all Florence are so feeble. Sir Axel would have me resume the war, King Stannis told Davos. The Lannisters think I am done and beaten. And my sworn lords have forsaken me near every one. Even Lord Estamont, my own mother's father, has bent his knee to Joffrey. The few loyal men who remain to me are losing heart. They waste their days drinking and gambling, and lick their wounds like beaten curs. Battle will set their hearts ablaze once more, your grace, Sir Axel said. Defeat is a disease, and victory is the cure. Victory, the king's mouth twisted. There are victories and victories, sir. But tell your plan to Sir Davos. I would hear his views on what you propose. Sir Axel turned to Davos, with a look on his face much like the look that proud Lord Belgrave must have worn the day King Baylor the Blessed had commanded him to wash the beggar's ulcerous feet. Nonetheless, he obeyed. The plan Sir Axel had devised with Salador San was simple. A few hours' sail from Dragonstone lay Claw Isle, ancient sea-girt seat of House Seltigar. Lord Ardrian Seltigar had fought beneath the fiery heart on the Blackwater, but once taken he had wasted no time in going over to Joffrey. He remained in King's Landing even now. Too frightened of his grace's wrath to come near Dragonstone, no doubt, Sir Axel declared, and wisely so. The man has betrayed his rightful king. Sir Axel proposed to use Salador San's fleet and the men who had escaped the Blackwater, Stannis still had some fifteen hundred on Dragonstone, more than half of them Florence, to exact retribution for Lord Celtigar's defection. Claw Isle was but lightly garrisoned, its castle reputedly stuffed with mirish carpets, volantine glass, gold and silver plate, jeweled cups, magnificent hawks, an axe of Valyrian steel, a horn that could summon monsters from the deep, chests of rubies, and more wines than a man could drink in a hundred years. Though Seltigar had shown the world a niggardly face, he had never stinted on his own comforts. "'Put his castle to the torch and his people to the sword, I say,' Sir Axel concluded. "'Leave Claw Isle a desolation of ash and bone, fit only for carrion crows, so the realm might see the fate of those who bed with Lannisters.' Stannis listened to Sir Axel's recitation in silence, grinding his jaw slowly from side to side. When it was done, he said— it could be done, I believe. The risk is small. Joffrey has no strength at sea until Lord Redwine sets sail from the arbor. The plunder might serve to keep that Lacine pirate Salador San loyal for a time. By itself, Claw Isle is worthless, but its fall would serve notice to Lord Tywin that my cause is not yet done. The king turned back to Davos. 
Speak truly, sir. What do you make of Sir Axel's proposal? Speak truly, sir. Davos remembered the dark cell he had shared with Lord Alistair, remembered lamprey and porridge. He thought of the promises that Sir Axel had made on the bridge above the yard. A ship or a shove, what shall it be? But this was Stannis asking. Your grace, he said slowly, I make it folly. I and cowardice. Cowardice! Sir Axel all but shouted. No man calls me craven before my king. Silence! Stannis commanded. Sir Davos, speak on. I would hear your reasons. Davos turned to face Sir Axel. You say we ought show the realm we are not done. Strike a blow. Make war, aye. But on what enemy? You will find no Lannisters on Claw Isle. We will find traitors, said Sir Axel, though it may be I could find some closer to home, even in this very room. Davos ignored the jibe. I don't doubt Lord Seltigar bent the knee to the boy Joffrey. He is an old dun man who wants no more than to end his days in his castle, drinking his fine wine out of his jeweled cups. He turned back to Stannis. Yet he came when you called, sire. Came with his ships and swords. He stood by you at Storm's Inn when Lord Renly came down on us, and his ships sailed up the Blackwater. His men fought for you, killed for you, burned for you. Claw Isle is weakly held, yes, held by women and children and old men. And why is that? Because their husbands and sons and fathers died on the Blackwater, that's why. Died at their oars or with swords in their hands, fighting beneath our banners. Yet Sir Axel proposes we swoop down on the homes they left behind to rape their widows and put their children to the sword. These small folk are no traitors. They are, insisted Sir Axel. Not all of Saltigar's men were slain on the Blackwater. Hundreds were taken with their lord and bent the knee when he did. When he did, Davos repeated. They were his men, his sworn men. What choice were they given? Every man has choices. They might have refused to kneel. Some did and died for it. Yet they died true men and loyal. Some men are stronger than others. It was a feeble answer, and Davos knew it. Stannis Baratheon was a man of iron will who neither understood nor forgave weakness in others. I am losing, he thought, despairing. It is every man's duty to remain loyal to his rightful king, even if the lord he serves proves false, Stannis declared in a tone that brooked no argument. A desperate folly took hold of Davos, a recklessness akin to madness. As you remained loyal to King Ares when your brother raised his banners, he blurted. Shocked silence followed until Sir Axel cried, Treason! and snatched his dagger from its sheath. Your grace, he speaks his infamy to your face. Davos could hear Stannis grinding his teeth. A vein bulged, blue and swollen, in the king's brow. Their eyes met. Put up your knife, Sir Axel, and leave us. As it please, Your Grace. It would please me for you to leave, said Stannis. Take yourself from my presence, and send me Melisandre. As you command. Sir Axel slid the knife away, bowed, and hurried it toward the door. His boots rang against the floor, angry. You have always presumed on my forbearance, Stannis warned at Davos when they were alone. I can shorten your tongue as easy as I did your fingers, smuggler. I am your man, your grace. So it is your tongue to do with as you please. It is, he said calmer, and I would have it speak the truth, though the truth is a bitter draught at times. There is... If you only knew, that was a hard choosing. My blood or my liege? My brother or my king? He grimaced. Have you ever seen the Iron Throne? The barbs along the back, the ribbons of twisted steel, the jagged ends of swords and knives all tangled up and melted? It is not a comfortable seat, sir. Ares cut himself so often men took to calling him King Scab, and Magor the Cruel was murdered in that chair, 
buy that chair to hear some tell it. It is not a seat where a man can rest at ease. Oft times I wonder why my brothers wanted it so desperately. Why would you want it, then? Devos asked him. It is not a question of wanting. The throne is mine, as Robert's heir. That is law. After me, it must pass to my daughter, unless Selyse should finally give me a son. He ran three fingers lightly down the table, over the layers of smooth, hard varnish, dark with age. I am king. Wants do not enter into it. I have a duty to my daughter, to the realm, even to Robert. He loved me but little, I know, yet he was my brother. The Lannister woman gave him horns and made a motley fool of him. She may have murdered him as well as she murdered John Arryn and Ned Stark. For such crimes there must be justice, starting with Cersei and her abominations. But only starting. I mean to scour that court clean, as Robert should have done after the trident. Sir Barristan once told me that the rot in King Ares' reign began with Varys. The eunuch should never have been pardoned, no more than the Kingslayer. At the least, Robert should have stripped the white cloak from Jamie and sent him to the wall, as Lord Stark urged. He listened to John Arryn instead. I was still at Storm's End, under siege and unconsulted. He turned abruptly, to give Davos a hard, shrewd look. The truth, now. Why did you wish to murder Lady Melisandre? So he does know. Davos could not lie to him. Four of my sons burned on the Blackwater. She gave them to the flames. You wrong her. Those fires were no work of hers. Curse the imp, curse the pyromancers, curse that fool of Florent who sailed my fleet into the jaws of a trap. Or curse me for my stubborn pride for sending her away when I needed her most. But not Melisandre. She remains my faithful servant. Maester Cresson was your faithful servant. She slew him as she killed Sir Courtney Penrose and your brother Renly. Now you sound a fool, the king complained. She saw Renly's end in the flames, yes, but she had no more part in it than I did. The priestess was with me. Your Devon would tell you so. Ask him if you doubt me. She would have spared Renly if she could. It was Melisandre who urged me to meet with him and give him one last chance to amend his treason. And it was Melisandre who told me to send for you when Sir Axel wished to give you to Valor. He smiled thinly. Does that surprise you? Yes. She knows I am no friend to her or her red god. But you are a friend to me. She knows that as well. He beckoned Davos closer. The boy is sick. Maester Pylos has been leeching him. The boy? His thoughts went to his Devon, the king's squire. My son, sire. Devon? A good boy. He has much of you in him. It is Robert's bastard who is sick, the boy we took at Storm's End. Edric Storm. I spoke with him in Aegon's garden. As she wished, as she saw. Stannis sighed. Did the boy charm you? He has that gift. He got it from his father with the blood. He knows he is a king's son, but chooses to forget that he is bastard-born. And he worships Robert, as Renly did when he was young. My royal brother played the fond father on his visits to Storm's End, and there were gifts, swords and ponies and fur-trimmed cloaks. The eunuch's work, every one. The boy would write the Red Keep full of thanks, and Robert would laugh and ask Varys what he'd sent this year. Renly was no better. He left the boy's upbringing to castellans and maesters, and every one fell victim to his charm. Penrose chose to die rather than give him up. The king ground his teeth together. It still angers me. How could he think I would hurt the boy? I chose Robert, did I not? When that hard day came, I chose blood over honor. He does not use the boy's name. That made Davos very uneasy. I hope young Edric will recover soon. Stannis waved a hand, dismissing his concern. It is a churl no more. 
He coughs, he shivers, he has a fever. Maester Pylos will soon set him right. By himself the boy is not, you understand. But in his veins flows my brother's blood. There is power in a king's blood, she says. Davos did not have to ask who she was. Stannis touched the painted table. Look at it on your night. My realm by rights. My Westeros. He swept a hand across it. This talk of seven kingdoms is a folly. Aegon saw that three hundred years ago when he stood where we are standing. They painted this table on his command. Rivers and bays they painted, hills and mountains, castles and cities and market towns, lakes and swamps and forests. But no borders. It is all one, one realm for one king to rule alone. One king, agreed Davos. One king means peace. I shall bring justice to Westeros. A thing Sir Axel understands as little as he does war. Claw ire would gain me not, and it was evil, just as you said. Seltigar must pay the traitor's price himself in his own person. And when I come into my kingdom he shall. Every man shall reap what he has sown, from the highest lord to the lowest gutter rat. And some will lose more than the tips off their fingers, I promise you. They have made my kingdom bleed, and I do not forget that. King Stannis turned from the table. On your knees, on your knight. Your grace. For your onions and fish I made you a knight once. For this I am of a mind to raise you to lord. This? Davos was lost. I am content to be your knight, your grace. I would not know how to begin being lordly. Good. To be lordly is to be false. I have learned that lesson hard. Now, kneel. Your king commands. Davos knelt, and Stannis drew his longsword. Lightbringer, Melisandre had named it, the red sword of heroes, drawn from the fires where the seven gods were consumed. The room seemed to grow brighter as the blade slid from its scabbard. The steel had a glow to it, now orange, now yellow, now red. The air shimmered around it, and no jewel had ever sparkled so brilliantly. But when Stannis touched it to Davos's shoulder, it felt no different than any other longsword. "'Sir Davos of House Seaworth,' the king said, "'are you my true and honest liege man, now and forever?' "'I am, Your Grace.' And do you swear to serve me loyally all your days, to give me honest counsel and swift obedience, to defend my rights and my realm against all foes in battles great and small, to protect my people and punish my enemies? I do, Your Grace. Then rise again, Davos Seaworth, and rise as Lord of the Rainwood, Admiral of the Narrow Sea, and Hand of the King. For a moment Davos was too stunned to move. I woke this morning in his dungeon. Your grace, you cannot. I am no fit man to be a king's hand. There is no man fitter. Stannis sheathed Lightbringer, gave Davos his hand, and pulled him to his feet. I am lowborn, Davos reminded him, an up-jumped smuggler. Your lords will never obey me. Then we will make new lords. But I cannot read nor write. Maester Pylos can read for you. As to writing, my last hand wrote the head off his shoulders. All I ask of you are the things you've always given me. Honesty, loyalty, service. Surely there is someone better, some great lord, Stannis snorted. Bar Emon, that boy? My faithless grandfather? Seltigar has abandoned me. The new Valarion is six years old, and the new Sunglass sailed for Volantis after I burned his brother. He made an angry gesture. A few good men remain, it's true. Sir Gilbert Faring holds Storm's End for me still, with two hundred loyal men. Lord Morrigan, the bastard of Night Song, young Chittering, my cousin Andrew. But I trust none of them, as I trust you, my Lord of Rainwood. You will be my hand. It is you I want beside me for the battle. Another battle will be the end of all of us, thought Davos. Lord Alistair saw that much true enough. Your grace asked for honest counsel. 
In honesty, then. We lack the strength for another battle against the Lannisters. It is the great battle His Grace is speaking of, said a woman's voice, rich with the accents of the East. Marasandra stood at the door in her red silks and shimmering satins, holding a covered silver dish in her hands. These little wars are no more than a scuffle of children before what is to come. The one whose name may not be spoken is marshalling his power, Davos Seaworth. A power, fell and evil and strong beyond measure. Soon comes the cold, and the night that never ends. She placed the silver dish on the painted table. Unless true men find the courage to fight it, men whose hearts are fire. Stannis stared at the silver dish. She has shown it to me, Lord Davos, in the flames. You saw it, sire? It was not like Stannis Baratheon to lie about such a thing. With my own eyes. After the battle, when I was lost to despair, the Lady Melisandre bid me gaze into the hearth fire. The chimney was drawing strongly, and bits of ash were rising from the fire. I stared at them, feeling half a fool, but she bid me look deeper, and... The ashes were white, rising in the updraft, yet all at once it seemed as if they were falling. Snow, I thought. Then the sparks in the air seemed to circle, to become a ring of torches, and I was looking through the fire, down on some high hill in a forest. The cinders had become men in black behind the torches, and there were shapes moving through the snow. For all the heat of the fire I felt a cold, so terrible I shivered, and when I did, the sight was gone. The fire, but a fire once again. But what I saw was real, I stake my kingdom on it. And have, said Marisandra. The conviction in the king's voice frightened Davos to the core. A hill in a forest? Shapes in the snow? I don't— It means that the battle is begun, said Marisandra. The sand is running through the glass more quickly now, and man's hour on earth is almost done. We must act boldly, or all hope is lost. Westeros must unite beneath her one true king, the prince that was promised, lord of Dragonstone, and chosen of R'hllor. The Lord chooses queerly, then. The king grimaced as if he'd tasted something foul. Why me, and not my brothers? Renly and his peach? In my dreams I see the juice running from his mouth, the blood from his throat. If he had done his duty by his brother, we would have smashed Lord Tywin. A victory even Robert could be proud of. Robert. His teeth ground side to side. He is in my dreams as well, laughing, drinking, boasting. Those were the things he was best at, those and fighting. I never bested him at anything. The Lord of Light should have made Robert his champion. Why me? Because you are a righteous man, said Melisandre. A righteous man. Stannis touched the covered silver platter with a finger. With leeches. Yes, said Melisandre, but I must tell you once more, this is not the way. You swore it would work, the king looked angry. It will, and it will not. Which? Both. Speak sense to me, woman. When the fires speak more plainly, so shall I. There is truth in the flames, but it is not always easy to see. The great ruby at her throat drank fire from the glow of the brazier. Give me the boy, your grace. It is the surer way, the better way. Give me the boy, and I shall wake the stone dragon. I have told you no. He is only one base-born boy against all the boys of Westeros, and all the girls as well against all the children that might ever be born in all the kingdoms of the world. The boy is innocent. 
The boy defiled your marriage bed, else you would surely have sons of your own. He shamed you. Robert did that, not the boy. My daughter has grown fond of him, and he is mine own blood. Your brother's blood, Melisandre said, a king's blood. Only a king's blood can wake the stone dragon. Stannis ground his teeth. I'll hear no more of this. The dragons are done. The Targaryens tried to bring them back half a dozen times, and made fools of themselves or corpses. Patchface is the only fool we need on this godforsaken rock. You have the leeches. Do your work. Melisandre bowed her head stiffly and said, As my king commands. Reaching up her left sleeve with her right hand, she flung a handful of powder into the brazier. The coals roared. As pale flames writhed atop them, the red woman retrieved the silver dish and brought it to the king. Davos watched her lift the lid. Beneath were three large black leeches, fat with blood. The boy's blood, Davos knew, a king's blood. Stannis stretched forth a hand, and his fingers closed around one of the leeches. "'Say the name,' Melisandre commanded. The leech was twisting in the king's grip, trying to attach itself to one of his fingers. "'The usurper,' he said, "'Joffrey Baratheon. When he tossed the leech into the fire, it curled up like an autumn leaf amidst the coals and burned. Stannis grasped the second. "'The usurper!' he declared louder this time. Balan Greyjoy! He flipped it lightly onto the brazier, and its flesh split and cracked. The blood burst from it, hissing and smoking. The last was in the king's hand. This one he studied a moment as it writhed between his fingers. The usurper! he said at last. Rob Stark! And he threw it on the flames. Jamie. Aaron Hall's bathhouse was a dim, steamy, low-ceilinged room filled with great stone tubs. When they led Jamie in, they found Brienne seated in one of them, scrubbing her arm almost angrily. "'Not so hard, wench,' he called. "'You'll scrub the skin off!' She dropped her brush and covered her tits with hands as big as Gregor Clegane's. The pointy little buds she was so intent on hiding would have looked more natural on some ten-year-old than they did on her thick, muscular chest. "'What are you doing here?' she demanded. "'Lord Bolton insists I sup with him, but he neglected to invite my fleas.' Jamie tugged at his guard with his left hand. "'Help me out of these stinking rags.' One-handed, he could not so much as unlace his breeches. The man obeyed grudgingly, but he obeyed. "'Now leave us.' Jimmy said, when his clothes lay in a pile on the wet stone floor. "'My Lady of Tarth doesn't want the likes of you, scum, gaping at her tits.' He pointed his stump at the hatchet-faced woman attending Brienne. "'You two, wait without. There's only the one door, and the wench is too big to try and chinny up a chimney.' The habit of obedience went deep. The woman followed his guard out, leaving the bathhouse to the two of them. The tubs were large enough to hold six or seven, after the fashion of the free cities, so Jamie climbed in with a winch, awkward and slow. Both his eyes were open, though the right remained somewhat swollen, despite Kyburn's leeches. Jamie felt a hundred and nine years old, which was a deal better than he had been feeling when he came to Harrenhal. Brienne shrunk away from him. There are other tubs. This one suits me well enough. Gingerly he immersed himself up to the chin in the steaming water. "'Have no fear, wench. Your thighs are purple and green, and I'm not interested in what you've got between them.' He had to rest his right arm on the rim, since Kyburn had warned him to keep the linen dry. He could feel the tension drain from his legs, but his head spun. "'If I faint, pull me out. No Lannister has ever drowned in his bath, and I don't mean to be the first. Why should I care how you die?' You swore a solemn vow. He smiled as a red flush crept up the thick white column of her neck. She turned her back to him. Still the shy maiden. What is it that you think I haven't seen? He groped for the brush she had dropped, caught it with his fingers, and began to scrub himself desultorily. Even that was difficult, awkward. My left hand is good for nothing. 
Still the water darkened as the caked dirt dissolved off his skin. The winch kept her back to him, the muscles in her great shoulders hunched and hard. "'Does the sight of my stump distress you so?' Jimmy asked. "'You ought to be pleased. I've lost the hand I killed the king with, the hand that flung the Stark boy from that tower, the hand I'd slide between my sister's thighs to make her wet.' He thrust his stump at her face. "'No wonder Renly died with you guarding him.' She jerked to her feet as if he'd struck her, sending a wash of hot water across the tub. Jamie caught a glimpse of the thick, blonde bush at the juncture of her thighs as she climbed out. She was much hairier than his sister. Absurdly, he felt his cock stir beneath the bathwater. "'Now I know I have been too long away from Circe.' He averted his eyes, troubled by his body's response. "'That was unworthy,' he mumbled. "'I'm a maimed man and bitter. Forgive me, wench. You protected me as well as any man could have, and better than most.' She wrapped her nakedness in a towel. "'Do you mock me?' That pricked him back to anger. "'Are you as thick as a castle wall? That was an apology. I am tired of fighting with you. What say we make a truce? Truces are built on trust. Would you have me trust the king slayer? Yes. The oathbreaker who murdered poor sad Ares Targaryen? Jamie snorted. It's not Ares I rue, it's Robert. I hear they've named you king slayer, he said to me at his coronation feast. Just don't think to make it a habit. And he laughed. Why is it that no one names Robert Oathbreaker? He tore the realm apart, yet I am the one with shit for honor. Robert did all he did for love. Water ran down Brienne's legs and pooled beneath her feet. Robert did all he did for pride, a cunt and a pretty face. He made a fist, or would have if he'd had a hand. Pain lanced up his arm, cruel as laughter. He rode to save the realm, she insisted to save the realm. Did you know that my brother set the Blackwater rush afire? Wildfire will burn on water. Ares would have bathed in it if he'd dared. The Targaryens were all mad for fire. Jamie felt lightheaded. It is the heat in here, the poison in my blood, the last of my fever. I am not myself. He eased himself down until the water reached his chin. Soiled my white cloak. I wore my gold armor that day, but... Gold armor? Her voice sounded far off, faint. He floated in heat, in memory. After dancing griffins lost the Battle of the Bells, Ares exiled him. Why am I telling this absurd, ugly child? He had finally realized that Robert was no mere outlaw lord to be crushed at wind, but the greatest threat House Targaryen had faced since Daemon Blackfire. The king reminded Lewin Martell gracelessly that he held Elia and sent him to take command of the ten thousand Dornishmen coming up the king's road. John Derry and Baristan Selmy rode to Stony Sep to rally what they could of Griffin's men, and Prince Rhaegar returned from the south and persuaded his father to swallow his pride and summon my father. But no raven returned from Casterly Rock, and that made the king even more afraid. He saw traitors everywhere, and Varys was always there to point out any he might have missed. So his grace commanded his alchemists to place caches of wildfire all over King's Landing, beneath Balar's sept and the hovels of Flea Bottom, under stables and storehouses, at all seven gates, even in the cellars of the Red Keep itself. Everything was done in the utmost secrecy by a handful of master pyromancers. They did not even trust their own acolytes to help. The Queen's eyes had been closed for years, and Rhaegar was busy marshalling an army, but Ares's new mason dagger hand was not utterly stupid. And with Rossart, Bellis, and Garagus coming and going night and day, he became suspicious. Chelstead, that was his name, Lord Chelstead. It had come back to him suddenly, with a telling, 
I thought the man craven, but the day he confronted Ares, he found some courage somewhere. He did all he could to dissuade him. He reasoned, he jested, he threatened, and finally he begged. When that failed, he took off his chain of office and flung it down on the floor. Ares burnt him alive for that, and hung his chain about the neck of Rossart, his favorite paramancer. The man who had cooked Lord Rickard Stark in his own armor. And all the time I stood by the foot of the Iron Throne in my white plate, still as a corpse, guarding my liege and all his sweet secrets. My sworn brothers were all away, you see, but Ares liked to keep me close. I was my father's son, so he did not trust me. He wanted me where Varys could watch me, day and night. So I heard it all. He remembered how Rossart's eyes would shine when he unrolled his maps to show where the substance must be placed. Garrigus and Bellis were the same. Rhaegar met Robert on the trident, and you know what happened there. When the word reached court, Ares packed the queen off to Dragonstone with Prince Viserys. Princess Elia would have gone as well, but he forbade it. Somehow he had gotten it in his head that Prince Lewin must have betrayed Rhaegar on the trident, but he thought he could keep Dorn loyal so long as he kept Elia and Aegon by his side. The traitors want my city, I heard him tell Rossart. But I'll give them naught but ashes. Let Robert be king over charred bones and cooked meat. The Targaryens never bury their dead. They burn them. Ares meant to have the greatest funeral pyre of them all. Though, if truth be told, I do not believe he truly expected to die. Like Arion bright fire before him, Ares thought the fire would transform him. That he would rise again, reborn as a dragon, and turn all his enemies to ash. Ned Stark was racing south with Robert's van, but my father's forces reached the city first. Pacell convinced the king that his warden of the west had come to defend him, so he opened the gates. The one time he should have heeded Varys, and he ignored him. My father had held back from the war, brooding on all the wrongs Ares had done him, and determined that House Lannister should be on the winning side. The trident decided him. It fell to me to hold the Red Keep, but I knew we were lost. I sent to Ares, asking his leave to make terms. My man came back with a royal command. Bring me your father's head if you are no traitor. Ares would have no yielding. Lord Rossart was with him, my messenger said. I knew what that meant. When I came on Rossart, he was dressed as a common man in arms, hurrying to a postern gate. I slew him first. Then I slew Ares before he could find someone else to carry his message to the pyromancers. Days later I hunted down the others and slew them as well. Bellus offered me gold, and Garrigus wept for mercy. Well, a sword's more merciful than fire. But I don't think Garrigus much appreciated the kindness I showed him. The water had grown cool. When Jamie opened his eyes, he found himself staring at the stump of his sword hand. The hand that made me Kingslayer. The goat had robbed him of his glory and his shame, both at once. Leaving what? Who am I now? The wench looked ridiculous, clutching her towel to her meager tits with her thick white legs sticking out beneath. Has my tail turned you speechless? Come, curse me, or kiss me, or call me a lie, or something. If this is true, how is it no one knows? The knights of the king's guard are sworn to keep the king's secrets. Would you have me break my oath? Jimmy laughed. Do you think the noble lord of Winterfell wanted to hear my feeble explanations? Such an honorable man. He only had to look at me to judge me guilty. Jimmy lurched to his feet, the water running cold down his chest. By what right does the wolf judge the lion? By what right? A violent shiver took him, and he smashed his stump against the rim of the tub as he tried to climb out. Pain shuddered through him, and suddenly the bathhouse was spinning. Brienne caught him before he could fall. 
Her arm was all goose-flesh, clammy and chilled, but she was strong and gentler than he would have thought. Gentler than Circe, he thought, as she helped him from the tub, his legs wobbly as a limp cock. Gods! he heard the wench shout. The Kingslayer! Jamie, he thought. My name is Jamie. The next he knew he was lying on the damp floor with the guards and the wench and Kyburn all standing over him looking concerned. Brienne was naked, but she seemed to have forgotten that for the moment. The heat of the tubs will do it, Maester Kyburn was telling them. No, he's not a maester. They took his chain. There's still poison in his blood as well, and he's malnourished. What have you been feeding him? Worms and piss and grey vomit, offered Jamie. Hard bread and water and oat porridge, insisted the guard. He don't hardly eat it, though. What should we do with him? Scrub him and dress him and carry him to King's Pyre, if need be, Kyburn said. Lord Bolton insists he will sup with him tonight. The time is growing short. Bring me clean garb for him, Brienne said. I'll see that he's washed and dressed. The others were all too glad to give her the task. They lifted him to his feet and sat him on a stone bench by the wall. Brienne went away to retrieve her towel and returned with a stiff brush to finish scrubbing him. One of the guards gave her a razor to trim his beard. Kyburn returned with rough-spun small clothes, clean black woolen breeches, a loose green tunic, and a leather jerkin that laced up the front. Jamie was feeling less dizzy by then, though no less clumsy. With the wench's help, he managed to dress himself. Now all I need is a silver looking glass. The bloody maester had brought fresh clothing for Brienne as well, a stained pink satin gown and a linen under tunic. I am sorry, my lady. These were the only women's garments in Harren Hall large enough to fit you. It was obvious at once that the gown had been cut for someone with slimmer arms, shorter legs, and much fuller breasts. The fine mirish lace did little to conceal the bruising that mottled Brienne's skin. All in all, the garb made the wench look ludicrous. She has thicker shoulders than I do, and a bigger neck, Jamie thought. Small wonder she prefers to dress in mail. Pink was not a kind color for her either. A dozen cruel japes leaped into his head, but for once he kept them there. Best not to make her angry. He was no match for her one-handed. Kyburn had brought a flask as well. What is it? Jamie demanded, when the chainless maester pressed him to drink. Liquorice steeped in vinegar with honey and cloves. It will give you some strength and clear your head. Bring me the potion that grows new hands, said Jamie. That's the one I want. Drink it, Brienne said, unsmiling. And he did. It was half an hour before he felt strong enough to stand. After the dim, wet warmth of the bathhouse, the air outside was a slap across the face. "'The Lord will be looking for him by now,' a guard told Kyburn. "'Her, too. Do I need to carry him?' "'I can still walk. Brienne, give me your arm.' Clutching her, Jamie let them herd him across the yard to a vast, drafty hall, larger even than the throne room in King's Landing. Huge hearths lined the walls, one every ten feet or so, more than he could count. But no fires had been lit, so the chill between the walls went bone-deep. A dozen spearmen in fur cloaks guarded the doors and the steps that led up to the two galleries above, and in the center of that immense emptiness, at a trestle table surrounded by what seemed like acres of smooth slate floor, the lord of the dread fort waited, attended only by a cup-bearer. "'My lord,' said Brienne, when they stood before him. Bruce Bolton's eyes were paler than stone.' darker than milk, and his voice was spider-soft. "'I am pleased that you are strong enough to attend me, sir. My lady, do be seated.' He gestured to the spread of cheese, bread, cold meat, and fruit that covered the table. "'Will you drink red or white? Of indifferent vintage, I fear. Sir Amory drained Lady Wentzellers nearly dry.' "'I trust you killed him for it.' Jamie slid into the offered seat quickly, so Bolton could not see how weak he was. White is for Starks. I'll drink red like a good Lannister. I would prefer water, said Brienne. 
Elmara, the bread for Sir Jamie, water for the Lady Brienne, and Hippocras for myself. Bolton waved a hand at their escort, dismissing them, and the men beat a silent retreat. Habit made Jamie reach for his wine with his right hand. His stump rocked the goblet, spattering his clean linen bandages with bright red spots, and forcing him to catch the cup with his left hand before it fell. But Bolton pretended not to notice his clumsiness. The Northman helped himself to a prune and ate it with small, sharp bites. Do try these, Sir Jamie. They are most sweet and help move the bowels as well. Lord Vargo took them from an inn before he burnt it. My bowels move fine. That goat's no lord, and your prunes don't interest me half so much as your intentions. Regarding you? A faint smile touched Roose Bolton's lips. You are a perilous prize, sir. You sow dissension wherever you go, even here in my happy house of Harrenhal. His voice was a whisker above a whisper. And in Riveron as well, it seems. Do you know, Edmure Tully has offered a thousand golden dragons for your recapture? Is that all? My sister will pay ten times as much. Well, shame. That smile again, there for an instant, gone as quick. Ten thousand dragons is a formidable sum. Of course, there is Lord Carstark's offer to consider as well. He promises the hand of his daughter to the man who brings him your head. Leave it to your goat to get it backward, said Jamie. Bolton gave a soft chuckle. Arion Carstark was captive here when we took the castle, did you know? I gave him all the carhold men still with me, and sent him off with Glover. I do hope nothing ill befell him at Duskendale, else Alice Carstark would be all that remains of Lord Rickard's progeny. He chose another prune. Fortunately for you, I have no need of a wife. I wed the Lady Walda Frey whilst I was at the Twins. Fair Walda? Awkwardly, Jamie tried to hold the bread with the stump while tearing it with his left hand. Fat Walda. My lord of Frey offered me my bride's weight in silver for a dowry, so I chose accordingly. Elma, break off some bread for Sir Jamie. The boy tore a fist-sized chunk off one end of the loaf and handed it to Jamie. Brienne tore her own bread. Lord Bolton, she asked, it said you mean to give Harrenhal to Varga Howitt. That was his price. Lord Bolton said, The Lannisters are not the only men who pay their debts. I must take my leave soon in any case. Edmure Tully is to wed the Lady Rosalind Frey at the Twins, and my king commands my attendance. Edmure weds? said Jamie. Not Rob Stark? His Grace King Rob is wed. Bolton spit a prune pit into his hand and put it aside. To a westerling of the crag. I am told her name is Jane. No doubt you know her, sir. Her father is your father's bannerman. My father has a good many bannermen, and most of them have daughters. Jamie groped one-handed for his goblet, trying to recall this Jane. The westerlings were an old house with more pride than power. This cannot be true, Brienne said stubbornly. King Rob was sworn to wed a fray. He would never break faith. He... His grace is a boy of sixteen, said Roose Bolton mildly, and I would thank you not to question my word, my lady. Jamie felt almost sorry for Rob Stark. He won the war on the battlefield and lost it in a bedchamber, poor fool. How does Lord Walder relish dining on trout in place of wolf? he asked. Oh, trout makes for a tasty supper. Bolton lifted a pale finger toward his cup-bearer. Though my poor Elmar is bereft, he was to wed Arya Stark, but my good father of Frey had no choice but to break the betrothal when King Rob betrayed him. Is there word of Arya Stark? Brienne leaned forward. Lady Caitlin had feared that— Is the girl still alive? Oh, yes, said the Lord of the Dreadfort. You have certain knowledge of that, my lord. Roose Bolton shrugged. Arya Stark was lost for a time, it was true, but now she has been found. 
I mean to see her returned safely to the north. Her and her sister both, said Brienne. Tyrion Lannister has promised us both girls for his brother. That seemed to amuse the Lord of the Dreadfort. My lady, has no one told you? Lannisters lie. Is that a slight on the honor of my house? Jimmy picked up the cheese knife with his good hand. A rounded point and dull, he said, sliding his thumb along the edge of the blade, but it will go through your eye all the same. Sweat beaded his brow. He could only hope he did not look as feeble as he felt. Lord Bolton's little smile paid another visit to his lips. You speak boldly for a man who needs help to break his bread. My guards are all around us, I remind you. All around us and half a league away, Jimmy glanced down the vast length of the hall. By the time they reach us, you'll be as dead as Ares. "'Tis scarcely chivalrous to threaten your host over his own cheese and olives,' the lord of the Dreadfort scolded. "'In the north we hold the laws of hospitality sacred still.' "'I'm a captive here, not a guest. Your goat cut off my hand. If you think some prunes will make me overlook that, you're bloody well mistaken.' That took Roose Bolton aback. "'Perhaps I am.' Perhaps I ought to make a wedding gift of you to Edmure Tully, or strike your head off, as your sister did for Eddard Stark. I would not advise it. Casterly Rock is a long memory. A thousand leagues of mountain, sea, and bog lie between my walls and your rock. Lannister enmity means little to Bolton. Lannister friendship could mean much. Jamie thought he knew the game they were playing now. But does the wench know as well? He dare not look to see. I am not certain you are the sort of friends a wise man would want. Bruce Bolton beckoned to the boy. Elmar, carve our guests a slice off the roast. Brienne was served first, but made no move to eat. My lord, she said, Sir Jamie is to be exchanged for Lady Caitlin's daughters. You must free us to continue on our way. The raven that came from Riverrun told of an escape, not an exchange. And if you helped this captive slip his bonds, you are guilty of treason, my lady. The big wench rose to her feet. I serve Lady Stark, and I the king in the north, or the king who lost the north, as some now call him, who never wished to trade Sir Jamie back to the Lannisters. Sit down and eat, Brienne. Jamie urged, as Elmar placed a slice of roast before him, dark and bloody. If Bolton meant to kill us, he wouldn't be wasting his precious prunes on us, at such peril to his bowels. He stared at the meat and realized there was no way to cut it, one-handed. I am worth less than a girl now, he thought. The goat's even to the trade, though I doubt Lady Caitlin will thank him when Circe returns her whelps in like condition. The thought made him grimace. I will get the blame for that as well, I'll wager. Bruce Bolton cut his meat methodically, the blood running across his plate. Lady Brienne, will you sit if I tell you that I hope to send Sir Jamie on, just as you and Lady Stark desire? I... Uh, you'd send us on? The wench sounded wary, but she sat. That is good, my lord. It is. However, Lord Vargo has created me one small difficulty. He turned his pale eyes on Jamie. Do you know why Howitt cut off your hand? He enjoys cutting off hands. The linen that covered Jamie's stump was spotted with blood and wine. He enjoys cutting off feet as well. He doesn't seem to need a reason. Nonetheless, he had one. Poet is more cunning than he appears. No man commands a company such as the brave companions for long, unless he has some wits about him. Bolton stabbed a chunk of meat with the point of his dagger, put it in his mouth, chewed thoughtfully, swallowed. Lord Vargo abandoned House Lannister because I offered him Harrenhal, a reward a thousand times greater than any he could hope to have from Lord Tywin. As a stranger to Westeros, he did not know the prize was poisoned. 
The curse of Harren the Black? Marked Jamie. The curse of Tywin Lannister. Bolton held out his goblet, and Elmar refilled it silently. Our goat should have consulted the Tarbex or the Reigns. They might have warned him how your Lord Father deals with betrayal. There are no Tarbex or Reigns, said Jamie. My point precisely. Lord Vargo doubtless hoped that Lord Stannis would triumph at King's Landing, and thence confirm him in his possession of this castle in gratitude for his small part in the downfall of House Lannister. He gave a dry chuckle. He knows little of Stannis Baratheon either, I fear. That one might have given him Harrenhal for his service, but he would have given him a noose for his crimes as well. A noose is kinder than what he'll get from my father. By now he has come to the same realization. With Stannis broken and Renly dead, only a stark victory can save him from Lord Tywin's vengeance. But the chances of that grow perishingly slim. King Rob has won every battle, Brienne said stoutly, as stubbornly loyal of speech as she was of deed. Won every battle. While losing the Freys, the Carstarks, Winterfell, and the North. A pity the wolf is so young. Boys of sixteen always believe they are immortal and invincible. An older man would bend the knee, I'd think. After a war there is always a peace, and with peace there are pardons. For the Rob Starks, at least. Not for the likes of Varga Hoet. Bolton gave him a small smile. Both sides have made use of him, but neither will shed a tear at his passing. The brave companions did not fight in the Battle of the Blackwater, yet they died there all the same. You'll forgive me if I don't mourn? You have no pity for our wretched doomed goat? Ah, but the gods must. Else why deliver you into his hands? Bolton chewed another chunk of meat. Carhold is smaller and meaner than Harrenhal, but it lies well beyond the reach of the lion's claws. Once wed to Alice Carstock, how it might be a lord in truth. If he could collect some gold from your father, so much the better. But he would have delivered you to Lord Rickard, no matter how much Lord Tywin paid. His price would be the maid and safe refuge. But to sell you, he must keep you, and the Riverlands are full of those who would gladly steal you away. Glover and Tallheart were broken at Duskendale, but remnants of their host are still abroad, with their mountains slaughtering the stragglers. A thousand Carstarks prowl the lands south and east of River Run, hunting you. Elsewhere are dairy men, left lordless and lawless, packs of four-footed wolves, and the lightning lord's outlaw bands. Don Darion would gladly hang you and the goat together from the same tree. The lord of the dread fort sopped up some of the blood with a chunk of bread. Harrenhal was the only place Lord Vargo could hope to hold you safe. But here his brave companions are much outnumbered by my own men, and by Sir Aeneas and his phrase. No doubt, he feared, I might return you to Sir Edmure at Riveron, or worse, send you on to your father. By maiming you, he meant to remove your sword as a threat, gain himself a grisly token to send to your father, and diminish your value to me. For he is my man, as I am King Rob's man. Thus his crime is mine, or may seem so in your father's eyes, and therein lies my small difficulty. He gazed at Jamie, his pale eyes unblinking, expectant, chill. I see. You want me to absolve you of blame, to tell my father that this stump is no work of yours. Jamie laughed. My lord, send me to Circe, and I'll sing as sweet a song as you could want of how gently you treated me. Any other answer he knew, and Bolton would give him back to the goat. Had I a hand, I'd write it out. 
How I was maimed by the soul sword my own father brought to Westeros, and saved by the noble Lord Bolton. I will trust to your word, sir. There is something I don't often hear. How soon might we be permitted to leave? And how do you mean to get me past all these wolves and brigands and Karstarks? You will leave when Kyburn says you are strong enough, with a strong escort of picked men under the command of my captain, Walton Steelshanks, he is called, a soldier of iron loyalty. Walton will see you safe and whole to King's Landing. Provided Lady Caitlin's daughters are delivered safe and whole as well, said the wench. My lord, your man Walton's protection is welcome, but the girls are my charge. The lord of the Dreadfort gave her an uninterested glance. The girls need not concern you any further, my lady. The Lady Sansa is the dwarf's wife. Only the gods can part them now. His wife? Brienne said, appalled. The imp? But he swore before the whole court in sight of gods and men. She is such an innocent. Jamie was almost as surprised, if truth be told, but he hid it better. Sansa Stark, that ought to put a smile on Tyrion's face. He remembered how happy his brother had been with his little crofter's daughter for a fortnight. What the imp did or did not swear scarcely matters now, said Lord Bolton, least of all to you. The wench looked almost wounded. Perhaps she finally felt the steel jaws of the trap when Roos Bolton beckoned to his guards. Sir Jamie will continue on to King's Landing. I said nothing about you, I fear. It would be unconscionable of me to deprive Lord Vargo of both his prizes. The Lord of the Dreadfort reached out to pick another prune. Were I you, my lady, I should worry less about Starks, and rather more about sapphires. Tyrion. A horse wickered impatiently behind him from amidst the ranks of gold cloaks drawn up across the road. Tyrion could hear Lord Giles coughing as well. He had not asked for Giles, no more than he'd asked for Sir Adam or Jalabar Show or any of the rest. But his lord father felt Doran Martell might take it ill if only a dwarf came out to escort him across the black water. Joffrey should have met the Dornishman himself, he reflected as he sat waiting, but he would have mucked it up, no doubt. Of late the king had been repeating little jests about the Dornish that he'd picked up from Mace Tyrell's men-at-arms. How many Dornishmen does it take to shoe a horse? Nine. One to do the shoeing, and eight to lift the horse up. Somehow Tyrion did not think Doran Martell would find that amusing. He could see their banners flying as the riders emerged from the green of the living wood in a long, dusty column. From here to the river only bare black trees remained a legacy of his battle. Too many banners, he thought sourly, as he watched the ashes kick up under the hooves of the approaching horses, as they had beneath the hooves of the Tyrell van as it smashed Stannis in the flank. Martell's brought half the lords of dawn, by the look of it. He tried to think of some good that might come of that, and failed. How many banners do you count? he asked Bronn. The sellsword knight shaded his eyes. Eight? No, nine. Tyrion turned in his saddle. Pard, come up here. Describe the arms you see, and tell me which houses they represent. Podrick Payne edged his gelding closer. He was carrying the royal standard, Joffrey's great stag and lion, and struggling with its weight. Bronn bore Tyrion's own banner, the Lion of Lannister, gold on crimson. He's getting taller, Tyrion realized, as Pod stood in his stirrups for a better look. He'll soon tower over me like all the rest. The lad had been making a diligent study of Dornish heraldry at Tyrion's command, but as ever he was nervous. I can't see. The wind is flapping them. Bronn, tell the boy what you see. Bronn looked very much the knight today in his new doublet and cloak, the flaming chain across his chest. A red sun and orange, he called, with a spear through its back. Martel! Padraic Payne said at once, visibly relieved. House Martel of Sunspear, my lord, the Prince of Dawn. My horse would have known that one, said Tyrion dryly. Give him another, Bronn. 
There's a purple flag with yellow balls. Lemons? Pod said hopefully. A purple field strewn with lemons? For how stalled? Of, of lemon wood. Might be. Next, a big black bird on yellow. Something pink or white in its claws, hard to say with a banner flapping. The vulture of Blackmont grasps a baby in its talons, said Pod. House Blackmont of Blackmont, sir. Braun laughed. Reading books again? Books will ruin your sword eye, boy. I see a skull, too, a black banner. The crown skull of House Manwoody, bone and gold on black. Pod sounded more confident with every correct answer. The Manwoodies of Kingsgrave. Three black spiders? The scorpions, sir. House Corgile of sandstone. Three scorpions, black on red. Red and yellow, a jagged line between. The flames of Hellholt, House Uller. Tyrion was impressed. The boy's not half stupid once he gets his tongue untied. Go on, Pod, he urged. If you get them all, I'll make you a gift. A pie with red and black slices, said Bronn. There's a gold hand in the middle. House Illyrion of God's Grace. A red chicken eating a snake, looks like. The Gargolins of Saltshore. A cockatrice, sir. A part, not a chicken, red with a black snake in its beak. Very good, exclaimed Tyrion. One more, lad. Bronn scanned the ranks of the approaching Dornishmen. The last's a golden feather on green checks. A golden quill, sir. Jordane of the Tor. Tyrion laughed. Nine and well done. I could not have named them all myself. That was a lie, but it would give the boy some pride, and that he badly needed. Martell brings some formidable companions, it would seem. Not one of the houses Pod had named was small or insignificant. Nine of the greatest lords of Dorne were coming up the King's Road, them or their heirs, and somehow Tyrion did not think they had come all this way just to see the dancing bear. There was a message here. And not one I like. He wondered if it had been a mistake to ship Myrcella down to Sunspear. My lord, Pod said a little timidly, there's no litter. Tyrion turned his head sharply. The boy was right. Doran Martell always travels in a litter, the boy said, a carved litter with silk hangings and suns on the drapes. Tyrion had heard the same talk. Prince Doran was past fifty and gouty. He may have wanted to make faster time, he told himself. He may have feared his litter would make too tempting a target for brigands, or that it would prove too cumbersome in the high passes of the boneway. Perhaps his gout is better. So why did he have such a bad feeling about this? This waiting was intolerable. Banners forward, he snapped. We'll meet them. He kicked his horse. Bran and Pod followed, one to either side. When the Dornishmen saw them coming, they spurred their own mounts, banners rippling as they rode. From their ornate saddles were slung the round metal shields they favored, and many carried bundles of short throwing spears, or the double-curved Dornish bows they used so well from horseback. There were three sorts of Dornishmen. The first King Daeron had observed. There were the salty Dornishmen who lived along the coasts, the sandy Dornishmen of the deserts and long river valleys, and the stony Dornishmen who made their fastnesses in the passes and heights of the Red Mountains. The salty Dornishmen had the most roinish blood, the stony Dornishmen the least. All three sorts seemed well represented in Doran's retinue. The salty Dornishmen were lithe and dark, with smooth olive skin and long black hair streaming in the wind. The sandy Dornishmen were even darker, their faces burned brown by the hot Dornish sun. They wound long bright scarves around their helms to ward off sunstroke. The stony Dornishmen were biggest and fairest, sons of the Andals and the first men, brown-haired or blonde, with faces that freckled or burned in the sun instead of browning. The lords wore silk and satin robes with jeweled belts and flowing sleeves. Their armor was heavily enameled and inlaid with burnished copper, shining silver and soft red gold. They came astride red horses and golden ones, and a few as pale as snow, all slim and swift with long necks and narrow beautiful heads. 
The fabled sand steeds of dawn were smaller than proper war horses, and could not bear such weight of armor, but it was said that they could run for a day and night and another day, and never tire. The Dornish leader forked a stallion black as sin, with a mane and tail the color of fire. He sat his saddle as if he'd been born there, tall, slim, graceful. A cloak of pale red silk fluttered from his shoulders, and his shirt was armored with overlapping rows of copper discs that glittered like a thousand bright new pennies as he rode. His high gilded helm displayed a copper sun on its brow, and the round shield slung behind him bore the sun and spear of House Martel on its polished metal surface. A Martel son, but ten years too young, Tyrion thought as he reined up, too fit as well, and far too fierce. He knew what he must deal with by then. How many Dornishmen does it take to start a war? he asked himself. Only one. Yet he had no choice but to smile. "'Well met, my lords. We had word of your approach, and his grace King Joffrey bid me ride out to welcome you in his name. My lord father, the king's hand, sends his greetings as well.' He feigned an amiable confusion. "'Which of you is Prince Doran?' "'My brother's health requires to remain at Sunspear.' The princeling removed his helm. Beneath his face was lined and saturnine, with thin arched brows above large eyes as black and shiny as pools of coal oil. Only a few streaks of silver marred the lustrous black hair that receded from his brow and a widow's peak as sharply pointed as his nose. A salty Dornishman, for certain. Prince Doran has sent me to join King Joffrey's council in his stead, as it pleases Grace. His Grace will be most honored to have the council of a warrior as renowned as Prince Oberyn of Dorn, said Tyrion, thinking this will mean blood in the gutters. And your noble companions are most welcome as well. Permit me to acquaint you with them, uh, my lord of Lannister, Sir Desiel Dalt of Lemonwood, Lord Tremond Gargalin, Lord Harmon Uller and his brother Sir Olwick, Sir Ryan Alerion and his natural son, Sir Damon Sand, the bastard of God's grace, Lord Dagos Manwoody, his brother Sir Miles, his sons Mors and Dickon. Sir Aaron Corgyle, and never let it be thought that I would neglect the ladies, Miria Jordain, heir to the Tor, Lady Lara Blackmont, her daughter Janessa, her son Peros. He raised a slender hand toward a black-haired woman to the rear, beckoning her forward. And this is Elaria Sand, mine own paramour. Tyrion swallowed a groan. His paramour, and bastard-born. Cersei will pitch a holy fit if he wants her at the wedding. If she consigned the woman to some dark corner below the salt, his sister would risk the Red Viper's wrath. Seat her beside him at the high table, and every other lady on the dais was likely to take offense. Did Prince Doran mean to provoke a quarrel? Prince Oberyn wheeled his horse about to face his fellow Dornishmen. Elaria, lords and ladies, says, see how well King Joffrey loves us. His grace has been so kind as to send his own Uncle Imp to bring us to his court. Bronn snorted back laughter, and Tyrion perforce must feign amusement as well. Not alone, my lords. That would be too enormous a task for a little man like me. His own party had come up on them, so it was his turn to name the names. Let me present Sir Flemont Brax, heir to Hornvale, Lord Giles of Rosby, Sir Adam Marbrand, Lord Commander of the City Watch, Jalabar Show, Prince of the Red Flower Vale, Sir Harris Swift, my Uncle Kevin's good father by marriage, Sir Merlon Craycall, Sir Philip Foote, and Sir Bron of the Blackwater, two heroes of our recent battle against the rebel Stannis Baratheon, and mine own squire, young Podrick of House Payne. The names had a nice ringing sound as Tyrion reeled them off, but the bearers were no wise near as distinguished nor formidable a company as those who accompanied Prince Oberyn, as both of them knew full well. "'My lord of Lannister,' said Lady Blackmont, "'we have come a long, dusty way, and rest and refreshment would be most welcome. Might we continue on to the city?' "'At once, my lady.' Tyrion turned his horse's head and called to Sir Adam Marbrand. 
The mounted gold cloaks who formed the greatest part of his honour guard turned their horses crisply at Sir Adam's command, and the column set off for the river and King's Landing beyond. Oberyn Nymeros Martell, Tyrion muttered under his breath as he fell in beside the man, the Red Viper of Dorne. And what in the seven hells am I supposed to do with him? He knew the man only by reputation, to be sure, but the reputation was fearsome. When he was no more than sixteen, Prince Oberyn had been found a bed with a paramour of old Lord Ironwood, a huge man of fierce repute and short temper. A duel ensued, though in view of the prince's youth and high birth it was only to first blood. Both men took cuts, and honour was satisfied. Yet Prince Oberyn soon recovered, while Lord Ironwood's wounds festered and killed him. Afterward men whispered that Oberyn had fought with a poisoned sword, and ever thereafter friends and foes alike called him the Red Viper. That was many years ago, to be sure. The boy of sixteen was a man past forty now, and his legend had grown a deal darker. He had travelled in the free cities, learning the poisoner's trade, and perhaps arts darker still, if rumours could be believed. He had studied the citadel going so far as to forge six links of a maester's chain before he grew bored. He had soldiered in the disputed lands across the narrow sea, riding with the second sons for a time before forming his own company. His tourneys, his battles, his duels, his horses, his carnality. It was said that he bedded men and women both, and had begotten bastard girls all over Dorn. The Sand Snakes, men called his daughters, so far as Tyrion had heard, Prince Oberyn had never fathered a son. And, of course, he had crippled the heir to Highgarden. There is no man in the Seven Kingdoms who will be less welcome at a Tyrell wedding, thought Tyrion. To send Prince Oberyn to King's Landing while the city still hosted Lord Mace Tyrell, two of his sons and thousands of their men-at-arms, was a provocation as dangerous as Prince Oberyn himself. A long word... An ill-timed jest, a look, that's all it will take, and our noble allies will be at one another's throats. "'We have met before,' the Dornish prince said lightly to Tyrion as they rode side by side along the king's road, past ashen fields and the skeletons of trees. "'I would not expect you to remember, though. You are even smaller than you are now.' There was a mocking edge to his voice that Tyrion misliked, but he was not about to let the Dornishman provoke him. "'When was this, my lord?' he asked in tones of polite interest. "'Oh, many and many a year ago, when my mother ruled in Dawn, and your lord father was hand to a different king.' "'Not so different as you might think,' reflected Tyrion. "'It was when I visited Casterly Rock with my mother, her consort, and my sister Elia. I was, oh, fourteen, fifteen, thereabouts, Elia a year older. Your brother and sister were eight or nine, as I recall, and you had just been born. A queer time to come visiting. His mother had died giving him birth, so the Martells would have found the rock deep in mourning. His father especially. Lord Tywin seldom spoke of his wife, but Tyrion had heard his uncles talk of the love between them. In those days his father had been Ares's hand, and many people said that Lord Tywin Lannister ruled the Seven Kingdoms, but Lady Joanna ruled Lord Tywin. He was not the same man after she died, Imp, his uncle Jerry told him once. The best part of him died with her. Gerion had been the youngest of Lord Tytos Lannister's four sons, and the uncle Tyrion liked best. But he was gone now, lost beyond the seas, and Tyrion himself had put Lady Joanna in her grave. "'Did you find Casterly Rock to your liking, my lord?' "'Scarcely. Your father ignored us the whole time we were there, after commanding Sir Kevin to see to our entertainment. The cell they gave me had a feather bed to sleep in, and mirish carpets on the floor, but it was dark and windowless, much like a dungeon when you come down to it, as I told Elia at the time.' Your skies were too grey, your wines too sweet, your women too chaste, your food too bland. And you yourself were the greatest disappointment of all. I had just been born. What did you expect of me? Your Normandy, the black-haired prince replied. You were small, but far-famed. 
We were an old town at your birth, and all the city talked of was the monster that had been born to the king's hand, and what such an omen might foretell for the realm. Famine, plague, and war, no doubt. Tyrion gave a sour smile. It's always famine, plague, and war. Oh, and winter, and the long night that never ends. All that, said Prince Oberyn, and your father's fall as well. Lord Tywin had made himself greater than King Ares, I heard one begging brother preach. But only a god is meant to stand above a king. You were his curse, a punishment sent by the gods to teach him that he was no better than any other man. I try, but he refuses to learn, Tyrion gave a sigh. But do go on, I pray you, I love a good tale. And well you might, since you were said to have one, a stiff curly tail like a swine's. Your head was monstrous huge, we heard, half again the size of your body, and you had been born with thick black hair and a beard besides, an evil eye and lion's claws. Your teeth were so long you could not close your mouth, and between your legs were a girl's privates as well as a boy's. Life would be much simpler if men could fuck themselves, don't you agree? And I can think of a few times when claws and teeth might have proved useful. Even so, I begin to see the nature of your complaint. Bronn gave out with a chuckle, but Oberyn only smiled. We might never have seen you at all but for your sweet sister. You were never seen at table or hall, though sometimes at night we could hear a baby howling down in the depths of the rock. You did have a monstrous great voice, I must grant you that. You would wail for hours, and nothing would quiet you but a woman's tit. Still true, as it happens. This time Prince Oberyn did laugh. A taste we share. Lord Gargolin once told me he hoped to die with a sword in his hand, to which I replied that I would sooner go with a breast in mine. Tyrion had to grin. You were speaking of my sister? Cersei promised Elia to show you to us. The day before we were to sail, whilst my mother and your father were closeted together, she and Jamie took us down to your nursery. Your wet nurse tried to send us off, but your sister was having none of that. He's mine, she said, and you're just a milk cow. You can't tell me what to do. Be quiet, or I'll have my father cut your tongue out. A cow doesn't need a tongue, only udders. Her grace learned charm at an early age, said Tyrion, amused by the notion of his sister claiming him as hers. She's never been in any rush to claim me since, the gods know. Cersei even undid your swaddling clothes to give us a better look, the Dornish prince continued. You did have one evil eye and some black fuzz on your scalp. Perhaps your head was larger than most, but there was no tail, no beard, neither teeth nor claws, and nothing between your legs but a tiny pink cock. After all the wonderful whispers, Lord Tywin's doom turned out to be just a hideous red infant with stunted legs. Eli even made the noise that young girls make at the sight of infants. I'm sure you've heard it. The same noise they make over cute kittens and playful puppies. I believe she wanted to nurse you herself, ugly as you were. When I commented that you seemed a poor sort of monster, your sister said, He killed my mother and twisted your little cock so hard I thought she was like to pull it off. You shrieked, but it was only when your brother Jamie said, Leave him be, you're hurting him, that Cersei let go of you. It doesn't matter, she told us. Everyone says he's like to die soon. He shouldn't even have lived this long. The sun was shining bright above them, and the day was pleasantly warm for autumn, but Tyrion Lannister went cold all over when he heard that. My sweet sister. He scratched the scar of his nose and gave the Dornishman a taste of his evil eye. Now why would he tell such a tale? Was he testing me, or simply twisting my cock as Cersei did, so he can hear me scream? Be sure and tell that story to my father. It will delight him as much as it did me. The part about my tail, especially. I did have one, but he had it lopped off. Prince Oberyn had a chuckle. You've grown more amusing since last we met. Yes, but I meant to grow taller. While we are speaking of amusement, I heard a curious tale from Lord Buckler's steward. He claimed that you had put a tax on women's privy purses. It is a tax on whoring, said Tyrion, irritated all over again. And it was my bloody father's notion. Only a penny for each, uh, act. The king's hand felt it might help improve the morals of the city. And pay for Joffrey's wedding besides. 
Needless to say, as master of coin, Tyrion had gotten all the blame for it. Bronn said they were calling it the dwarf's penny in the streets. "'Spread your legs for the half-man now!' they were shouting in the brothels and wine sinks, if the sellsword could be believed. "'I will make certain to keep my pouch full of pennies. Even a prince must pay his taxes.' "'Why should you need to go whoring?' He glanced back to where Alaria Sand rode among the other women. "'Did you tire of your paramour on the road?' "'Never. We share too much,' Prince Oberyn shrugged. "'We have never shared a beautiful blonde woman, however, and Alaria is curious. Do you know of such a creature?' "'I am a man wedded, though not yet bedded. I no longer frequent horse, unless I want to see them hanged.' Oberyn abruptly changed the subject. It said there ought to be seventy-seven dishes served at the king's wedding feast. Are you hungry, my prince? I have hungered for a long time, though not for food. Pray tell me, when will the justice be served? Justice. Yes, that is why he's here. I should have seen that at once. You were close to your sister. As children, Elia and I were inseparable, much like your own brother and sister. Gods, I hope not. Wars and weddings have kept us well occupied, Prince Oberyn. I fear no one has yet had the time to look into murders sixteen years stale, dreadful as they were. We shall, of course, just as soon as we may. Any help that Dorne might be able to provide to restore the king's peace would only hasten the beginning of my lord father's inquiry. Dwarf! said the Red Viper, in a tone grown markedly less cordial. Spare me your Lannister lies. Is it sheep you take us for, or fools? My brother is not a bloodthirsty man, but neither has he been asleep for sixteen years. John Arryn came to Sunspear the year after Robert took the throne, and you can be sure that he was questioned closely. Him and a hundred more. I did not come for some mummer's show of an inquiry. I came for justice for Elia and her children, and I will have it starting with this lummox Gregor Clegane, but not, I think, ending there. Before he dies, the enormity that rides will tell me whence came his orders. Please assure your lord father of that. He smiled. An old septon once claimed I was living proof of the goodness of the gods. Do you know why that is, imp? No, Tyrion admitted warily. Why, if the gods were cruel, they would have made me my mother's firstborn, and Doran her third. I am a bloodthirsty man, you say. And it is me you must contend with now, not my patient, prudent, and gouty brother. Tyrion could see the sun shining on the Blackwater Rush half a mile ahead, and on the walls and towers and hills of King's Landing beyond. He glanced over his shoulder at the glittering column following them up the King's Road. You speak like a man with a great host at his back, he said. Yet all I see are three hundred. Do you spy that city there, north of the river? The midden heap you call King's Landing? That's the very one. Not only do I see it, I believe I smell it now. Then take a good sniff, my lord. Fill up your nose. Half a million people stink more than three hundred, you'll find. Do you smell the gold cloaks? There are near five thousand of them. My father's own sworn swords must account for another twenty thousand. And then there are the roses. Roses smell so sweet, don't they? especially when there are so many of them. Fifty, sixty, seventy thousand roses in the city are camped outside it. I can't really say how many are left, but there's more than I care to count anyway. Martel gave a shrug. In Dorne of old, before we married Daron, it was said that all flowers bow before the sun. Should the roses seek to hinder me, I'll gladly trample them underfoot. As you trampled Willis Tyrell... The Dornishman did not react as expected. I had a letter from Willis not half a year past. We share an interest in fine horse flesh. He has never borne me any ill will for what happened in the lists. I struck his breastplate clean, but his foot caught in a stirrup as he fell, and his horse came down on top of him. I sent a maester to him afterward, but it was all he could do to save the boy's leg. The knee was far past mending. If any were to blame, it was his fool of a father. Willis Tyrell was green as a surcoat, and had no business riding in such company. The fat flower thrust him into tourneys at too tender an age, just as he did with the other two. 
He wanted another Leo Longthorn and made himself a cripple. There are those who say Sir Loris is better than Leo Longthorn ever was, said Tyrion. Renly's little rose? I doubt that. Doubt it all you wish, said Tyrion. But Sir Loris has defeated many good knights, including my brother Jaime. By defeated you mean unhorsed in tourney. Tell me who he's slain in battle if you mean to frighten me. Sir Robar Royce and Sir Amon Cui for two. And men say he's performed prodigious feats of valor on the Blackwater, fighting beside Lord Renly's ghost. So these same men who saw the prodigious feats saw the ghost as well, yes? The Dornishman laughed lightly. Tyrion gave him a long look. Chetayas on the street of silk has several girls who might suit your needs. Dancy has hair the color of honey. Marie's is pale white gold. I would advise you to keep one or the other by your side at all times, my lord. At all times? Prince Oberon lifted a thin black eyebrow. And why is that, my good imp? You want to die with a breast in hand, you said. Tyrion cantered on ahead to where the ferry barges waited on the south bank of the Blackwater. He had suffered all he meant to suffer of what passed for Dornish wit. Father should have sent Joffrey after all. He could have asked Prince Oberon if he knew how a Dornishman differed from a cowflop. That made him grin, despite himself. He would have to make a point of being on hand when the Red Viper was presented to the king. Arya. Oh, yeah. The man on the roof was the first to die. He was crouched down by the chimney two hundred yards away, no more than a vague shadow in the pre-dawn gloom, but as the sky began to lighten, he stirred, stretched, and stood. Angie's arrow took him in the chest. He tumbled bonelessly down the steep slate pitch and fell in front of the septory door. The mummers had posted two guards there, but their torch left them night-blind, and the outlaws had crept in close. Kyle and Notch let fly together. One man went down with an arrow through his throat, the other through his belly. The second man dropped the torch, and the flames licked up at him. He screamed as his clothes took fire, and that was the end of stealth. Thoros gave a shout, and the outlaws attacked in earnest. Arya watched from atop her horse on the crest of the wooded ridge that overlooked the septry, mill, brewhouse, and stables, and the desolation of weeds, burnt trees, and mud that surrounded them. The trees were mostly bare now, and the few withered brown leaves that still clung to the branches did little to obstruct her view. Lord Beric had left beardless Dick and Mudge to guard them. Arya hated being left behind like she was some stupid child, but at least Gendry had been kept back as well. She knew better than to try and argue. This was battle, and in battle you had to obey. The eastern horizon glowed gold and pink, and overhead a half-moon peeked out through low scuttling clouds. The wind blew cold, and Arya could hear the rush of water and the creak of the mill's great wooden water-wheel. There was a smell of rain in the dawn air, but no drops were falling yet. Flaming arrows flew through the morning mists, trailing pale ribbons of fire, and thudded into the wooden walls of the septry. A few smashed through shuttered windows, and soon enough thin tendrils of smoke arising between the broken shutters. Two mummers came bursting from the septry, side by side, axes in their hands. Angie and the other archers were waiting. One axeman died at once. The other managed to duck, so the shaft ripped through his shoulder. He staggered on, till two more arrows found him, so quickly it was hard to say which had struck first. The long shafts punched through his breastplate, as if it had been made of silk instead of steel. He fell heavily. Angie had arrows tipped with bodkins as well as broadheads. A bodkin could pierce even heavy plate. I am going to learn to shoot a bow, Arya thought. She loved sword-fighting, but she could see how arrows were good, too. Flames were creeping up the west wall of the septry, and thick smoke poured through a broken window. A mirish crossbowman poked his head out a different window, got off a bolt, and ducked down to rewind. She could hear fighting from the stables as well, shouts well mingled with the screams of horses and the clang of steel. Kill them all, she thought fiercely. She bit her lips so hard she tasted blood. Kill every single one! The crossbowman appeared again, but no sooner had he loosed than three arrows hissed past his head. One rattled off his helm. He vanished, bow and all. Arya could see flames in several of the second-story windows. Between the smoke and the morning mists, the air was a haze of blowing black and white. Angie and the other bowmen were creeping closer, the better to find targets. Then the sceptre erupted, the mummers boiling out like angry ants. 
Two Ebenese rushed through the door with shaggy brown shields held high before them, and behind them came a Dothraki with a great curved arak and bells in his braid, and behind him three Valentine sellswords covered with fierce tattoos. Others were climbing out windows and leaping to the ground. Arya saw a man take an arrow through the chest with one leg across a window sill, and heard his scream as he fell. The smoke was thickening. Quarrels and arrows sped back and forth. Wati fell with a grunt, his bow slipping from his hand. Kyle was trying to knock another shaft to his string when a man in black mail flung a spear through his belly. She heard Lord Beric shout. From out of the ditches and trees the rest of his band came pouring, steel in hand. Arya saw Lem's bright yellow cloak flapping behind him as he rode down the man who'd killed Kyle. Thoros and Lord Beric were everywhere, their swords swirling fire. The Red Priest hacked at a hide shield until it flew to pieces, while his horse kicked the man in the face. A Dothraki screamed and charged the Lightning Lord, and the flaming sword leapt out to meet his arak. The blades kissed and spun and kissed again. Then the Dothraki's hair was ablaze, and a moment later he was dead. She spied Ned, too, fighting at the Lightning Lord's side. It's not fair. He's only a little older than me. They should have let me fight. The battle did not last very long. The brave companions, still on their feet, soon died or threw down their swords. Two of the Dothraki managed to regain their horses and flee, but only because Lord Beric let them go. "'Let them carry the word back to Harrenhal,' he said, with flaming sword in hand. "'It will give the leech lord and his goat a few more sleepless nights.' Jack be lucky, Harwin, and Merritt a Moontown braved the burning sceptre to search for captives. They emerged from the smoke and flames a few moments later with eight brown brothers, one so weak that Merritt had to carry him across a shoulder. There was a septon with them as well, round-shouldered and balding, but he wore black chain-mail over his grey robes. "'Found him hiding under the cellar steps,' said Jack, coughing. Thoros smiled to see him. "'You are Ut. Septon Ut, a man of God.' "'What God would want the likes of you?' growled Lem. "'I have sinned,' the septon wailed. "'I know, I know. Forgive me, father. Oh, grievously have I sinned.' Arya remembered septon Ut from her time at Harrenhal. Shagwell the fool said he always wept and prayed for forgiveness after he'd killed his latest boy. Sometimes he even made the other mummers scourge him. They all thought that was very funny. Lord Beric slammed his sword into its scabbard, quenching the flames. "'Give the dying the gift of mercy, and bind the others hand and foot for trial,' he commanded, and it was done. The trials went swiftly. Various of the outlaws came forward to tell of things the brave companions had done. Towns and villages sacked, crops burned, women raped and murdered, men maimed and tortured. A few spoke of the boys that Septon Ut had carried off. The septon wept and prayed through it all. "'I am a weak reed,' he told Lord Beric. "'I pray to the warrior for strength, but the gods made me weak. "'Have mercy on my weakness. "'The boys, the sweet boys, I never mean to hurt them.' Septon Ut soon dangled beneath a tall elm, swinging slowly by the neck, as naked as his name-day. The other brave companions followed one by one. A few fought, kicking and struggling, as the noose was tightened round their throats. One of the crossbowmen kept shouting, "'I soldier! I soldier!' in a thick, mirish accent. Another offered to lead his captors to gold. A third told them what a good outlaw he would make. Each was stripped and bound and hanged in turn. Tom Sevenstrings played a dirge for them on his wood harp, and Thoros implored the Lord of Light to roast their souls until the end of time. A mummer tree! Arya thought as she watched them dangle, their pale skins painted a sullen red by the flames of the burning sceptre. Already the crows were coming, appearing out of nowhere. She heard them croaking and cackling at one another, and wondered what they were saying. Arya had not feared Septon Ut as much as she did Rorg and Biter, and some of the others still at Harrenhal, but she was glad that he was dead all the same. They should have hanged the hound, too, or chopped his head off. Instead, to her disgust, the outlaws had treated Sandor Clegane's burned arm, restored his sword and horse and armor, and set him free a few miles from the hollow hill. All they'd taken was his gold. The sceptre soon collapsed in a roar of smoke and flame, its walls no longer able to support the weight of its heavy slate roof. The eight brown brothers watched with resignation. 
They were all that remained, explained the eldest, who wore a small iron hammer on a thong about his neck, to signify his devotion to the smith. Before the war we were four and forty, and this was a prosperous place. We had a dozen milk cows and a bull, a hundred beehives, a vineyard and an apple arbor. But when the lions came through, they took all our wine and milk and honey, slaughtered the cows, and put our vineyard to the torch. After that, I have lost count of our visitors. This false septon was only the latest. There was one monster. We gave him all our silver, but he was certain we were hiding gold, so his men killed us one by one to make Elder Brother talk. How did the eight of you survive? asked Angie the archer. I am ashamed, the old man said. It was me. When it came my turn to die, I told them where our gold was hidden. Brother, said Thoros of Mir, the only shame was not telling them at once. The outlaws sheltered that night in the brew house beside the little river. Their hosts had a cache of food hidden beneath the floor of the stables, so they shared a simple supper, oaten bread, onions, and a watery cabbage soup, tasting faintly of garlic. Arya found a slice of carrot floating in her bowl, and counted herself lucky. The brothers never asked the outlaws for names. They know, Arya thought. How could they not? Lord Beric wore the lightning bolt on breastplate, shield, and cloak, and Thoros his red robes, or what remained of them. One brother, a young novice, was bold enough to tell the red priest not to pray to his false god so long as he was under their roof. "'Bugger that,' said Lem, Lemon Cloak. "'He's our god, too, and you owe us for your bloody lives. And what's false about him? Might be your smith can mend a broken sword, but can he heal a broken man?' "'Enough, Lem,' Lord Beric commanded. "'Beneath their roof we will honor their rules. "'The sun will not cease to shine if we miss a prayer or two. Thoros agreed mildly. I am one who would know. Lord Beric himself did not eat. Arya had never seen him eat, though from time to time he took a cup of wine. He did not seem to sleep either. His good eye would often close, as if from weariness, but when you spoke to him it would flick open again at once. The marcher lord was still clad in his ratty black cloak and dented breastplate, with its chipped enamel lightning. He even slept in that breastplate. The dull black steel hid the terrible wound the hound had given him, the same way his thick woolen scarf concealed the dark ring about his throat. But nothing hid his broken head, all caved in at the temple, or the raw red pit that was his missing eye, or the shape of the skull beneath his face. Arya looked at him warily, remembering all the tales told of him in Harrenhal. Lord Beric seemed to sense her fear. He turned his head and beckoned her closer. Do I frighten you, child? No. She chewed her lip. Only, well, I thought the hound had killed you, but— A wound, said Lem, Lemon Cloak. A grievous wound, aye, but Thoros healed it. There's never been no better healer. Lord Beric gazed at Lem with a queer look in his good eye, and no look at all in the other, only scars and dried blood. No better healer, he agreed wearily. Lem, past time to change the watch, I'd think. See to it, if you'd be so good. Aye, my lord. Lem's big yellow cloak swirled behind him as he strode out into the windy night. Even brave men blind themselves sometimes when they are afraid to see, Lord Beric said when Lem was gone. Thoros, how many times have you brought me back now? The red priest bowed his head. It is Valor who brings you back, my lord, the Lord of Light. I am only his instrument. How many times? Lord Beric insisted. Six, Thoros said reluctantly. And each time is harder. You have grown reckless, my lord. Is death so very sweet? Sweet? No, my friend, not sweet. Then do not court it so. Lord Tywin leads from the rear, Lord Stannis as well. You would be wise to do the same. A seventh death might mean the end of both of us. Lord Beric touched the spot above his left ear, where his temple was caved in. Here is where Sir Burton Craycaw broke helm and head with a blow of his mace. He unwound his scarf, exposing the black bruise that encircled his neck. Here the mark the manticore made at rushing falls. 
He seized a poor beekeeper and his wife, thinking they were mine, and let it be known far and wide that he would hang them both unless I gave myself up to him. When I did, he hanged them anyway, and me on the gibbet between them. He lifted a finger to the raw red pit of his eye. Here is where the mountain thrust his dirk through my visor. A weary smile brushed his lips. That's thrice I have died at the hands of House Clegane. You would think that I might have learned. It was a jest, Arya knew, but Thoros did not laugh. He put a hand on Lord Beric's shoulder. Best not to dwell on it. Can I dwell on what I scarce remember? I held a castle on the marches once, and there was a woman I was pledged to marry. But I could not find that castle today, nor tell you the color of that woman's hair. Who knighted me, old friend? What were my favorite foods? It all fades. Sometimes I think I was born on the bloody grass in that grove of ash, with a taste of fire in my mouth and a hole in my chest. Are you my mother, Thoros? Arya stared at the Mirish priest, all shaggy hair and pink rags and bits of old armor. Gray stubble covered his cheeks and the sagging skin beneath his chin. He did not look much like the wizards in old Nan's stories, but even so— "'Could you bring back a man without a head?' Arya asked. "'Just the once? Not six times? Could you?' "'I have no magic, child, only prayers. That first time his lordship had a hole right through him and blood in his mouth. I knew there was no hope. So when his poor, torn chest stopped moving, I gave him the good God's own kiss to send him on his way. I filled my mouth with fire and breathed the flames inside him down his throat to lungs and heart and soul. The last kiss, it is called, and many a time I saw the old priests bestow it on the Lord's servants as they died. I had given it a time or two myself, as all priests must, for never before had I felt a dead man shudder as the fire filled him, nor seen his eyes come open. It was not me who raised him, my lady. It was the Lord. The Lord is not done with him yet. Life is warmth, and warmth is fire, and fire is God's, and God's alone. Arya felt tears well in her eyes. Thoros used a lot of words, but all they meant was, no, that much she understood. Your father was a good man, Lord Beric said. Arwen has told me much of him. For his sake I would gladly forego your ransom, but we need the gold too desperately. She chewed her lip. That's true, I guess. He had given the hound's gold to Greenbeard and the huntsmen to buy provisions south of the Mander, she knew. The last harvest burned. This one is drowning, and winter will soon be on us, she had heard him say when he sent them off. The small folk need grain and seed, and we need blades and horses. Too many of my men ride roundsies, drays, and mules against foes mounted on coursers and destriers. Arya didn't know how much Rob would pay for her, though. He was a king now, not the boy she'd left at Winterfell with snow melting in his hair. And if he knew the things she'd done, the stable boy and the guard at Harrenhal and all, what if my brother doesn't want to ransom me? Why would you think that? asked Lord Beric. Well, Arya said, my hair's messy and my nails are dirty and my feet are all hard. Rob wouldn't care about that, probably, but her mother would. Lady Caitlin always wanted her to be like Sansa, to sing and dance and sew and mind her courtesies. Just thinking of it made Arya try to comb her hair with her fingers, but it was all tangles and mats, and all she did was tear some out. I ruined that gown that Lady Smallwood gave me, and I don't sew so good. She chewed her lip. I don't sew very well, I mean. Septa Mordain used to say I had a blacksmith's hands. Gendry hooted. Those soft little things, he called out. You couldn't even hold a hammer. I could if I wanted. She snapped at him. Thoros chuckled. Your brother will pay, child. Have no fear on that count. Yes, but what if he won't? She insisted. Lord Beric sighed. Then I will send you to Lady Smallwood for a time, or perhaps to mine own castle of Blackhaven. But that will not be necessary, I am certain. I do not have the power to give you back your father, no more than Thoros does. But I can at least see that you are returned safely to your mother's arms. Do you swear? she asked him. Yorin had promised to take her home, too, only he'd gotten killed instead. On my honor as a knight, 
the lightning lord said solemnly. It was raining when Len returned to the brew house, muttering curses as water ran off his yellow cloak to puddle on the floor. Angie and Jack Be Lucky sat by the door rolling dice, but no matter which game they played, one-eyed Jack had no luck at all. Tom Seven Strings replaced a string on his wood harp and sang The Mother's Tears. When Willem's wife was wet, Lord Hart rode out on a rainy day, and then the reigns of Castamere. And who are you, the proud lord said, that I must bow so low? Only a cat of a different coat, that's all the truth I know. In a coat of gold or a coat of red, a lion still has claws, and mine are long and sharp, my lord, as long and sharp as yours. And so he spoke, and so he spoke, that lord of Castamere, but now the rains weep o'er his hall, with no one there to hear. Yes, now the rains weep o'er his hall, and not a soul to hear. Finally, Tom ran out of rain songs and put away his harp. Then there was only the sound of the rain itself beating down on the slate roof of the brew house. The dice game ended, and Arya stood on one leg and then the other, listening to Merritt complain about his horse throwing a shoe. I could shoe him for you, said Gendry, all of a sudden. I was only apprentice, but my master said my hand was made to hold a hammer. I can shoe horses, close up rents in mail, and beat the dents from plate. I bet I could make swords, too. "'What are you saying, lad?' asked Harwin. "'I'll smith for you,' Gendry went to one knee before Lord Berwick. "'If you'll have me, my lord, I could be of use. I've made tools and knives, and once I made a helmet that wasn't so bad. One of the mountain's men stole it from me when we was taken.' Arya bit her lip. "'He means to leave me, too.' "'You will do better serving Lord Tully at River Run, said Lord Berwick. "'I cannot pay for your work.' "'No one ever did.' I want a forge, and food to eat, some place I can sleep. That's enough, my lord. A smith can find a welcome most anywhere. A skilled armorer, even more so. Why would you choose to stay with us? Arya watched Gendry screw up his stupid face, thinking. But the hollow hill, what you said about being King Robert's men and brothers, I liked that. I liked that you gave the hound a trial. Lord Bolton just hanged folk or took off their heads, and Lord Tywin and Sir Amory were the same. I'd sooner smith for you. We got plenty of mail needs mending, my lord, Jack reminded Lord Berwick. Most we took off the dead, and there's holes where the death came through. You must be a lackwit, boy, said Lem. We're outlaws, low-born scum, most of us, excepting his lordship. Don't think it'll be like Tom's fool songs, neither. You won't be stealing no kisses from a princess, nor riding in no tourneys in stolen armor. You join us, you'll end with your neck in a noose, or your head mounted up above some castle gate. It's no more than they'd do for you, said Gendry. Aye, that's so, said Jack Be Lucky, cheerfully. The crows await us all. My lord, the boy seems brave enough. "'And we do have need of what he brings us.' "'Take him,' says Jack. "'And quick,' suggested Harwin, chuckling, "'before the fever passes and he comes back to his senses.' "'A wan smile crossed Lord Berwick's lips. "'For us, my sword.' "'This time the lightning lord did not set the blade afire, "'but merely laid it light on Gendry's shoulder. "'Gendry, do you swear before the eyes of gods and men?' to defend those who cannot defend themselves, to protect all women and children, to obey your captains, your liege lord, and your king, to fight bravely when needed, and do such other tasks as are laid upon you, however hard or humble or dangerous they may be? I do, my lord. The marcher lord moved the sword from the right shoulder to the left, and said, Arise, Sir Gendry, knight of the hollow hill and be welcome to our brotherhood. From the door came rough, rasping laughter. The rain was running off him. His burned arm was wrapped in leaves and linen and bound tight against his chest by a crude rope sling, but the older burns that marked his face glistened black and slick in the glow of their little fire. Making more nights, Tondarion, the intruder said in a growl. I ought to kill you all over again for that. 
Lord Berwick faced him coolly. I'd hoped we'd seen the last of you, Clegane. How did you come to find us? It wasn't hard. You made enough bloody smoke to be seen in Old Town. What's become of the sentries I posted? Clegane's mouth twitched. Those two blind men? Might be I killed them both. What would you do if I had? Angie strung his bow. Notch was doing the same. Do you wish to die so very much, Sandor? asked Thoros. You must be mad or drunk to follow us here. Drunk on rain? You didn't leave me enough gold to buy a cup of wine, you whore-sons. Angie drew an arrow. We're outlaws. Outlaw steel. It's in the songs. If you ask nice Tom, may sing you one. Be thankful we didn't kill you. Come try it, Archer. I'll take that quiver off you and shove those arrows up your freckly little arse. Angie raised his long bow, but Lord Beric lifted a hand before he could loose. Why did you come here, Clegane? To get back what's mine. Your gold? What else? It wasn't for the pleasure of looking at your face, Don Darion, I'll tell you that. You're uglier than me now, and a robber knight besides, it seems. I gave you a note for your gold, Lord Beric said calmly. A promise to pay when the war's done. I wiped my arse with your paper. I want the gold. We don't have it. I sent it south with Greenbeard and the Huntsman to buy grain and seed across the Mander. To feed all them whose crops you burned, said Gendry. Is that the tale now? Sandor Clegane laughed again. As it happens, that's just what I meant to do with it. Feed a bunch of ugly peasants and their poxy whelps. You're lying, said Gendry. The boy has a mouth on him, I see. Why believe them and not me? Couldn't be my face, could it? Clegane glanced at Arya. You're going to make her a knight too, Dondarrion? The first eight-year-old girl knight? I'm twelve, Arya lied loudly. And I could be a knight if I wanted. I could have killed you too, only Lem took my knife. Remembering that still made her angry. Complain to Lem, not me. Then tuck your tail between your legs and run. Do you know what dogs do to wolves? Next time I will kill you. I'll kill your brother too. No. His dark eyes narrowed. That you won't. He turned back to Lord Beric. Say, make my horse a knight. He never shits in the hall and doesn't kick more than most. He deserves to be knighted. Unless you meant to steal him, too. Best climb on that horse and go, warned Lem. I'll go with my gold. Your own god said I'm guiltless. The Lord of Light gave you back your life, declared Thoros of Mir. He did not proclaim you, Baelor the Blessed, come again. The Red Priest unsheathed his sword, and Arya saw that Jack and Merritt had drawn as well. Lord Beric still held the blade he used to dub Gendry. Maybe this time they'll kill him. The Hound's mouth gave another twitch. You're no more than common thieves, Lem glowered. Your lion friends ride into some village, take all the food and every coin they find, and call it foraging. The wolves as well, so why not us? No one robbed you, dog. you just been good and foraged. Sandor Clegane looked at their faces, every one, as if he were trying to commit them all to memory. Then he walked back out into the darkness and the pouring rain from whence he'd come with never another word. The outlaws waited, wondering. I best go see what he did to our sentries. Harwin took a wary look out the door before he left, to make certain the hound was not lurking just outside. Oh, that bloody bastard get all that gold anyhow, Lem Lemon Cloak said, to break the tension. Angie shrugged. He won the hand's tourney in King's Landing. The bowman grinned. I won a fair fortune myself, but then I met Dancy, Jade, and Aleia. They taught me what roast swan tastes like and how to bathe in arbor wine. Pissed it all away, did you? laughed Harwin. Not all. I bought these boots and this excellent dagger. You ought to have bought some land and made one of them roast swan girls an honest woman, said Jack Be Lucky. Raised yourself a crop of turnips and a crop of sons. Warrior, defend me. 
What a waste that would have been to turn my gold to turnips. I like turnips, said Jack, aggrieved. I could do with some mashed turnips right now. Foros of Mir paid no heed to the banter. The hound has lost more than a few bags of coin, he mused. He has lost his master and kennel as well. He cannot go back to the Lannisters. The young wolf would never have him, nor would his brother be like to welcome him. That gold was all he had left, it seems to me. Bloody hell, said Watty the Miller. He'll come murder us in our sleep for sure, then. No, Lord Beric had sheathed his sword. Sandor Clegane would kill us all gladly, but not in our sleep. Angie, on the morrow, take the rear with Beardless Dick. If you see Clegane still sniffing after us, kill his horse. That's a good horse, Angie protested. Aye, said Lem. It's the bloody rider we should be killing. We could use that horse. I'm with Lem, Not said. Let me feather the dog a few times. Discourage him some. Lord Berwick shook his head. Clegane won his life beneath the hollow hill. I will not rob him of it. My lord is wise, Thoros told the others. Brothers, a trial by battle is a holy thing. You heard me ask Relor to take a hand. And you saw his fiery finger snap Lord Beric's sword, just as he was about to make an end of it. The Lord of Light is not yet done with Joffrey's hound, it would seem. Arwen soon returned to the brew house. Puddingfoot was sound asleep, but unharmed. Wait till I get hold of him, said Lem. I'll cut him a new bunghole. He could have gotten every one of us killed. No one rested very comfortably that night, knowing that Sandor Clegane was out there in the dark, somewhere close. Arya curled up near the fire, warm and snug, yet sleep would not come. She took out the coin that Jokin Hagar had given her, and curled her fingers around it as she lay beneath her cloak. It made her feel strong to hold it, remembering how she'd been the ghost in Harrenhal. She could kill with a whisper then. Jokin was gone, though. He'd left her. Hot Pie left me, too, and now Gendry is leaving. Lamy had died. Yorin had died. Cyril Farrell had died. Even her father had died. And Jokin had given her a stupid iron penny and vanished. Falar Morgulis, she whispered softly, tightening her fist so the hard edges of the coin dug into her palm. Sir Gregor, Dunson, Poliver, Raff the Sweetling, the Tickler and the Hound, Sir Ellen, Sir Merrin, King Joffrey, Queen Circe. I had tried to imagine how they would look when they were dead, but it was hard to bring their faces to mind. The Hound she could see, and his brother, the Mountain, and she would never forget Joffrey's face or his mother's. But Rath and Dunson and Poliver were all fading, and even the tickler, whose looks had been so commonplace. Sleep took her at last, but in the black of night Arya woke again, tingling. The fire had burned down to embers. Mudge stood by the door, and another guard was pacing outside. The rain had stopped, and she could hear wolves howling. So close, she thought, and so many. They sounded as if they were all around the stable, dozens of them, maybe hundreds. I hope they eat the hound. She remembered what he'd said about wolves and dogs. Come morning, Septon Ut still swung beneath the tree, but the Brown brothers were out in the rain with spades digging shallow graves for the other dead. Lord Beric thanked them for the night's lodging and the meal, and gave them a bag of silver stags to help rebuild. Harwin, likely Luke, and Waddy the Miller were not scouting, but neither wolves nor hounds were found. As Arya was cinching her saddle girth, Gendry came up to say that he was sorry. She put a foot in the stirrup and swung up into her saddle so she could look down on him instead of up. You could have made swords at River Run for my brother, she thought. But what she said was, If you want to be some stupid outlaw knight and get hanged, why should I care? I'll be at River Run, ransomed with my brother. There was no rain that day, thankfully, and for once they made good time. Bran The tower stood upon an island, its twin reflected on the still blue waters. When the wind blew, ripples moved across the surface of the lake, chasing one another like boys at play. 
Oak trees grew thick along the lake shore, a dense stand of them with a litter of fallen acorns on the ground beneath. Beyond them was the village, or what remained of it. It was the first village they had seen since leaving the foothills. Mira had scouted ahead to make certain there was no one lurking amongst the ruins. Sliding in and amongst oaks and apple trees with a net and spear in hand, she startled three red deer and sent them bounding away through the brush. Summer saw the flash of motion and was after them at once. Bran watched the dire wolf lope off, and for a moment wanted nothing so much as to slip his skin and run with him. But Mira was waiting for them to come ahead. Reluctantly he turned away from Summer and urged Hodor on into the village. Jojin walked with them. The ground from here to the wall was grasslands, brand new, fallow fields and low rolling hills, high meadows and lowland bogs. It would be much easier going than the mountains behind, but so much open space made Mira uneasy. I feel naked, she confessed. There's no place to hide. Who holds this land? Jojen asked Bran. The Night's Watch, he answered. This is the gift, the new gift, and north of that Brandon's gift. Maester Lewin had taught him the history. Brandon the Builder gave all the land south of the wall to the Black Brothers, to a distance of twenty-five leagues. For their, for their sustenance and support, he was proud that he still remembered that part. Some maesters say it was some other Brandon, not the Builder, but it's still Brandon's gift. Thousands of years later, good Queen Alisan visited the wall on her dragon silver wing, and she thought the Night's Watch was so brave that she had the old king double the size of their lands to fifty leagues. So that was the new gift. He waved a hand. Here, all this. No one had lived in the village for long years, Bran could see. All the houses were falling down, even the inn. It had never been much of an inn to look at it, but now all that remained was a stone chimney and two cracked walls, set amongst a dozen apple trees. One was growing up through the common room, where a layer of wet brown leaves and rotting apples carpeted the floor. The air was thick with the smell of them, a cloying, cidery scent that was almost overwhelming. Mira stabbed a few apples with her frog spear, trying to find some still good enough to eat, but they were all too brown and wormy. It was a peaceful spot, still and tranquil and lovely to behold, but Bran thought there was something sad about an empty inn, and Hodor seemed to feel it too. Hodor, he said in a confused sort of way, Hodor, Hodor. This is good land. Jojen picked up a handful of dirt, rubbing it between his fingers. A village, an inn, a stout hold fast in the lake, all these apple trees. But where are the people, Bran? Why would they leave such a place? They were afraid of the wildlings, said Bran. Wildlings come over the wall or through the mountains to raid and steal and carry off women. If they catch you, they make your skull into a cup to drink blood, old Nan used to say. The night's watch isn't so strong as it was in Brandon's day or Queen Alisan's. Some more get through. The places nearest the wall got raided so much, the small folk moved south into the mountains or onto the umber lands east of the King's Road. The Great John's people get raided too, but not so much as the people who used to live in the gift. Jojen Reed turned his head slowly, listening to music only he could hear. We need to shelter here. There's a storm coming, a bad one. Bran looked up at the sky. It had been a beautiful, crisp, clear autumn day, sunny and almost warm, but there were dark clouds off to the west now, that was true, and the wind seemed to be picking up. "'There's no roof on the inn and only the two walls,' he pointed out. "'We should go out to the holdfast.' "'Hodor,' said Hodor. Maybe he agreed. "'We have no boat, Bran,' Mira poked through the leaves idly with her frog spear. "'There's a causeway.' A stone causeway, hidden under the water. We could walk out. They could, anyway. He would have to ride on Hodor's back, but at least he'd stay dry that way. The reeds exchanged a look. How do you know that? asked Jojen. Have you been here before, my prince? No. Old Nan told me. The Holdfast has a golden crown, see? He pointed across the lake. He could see patches of flicking gold paint up around the crenellations. Queen Alisan slept there, so they painted the Merlin's gold in her honor. A causeway? 
Jojen studied the lake. You are certain? Certain, said Bran. Mira found the foot of it easily enough, once she knew to look, a stone pathway three feet wide, leading right out into the lake. She took them out step by careful step, probing ahead with a frog spear. They could see where the path emerged again, climbing from the water onto the island and turning into a short flight of stone steps that led to the holdfast door. Path, steps, and door were in a straight line, which made you think the causeway ran straight. But that wasn't so. Under the lake it zigged and zagged, going a third of a way around the island before jagging back. The turns were treacherous, and the long path meant that anyone approaching would be exposed to arrow fire from the tower for a long time. The hidden stones were slimy and slippery, too. Twice Hordor almost lost his footing and shouted, Hordor! in alarm before regaining his balance. The second time scared Bran badly. If Hodor fell into the lake with him in his basket, he could well drown, especially if the huge stable boy panicked and forgot that Bran was there, the way he did sometimes. Maybe we should have stayed at the inn, under the apple tree, he thought. But by then it was too late. Thankfully there was no third time, and the water never got up past Hodor's waist, though the reeds were in it up to their chests. And before long they were on the island, climbing the steps to the holdfast. The door was still stout, though its heavy oak planks had warped over the years, and it could no longer be closed completely. Mira shoved it open all the way, the rusted iron hinges screaming. The lintel was low. "'Duck down, Hodor,' Bran said, and he did, but not enough to keep Bran from hitting his head. "'That hurt,' he complained. "'Hodor,' said Hodor, straightening. They found themselves in a gloomy strong room, barely large enough to hold the four of them. Steps built into the inner wall of the tower curved away upward to their left, downward to their right, behind iron grates. Bran looked up and saw another grate just above his head. A murder hole. He was glad there was no one up there now to pour boiling oil down on them. The grates were locked, but the iron bars were red with rust. Hodor grabbed hold of the left-hand door and gave it a pull, grunting with effort. Nothing happened. He tried pushing with no more success. He shook the bars, kicked, shoved against them, and rattled them, and punched the hinges with a huge hand until the air was filled with flakes of rust, but the iron door would not budge. The one down to the under vault was no more accommodating. No way in, said Mira, shrugging. The murder hole was just above Bran's head as he sat in his basket on Hodor's back. He reached up and grabbed the bars to give them a try. When he pulled down, the grating came out of the ceiling in a cascade of rust and crumbling stone. Hodor! Hodor shouted. The heavy iron grate gave Bran another bang in the head and crashed down near Jojen's feet when he shoved it off of him. Mira laughed. Look at that, my prince, she said. You're stronger than Hodor. Bran blushed. With the grate gone, Hodor was able to boost Mira and Jojen up through the gaping murder hole. The Kranich men took Bran by the arms and drew him up after them. Getting Hodor inside was the hard part. He was too heavy for the reeds to lift the way they'd lifted Bran. Finally, Bran told him to go look for some big rocks. The island had no lack of those, and Hodor was able to pile them high enough to grab the crumbling edges of the hole and climb through. Hodor, he panted happily, grinning at all of them. They found themselves in a maze of small cells, dark and empty, but Mira explored until she found the way back to the steps. The higher they climbed, the better the light. On the third story, the thick outer wall was pierced by arrow slits. The fourth had actual windows, and the fifth and highest was one big round chamber with arched doors on three sides opening onto small stone balconies. On the fourth side was a privy chamber, perched above a sewer chute that dropped straight down into the lake. By the time they reached the roof, the sky was completely overcast, and the clouds to the west were black. The wind was blowing so strong it lifted up Bran's cloak and made it flap and snap. Hodor, Hodor said to the noise. Mira spun in a circle. I feel almost a giant standing high above the world. There are trees in the neck that stand twice as tall as this, her brother reminded her. Aye, but they have other trees around them just as high, said Mira. The world presses close in the neck, and the sky is so much smaller. Here, feel that wind, brother, and look how large the world has grown. It was true, you could see a long ways from up here. 
To the south the foothills rose, with the mountains gray and green beyond them. The rolling plains of the new gift stretched away to all the other directions, as far as the eye could see. I was hoping we could see the wall from here, said Bran, disappointed. That was stupid. We must still be fifty leagues away. Just speaking of it made him feel tired and cold as well. Jojen, what will we do when we reach the wall? My uncle always said how big it was, seven hundred feet high and so thick at the base that the gates are more like tunnels through the ice. How are we going to get past to find the three-eyed crow? There are abandoned castles along the wall, I've heard, Jojen answered. Fortresses built by the Night's Watch, but now left empty. One of them may give us our way through. The ghost castles, old Nan had called them. Maester Lewin had once made Bran learn the names of every one of the forts along the wall. That had been hard. There were nineteen of them, all told, though no more than seventeen had ever been manned at any one time. At the feast in honor of King Robert's visit to Winterfell, Bran had recited the names for his uncle Benjen, east to west, and then west to east. Benjen Stark had laughed and said, "'You know them better than I do, Bran. Perhaps you should be first ranger.' I'll stay here in your place. That was before Bran fell, though, before he was broken. By the time he'd woken crippled from his sleep, his uncle had gone back to Castle Black. My uncle said the gates were sealed with ice and stone whenever a castle had to be abandoned, said Bran. Then we'll have to open them again, said Mira. That made him uneasy. We shouldn't do that. Bad things might come through from the other side. We should just go to Castle Black and tell the Lord Commander to let us pass. Your Grace, said Jojen, we must avoid Castle Black, just as we avoided the King's Road. There are hundreds of men there. Men of the Night's Watch, said Bran. They say vows to take no part in wars and stuff. Aye, said Jojen, but one man willing to forswear himself would be enough to sell your secret to the Iron Men or the Bastard of Bolton, and we cannot be certain that the Watch would agree to let us pass. They might decide to hold us or send us back. But my father was a friend of the Night's Watch, and my uncle is First Ranger. He might know where the Three-Eyed Crow lives, and John's at Castle Black, too. Bran had been hoping to see John again, and their uncle, too. The last Black brothers to visit Winterfell said that Benjen Stark had vanished on arranging, but surely he would have made his way back by now. I bet the Watch would even give us horses, he went on. Quiet. Jojen shaded his eyes with a hand and gazed off toward the setting sun. Look, there's something. A rider, I think. Do you see him? Bran shaded his eyes as well, and even so he had to squint. He saw nothing at first, till some movement made him turn. At first he thought it might be summer, but no. A man on a horse. He was too far away to see much else. Hold door. Hodor had put a hand over his eyes as well, only he was looking the wrong way. Hodor! He is in no haste, said Mira, but he's making for this village, it seems to me. We had best go inside, before we're seen, said Jojen. Summer's near the village, Bran objected. Summer will be fine, Mira promised. It's only one man on a tired horse. A few fat, wet drops began to patter against the stone as they retreated to the floor below. That was well-timed. The rain began to fall in earnest a short time later. Even through the thick walls they could hear it lashing against the surface of the lake. They sat on the floor in the round, empty room, amidst gathering gloom. The north-facing balcony looked out toward the abandoned village. Mira crept out on her belly to peer across the lake and see what had become of the horsemen. He's taken shelter in the ruins of the inn, she told them when she came back. It looks as though he's making a fire in the hearth. I wish we could have a fire, Bran said. I'm cold. There's broken furniture down the stairs. I saw it. We could have Hodor chop it up and get warm. Hodor liked that idea. Hodor, he said hopefully. Jojin shook his head. Fire means smoke. Smoke from this tower could be seen a long way off. If there were anyone to see, his sister argued, there's a man in the village. One man. One man would be enough to betray Bran to his enemies if he's the wrong man. We still have half a duck from yesterday. We should eat and rest. 
Come morning, the man will go on his way, and we will do the same. Jojin had his way, he always did. Mira divided the duck between the four of them. She had caught it in her net the day before, as it tried to rise from the marsh where she would surprised it. It wasn't as tasty cold as it had been hot and crisp from the spit, but at least they did not go hungry. Bran and Mira shared the breast while Jojin ate the thigh. Hodor devoured the wing and leg, muttering, Hodor, and licking the grease off his fingers after every bite. It was Bran's turn to tell a story, so he told them about another Brandon Stark, the one called Brandon the Shipwright, who had sailed off beyond the Sunset Sea. Dusk was settling by the time duck and tail were done, and the rain still fell. Bran wondered how far summer had roamed and whether he had caught one of the deer. Gray gloom filled the tower and slowly changed to darkness. Hodor grew restless and walked a while, striding round and round the walls and stopping to peer into the privy on every circuit, as if he had forgotten what was in there. Jojen stood by the north balcony, hidden by the shadows, looking out at the night and the rain. Somewhere to the north a lightning bolt crackled across the sky, brightening the inside of the tower for an instant. Hodor jumped and made a frightened noise. Bran counted to eight, waiting for the thunder. When it came, Hodor shouted, Hodor! I hope Summer isn't scared, too, Bran thought. The dogs in Winterfell's kennels had always been spooked by thunderstorms, just like Hodor. I should go see to calm him. The lightning flashed again, and this time the thunder came at six. Hodor! Hodor yelled again. Hodor! Hodor! He snatched up his sword, as if to fight the storm. Jojen said, Be quiet, Hodor. Bran, tell him not to shout. Can you get the sword away from him, Mira? I can try. Hodor, hush, said Bran. Be quiet now. No more stupid Hodoring. Sit down. Hodor. He gave the long sword to Mira, meekly enough, but his face was a mask of confusion. Jojen turned back to the darkness, and they all heard him suck in his breath. What is it? Mira asked. Men in the village. The man we saw before? Other men. Armed. I saw an axe and spears as well. And Jojen had never sounded so much like the boy he was. I saw them when the lightning flashed, moving under the trees. How many? Many and more. Too many to count. Mounted? No. Hodor? Hodor sounded frightened. Hodor? Hodor? Bran felt a little scared himself, though he didn't want to say so in front of Mira. What if they come out here? They won't. She sat down beside him. Why should they? For shelter. Jojen's voice was grim. Unless the storm lets up. Mira, could you go down and bar the door? I couldn't even close it. The wood's too warped. They won't get past those iron gates, though. They might. They could break the lock or the hinges, or climb up through the murder hole as we did. Lightning slashed the sky, and Hodor whimpered. Then a clap of thunder rolled across the lake. Hodor! he roared, clapping his hands over his ears and stumbling in a circle through the darkness. Hodor! 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 No! Bran shouted back. No Hodoring! It did no good. Hodor! moaned Hodor. Mira tried to catch him and calm him, but he was too strong. He flung her aside with no more than a shrug. Hodor! The stable boy screamed as lightning filled the sky again, and even Jojen was shouting now, shouting at Bran and Mira to shut him up. Be quiet! Bran said in a shrill, scared voice, reaching up uselessly for Hodor's leg as he crashed past, reaching, reaching. Hodor staggered and closed his mouth. He shook his head slowly from side to side, sank back to the floor, and sat cross-legged. When the thunder boomed, he scarcely seemed to hear it. The four of them sat in the dark tower, scarce daring to breathe. "'Bran, what did you do?' Mira whispered. "'Nothing,' Bran shook his head. "'I don't know.' But he did. "'I reached for him.' the way I reach for summer. He had been Hodor for half a heartbeat. It scared him. Something is happening across the lake, said Jojen. I thought I saw a man pointing at the tower. I won't be afraid. He was the Prince of Winterfell, Eddard Stark's son. Almost a man grown, and a warg too, not some little baby boy like Rickon. Summer would not be afraid. 
Most like they're just some umbers, he said. Or they could be knots or norries or flints come down from the mountains, or even brothers from the Night's Watch. Were they wearing black cloaks, Jojen? By night all cloaks are black, Your Grace, and the flash came and went too fast for me to tell what they were wearing. Mira was wary. If they were black brothers, they'd be mounted, wouldn't they? Brand had thought of something else. It doesn't matter, he said confidently. They couldn't get out to us even if they wanted, not unless they had a boat or knew about the causeway. The causeway! Mira mussed Brand's hair and kissed him on the forehead. Our sweet prince, he's right, Jojen. They won't know about the causeway. Even if they did, they could never find the way across at night in the rain. The night will end, though. If they stay till morning, Jojen left the rest unsaid. After a few moments, he said, They are feeding the fire. The first man started. Lightning crashed through the sky, and light filled the tower and etched them all in shadow. Hodor rocked back and forth, humming. Bran could feel Summer's fear in that bright instant. He closed two eyes and opened a third, and his boy's skin slipped off him like a cloak as he left the tower behind and found himself out in the rain, his belly full of deer, cringing in the brush as the sky broke and boomed above him. The smell of rotten apples and wet leaves almost drowned the scent of man, but it was there. He heard the clink and slither of hard skin, saw men moving under the trees. A man with a stick blundered by, a skin pulled up over his head to make him blind and deaf. The wolf went wide around him, behind a dripping thorn bush and beneath the bare branches of an apple tree. He could hear them talking, and there, beneath the scents of rain and leaves and horse, came the sharp red stench of fear. John The ground was littered with pine needles and blown leaves, a carpet of green and brown still damp from the recent rains. It squished beneath their feet. Huge bare oaks, tall sentinels, and hosts of soldier pines stood all around them. On a hill above them was another round tower, ancient and empty, thick green moss crawling up its side almost to the summit. "'Who built that, all of stone like that?' Ygritte asked him. "'Some king?' "'No, just the men who used to live here. What happened to them?' "'They died or went away.' Brandon's gift had been farmed for thousands of years, but as the watch dwindled, there were fewer hands to plough the fields, tend the bees, and plant the orchards, so the wild had reclaimed many a field and hall. In the new gift there had been villages and holdfasts, whose taxes, rendered in goods and labour, helped feed and clothe the black brothers. But those were largely gone as well. "'They were fools to leave such a castle,' said Egret. It's only a tower-house. Some little lordling lived there once with his family and a few sworn men. When raiders came, he would light a beacon from the roof. Winterfell has towers three times the size of that. She looked as if she thought he was making that up. How could men build so high with no giants to lift the stones? In legend, Brandon the Builder had used giants to help raise Winterfell, but John did not want to confuse the issue. Men can build a lot higher than this. In Old Town there's a tower taller than the wall. He could tell she did not believe him. If I could show her Winterfell, give her a flower from the glass gardens, feast her in the great hall, and show her the stone kings on their thrones, we could bathe in the hot pools and love beneath the heart tree while the old gods watched over us. The dream was sweet. But Winterfell would never be his to show. It belonged to his brother, the king in the north. He was a snow, not a stark. Bastard, oath-breaker, and turncloak. Might be after we could come back here and live in that tower, she said. Would you want that, Jon Snow, after? After. The word was a spear-thrust. After the war, after the conquest after the wildlings break the wall. His lord father had once talked about raising new lords and settling them in the abandoned holdfasts as a shield against wildlings. 
The plan would have required the watch to yield back a large part of the gift, but his uncle Benjamin believed the Lord Commander could be won around, so long as the new lordlings paid taxes to Castle Black rather than Winterfell. It is a dream for spring, though, Lord Eddard had said. Even the promise of land will not lure men north with a winter coming on. If winter had come and gone more quickly, and spring had followed in its turn, I might have been chosen to hold one of these towers in my father's name. Lord Eddard was dead, however. His brother Benjen lost. The shield they dreamt together would never be forged. This land belongs to the watch, John said. Her nostrils flared. No one lives here. Your raiders drove them off. They were cowards, then. If they wanted the land, they should have stayed and fought. Maybe they were tired of fighting, tired of barring their doors every night and wondering if Rattleshirt or someone like him would break them down to carry off their wives, tired of having their harvests stolen, any valuables they might have. It's easier to move beyond the reach of raiders. But if the wall should fail, all the north will lie within the reach of raiders. You know nothing, John Snow. Daughters are taken, not wives. You're the ones who steal. You took the whole world and built the wall to keep the free folk out. Did we? Sometimes John forgot how wild she was, and then she would remind him. How did that happen? The gods made the earth for all men to share. Only when the kings come with their crowns and steel swords, they claimed it was all theirs. My trees, they said. You can't eat them apples. My stream, you can't fish here. My wood, you're not to hunt. My earth, my water, my castle, my daughter, keep your hands away or I'll chop them off. But maybe if you kneel to me, I'll let you have a sniff. You call us thieves, but at least the thief has to be brave and clever and quick. A kneeler only has to kneel. Harma and the bag of bones don't come raiding for fish and apples. They steal swords and axes, spices, silks and furs. They grab every coin and ring and jeweled cup they can find, casks of wine in summer and casks of beef in winter, and they take women in any season and carry them off beyond the wall. And what if they do? I'd sooner be stolen by a strong man than be given to some weakling by my father. You say that, but how can you know? What if you were stolen by someone you hated? He'd have to be quick and cunning and brave to steal me, so his sons would be strong and smart as well. Why would I hate such a man as that? Maybe he never washes, so he smells as rank as a bear. Then I'd push him in a stream or throw a bucket of water on him. Anyhow, men shouldn't smell sweet like flowers. What's wrong with flowers? Nothing for a bee. For bed, I want one of these. Egret made to grab the front of his breeches. John caught her wrist. What if the man who stole you drank too much? He insisted. What if he was brutal or cruel? He tightened his grip to make a point. What if he was stronger than you and liked to beat you bloody? I'd cut his throat while he slept. You know nothing, John Snow. He grit, twisted like an eel, and wrenched away from him. I know one thing. I know that you are waddling to the bone. It was easy to forget that sometimes, when they were laughing together or kissing. But then one of them would say something or do something, and he would suddenly be reminded of the wall between their worlds. A man can own a woman, or a man can own a knife, Migrit told him, but no man can own both. Every little girl learns that from her mother. She raised her chin defiantly and gave her thick red hair a shake. And men can't own the land no more than they can own the sea or the sky. You kneelers think you do, but Mance is going to show you different. It was a fine, brave boast, but it rang hollow. John glanced back to make certain the Magnar was not an earshot. Eric, Big Boyle, and Hempen Dan were walking a few yards behind them, but paying no attention. Big Boyle was complaining of his arse. "'Me grit,' he said in a low voice. "'Mance cannot win this war.' "'He can,' she insisted. "'You know nothing, Jon Snow. You have never seen the free folk fight.' Wildlings fought like heroes or demons, depending on who you talked to. But it came down to the same thing in the end. They fight with reckless courage, every man out for glory. I don't doubt that you're all very brave, but when it comes to battle, discipline beats valor every time. In the end, Mance will fail, as all the kings beyond the wall have failed before him. And when he does, you'll die. All of you. 
Egret had looked so angry he thought she was about to strike him. "'All of us,' she said. "'You too. "'You're no crow now, Jon Snow. "'I swore you weren't, so you better not be.' She pushed him back against the trunk of a tree and kissed him, full on the lips, right there in the midst of the ragged column. John heard Grig the goat urging her on. Someone else laughed. He kissed her back, despite all that. When they finally broke apart, Egret was flushed. "'You're mine,' she whispered. "'Mine as I'm yours. And if we die, we die. All men must die, Jon Snow. But first we'll live.' Yes, his voice was thick. First. We'll live. She grinned at that, showing John the crooked teeth that he had somehow come to love. Waddling to the bone, he thought again, with a sick, sad feeling in the pit of his stomach. He flexed the fingers of his sword hand and wondered what Egret would do if she knew his heart. Would she betray him if he sat her down and told her that he was still Ned Stark's son and a man of the Night's Watch? He hoped not, but he dare not take that risk. Too many lives depended on his somehow reaching Castle Black before the Magnar, assuming he found a chance to escape the wildlings. They had descended the south face of the wall at Greyguard, abandoned for two hundred years. A section of the huge stone steps had collapsed a century before, but even so the descent was a good deal easier than the climb. From there, Steer marched them deep into the gift to avoid the watch's customary patrols. Grig the goat led them past the few inhabited villages that remained in these lands. Aside from a few scattered round towers poking the sky like stone fingers, they saw no sign of man. Through cold, wet hills and windy plains they marched, unwatched, unseen. "'You must not balk whatever is asked of you,' the half-hand had said. "'Ride with them, eat with them, fight with them, for as long as it takes.' He'd ridden many leagues and walked for more, had shared their bread and salt, and he grits blankets as well, but still they did not trust him. Day and night the Thens watched him, alert for any signs of betrayal. He could not get away, and soon it would be too late. "'Fight with them,' Corin had said before he surrendered his own life to Longclaw. But it had not come to that till now. "'Once I shed a brother's blood I am lost.' I crossed the wall for good then, and there is no crossing back. After each day's march, the Magnar summoned him to ask shrewd, sharp questions about Castle Black, its garrison and defences. John lied where he dared and feigned ignorance a few times, but Grig the Goat and Eric listened as well, and they knew enough to make John careful. Too blatant a lie would betray him. But the truth was terrible. Castle Black had no defences, but for the wall itself. It lacked even wooden palisades or earthen dikes. The castle was nothing more than a cluster of towers and keeps, two-thirds of them falling into ruin. As for the garrison, the old bear had taken two hundred on his ranging. Had any returned? John could not know. Perhaps four hundred remained at the castle, but most of those were builders or stewards, not rangers. The Thens were hardened warriors and more disciplined than the common run of wildling. No doubt that was why Mance had chosen them. The defenders of Castle Black would include blind Maester Amon and his half-blind steward, Clydus, one-armed Donal Noy, drunken Septon Celador, deaf Dick Follard, three-finger Hob the cook, old Sir Winton Stout, as well as Halder and Toad and Pip and Albit, and the rest of the boys who'd trained with John and commanding them would be red-faced Bowen Marsh, the plump Lord Steward who had been made Castellan in Lord Mormont's absence. Dolor is said sometimes called Marsh the old pomegranate, which fit him just as well as the old bear fit Mormont. "'He's the man you want in front when the foes are in the field,' Ed would say in his usual doer voice. "'He'll count them right up for you. A regular demon for counting, that one.' If the Magnar takes Castle Black unawares, it will be red slaughter, boys butchered in their beds before they know they are under attack. John had to warn them, but how? He was never sent out to forage or hunt, nor allowed to stand a watch alone. And he feared for Egrit as well. He could not take her, but if he left her, would the Magnar make her answer for his treachery? Two hearts that beat as one. They shared the same sleeping skins every night, and he went to sleep with her head against his chest and her red hair tickling his chin. 
The smell of her had become a part of him. Her crooked teeth, the feel of her breast when he cupped it in his hand, the taste of her mouth, they were his joy and his despair. Many a night he lay with Ygritte warm beside him, wondering if his lord father had felt this confused about his mother, whoever she had been. Ygritte set the trap, and Mance Raider pushed me into it. Every day he spent among the wildlings made what he had to do that much harder. He was going to have to find some way to betray these men, and when he did, they would die. He did not want their friendship any more than he wanted Ygritte's love, and yet the Thens spoke the old tongue and seldom talked to John at all. But it was different with Jarl's raiders, the men who'd climbed the wall. John was coming to know them despite himself. Gaunt, quiet Eric, and gregarious Grig the goat, the boys, Quart and Bodger, Hemp and Dan the rope-maker. The worst of the lot was Dell, a horse-faced youth near John's own age, who would talk dreamily of this wildling girl he meant to steal. She's lucky, like your Egrit. She's kissed by fire. John had to bite his tongue. He didn't want to know about Dell's girl, or Bodger's mother, the place by the sea that Hank the Helm came from, how Grig yearned to visit the green men on the Isle of Faces, all the time a moose had chased Toefinger up a tree. He didn't want to hear about the boil and Big Boil's arse, how much ale Stone Thumbs could drink, or how Quart's little brother had begged him not to go with Jarl. Quart could not have been older than fourteen, though he'd already stolen himself a wife and had a child on the way. "'Might be he'll be born in some castle,' the boy boasted. "'Born in a castle, like a lord!' He was very taken with the castles they'd seen, by which he meant watchtowers. John wondered where Ghost was now. Had he gone to Castle Black, or was he running with some wolf pack in the woods? He had no sense of the dire wolf, not even in his dreams. It made him feel as if part of himself had been cut off. Even with the grit sleeping beside him, he felt alone. He did not want to die alone. By that afternoon the trees had begun to thin, and they marched east over gently rolling plains. Grass rose waist-high around them, and stands of wild wheat swayed gently when the wind came gusting. But for the most part the day was warm and bright. Toward sunset, however, clouds began to threaten in the west. They soon engulfed the orange sun, and Len foretold a bad storm coming. His mother was a woods witch, so all the raiders agreed he had a gift for foretelling the weather. "'There's a village close,' Grig the goat told the Magnar. Two miles, three. We could shelter there.' Steer agreed at once. It was well past dark, and the storm was raging by the time they reached the place. The village sat beside a lake, and had been so long abandoned that most of the houses had collapsed. Even the small timber inn that must once have been a welcome sight for travellers stood half-fallen and roofless. "'We will find scant shelter here.' John thought gloomily. Whenever the lightning flashed, he could see a stone round tower rising from an island out on the lake, but without boats they had no way to reach it. Eric and Dell had crept ahead to scout the ruins, but Dell was back almost at once. Steer halted the column and sent a dozen of his thens trotting forward, spears in hand. By then John had seen it too, the glimmer of a fire, reddening the chimney of the inn. "'We are not alone,' dread coiled inside him like a snake. He heard a horse neigh, and then shouts. "'Ride with them, eat with them, fight with them,' Corin had said. But the fighting was done. "'There's only one of them,' Eric said when he came back. "'An old man with a horse!' The Magnar shouted commands in the old tongue, and a score of his thens spread out to establish a perimeter around the village, whilst others went prowling through the houses to make certain no one else was hiding amongst the weeds and tumbled stones. The rest crowded into the roofless inn, jostling each other to get closer to the hearth. The broken branches the old man had been burning seemed to generate more smoke than heat, but any warmth was welcome on such a wild, rainy night. Two of the thens had thrown the man to the ground and were going through his things. Another held his horse, while three more looted his saddlebags. John walked away. A rotten apple squished beneath his heel. Steer will kill him. The Magnar had said as much at Greyguard. Any kneelers they met were to be put to death at once, to make certain they could not raise the alarm. Ride with them, eat with them, fight with them. Did that mean he must stand mute and helpless while they slit an old man's throat? 
Near the edge of the village, John came face to face with one of the guards Steer had posted. The Then growled something in the old tongue and pointed his spear back toward the inn. Get back where you belong, John guessed. But where is that? He walked towards the water and discovered an almost dry spot beneath the leaning daub and wattle wall of a tumble-down cottage that had mostly tumbled down. That was where Egrit found him, sitting, staring off across the rain-whipped lake. I know this place, he told her when she sat beside him. That tower? Look at the top of it the next time the lightning flashes, and tell me what you see. Aye, if you like, she said, and then some of the thens are saying they heard noises out there. Shouting, they say. Thunder! They say shouting. Might be it's ghosts. The holdfast did have a grim, haunted look, standing there black against the storm on its rocky island, with the rain lashing at the lake all around it. We could go out and take a look, he suggested. I doubt we could get much wetter than we are. Swimming in the storm? She laughed at the notion. This is a trick to get the clothes off me, John Snow. Do I need a trick for that now? he teased. Or is it that you can't swim a stroke? John was a strong swimmer himself, having learned the art as a boy in Winterfell's great moat. Egrit punched his arm. You know nothing, John Snow. I'm half a fish, I'll have you know. Half fish, half goat, half horse. There's too many halves to you, Egrit. He shook his head. We wouldn't need to swim. If this is the place I think, we could walk. She pulled back and gave him a look. Walk on water? What Southron sorcery is that? No sort he began as a huge bolt of lightning stabbed down from the sky and touched the surface of the lake. For half a heartbeat the world was noonday bright. The clap of thunder was so loud that Egrit gasped and covered her ears. "'Did you look?' John asked, as the sound rolled away and the night turned black again. "'Did you see?' "'Yellow,' she said. "'Is that what you meant? Some of them standing stones on top were yellow. We call them Merlins.' They were painted gold a long time ago. This is Queen's crown. Across the lake the tower was black again, a dim shape dimly seen. A queen lived there? asked Egrit. A queen stayed there for a night. Old Nan had told him the story, but Mr. Lewin had confirmed most of it. Alasan, the wife of King Jeharis the Conciliator. He's called the old king because he reigned so long, but he was young when he first came to the Iron Throne. In those days it was his wont to travel all over the realm. When he came to Winterfell he brought his queen, six dragons, and half his court. The king had matters to discuss with his warden of the north, and Alisanne grew bored, so she mounted her dragon Silverwing and flew north to see the wall. This village was one of the places where she stopped. Afterward the small folk painted the top of their hold fast to look like the golden crown she'd worn when she spent the night among them. I have never seen a dragon. No one has. The last dragons died a hundred years ago or more. But this was before that. Queen Alisan, you say? Good Queen Alisan, they called her later. One of the castles on the wall was named for her as well, Queensgate. Before her visit they called it Snowgate. If she was so good, she should have torn that wall down. No, he thought. The wall protects the realm from the others. And from you and your kind as well, sweetling. I had another friend who dreamed of dragons. A dwarf, he told me. John Snow! One of the Thens loomed above them, frowning. Magna once! John thought it might have been the same man who'd found him outside the cave the night before they climbed the wall, but he could not be sure. He got to his feet. A grit came with him, which always made Steer frown, but whenever he tried to dismiss her, she would remind him that she was a free woman, not a kneeler. She came and went as she pleased. They found the Magnar standing beneath the tree that grew through the floor of the common room. His captive knelt before the hearth, encircled by wooden spears and bronze swords. He watched John approach, but did not speak. The rain was running down the walls and pattering against the last few leaves that still clung to the tree, while smoke swirled thick from the fire. "'He must die,' Steer the Magnar said. "'Do it, Crow.' The old man said no word. He only looked at John, standing amongst the wildlings. Amidst the rain and smoke, lit only by the fire, he could not have seen that John was all in black. 
but for his sheepskin cloak. Or could he? John drew long claw from its sheath. Rain washed the steel, and the firelight traced a sullen orange line along the edge. Such a small fire to cost a man his life. He remembered what Corin Halfhand had said when they spied the fire in the Skirling Pass. Fire is life up here, he told them, but it can be death as well. That was high in the frost fangs, though, in the lawless wild beyond the wall. This was the gift, protected by the night's watch and the power of Winterfell. A man should have been free to build a fire here without dying for it. Why do you hesitate? Steer said. Kill him and be done. Even then the captive did not speak. Mercy, he might have said, or you have taken my horse, my coin, my food, let me keep my life, or no, please, I have done you no harm. He might have said a thousand things, or wept, or called upon his gods. No words would save him now, though. Perhaps he knew that. So he held his tongue and looked at John in accusation and appeal. You must not balk. Whatever is asked of you, ride with them, eat with them, fight with them. But this old man had offered no resistance. He had been unlucky, that was all. Who he was, where he came from, where he meant to go on his sorry sway-backed horse, none of it mattered. He is an old man, John told himself, fifty, maybe even sixty. He lived a longer life than most. The Thens will kill him anyway. Nothing I can say or do will save him. Longclaw seemed heavier than lead in his hand, too heavy to lift. The man kept staring at him with eyes as big and black as wells. I will fall into those eyes and drown. The Magnar was looking at him, too, and he could almost taste the mistrust. The man is dead. What matter if it is my hand that slays him? One cut would do it quick and clean. Longclaw was forged of Valyrian steel, like ice. John remembered another killing. The deserter on his knees, his head rolling, the brightness of blood on snow, his father's sword, his father's words, his father's face. Do it, John Snow, Egret urged. You must, to prove you are no crow but one of the free folk. An old man sitting by a fire? Aurel was sitting by a fire, too. You killed him quick enough. The look she gave him then was hard. You meant to kill me, too, till you saw I was a woman, and I was asleep. That was different. You were soldiers, sentries. I and you crows didn't want to be seen, no more than we do now. It's just the same. Kill him. He turned his back on the man. No. The Magnar moved closer, tall, cold, and dangerous. I say yes. I command here. You command Thens, John told him, not free folk. I see no free folk. I see a crow and a crow wife. I'm no crow wife. Egret snatched her knife from its sheath. Three quick strides, and she yanked the old man's head back by the hair and opened his throat from ear to ear. Even in death the man did not cry out. You know nothing, John Snow, she shouted at him and flung the bloody blade at his feet. The Magnar said something in the old tongue. He might have been telling the Thens to kill John where he stood, but he would never know the truth of that. Lightning crashed down from the sky, a searing blue-white bolt that touched the top of the tower in the lake. They could smell the fury of it, and when the thunder came it seemed to shake the night. And death leapt down amongst them. The lightning flash left John night blind, but he glimpsed the hurtling shadow half a heartbeat before he heard the shriek. The first then died as the old man had, blood gushing from his torn throat. Then the light was gone and the shape was spinning away, snarling, and another man went down in the dark. There were curses, shouts, howls of pain. John saw a big boil stumble backward and knock down three men behind him. Ghost, he thought for one mad instant. Ghost leapt the wall. Then the lightning turned the night to day, and he saw the wolf standing on Dell's chest, blood running black from his jaws. Gray! He's gray! Darkness descended with a thunderclap. The Thens were jabbing with their spears as the wolf darted between them. The old man's mare reared, maddened by the smell of slaughter, and lashed out with her hooves. Long claw was still in his hand. All at once John Snow knew he would never get a better chance. He cut down the first man as he turned toward the wolf, shoved past a second, slashed at a third. Through the madness he heard someone call his name, but whether it was Egrit or the Magnar he could not say. The Then, fighting to control the horse, never saw him. Longclaw was feather light. He swung at the back of the man's calf and felt the steel bite down to the bone. 
When the wildling fell, the mare bolted, but somehow John managed to grab her mane with his offhand and vault himself onto her back. A hand closed round his ankle, and he hacked down and saw Bodger's face dissolve in a welter of blood. The horse reared, lashing out. One hoof caught a thin in the temple with a crunch, and then they were running. John made no effort to guide the horse. It was all he could do to stay on her as they plunged through mud and rain and thunder. Wet grass whipped at his face, and a spear flew past his ear. If the horse stumbles and breaks a leg, they will run me down and kill me, he thought. But the old gods were with him, and the horse did not stumble. Lightning shivered through the black dome of sky, and thunder rolled across the plains. The shouts dwindled and died behind him. Long hours later, the rain stopped. John found himself alone in a sea of tall black grass. There was a deep throbbing ache in his right thigh. When he looked down, he was surprised to see an arrow jutting out the back of it. When did that happen? He grabbed hold of the shaft and gave it a tug, but the arrowhead was sunk deep in the meat of his leg, and the pain when he pulled on it was excruciating. He tried to think back on the madness of the end, but all he could remember was the beast, gaunt and grey and terrible. It was too large to be a common wolf. A dire wolf, then. It had to be. He had never seen an animal move so fast, like a grey wind. Could Rob have returned to the north? John shook his head. He had no answers. It was too hard to think about the wolf, the old man. He grit any of it. Clumsily he slid down off the mare's back. His wounded leg buckled under him, and he had to swallow a scream. This is going to be agony. The arrow had to come out, though, and nothing good could come of waiting. John curled his hand around the fletching, took a deep breath, and shoved the arrow forward. He grunted, then cursed. It hurt so much he had to stop. I am bleeding like a butchered pig, he thought. But there was nothing to be done for it until the arrow was out. He grimaced and tried again, and soon stopped again, trembling. Once more. This time he screamed, but when he was done, the arrowhead was poking through the front of his thigh. John pushed back his bloody breeches to get a better grip, grimaced, and slowly drew the shaft through his leg. How he got through that without fainting he never knew. He lay on the ground afterward, clutching his prize and bleeding quietly, too weak to move. After a while he realized that if he did not make himself move, he was like to bleed to death. John crawled to the shallow stream where the mare was drinking, washed his thigh in the cold water, and bound it tight with a strip of cloth torn from his cloak. He washed the arrow, too, turning it in his hands. Was the fletching gray or white? Egrit fletched her arrows with pale grey goose feathers. Did she loose a shaft at me as I fled? John could not blame her for that. He wondered if she'd been aiming for him or the horse. If the mare had gone down, he would have been doomed. A lucky thing my leg got in the way, he muttered. He rested for a while to let the horse graze. She did not wander far. That was good. Hobbled with a bad leg, he could never have caught her. It was all he could do to force himself back to his feet and climb onto her back. How did I ever mount her before without saddle or stirrups and a sword in one hand? That was another question he could not answer. Thunder rumbled softly in the distance, but above him the clouds were breaking up. John searched the sky until he found the ice dragon, then turned the mare north for the wall and castle black. The throb of pain in his thigh muscle made him wince as he put his heels into the old man's horse, I am going home, he told himself. But if that was true, why did he feel so hollow? He rode till dawn, while the stars stared down like eyes.